Chapter 151 Storm in the East When the Duke of Alma brought Raphael to Fletcher Village, Raphael was still building defense facilities without knowing anything. When he met the Duke of Alma, Ralph's expression was unusually complicated. Of course he knew Alma and had known her for 30 years. Alma broke away from the Knights of the Lion more than 30 years ago and became the Knight Commander of the Clarion Call Rangers in the following years. Ralph was still a young ranger at the time. Moreover, Alma could have become the Grand Leader of the Horn Call Rangers. At that time, Alma was the Lord of Lunga Town and had a high reputation in Lunga Town. However, after a tragedy occurred in Lion Lake City, the original Lord of Lion Lake City, Alf Juan, was transferred because he failed to protect the king and nobles and lost the territory of Lion Lake City. Alma rescued the Mad King and was named Lord of Lion Lake City. But later Alma killed some scum in his family. Parasite was a serious crime. So he lost his family's territory in Chunga Town. Just in time, Duke Alf Juan, who lost Shirhu City, took over Chunga Town. The two dukes are equivalent to exchanging territories. This result is of course not a coincidence, but the result of the mutual support of these close friends. However, this result prevented Alma from becoming the grand leader of the Horn Call Rangers. After all, the purpose of the Ranger Group is to protect the homeland, and it is not in line with the tradition and charter of the Ranger Group to allow a lord outside the jurisdiction of Chang'e Town to serve as the leader. Moreover, after Alma was sealed to Lion Lake City, she took charge of the Lion Lake City Flag Guard, which completely prevented her from taking up the position of the Horn Summoning Knights. The Lion Lake City Flag Guard was actually formed by Duke Alf Juan, and now this force is the Lion Lake City Heavy Cavalry led by Fathered at the beginning. In fact, the establishment of the Lion Lake City Flag Guard was also due to the tragedy Leonardo caused in Lion Lake City. Too many noble lords were killed, causing Lion Lake City to feel empty for a while. Moreover, Alf Wanbin lost the territory of Lion Lake City because of his weak defense and failed to withstand the Lion Knights led by Leonardo. Although it has been transferred to Chang'e Town, Shirhu City is Alf Wan's hometown after all. So before he left, he armed the wealthy citizens with property in Shirhu City and formed a military force between civilians and nobles. Heavy Cavalry Troops the newly formed Shirhu City Flag Guard is actually similar in nature to the Bugle Call Rangers. It was originally a civilian force with the purpose of protecting the countryside. In order to quickly equip Alma with the ability to protect Lion Lake City, Alf Juan handed over the Lion Lake City Flag Guard to Alma. Of course, it was also to allow himself to continue to maintain influence in Lion Lake City. During the years when Alf Juan was healthy, the Lion Lake City Heavy Cavalry actually helped Alf Juan fight in many battles and Count Odin became the Grand Master of the Horn Call Rangers. Alma and Alfan have indeed always been close friends who cooperated with each other, and Alfan provided Alma with opportunities until his death. But Count Odin and Ralph have gradually become Alma's enemies in the past 30 years. In addition to conflicts of interest, there are also conflicts in ideas and behavior patterns. For example, what Alma is doing now is something that Odin and Ralph would never do. Ralph, old man, I know you don't like me now. But it doesn't matter. As long as you still like your only son. That's all. Alma raised her head and looked at Ralph. I just need a favor from you. Your Majesty. Your actions will only make me look down on you. Ralph shook his head. His eyes filled with contempt. It doesn't matter. I never care what others think of me. Ralph. I want to become the Grand Leader of the Horn Call Rangers. And I need your support. You also know that my patience is limited. For the sake of your son. Tell the young men of the rangers that I am supposed to be their leader. Alma shook her head, her face expressionless. Killing the leader of the rangers? Bah! Young Raphael kept struggling and his attitude was extremely fierce. Alma killed 20 rangers in front of him. One can imagine his anger. Shut up! Kid! I don't want to hurt you! Alma turned her head and asked her men to gag Raphael's mouth. And then stared into Ralph's eyes. This is your only son! Ralph! He is brave and determined, and has a bright future. I swear, if you are willing to help me, I will make Raphael the next grand leader. Of course, you don't have to agree, as long as you are willing to leave him forever. I will give you five minutes to think about it. Of course Ralph couldn't give up his only son. No matter how determined a tough guy you are, there will always be a weakness. With the cooperation of Ralph, the Horn summoned all the rangers to gather at Fletcher Village. In just two days, Alma became the grand leader of the Horn Call Rangers in name only, and headed west with the Horn Call Rangers. He claimed that he would lead the Ranger Group to suppress bandits, 
the large force of the Ranger Regiment actually happened to pass by Godric and others who broke through the siege and returned to Fort Brave Shield. The closest thing to them was actually only 20 miles apart. This was the route that Alma deliberately guided. The Horncall Rangers did not approach the hilltop where Godric was besieged. There are indeed a large number of bandits west of Fletcher Village. The members of the Clarion Call Rangers, who did not know the truth, did see many members of the Red Brotherhood with their own eyes. So they did not doubt the Duke of Alma's purpose at all. So, just three days later, Alma took the horn to summon all the rangers to pursue a large group of bandits and arrived near Payne Village within the jurisdiction of Lion Lake City. But after arriving here, they lost track of the group of Red Brotherhood members. Alma has asked Ketalan to take the rogue knights and bandits of the Red Brotherhood in a circle to Brave Shield Keep. Of course, he would not let those Red Brotherhood bandits enter any village within the jurisdiction of Shurhu City. If these unruly and uncontrollable gangsters appear in Lion Lake City, they will arouse the dissatisfaction of the nobles of Lion Lake City against him, especially members of his Horton family. Half a year ago, many villages were harmed by Fauché and the Red Brotherhood. Everyone in the family knew that Alma was connected to the Red Brotherhood. If Brotherhood members appeared in large numbers in the Lion Lake City area, the Horton family would give up on Alma. In fact, it is difficult for members of the Red Brotherhood to unite together. There are Red Brotherhoods in every city in Pendor, but they have no common leader, no clear hierarchy, and no serious army. This is a huge underworld organization that obtains wealth through assassinations, collection of protection fees, drug trafficking, selling human organs, and catching and selling slaves. It is probably the largest organization in the entire continent. But this organization is very loose and difficult to manage. Many seemingly ordinary civilians, businessmen and even nobles are also members of the Red Brotherhood. But they all belong to various gangs. Gangs in various cities have been fighting each other for territory. And it is difficult to unite. However, the Duke of Alma spent a lot of money to buy many rogue knights and asked these noble rogues to recruit men from various cities to form such a large force, and asked Baron Ketalan to coordinate and manage it. Alma convinces Ketran to fully support him in exchange for giving these rogue knights to Ketran to become Ketran's personal soldiers. Members of the Red Brotherhood have been inquiring about Raphael's movements. Raphael can find traces of bandits near that hill. Of course, Alma deliberately sent people to lure him. His main purpose was to capture Raphael. Use Ketalan, who is familiar with the terrain to capture Raphael and trap Godric and Charles, leaving Fletcher and Ralph's border camp empty and preventing Godric and Charles from destroying him. Thing. Then Alma used Raphael to coerce Ralph to cooperate and become the grand leader of the Horn Call Rangers, and once again used members of the Red Brotherhood to lure the Rangers into launching a large-scale suppression of bandits. All members left the eastern region and were unable to assist the brave Shield Braves. Shield Castle temporarily became an isolated city. Kedron's current mission is to lead the Red Brotherhood members back to the eastern border, completely occupy Ralph's camp and Fletcher village, and then besiege Fort Brave Shield. This is the same routine as when Alma occupied Chang'e Town. But this time he wanted to achieve more goals. Use the bandits of the Red Brotherhood to capture Fort Brave Shield, and then lead the Horn to summon the Ranger Group to recover the lost territory. You can be established and gain a good reputation. If the Duke of Alma gets hold of Fort Brave Shield and controls the dangerous areas on the border, he can use the safety of River Town as a bargaining chip to completely intimidate the Horn Call Rangers to do his bidding. He first asked Fauché to send people to build a camp and build a bridge by the river, originally to intimidate the Rangers. Alma could has never forgotten his family's original territory, Chungha Town. This plan had consumed all his savings. He wanted to finish it off in one go and use all the members of the Red Brotherhood who were about to be given to Ketalan. Moreover, he took the horn to summon the rangers to Payne Village near Lion Lake City, killing two birds with one stone. Alma went directly to the first flag guard of Lion Lake City. This is a heavy cavalry force of more than 200 people, who are now gathering at Penn because they have discovered a large number of armed troops approaching in the east. Due to the large number of invading troops, Grand Long, the flag officer of the first flag guard of Shurhu City, did not act lightly out of caution but instead deployed defenses in Payne Village. But Grandron never expected that these people were actually the Horn Call Rangers. And the leader was his old lord, the Duke of Alma. The Duke of Alma, who was leading the entire Ranger Regiment, took only a few minutes to get Grandron back behind him. The total strength of the Horn Call Rangers exceeds 900. And they are all elite. Of course, a large and powerful Ranger group has a huge deterrent effect. 
But Granlon didn't know that the ranger group was just deceived. You must know that the Horn Call Rangers were only protecting the security of the Eastern Region before this. They almost never left the Eastern Region, let alone entered the jurisdiction of Shurhu City. Being able to take the Rangers away from the East, and also appearing in large numbers in Payne Village near Lion Lake City. In Granlon's opinion, there is only one possibility. He thought that the Rangers were fully controlled by Alma and became a private soldier. In this case, of course Granlon had to submit. Moreover, in addition to the deterrence of the rangers, there is also a sentence that works. Granlon, follow me with the standard guard. I know that the families of the standard guard members are under father's supervision. Let's change everything. The family members of this unit have always been controlled by father. But the young noble master probably did not expect that his father would do the opposite and easily instigate rebellion against this elite unit. After all, Alma is the lord of Lion Lake City, and it is only natural that Grand, the flag officer of the first flag guard, should return to his old master. In the next half day, Granlon took Alma into Shuru City without attracting attention, and privately visited the commanders of various troops in the city. The two knight captains and a dozen knights were killed one by one by Alma and Granlon. Most of the troops in Shuru City quietly returned to Alma's hands overnight. Just as Alma said, as long as he appeared in Shuru City, no one would dare to attack him. That night, Fawcett became Alma's prisoner. This was also the work of the heavy cavalry of the Lion Lake City Standard Guard. They tied Father in his sleep to the Duke of Alma. From the time Alma began planning to capture Raphael, within just a few days, Lion Lake City was back in the hands of the elderly Duke. Fawcett finally gave in to his father and confessed everything under whips and salt water, including what happened with his sister. Alma kicked him out of the house and exiled Fawcett and his sister to Raven Land. Later, Baron Kedron's scouts came with the news that Jatu and bandits have joined forces to attack Brave Shield Castle. Alma immediately led most of the army of Lion Lake City and marched towards Brave Shield Castle together with the Horn Call Rangers. Like a loyal minister who actively defends the country's borders. Brave Shield Keep, Lord's Hall. After successfully breaking through and rendezvousing with Leofric, Godric, Charles and others entered Brave Shield Castle to rest. There were too many wounded in the team. And Riva was even dying. Only Brave Shield Castle had military doctors to treat the injuries. When they passed through Fletcher Village, they received a report from Ralph's craftsmen, saying that the Duke of Alma had become the Grand Master of the Horn Call Rangers and was leading the Rangers to the West to suppress bandits. Godric naturally realized that the thousands of members of the Red Brotherhood must have been created by the Duke of Alma because it reminded him of the time when Alma sent his army to suppress bandits to control Chang'e Town. But this time, there are knights sent by the king to monitor Lung'e Town. And Duke Brennus's son Marbert is also there. Alma should not have any plans to take advantage of Lung'e Town. In addition, those Red Brotherhood members appeared on the northern border. So Alma may want to deal with Ford Brave Shield. So he asked all the troops to enter Brave Shield Castle to prepare for war, and sent an order to Chang'e Town to summon troops to come for support. Lord Godric, how did the Duke of Alma become the leader of the Horn Call Rangers? Ralph would not support him. Leofric still didn't quite understand. Of course Godric didn't know the reason. He thought for a long time and finally came to a conclusion. No matter what method Alma used, I at least believe that the Rangers will not attack us. As long as we can defeat those he is a gangster. And his plan will not succeed. All we have to face for the time being are those members of the Red Brotherhood. No, maybe there are Jada people. Riva suddenly opened her eyes from her coma and said something pale. Her injuries were very serious. Although she had been barely bandaged, the two fatal wounds on her chest and abdomen could not stop the bleeding. She was currently being looked after by Charles. Riva, you'd better stop talking and have a good rest. No, Charles, let me see Fort Brave Shield. Huh? It turns out this is what this place looks like. Riva grabbed Charles's arm tightly. Let Charles help her sit up. Leaned against Charles and looked around. Jada people, Leofric muttered. I have made deals with the Jada people. I know that the person who has the most contact with the Jada people is the Duke of Alma. He can even hire Jada people to do things for him. The Red Brotherhood is not capable of attacking Brave Shield Castle. But the Jada people, Riva's voice became lower and lower, and her face became paler. Sitting up suddenly consumed all her remaining strength. Everyone looked at Riva. She's right. We're going to face a tough battle. Godric nodded in agreement. Miss Riva? You not Miss Riva? Riva suddenly stopped moving. 
Reba, Reba, don't sleep, don't sleep, Reba. Charles felt a sharp pain in his heart and burst into tears. He supported the limp Reba and shouted helplessly. He has realized that Reba was able to sit up just now. Maybe it was a reflection of her past. Don't make any noise. Charles, help me tell Master Leon that I can't repay his favor. But at least, I'm back home. Reba's voice gradually became as low as a mosquito. After the last murmur, her head hung down. Until the last moment, she still kept her eyes open, looking greedily at everything in the Lord's Hall. This was the castle her father had built. But this was her first time entering the Lord's Hall. It's also the last time. She once refused to acknowledge this as her home. But she finally came home. In the way a nobleman should. Lion City. After being imprisoned in the secret room for two and a half days, Leon finally met King Ulrich. The king's face was too pale to be alive. This face reminded Leon of the secret agent of the Bacchus Empire. However, even after seeing the king, the lord still lay on the bed and did not move. Leon, the Bacchus Empire is attacking White Deer Castle. You have to find a way to repel the enemy. Ulrich didn't care about Leon's rude behavior and confidently gave Leon instructions in the first sentence. As if nothing happened. Your Majesty, I am imprisoned here now. How can I repel the enemy? Do I rely on my thoughts? The Lord lay on the bed and turned over, lying on his side facing the king, probably as a sign of respect. This is Igor. Sigh. Go back to your territory. I will give you some compensation. Ulrich originally planned to blame it on Igor. But looking at Leon's appearance, he changed his mind and directly offered compensation. Your Majesty. What kind of compensation? Upon hearing this, the Lord turned over and stood up from the bed. His attitude becoming extremely correct. I know your business is doing well. And I need a lot of funds now. You can find a way to help me raise 100,000 dinars. And I will give you the flag to grant tax-free rights in my jurisdiction. This is only the royal industry. Is this enough compensation for the privileges you have received? Ulrich's voice was low. His breath was weak. And he was obviously in poor physical condition. But he kept his head held high. Dot your majesty. This is a transaction. Not compensation. Leon shook his head. Having a new understanding of Ulrich's thickness of face. But Leon also knew that what Ulrich proposed was indeed a win-win approach. Chapter 152 Crisis is Everywhere. Granting domestic tax-free rights to Liang's flag actually means that industries using Liang's flag do not need to pay taxes anywhere under the direct jurisdiction of Ulrich. In other words, in the territories directly under the jurisdiction of Ulrich, such as Lion City and Changna Town, branches and stores are not required to pay taxes. As long as they fly Liang's griffin flag, the tax officer is not qualified to take charge. This is of course a very valuable privilege, and it is indeed beneficial to both Leon and King Ulrich. There is nothing wrong with saying it is compensation. The king himself is in urgent need of funds, and it is not easy to raise a large amount of cash for a while. If he can get 100,000 dinars from Leon, Ulrich's urgent need can be solved. What is the concept of 100,000 dinars? A duke like Alma owns a territory like Lion Lake City. If we only look at the tax revenue of the territory, it is only about 100,000 dinars a year. The entire county of Shurhu City has a combined population of 100,000 and almost every person provides one dinar for the duke. Of course, this only refers to the territorial taxes that can go into the duke's pocket, and does not take into account his other private properties. Although it seems that the tax amount of only one dinar per capita to the duke is quite low, the actual situation is that the average tax per capita in the lion realm is more than 10 dinars per year, which is already more than half of the per capita annual income, because the duke also has to pay taxes to the country, and the ones who collect taxes directly from the common people are not big nobles such as the duke, but the tax collectors under the duke's subordinates. The knights. The actual amount of taxes received by the vast majority of knights accounts for more than half of residents' income. After all, knights have to support themselves and their followers, and they also have to pay taxes to their superior lords. 100,000 dinars per year is actually not much. If you really want to calculate it carefully, it is just the price of purchasing hundreds of thousands of sets of high-quality weapons and equipment. If you are buying horses, 200 war horses or more than 300 draft horses, you will have to spend 100,000 dinars. So don't think that big men like the Duke are rich. Although they have a large territory and strong power, their corresponding expenses are also large. They really can't come up with a lot of cash anytime and anywhere. The king is not rich either. 
although King Ulrich has recently been expanding his direct jurisdiction. Chang'e town has just been nominally under the direct jurisdiction. There is no profit yet, and he can only rely on Lion City. The territory under the jurisdiction of Lion City is relatively wealthy. As the capital, nearly 400,000 people live in the surrounding areas, and the territory's annual income can reach more than 300,000 dinars. This refers to the king's private income, not the country's fiscal revenue. After all, the current estimated population of the Lion Kingdom is only 2 million, of which 20% are residents of the king's direct jurisdiction. This is actually a quite large proportion. Of course, it can't be compared to the period of Pender Kingdom. Before the Kingdom of Pender suffered the Red Death, the population of the capital area was more than 1 million. The sharp population decline was mainly caused by the Red Death and wars that lasted for more than a hundred years. Before the Red Death, the total population of Pender was almost 24 million. Now, the total population of the entire continent may be only about 10 million. Therefore, Emperor Marius of the Bacchus Empire promulgated the policy of hard labor for those who did not get married, just to increase the population. The income from the king's direct territory is the king's private property, which is used for the expenses of the palace and his own territory, and also includes supporting some private troops such as the royal guards and other retinue troops. 100,000 dinars is one-third of the king's own annual income, which is a lot of money for the king. The king's private property is different from the country's fiscal revenue. The national fiscal revenue is of course more than the king's private income. It is maintained by taxes paid by the nobles. That is, taxes received from other noble territories. Most of the time, it is apportioned annually in the form of tasks based on the size of the territory. This money is controlled by the kingdom's finance minister and is used according to the annual budget. It is public funds and the king has no right to use it at will. For example, Expenditures for important border defense military areas such as Chicha Fortress are used for disaster relief, road construction, and maintenance of infrastructure in various parts of the kingdom, or for subsidizing border lords, building infrastructure, or for war, etc. As a national knight's order, the Lion Knights can also receive some subsidies from the national finance. Of course, the main source of income for the Lion Knights is the tuition paid by the Lion Knights. But this is far from enough. King Ulrich himself will also use his own money to provide some subsidies to ensure that the Lion Knights pay their dues. Loyalty. The national finances are never enough, let alone satisfy the king's selfishness. Instead, the king needs to fill some gaps with his private property from time to time. Since he had to spend money everywhere, the king was actually more short of money than the average noble. Ulrich knew that Liang's business was quite large. If Liang's caravans could be fully tax-free on his territory, then Maishang Company's industry would definitely grow rapidly, which would actually quickly boost the overall economy within the jurisdiction. Although Liang's property is tax-free, it actually has greater benefits for the king's own territory. After commercial revitalization, various transactions will increase. If Maishang Company operates more business in the king's direct territory, other businessmen will also frequently coming and going. The king can receive more business taxes from other merchants. Rulers use tax-free policies to attract investment. This method has been used since ancient times and is actually quite reasonable. Considering the scale of Liang's business, the price of 100,000 dinars in exchange for tax-free rights, or to buy out all future business taxes in the king's direct territory, seems very reasonable. Based on the current situation, the total commercial taxes paid by the branches and agents of Maishan Company to local lords in half a year have exceeded 50,000 dinars. Although Bailu Castle and Makes Angling do not collect taxes, but if a branch is opened on the territory of other lords, it must pay business tax. And the amount of tax is different in each place. But those branches were located in other cities and villages. And commercial taxes were paid to local lords and could not enter the king's pocket. Of course, the commercial taxes paid in the Lion City area and Chang'e town belong to the king. The total amount of these commercial taxes is nearly 20,000 dinars. And it is increasing month by month. After careful calculation, it is indeed a good deal to invest 100,000 dinars in one time and then be tax-free for life. Ulrich made a good plan. And Leon was indeed tempted. For others, this deal may simply mean paying taxes for three to five years at once and then being tax-free for a lifetime. But it's different for Leon. This can be considered as the king giving the lord a hugely profitable industry. After all, the king didn't quite understand what kind of businessman Leon was. Maishang International is a group company. If you join the Maishang group, 
you can be completely tax-free in the jurisdictions of Lion City and Chang'e Town. Liang can even point to the map, separate out various industries, and directly sell the operating qualifications of Maishang Group's branches in the duty-free zone, and sell them on an annual basis. Just collecting operating expenses and deposits every year can make you rich as a country. When the Griffin flag can represent tax-free privileges, Liang can bring most of the country's businessmen under his banner. 100,000 dinars is nothing in comparison. However, even though he was secretly happy, Liang still showed a dissatisfied expression. Your Majesty, this is a deal, not compensation. Of course, I am willing to make a fair deal. But before that, I am more concerned about how to restore my reputation. The Lord looked very serious. Ulrich was silent for a moment. What Liang said makes sense. The king caught people and put them back. Although Liang was not harmed, it did damage the reputation of nobles like Liang. After all, it meant that the king was doubting him. I will find a way to help you raise 100,000 dinars. But I hope you can give me the power to use the golden coat of arms. In other words, in addition to being exempt from commercial taxes in your direct jurisdiction, I can also freely develop territories and conquer rebellion. Only in this way can you show that you do not regard me as a traitor, but as a rebel. And in this way, you can restore my reputation. Leon paid back the deal. In the Lion Kingdom, the Golden Coat of Arms represents the same privileges as members of the royal family. This was a reasonable counteroffer, as the privilege of using the Golden Coat of Arms was only granted to trusted and close lords. And it did remove any suspicion Ulrich had of treason. The lord has always been fair when it comes to transactions. Ulrich claimed to grant Leon's flag. Privileges that can only be obtained by royal estates. So Leon simply counteroffered it to. The same privileges as members of the royal family. The difference between these two logics is of course very big. However, if the asking price is met and the money is paid, the business is negotiated. The golden coat of arms is not just tax-free. It represents the power of free rebellion, the ability to independently launch attacks on hostile forces, and the ability to directly occupy territories captured independently. Of course, it is limited to attacking hostile forces or rebels, and cannot provoke disputes at will, nor can it declare war on behalf of the country. However, it is rare to have the authority to freely rebel and occupy the territory that you have conquered alone. Currently, no noble in the entire kingdom has this authority. Only more than a hundred years ago, when Alfred was still the Duke of Lyon, he had received this privilege. At that time, he changed his coat of arms to a solid golden lion. Therefore, after he established the kingdom of the lion, the pure golden coat of arms was given this special meaning. Ulrich naturally knew what the golden coat of arms meant. You want to be given the authority to freely crusade against rebellion to prove your loyalty? This is indeed a reasonable request. But crusade against rebellion? Where is there any rebellion now? Ulrich hesitated and shook his head. Isn't Rhaenyra a traitor? Isn't Albert a traitor? I just want to contribute to the country. If there are traitors again, I will take the initiative to attack them. The territory I captured belongs to me. All I want is that's all. Of course, Leon did not give up and explained that he was thinking about the country, and clearly stated that he did have selfish motives. But this kind of selfishness was also deserved. But do you have the ability to fight against rebellion? King Ulrich took a deep look at Leon. Didn't I kill two of them before? You saw one of them with your own eyes. Leon spread his hands. Dot okay. Deal. I hope you won't die in the hands of the traitors. But you have to deliver 100,000 dinars to me within a month. Ulrich nodded in agreement. But there was a clear gloom in his eyes. He really needs money. After all, he is the king. He can grant authority now, and can take it back in the future. Ulrich is not too worried about Leon. A little baron. Half a day later, Ulrich asked Archmaster Igor to issue an announcement in King's Square in the Lion City, allowing Leon to make the heraldic pattern into pure gold. This color is indeed dyed with real gold, and is worth 100,000 dinars. Grand Maester Igor read out the king's authorization in front of the officials of the House of Nobles, with an expressionless face, and then hung the authorization letter on the bulletin wall of the House of Nobles. After making this announcement, Igor turned around and entered the tower of the old noble house, which was the king's private residence, but Felina no longer lived in the garden. Your Highness, Leon has been released, and His Majesty the King has even protected his property. You may just have to wait patiently. On the top floor of the tower of the old noble house, Igor stood respectfully behind a young man with a gloomy face. This young man is Alan Rick, the only son of King Ulrich 
and the prince of the Lion Kingdom. This prince was only in his twenties, but he looked lifeless, pale, and seemed to be in poor health. Eager, this is not the result I want. You know, Alan Rick stood at the window on the top floor, looking down at the busy crowd below the city, and spoke lightly. Your Highness, who would have thought that the Bacchus Empire would attack White Deer Castle at this time? Originally, I had convinced His Majesty the King that Leon would indeed be declared a traitor as you wished. But under the current circumstances, the King Your Majesty cannot ignore the security of the border. Igor looked at Alanric's thin back and lowered his head. No, it is precisely this situation that is the best situation. Igor, if Leon dies in Lion City at this time, what will the nobles think? Alanric turned his head and rubbed the arm that was holding the window edge. It seemed that just such movements could make his arm sore. Now the Bacchus Empire is attacking White Deer Castle. If Leon dies in Lion City at this time, the nobles will lose confidence in the king. Your Highness, he is trying to seize the vassal's property for his own selfish purposes. If he fails to seize it, he will be killed. Life, regardless of the safety of the kingdom. In this case, at least half of the nobles will no longer obey your father's orders. And a civil war will inevitably break out in the lion realm. Igor raised his head and glanced at Alanric's arm. His eyes were complicated. There were several clear purple blood spots on Alanric's arms, which were exactly the same as the blood spots on King Ulrich's body. Since you know, then find a way to kill him. Didn't you just help my father hire some adventurers? That, Griffin sword. Adventure group. Let that adventure group kill him. And this can be solved I put the blame on my father. Alanric squeezed his arm and gave incredible instructions in an understatement. Your Highness, if you do this, those nobles may indeed oppose the king, but they may not support you. Igor raised his head in surprise. He did not expect that the prince would suddenly give such an order. Igor, my uncle, Duke Brennus of Cliff Bay will support me. Duke Alma has a grudge against Leon, and I helped him a few days ago. So he will also support me if the king kills Leon. Then Felina and Godric will also support me. The great lords of all factions. Plus you. This is enough. Alanric twisted his wrist and walked to an easel. There is a lifelike oil painting on the shelf, which depicts a seven or eight year old boy riding a horse with the help of the king. That boy is Alanric. But the young man in the painting looks much more energetic than he does now as an adult. Your Highness, your father's time is short. So you don't have to be so anxious. His Majesty the King only let him go so that he can get a bigger estate from him in the future. Igor seemed to want to persuade. Ha! Huh? But those more properties have nothing to do with me. Igor, you should know why my father went to find Nodo. Alanric stared at the oil painting. His voice as deep as coming from H. L. It is said that the blood of the Nodo will not be infected with many diseases. Your majesty did this for the future of the kingdom. Igor did not raise his head. His voice was low. The future of the kingdom? Ha! Huh? But what does that have to do with me? I've already contracted the disease. I have no future at all. A trace of madness appeared on Alanric's face. He looked at his arms and clenched his hands into fists. Igor sighed deeply and stopped talking. Igor, my uncle, you know, I have no future and I'm experiencing symptoms right now. I can't wait any longer. But he didn't go to Nuoduo Nua for medical treatment. And it wasn't for me either. But he wants to give me another brother. Snort. Ha uh ha. -huh. I heard what the three prophets and he said in the secret room. He doesn't want me to inherit the throne because I'm destined to get sick. He wants to give birth to another healthy heir. Igor, what about me? And me? I just want to get the throne I deserve. Maybe I will die in ten years. But I am the heir to the kingdom. I can't be locked up in a tower with no name for the rest of my life. You know, only I can give you everything you want. And you will become a grand duke. You know, I'd do better than my dad. He can find an older noble girl to continue his healthy bloodline. And so can I. The future of the lion will still be better. Kill Leon and let the king be charged with murdering the nobles. The nobles will definitely put me on the throne. Alanric gradually lost control. And there was even a fierce glint in his eyes. Igor looked up at Alanric and smiled bitterly. My child, this will cause chaos in the kingdom. So what? Uncle, I don't have that much time to wait. If I don't do something, I'm afraid I will die in front of my father. I don't believe those three witches. I don't want to live forever. I just want to get I deserve it. Alaric's voice became more and more excited. But his expression became more and more lonely. Oh dot I understand dot I'll make arrangements right away. 
He's always under my surveillance. Igor frowned deeply and exited the room. Alaric turned around again and looked at the palace opposite from the window at the highest point in the entire Lion City. Father, maybe you are doing it for the future of the family. But this is not fair. Dot, it's not fair. He whispered towards the dome of the palace. Chapter 153 Sneak Attack and Counter Sneak Attack Adventurers in or Tavern This is where Leon once met Sarah. When Leon came to this hotel again, it was already that night. After reaching an agreement with the king at noon, he has been signing various documents in the House of Lords and confirming the changes in the coat of arms. Although it was just a simple color change, I didn't know whether it was because Igor's subordinates were not skilled in the business or because the atmosphere of the House of Lords was so procrastinating. Anyway, it delayed him for a full half day. It was not until nightfall that the House of Lords completed all its affairs and sent two attendants to take him to the hotel. Of course, the attendants sent Leon to the door of the hotel and left. These attendants were not there to protect him, but probably just to keep an eye on Liang's whereabouts. Leon kept looking up at the rooftops all the way. He didn't feel relieved until he saw Risa Dillon's figure flashing past on a big tree in the city. There were not many people in the hotel, and Eric had booked the hotel, guest rooms, and tavern together. Eric was naturally waiting for the Lord. Sir, it's great that you are safe. I thought it would be very difficult this time. In fact, I was ready to break the prison. Miss Amy asked me to bring Alice here. We need leave here immediately? Eric saw Leon entering the hotel and immediately came forward to greet him. Without saying too much nonsense, he directly asked for the next instructions. He does seem to be prepared for everything. There is a reason why Leon has always looked at Goshun differently. I asked you to come. I originally thought that we would encounter bigger troubles this time. I didn't expect to escape so smoothly. How many people did you bring to Lion City? Before leaving White Deer Castle, Leon actually carried a lot of things with him for running away. But he has not used any of them so far. This is of course a good thing. Now that everything is safe and there is a large army to support him. The Lord feels quite relaxed now. More than 400 people. All trained and skilled warriors. Eric brought all the fighting power in Chungha Town at that time. And now these people are scattered in hotels throughout the city. There are only about a hundred people staying in this adventurous hotel. And there are dozens of carriages parked. But it has already filled up the largest hotel in Lion City. There are no outsiders here. Right? The Lord looked around cautiously. There were dozens of sergeants sitting in the hall. All of them fully armed. But with different equipment. Don't worry. Sir, we are all in the hall. Eric is really reliable. The people in the hall were all armed escorts from Chanha Express now called bodyguards by Leon. Eric was careful not to let them wear neat heraldic robes to avoid questioning. So they looked like a group of soldiers. Very good. Let's leave some brothers to handle business in this tavern and arrange for them to keep an eye on one person. I'm worried that similar things will happen in the future. Since there were no outsiders, the Lord began to arrange work on the spot. Sir, the basement of this tavern is a casino under the name of my Xiong group. The owner of the tavern is now our agent. This adventurer has been our business partner for a long time. In fact, most of the names in Leisher are the adventurer. Hotels are already cooperating with us. This was specially arranged by Miss Leslie. Who do you want the brothers to keep an eye on? Eric pointed toward the inside of the pub bar. Leon looked over and saw a griffin mark on the wall of the bar. This mark indicated that this place was a cooperative unit of my Xiong group. The Lord had not interfered too much with Leslie's operation of Changha Express before and just asked Leslie to spread the business as much as possible. It seems that in the past few months, Leslie has quietly developed many partners, and is indeed a qualified general manager. Keep an eye on Igor, Grand Scholar of the Palace. I need to know who he will meet privately in the future, and what he will do. Leon felt that there was something wrong with Igor from the beginning. It was impossible for his men to keep an eye on the king. They couldn't enter the palace. But it works to keep an eye on Igor. This court bachelor actually does not serve in the palace most of the time. But in the house of nobles. Igor. Grand bachelor. Okay. Sir. I guarantee you that I can even find out which noble lady he is having an affair with. So. Do we want to leave here now? Sir? Eric nodded. Seemingly confident about the task. Ever since he was transferred to Changha Express. And was able to command hundreds of people. This bitch seemed to have confidence in everything. This mentality was very similar to that of the Lord. You arrange the matter. And then follow me back to Chang'e Town. I have just obtained the tax-free rights in the king's territory. 
but I need to pay the king a large amount of money. Arrange this first, and then return to White Deer Castle. Leon nodded and left the tavern hall, waiting for Eric to arrange his affairs. When it comes to arranging specific matters to the brothers, since Eric has arranged it, Leon will generally not intervene personally. This is the principle of being a big boss. On the one hand, you must trust your subordinates. And on the other hand, you must try to avoid overstepping orders to avoid causing trouble to lower level employees. He went straight to the stables and found Alice. This stable is behind the hotel. Enter from a dark alley on the side of the hotel. Behind it is an open area where horses and vehicles are parked. But just when he got close to Alice, the little mare suddenly shook her head and humped him a few times, paced her feet, and kept tightening the reins, which was a signal for him to untie herself immediately. Leon thought that Alice missed him after not seeing him for many days, so he quickly stepped forward to comfort her, caressed Alice's neck, and untied the horse. But Alice did not calm down. Instead, she cradled his body with her head, pushing him closer to the saddle. It seemed to be signaling Leon to mount his horse quickly. Leon immediately became nervous. This was the instinct of animals. Alice felt the danger. The last time Alice had such a nervous reaction was when Lisa Dillon took out the snake heart stone. No matter what was about to happen, the Lord decided to trust Alice's instinctive judgment. He immediately mounted his horse. Without waiting for his command, Alice left the stable as quickly as possible, ran out of the dark alley, and came to the king's road, which was the main entrance of the tavern hall on the first floor of the hotel. Originally, Alice still had no intention of stopping, but Leon had no weapons on him at the moment and felt no sense of security. And he had to say H, low to his men. So he stopped his horse at the door of the tavern and shouted, Eric! As soon as he finished speaking, before Eric could come out, a large group of people came out from all directions and surrounded the adventurer hotel. Leon frowned and looked around. There were dozens of people in front and behind, blocking the road at both ends. Twenty or thirty people also came out of the dark alley leading to the stables next to the hotel. There were about a hundred people in all directions. These people were both men and women, and they seemed to have good equipment. They were definitely not members of the Red Brotherhood. None of them covered their faces, but basically everyone wore a full-face helmet or a face-covering helmet, and some helmets didn't even match the armor they were wearing. This group of people obviously had bad intentions. The Lord's position is directly in front of the main entrance and you can see into the tavern hall from the half-length door. And the knight's men were blocking dozens of meters in front and back of Leon. From their perspective, they definitely couldn't see inside the tavern. In the tavern, Eric was leading a group of men behind the half-length door. Preparing to come out, Leon glanced at Eric and winked. Eric heard the noise just now and saw the situation outside. After seeing the Lord's eyes, he wisely stepped back, stopped the men behind him, and after whispering a few words, he opened the door and ran out alone. What's going on? Sir? Who are you? What are you going to do? Eric looked like a follower who had just discovered that his lord was surrounded. He shouted and handed a sword to Leon. The lord did not bring his own sword when he came to Lion City. And now he has no weapons in his hand. Eric is a careful subordinate. He understands his boss's habits. What he handed over was a silver-plated knight sword which was basically the same as Leon's sword before the silver coating was polished off. Your Excellency Leon. Right. I didn't expect you to be so alert. You ran away before I even had time to react. A knight-looking guy wearing blue heavy armor came out of the alley of the stables and separated the masked man blocking the intersection. This guy looks quite burly. And there is a clang, 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 clang sound with every step he takes. Those were plate armor boots and he was also wearing a full set of heavy plate and chain armor. And he was wearing a full coverage helmet, with only a slit for his eyes exposed. Wearing this outfit to commit assassination in Lion City? This is the capital. Except for people from the Lion Knights. Most people will not appear on the streets at night, wearing heavy armor, and a large number of manpower. It is easy to be discovered, and may be considered treason. It looked like this was a premeditated attack. But this guy was definitely not a professional killer and this assassination method seemed quite amateurish. Professional killers will not bring so many people to cause trouble. One hidden arrow is more effective than a hundred people. Who is your excellency? Who sent you here? The lord's hand reached to the hilt of the sword. The knight in blue armor opposite raised his hand, and dozens of crossbow arrows were raised in front of and behind him, aiming at Leong. I originally wanted to confirm whether I killed the wrong person, 
it seems that I did not admit my mistake. Crack. As soon as he said this, a long arrow was nailed under the knight's body, and the tail of the arrow was still vibrating. The arrow was nailed between the knight's legs, and the arrow penetrated the stone slab on the ground diagonally for a foot and a half. This penetration was obviously enough to penetrate the heavy armor on his body. This was naturally shot by Rasadalin in order to warn the enemies holding crossbows. You want to kill me? It's not certain who will kill whom. Who sent you here? Liang stared into the knight's eyes. But the guy seemed to be very brave. He didn't answer the question. Instead, he glanced at the arrow at his feet and stretched out his foot to break the arrow shaft. But his kick had no effect. And he almost tripped. Instead, the big stone slab that paved the road cracked in half. It was a Nolder arrow. The arrow body and shaft were made of Nolder enchanted metal, which was hard and extremely tough. Dot Nolder! The knight was obviously knowledgeable. He looked up and looked around a few times. But he didn't seem to be afraid. Hearing him say Noldor, several people came from both sides and blocked the knight. Those were several heavily armed women. But the knight stretched out his hand to separate the women and stood at the front. Don't be like this. Ladies, in this environment, you can't stop the Noldor's arrows. I don't want you to make any mistakes. He seems quite gentlemanly. The gentleman began to look left and right behind Liang. But this was night. And Rasadalin would be difficult to spot during the day. Let alone in a dark environment. Of course, the knight couldn't see him. But the arrow that penetrated into the stone slab was already very convincing. Only the Nolder could shoot such a terrible arrow. This accuracy of shooting between the legs without causing any harm is enough to prove that the Nolder archer hidden in the darkness has the ability to kill him with an arrow. The knight didn't seem to intend to die together. He didn't see Rasadalin. He stretched out his hand to signal everyone to put down their crossbows. Baron Leon, there are actually Nolder elves helping you. This is really an unexpected surprise. The knight shook his head and seemed to be sighing. But his eyes kept glancing behind Leon. But Leon didn't intend to respond to him. Because Leon probably already knew who this guy was. Ulrich's purpose of making money is to hire an adventuring group to deal with the Nolder. This knight seems to know the archery skills of the Nolder elves. But he is not afraid of the Nolder. He is obviously the mercenary group hired by the king to capture the noble girls of the Nolder. But why do they want to kill themselves? The king has just signed an agreement with himself. But he hasn't gotten the money yet. Ulrika was definitely not responsible for this assassination. So, who could it be? The lord felt a little baffled that no one in the Lion City had any grudge against him. Sir, how about we each take a step back and go outside the city? If this continues, the patrol of the Lion Knights will probably arrive. What do you call me? Leon was ready to talk. But the knight ignored him and kept looking behind Leon. It seems the only option is to fight. Leon glanced at the tavern again. And there were already a lot fewer people inside the halflink door. Eric fully understood the meaning of the Lord's look. And he had already made some arrangements for his brothers before he came out. Leon and Eric were waiting for the brothers to be fully seated. However, at this time, the knight had already stretched out his hand and pointed to a roof behind Leon. Over there! Shoot him! He seemed to have discovered Rasadalin's location. Brothers! Kill him! That was indeed Rasadalin's position. This knight had good eyesight. So at the same time, Leon also issued an order. A crossbow bolt hit the roof behind Leon. But it probably had no effect. Anyway, Lisa Dillon didn't say a word. Nearly a hundred heavily armed soldiers also rushed out from behind pubs, alleys and hotels. This was a counter-sneak attack. The knight was obviously quite surprised. He didn't expect that Leon had so many men in Lion City. The people on both sides were fighting together in an instant. The brothers who came out from the direction of the stables were the first to achieve victory. The more than 20 people had their backs to the dark alley. They were completely unaware that they would be attacked from behind. Half of them fell down almost instantly. But since the preparation time given to the brothers was not enough, the other two directions did not have this effect. Eric led the escorts, who rushed out from the half-door of the tavern and blocked dozens of enemies on the road behind Leon. Another group of escorts came out from behind the hotel and blocked those in front of Leon. The escorts came out so quickly that all the enemies had to drop their crossbows and start fighting hand to hand. The two sides have about the same number of people, and their overall combat effectiveness is roughly the same. So they will be evenly matched for a while. Leong himself rushed towards the leading knight on horseback. To capture the thief first capture the king. This is an ancient saying. The knight was in the middle of the alley in the direction of the stables. He had just been attacked from behind and seemed to be in a hurry. 
Now the knight has the smallest number of people around him. Liang's bodyguards launched a wave of sneak attacks in the alleys, forming a partial numerical advantage. The current situation is 30 against 10. And there is also Lisa Dillon, who is secretly shooting secret arrows. But the knight and the female warriors around him still held their ground, dropped their crossbows one by one, and drew out their swords to fight back. They were all black swords, which seemed to be very sharp. Liang rode very fast and reached the knight's side almost in an instant. The knight turned around, looked at Leon who was getting closer and closer, took off his shield from his body, and even rushed forward a few steps. This was obviously a guy with extraordinary skills. The few steps he took forward happened to get stuck in front of Alice, in the direction of the lord's left hand that was not holding the sword. This is how Leon dealt with the doom bringer before. But Leon didn't hold the shield. He directly handed the sword to his left hand, and then rushed past the knight. The left-hand sword in his hand used the speed of the horse to swing lightly towards the opponent's neck. The knight was facing the horse with a shield raised in one hand and a sword in the other. He was obviously prepared to meet Liang's backhand sword. But Liang switched to swinging the sword with his left hand, which prevented the knight from counterattacking. Instead, he took a step back and raised the sword in his hand to block the blow. The two swords intersected, and huge sparks exploded in the dark night when fighting on horseback. Even a light sword would have great power due to the speed of the horse. The knight was blocked by this move, causing the long sword in his hand to fly out. However, Liang's losses were even greater. The lord did not expect that the silver-plated sword in his hand would break with just one strike. In the knight's hand was a sword as sharp as iron. But before she had time to think about it, Alice had already bumped into the backs of the female warriors. Alice, who weighed more than a thousand pounds, knocked the two female warriors flying and then crashed straight into the alley, even knocking down one of her own. It was a warrior holding a spear. He saw that Liang's sword was broken. In order to pass his spear to his big boss, he was carried away by the horse. After getting the spear, Liang turned his horse around, and Alice turned around again and savagely hit her back. This time, the knight couldn't stop him. In other words, they didn't dare to stand in front of him. When fighting on horseback, Holding short weapons and holding long pole weapons have completely different deterrent effects. Retreat! The knight shouted, raised his shield, and rolled to get rid of the spear thrust by Liang. Then he threw the shield at Liang and started running quickly towards a crowded place. The guy was wearing heavy armor but ran very fast. And he didn't care about the female warrior behind him at all. It seems that this gentleman will leave a woman and run away when his life is really at stake. But the women around him seemed willing to protect him with their lives and several female warriors tried their best to block Leon. By the time the lord led his men to kill those women, the knight was already on the other side of the king's road, leading his men to begin a full retreat. Chapter 154 Put Yourself to Death and Survive Eric, pack up and send a message to the brothers and other hotels, asking them to meet near Yalandal tomorrow morning. We will leave the city immediately. Leon looked at the situation at the scene and watched the strange group of attackers disappear from King's Avenue. He did not pursue them, but immediately signaled Eric to clean up the scene and prepare to leave. Of course, you can't pursue it. Eric's bodyguards attacked from behind and from the side of the enemy. But in this case, they actually had more casualties than the enemy. These people are quite powerful in fighting. Those enemies obviously did not expect that Leon would have so many men, and were worried that Leon would have backup. So they retreated so quickly. There were about 200 people on both sides. If there was such a big movement, if the fighting continued, it would inevitably be suppressed by the city defense army or the lion knights. In fact, the enemies did not suffer as a whole. They only lost about 10 people in the alley next to the stables. Those on the king's road actually suffered no losses. These enemies are a well-trained and strong force. But it doesn't look like a regular army. After all, I have never seen a regular army with so many women in the lion realm. But since this force dared to attack him in Lysher City, it meant that there must be some big shot in Lysher City who wanted to kill him by name. After the king has signed an agreement with himself, he still plans to take his own life? The Lord doesn't understand. What kind of person would do this? Could it be that Ulrich was suffering from some kind of madness? Therefore, Leon planned to leave Lion City as soon as possible. It is night now, and the city gate is closed. The inspection in Lion City is very strict at night. It is easy for one or two people to go out but the convoy cannot leave the city together. Lion City does not allow large numbers of armed personnel to enter and leave the city at will. 
Eric and the others previously entered the city in batches in the name of a transportation team. But now they could only leave the city in batches. Eric directed half of the brothers to quickly pull out the carriage behind the hotel and move all the bodies to the carriage. The escorts once again became a transport convoy. The other half were the people left behind by Eric to gather intelligence. And they began to clean the scene to clean up the blood stains and remove all traces of the battle just now. Naturally, no one would stop the transport convoy with three barren flags. And dozens of people quickly left the city. Eric, do you know who these people are? Outside the Lion City, Leon was a little confused looking at the corpses in several cars. His bodyguards lost more than a dozen people in this short battle. Most of them killed by a single sword attack. The enemies were generally very skilled and used unusual weapons. The enemy also left more than a dozen corpses. Most of them died in sneak attacks. There are several corpses that should be adventurers from Ravenland. But more of the corpses were women. It was rare for so many female adventurers to gather in one team. Moreover, these women seemed willing to protect the leading knight with their lives. This is even rarer. Leong picked up a sword and a fan-shaped shield from the carriage. This sword and shield were left behind by the leading knight. It was a knight's long sword with a blade as black as ink. It looked older and very similar to Liang's own sword. Moreover, the griffin emblem is also clearly engraved on the counterweight of the sword hilt. This is the griffin knight's sword. The fan-shaped shield is also very old. And the black coat of arms is somewhat mottled. But it can still be seen clearly that it is a griffin. The outer edge of the shield is covered with brass. Making the entire shield look like a pattern of a black griffin on a gold background. This was the equipment of the Griffin Knights back then. Sir, this looks like the prodigal son Mirgon Kirik. That guy is very famous in the mercenary industry. His mercenary group is called Griffin Sword. After all, Eric has been a mercenary for more than 10 years. So he is quite familiar with people. Most of his escorts are also well informed. And they all said that this person should be him. The Griffin Sword mercenary group is indeed famous. But most people feel that they actually have nothing to do with Gupan's Griffin Knights. If there is a connection, it is that this mercenary group is generally equipped with military swords with the griffin emblem that were once the weapons of the griffin knights. That's why they call it griffin sword. But this mercenary group is not famous because of this equipment of unknown origin. But because of the leader of the mercenary group, Mirgon Kilik. Mirgon is notorious for his greed, arrogance, and unique charm that attracts women. He is known as Pinders, Flower Sun, and is extremely good at seducing women. There are a large number of female explorers or female warriors in the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group. And most of them were hooked up by him. And most of the girls even secretly ran away from home to join his team and followed them voluntarily, bringing their own dry food. So no one really could blame him. Nobles who knew Mirgon Killick would often lock up their wives and daughters when they saw him. So as not to be deceived into joining the mercenary group by him. But although Mirgon himself is not popular among male nobles, his mercenary group enjoys a high reputation in Pender. So far, the Griffin Sword mercenary group has been able to successfully complete their missions most of the time, and they are quite trustworthy. Therefore, it is strange that the nobles hired him while cursing him. The escorts were all talking about this mercenary group. It seemed that many people had heard of Mergen's romantic story. Most of the escorts showed a strange kind of envy and jealousy, including Eric. His performance is even more obvious because he is already 30 years old but he is still a bachelor. So he changed the subject. Sir, these swords look very old, but they are still so sharp. They should be swords made of ebony. Eric took off another griffin knight sword from the body of another female warrior and lightly scratched the blade with a broken gun shaft. The barrel of the gun was chipped neatly with ease. Ebony sword. Eric, take this sword and use it yourself. From now on, let the brothers pay attention to where there are ebony minerals. Eric obviously liked the sword but he had not taken it away before. Obviously, Go Sheng was still practicing the rules set by Leon to distribute the spoils based on military merit. That was the gain of the entire team. And now the top commander is Leon. So he has to wait for Leon to distribute it. Eric is indeed a very clever man. So the Lord directly gave the sword to him. The person with the highest merit in this battle was Eric, who fully understood Leon's look. Otherwise, if they had a direct confrontation, the losses of the brothers would definitely be much greater than there now. The ebony in Pender Continent is not actually wood, but a rare metal unique to Pender Continent. It is only called ebony because this metal produces a wood-like texture after being refined and shaped. It is said that this metal was used to make magic items in the Titan Age tens of millions of years ago. 
This metal was also called mithril, or black gold. But those were just ancient rumors. Nowadays, magic in the true sense is basically no longer seen on this continent. This metal unique to Pender can last for more than a hundred years without rusting. It is obviously the best weapon material. Of course, Leon also wants to find it. In Lion City, Igor's private residence, an ordinary-looking aristocratic mansion, two people were quarreling. You actually let him run away? Igor didn't understand. Didn't you bring a lot of people with you? Igor, you bastard. You said he traveled alone, but he had more than a hundred men in that hotel. You caused me to lose many brave female warriors. Mirgon Kilik waved his helmet and roared at Igor menacingly. More than a hundred people? How could it be? Did he bring all the troops to Lion City? I didn't find it before. Igor was confused. But in the blink of an eye he shook his head. Even if he has more than a hundred people, with the ability of your griffin sword, it won't be difficult to kill him. Right. Of course I can kill him. But this is different. Do you understand? Killing a person is very different from killing an army. Miron shook his head dissatisfied. The mustache on his lips was neatly trimmed. And his eyes seemed to be firing all the time. He was indeed an extremely handsome middle-aged man. But this handsome guy's face was livid at the moment. And his electric eyes seemed to be spraying with anger. Igor sighed heavily. Mirgon, you have to show your credibility. Of course I'm talking about credibility. I mean, you have to pay more. Igor, you have to make up for my losses. Mirgon shouted, waving his helmet. Before he returns to the east, if you can kill him and bring his body to Lion City, you can get 50,000 dinars. Mirgon, are you satisfied with this price? Igor thought for a while and directly added an outrageous price. 50,000. Uh-huh. I have to collect a deposit first. Mergen's anger dissipated almost immediately. Bullshit deposit. You'd better go after him quickly. If he runs back to the east and meets Godric. Not to mention whether you can kill him or not. Even if you can do it, you will lose the chance to kill him. The meaning is gone. He and his people must die within the jurisdiction of Lion City. And no one can escape. Do you understand? This time it was Igor's turn to lose his temper. If the ink continued, Leon would run away. If a noble like Godric knew that Leon had been released by the king a long time ago, it would be difficult to blame the king. Don't worry. He can't escape. If we don't let him out of the city, we can't kill so many people. I can't start a war in the city. Right. Mirgon spoke quite arrogantly. He does have arrogance. After coming out of Lion City, he went to a camp outside the city. My dear, they went all the way to the west. There are only about 60 of them. I sent people to keep an eye on them all the way. In the camp, a female explorer showed her merits to Mirgon. Very well. Honey, you are the most capable baby. Everyone, come with me. We have a big and exciting job to do. After hugging the woman and kissing her heart, Mirgon brought out a large army of 500 people from the camp. All cavalry. This is the reason why the Griffin sword Mercenary group enjoys a high reputation in the continent of Pender. This is a force that no one can ignore. The speed of the convoy is relatively slow at night. After all, vehicles can only travel on the main road. And it is indeed not as convenient as horses. The night passed and until early morning, the convoy only reached the vicinity of Yaladar village and the foot of the goddess mountain. Leong asked everyone to stop first to let the horses rest and buried all the bodies under the goddess mountain. Brothers who died in battle must, of course, have a suitable destination. And at the foot of the Goddess Mountain is a destination that all warriors in the Fierce Lion Realm will be satisfied with, whether they are enemies or one of our own. This is also the meeting point agreed with the escorts and other hotels in Lion City. But the escorts haven't arrived yet. Sir, I seem to hear the sound of horse hooves. Lots of horse hooves. At the foot of the mountain, Leon was leading his brothers to bury the body and the bodyguard serving as scouts outside shouted. The Lord turned his head, but did not see the enemy. Eric laid down on the ground and listened. Sir, it seems that a large army is coming. I don't know if it is one of our own. The escorts also have a large number of carriages. But Risa Dillon suddenly appeared at this moment. He jumped down from a big tree and came to the Lord. Lord Leon, I saw a big plume of smoke coming here. It's definitely you are not one of our own. You better get out of here as soon as possible. Rasadalan's eyesight was far superior to that of ordinary people, and he could see far from a high position in the tree. Since he said this, there must indeed be a large number of enemies coming. Risa Dillon, 
you protect me and go first. I'll stay and check on the situation. Eric nodded to the Nolder. Eric is currently the person who is most familiar with Lisa Dillon besides the Lord. The two of them can occasionally talk to each other. Lisa Dillon is indeed a little guilty for accidentally injuring Eric. Eric, it's best to go together. Those people seem to know our location. And they feel like they are going to surround us. If we stay here, there will be no way out. Lisa Dillon rarely spoke a lot. Everyone, follow me. Since there was danger, Leon naturally didn't waste any time. Got on his horse and ordered everyone to start retreating. Eric drove a carriage and followed Leon. Lisa Dillon, get in the car. The escorts were indeed well trained. Within half a minute, they all drove the carriage and followed Leon to the east. Rasadalin's advice was timely. Just a few minutes later, Mirgon led his mercenary group to catch up. The scene of 500 cavalry galloping was quite astonishing. Even in the early morning when the dew was heavy, it also brought out smoke and dust rising high along the way. When he saw the new graves, Mirgon, the leader, slowed down. He saw several female warriors placed in the pit, their bodies covered with a thin layer of soil, but they had not yet had time to completely bury the tombs. They stayed here before, and left before they finished covering it with soil. So they are not far away. My dear, what are our arrangements now? Mirgon asked the female explorer beside him. A few dozen miles to the east is the foggy no man's land. If it were me, I would definitely run there. My dear, you'd better arrange for two centurions to surround you, and then lead a large force to pursue them from behind. In the foggy area, the edge intercepts them. The woman looked to be in her twenties. She was the only one in the mercenary group who was not wearing armor. She was not pretty, but quite capable. She was probably Mergen's right-hand man. You arranged it well. My dear. Mirgon praised the woman next to him. My dear, I am going to charge. You are not good at riding a horse. So just stay here and bury these brave ladies. After saying that, he left the capable woman and several female warriors at the foot of the goddess mountain, divided the troops into three groups, and continued to pursue eastward. As for the lord, after running eastward for several miles, he saw two cavalry troops each with about a hundred men. One is a cavalry team composed of Ravenland adventurers and rogue knights. The other branch is all women, female adventurers and explorers. This is obviously a member of the Griffin Sword mercenary group. These two troops are obviously faster than the convoy, but they are moving parallel to the side far away. They seem to be consciously flanking both sides, compressing the space for Liang's team to move, so that he can only move in one direction. Stop! The Lord stopped his horse suddenly causing the convoy behind him to stop. Eric, turn around. Let's go back to the place where we agreed to meet with the brothers. Leon ordered to return in a tone that could not be questioned. Sir, this. Ahead is a no man's land shrouded in heavy fog. It's very possible for us to escape there. Eric didn't understand. But Leon had already turned around and rode away. They are outflanking us. Let us die and survive. Hurry up. Follow me. Even if the horse is beaten to death. Don't be bitten by the enemy. Lisa Dillon flew into the driver's seat of the carriage, took the reins of the horse to turn around, and whipped the horse on the butt. Eric, those two cavalrymen were faster than us, but they didn't catch up directly. Your lord's judgment was correct. We can't go any further. Encountering real danger, the Nolder elf no longer seems to be autistic. In terms of starting point, he may have more experience than everyone else. Leon led the convoy in a circle and ran back. The convoy was empty and the speed of the horses was quite fast. The cavalry team on both sides actually overran for a while. Although their horses were much more agile than the convoy, no one probably expected that Leon would suddenly come back with a carbine. Who would do it when they knew someone was chasing him behind? Running back. As a result, when they turned around and pursued them again, the convoy had already picked up speed, and the two cavalry could still only follow on both sides. A few minutes later, Leon led the convoy in an arc and returned to the foot of the goddess mountain. The convoy stopped. Eric, set up the car formation. Leon shouted. And then he took Lisa Dillon and started to clean up the few women left here. That was the capable woman who had been talking to Mirgon. She was not wearing heavy armor, but was wearing a noble brocade robe. She was probably not very skilled. So Mirgon left her here to bury her tomb. Now this woman was a little panicked. She obviously didn't expect that Leon would go and come back. She supported a horse and tried to ride on it, but failed to get on the horse twice. Her brocade robe was not suitable for riding. 
and the horse was not suitable for riding. It's a bit high for her. The other female warriors were quite powerful, and their fighting power was probably a bit stronger than that of the Lion Knight. Risa Dillon was actually beaten up by them together, and was beaten into confusion. But Leon didn't go to help. The Lord always picks up the weaklings first in battles. Although Leon doesn't know what's going on with these women staying here. But just judging from their attire, the weakling present now is obviously the woman in the brocade robe. So, just ten seconds later, a sword was placed around the woman's neck. This is the sword that Mirgon Killig dropped. Chapter 155, actually seducing someone else's wife. Don't move! Lisa Dillon, disarm them. This woman's status is obviously higher than those of the female warriors. Anyway, after she was caught by Leon, those female warriors no longer besieged Risa Dillon, but surrounded Leon. It seemed that they did not want the brocade robe what hurts women. Resaderin slowly approached the female warriors with the Noldor sword in his hand and reached out to take away the swords in their hands. The female warriors did not move, allowing Lisa Dillon to take away their weapons one by one. Then Lisa Dillon took off the quivers from their waists and carried them to himself. Leon clearly saw that there seemed to be two female warriors blushing. At this time, they probably saw clearly the appearance of Lisa Dillon hidden in the hood. And the handsome elf was untying their belts. Well, just the quiver belt. But as the Nolder elves took away the quivers and weapons and left them, the female warrior seemed to have a hint of reluctance. Unfortunately, Rasadalin clearly showed his distaste and even wiped his hands. The Lord couldn't understand the brain circuits of these women. This way of looking at handsome men with stars in their eyes made him a little bit unconvinced that these people were chasing him. He looked at the woman in brocade robes and asked, Are you from Mirgon? Who asked you to come after us? The woman blinked and smiled dryly. Sir, I don't know anything. At this time, the two cavalrymen finally caught up here, spread out 200 meters apart, and surrounded the small car formation that Eric had arranged urgently. No wonder the enemy wanted to double team just now. Looking at the full siege posture put up by the opponent, Leong realized that these enemies probably didn't want anyone on his side to escape. Eric, tie her up. Since this woman was uncooperative, the Lord did not bother to ask. Anyway, Leong at least knew that those female warriors were protecting her, which meant that this woman had a special identity and was probably an important role. Eric quickly tied up the woman tightly, and it seemed that he was very skilled in binding people. While kidnapping people, he also ate a few tofu, and did not avoid people at all. This guy has been single for 30 years, and he is obviously a little jealous of Mirgan. This behavior is understandable. Of course, Every soldier these days does this when tying up a woman. And some do it even more excessively. But that's inconvenient to describe. Soon another large puff of smoke came from the distance. And Mirgon also led his people back. Asshole! Let her go! Otherwise none of you will survive! Seeing that the woman in brocade robes was tied up, Mirgon looked a little angry. If you let her go, will you let me live? Mirgon! Right! Who sent you to kill me? Leon curled his lips disapprovingly and frowned at Mergen's horse armor. That set of horse armor is very exquisite, with a clear griffin emblem on it. It must be something from the griffin knights. Baron Leon, let her go, and I will not hunt you down again. I swear on the honor of the griffin sword. Mirgon still didn't answer. With a livid face, he dismounted and walked to the front of the team. Mirgon, are you drunk? To which woman did you swear the last time? Leon almost thought he was hallucinating. An oath sworn by a dandy surrounded by women. Which man would believe it? Eric said quietly. Sir, maybe he is not lying. He probably means that he himself will not hunt us down. But his women will. But Miron seemed to be very serious. When he heard this, he took off his helmet and looked at Eric. Then turned around and ordered. Everyone dismount. Drive the horses away. All members of the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group dismounted obediently and drove the horses away from him. This kind of performance is quite sincere. Your Excellency Leon, I may be a playboy, but my oaths are always valid. Miron opened his hands to the Lord. You can take your people and leave here. Let her go. We can't pursue you now. Leon was silent for two seconds and then suddenly laughed. Huh? Mirgon, don't you want your mercenary group to have credibility? You took over the task of killing me, but you let me go without credibility. You said, I should trust you as the leader of the mercenary group. Credit. Or should I believe in your current oath? The Lord shook his head, obviously not believing what this playboy said. Mirgon would behave like this. 
which can only mean that this woman is very important. Then we definitely can't let her go. At this time, the woman spoke. Baron Leon, I am Nelda Horton. You'd better let me go. Otherwise, you won't be able to bear my father's anger. Leon was stunned. Horton? Nelda? Madam, who are you? The Duke of Alma? Leon felt that his unintentional decision to risk his own life might have allowed him to catch a talisman. But there is no doubt that it is pure luck to be in the current situation. Leon turned around and came back. Originally, he just wanted to stay here for a few hours, waiting for the escorts from the Lion City to come, or until the troops of other lords passed by. This is a main road, and no one will come. But Leon really didn't expect to catch such a big fish. That's my father. I'm the eldest daughter of the Horton family. Baron Leon, I'm not a member of the Griffin Sword. You can't use me to threaten your gone. He's a playboy who won't care about me. But before Nelda could finish her words, she saw Mirgon throw down his helmet, rush in front of Leon's horse, and block the way. Your Excellency Leon, Nelda is innocent. She is not from my mercenary group. Let her go, and I can replace her with myself. The woman had just said that Mirgon wouldn't care, but she offered her body in exchange for it. Leon glanced at Nelda. Nelda's face already looked like she was intoxicated with love. Mirgon, you want to kill me because of your profession. I don't blame you for this. But you are not the Duke's daughter. It is useless for me to catch you. Besides, she doesn't look that innocent. Leon said as he greeted Eric. Let's go! Seeing that Leon really wanted to tie up the man and leave. Miron seemed a little anxious now. And quickly whistled to summon his horse. His men followed suit and whistled everywhere. Only half a minute later. The horses that had been driven aside ran back quickly. It seemed that their driving away the horses was just a pretense and those horses could return to them at any time. A large group of cavalry once again surrounded the convoy. It seems you don't care that much about Miss Nelda. Leon had a gloomy face and asked his brothers to defend the car formation again. Mergen's face was uncertain. He was a little anxious now and didn't know whether he should forcefully charge into the battle. He knew that a noble lord like Leon would not harm a noble woman easily. But if his life safety was threatened, that would not necessarily be the case. Originally, Mergen's arrangement was considered very appropriate. The two centurions compressed the space on both sides. If someone on Liang's side fell behind or separated his manpower, the two centurions could also send out troops to kill. He himself led a large group of troops to pursue them from behind. Following the ruts, the Griffin Sword mercenary group is all cavalry. This is a plan that can capture Liang's fleet of only about 60 people. Even if Liang asks all his men to split up and run away, it is unlikely that they can escape. But who could have imagined that Leon would suddenly turn around, take a curved route through the wilderness to bypass him, and return to the foot of the goddess mountain to catch Nelda? This was an unexpected surprise that no one had expected. Even Leon I didn't even think of it. And this woman has a special status. And it will be very troublesome if something happens to her. Although the number of Liang's men is not too large. There are quite a lot of carriages. And the vehicle formation looks very stable. Using the vehicle formation to defend against horse, thieves, is the most skilled business of the transportation team. So now Mirgon can only surround Leon, frowning and thinking of a way. A brief confrontation began between the two sides. But this confrontation is beneficial to Leon, who originally wanted to delay time. Not long after, some convoys came from the direction of Lion City. It was already morning. And the escorts in Lion City were arriving here in batches to meet up. This place was not far from the Lion City. Soon. One after another convoys with three flags were approaching. Most of the escorts were experienced mercenaries, so they would not rush in rashly when they saw this situation. They stopped a few hundred meters apart and quickly got together. In fact, seeing more convoys coming with the same flag, Mildon had already realized that his temporary business could no longer be completed. Right now, the convoys with the three barren flags that Mildon saw, plus the manpower around Leon, the total number of people exceeded 300. Leon has far more manpower than expected. And he will not be able to kill him for a while. And this location is too close to Lion City and Chicha Fortress. And there will be troops patrolling at any time. If they really fight desperately, it's hard to say whether they can kill Leon. But the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group will definitely suffer huge losses. Even if he succeeds, he will definitely face revenge from at least three baronies. With so many people, it is impossible to kill them all. And many people will definitely run away and go back to report the news. The reward of 50,000 dinars was indeed tempting. But it was not worth taking such a big risk. 
and Igor didn't even pay a deposit. Although Mirgan is greedy, he is not stupid. He is not sure whether Igor will fulfill his promise after killing Leon. He even thinks that he may have been deceived by taking this task. Maybe this is Igor's conspiracy. Just to do something. Kill your own griffin sword mercenary group. Judging from the constant number of people under Baron Leon. This possibility is quite high. And Milgon doesn't want to wade into this muddy water. It would be more profitable to help King Ulrich capture the Nuadua girl honestly. Once successful. It would mean 100,000 or even hundreds of thousands of dinars. And the risk might be smaller than this. After all, compared to Igor, King Ulrich is relatively trustworthy. Your Excellency Leon, let's make a deal. Miron cursed Igor while approaching Leon. Of course, Leon also saw his convoy gathered a few hundred meters away. In this case, Mirgon certainly wanted to negotiate sincerely. Of course, negotiations are necessary. And the Lord does not want to waste time here. Mirgon, you have to tell me first. Who hired you to kill me? It's Igor. Of course, it shouldn't be him. I guess it's Prince Alanric. And Igor is his uncle. Mirgon seems to be very happy now. After all, the deposit has been confiscated. So he can give up this task completely. Do you know the reason? When Leon remembered leaving White Deer Castle, Amy reminded him that the king's son Alan Rick lived in the old noble house. Could it be that this prince? I don't know. And I don't want to know. Mr. Leon, what I want to say is that I will give up this mission and escort you to Chang'e Town. But you must release Nelda when you reach a safe place. When you reach Chang'e Town. You sure are you relieved? I don't want to deal with you anymore. Miron really planned to give up the pursuit. But I don't trust you very much. Mirgon. How about this? If you disarm and join my team, it will be easier for you to take care of Nelda. I will also join your team without weapons and let your men keep an eye on me. Everyone feels at ease with me. What do you think? Leon also knew that Mirgon probably did not lie this time. But the words of such a person were not trustworthy. So the Lord gave a plan that both parties could rest assured. It's just that both leaders take huge risks. However, Mirgon did not hesitate this time and seemed to appreciate Liang's thinking. Your Excellency Liang is indeed a fair and brave man. We should have been friends originally. Then we will make it a deal. We will be each other's hostage. After saying that, he threw away his weapon, mounted his horse, and walked to the front of the car formation. The Lord Lord also walked out of the car formation without any weapons on him. Miron, by the way, where did you get these equipment? When walking past Mirgon, Leong asked. This was indeed just out of curiosity. They are all trophies. Forget it. I can tell you the truth. I picked these up in an abandoned ruins more than ten years ago. It should be the residence of the ancient Griffin Knights. It was because of the discovery of these fine products with the equipment. My adventure group became the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group. Of course, picking up things doesn't sound very nice after all. So I usually call them trophies. Mirgon originally wanted to answer casually, but probably out of respect for a brave nobleman. He shook his head and told the truth. Apparently, there was a reason why Fauché didn't find anything in the ruins. That ruin has existed for more than a hundred years. So it is not surprising that others found it first and emptied it out. Moreover, Mergen's people are all adventurers and explorers. His team used to be an adventure group. It is indeed the right thing for a professional expedition team like this to find the ruins first. Is that ruins near Kerwin village? Leon nodded and smiled at Mirgon. Your Excellency Leon actually knows where it is. Mirgon looked at Leon again with some strangeness. And his gaze rested on the griffin flag thoughtfully. Griffin emblem. Could it be? I won't return the sword you dropped last night. It's my trophy. Leon interrupted Mirgon. Mirgon paused. Then shook his head and said seriously. Of course. If you knocked off my sword last night, then that sword belongs to you. I am a principled knight. Although many people are slandering me. But I at least respect the rules of knights. Even if my mercenary group suffered a lot last night. It is my responsibility. And I will not resent anyone. I know you also lost some men last night. But the same. That is your responsibility. We originally had no personal grudges. And I did not intend to be your enemy. After all. I am just a mercenary group that takes money to do things. Leon nodded and said nothing more. Mirkon was right. He was just a mercenary leader who was paid to do things. And he had no enmity with him. The deaths and injuries of his subordinates are indeed the leader's responsibility and cannot be blamed on anyone else. The real enemy is not Mirkon, but Igor or Alanric. 
The following day was a strange experience for both teams. Now they each took their own hostages and embarked on the road together. The hostages on both sides were treated with courtesy. And Leon once again enjoyed corruption without having to do anything. Although Liang's men were jealous of Mirgan, they not only did not make things difficult for him, but were also quite polite to him. Perhaps Eric and the escorts also wanted to learn the special skills of this veteran Watsong. They watched Mirgan coaxing Nelda all the way, and also watched the relationship between the two of them heat up rapidly. But it's probably Nelda's one-sided feelings. One day later, the two troops passed through the foggy no man's land and arrived near Kerwin. The large army needed to rest. So camps were set up on both sides. And Mirgon and Leon almost arrived between the two camps at the same time. Both sides seemed to want to say something. Mirgon waved his hand and told the female explorers behind Leon to stay away. Probably because they had something confidential to say. Upon seeing this, Leon also asked Eric and others to step back. The two began to chat alone. Your Excellency Leon, we should be able to arrive at Chungha Town tomorrow night. But I want to ask you for a favor. I want to send someone to send Nelda back to Shurhu City now. I myself will still stay in your team as a hostage. So you should also be able to rest assured. Mirhan actually used honorifics. If you want to send Nelda to Shurhu City, you should go north from Qin Village. Leon needs to release Nelda directly here. Why? You have to tell me clearly. Leon didn't want to cause any trouble. I don't mean anything else. But you may not know that Nelda is the wife of Granlon, the flag officer of the first flag guard of Lion Lake City. She can't go to Changa Town with me. She was originally visiting Lion City. She secretly came out to see me in the name of Duke Alma. Now that the Duke has returned to Shurhu City, I must send her back quickly. Miron looked around to make sure no one else could hear him and whispered the reason to Leon. Hiss. You are so good. I thought you were just pursuing the daughter of Archduke Alma. But I didn't expect that you were actually hooking up with someone else's wife. You are indeed the famous Knight of Flowers. Leon shook his head and gave a thumbs up to express his admiration. On the contrary, Nelda was two years older than fathered. Most aristocratic women of this age in this era had already gotten married and had children. Chapter 156 Let the Enemy Deal with the Enemy Using the daughters of the family to marry to ensure the loyalty of the military leader is what most families will do. It seems that Mirgon does have a way of seducing noble women. But cuckoldry is probably also the norm in aristocratic families. Most of the marriages of great aristocrats are political marriages. There is really no emotional foundation between husband and wife. Private affairs are very common. Judging from Nelda's appearance, she seemed to believe that Mirgon was her true love with all her heart. But Nelda really couldn't follow Milgan's team to Changa Town. She was the eldest daughter of Duke Alma and had stayed in Changha Town for a long time. Many people in Changha Town knew her. An affair is an affair. No one will say anything if it is not made public. But if it is made public, her cuckold husband will have to lead his troops to kill Mirgan. The Lion Lake City Standard Guard was nothing more. More importantly, she was likely to face the wrath of a duke. Nelda went to Mirgan in the name of visiting her father. But she did not go to see Alma at all. This lie could easily be revealed. It may not matter to Alma that Nelda cheated on her lover. At most, she would be scolded. But no matter what, Mirgon will definitely be unlucky. But Alma is no longer in Lion City so soon? The Lord did not know that Alma had escaped early, much earlier than he expected. Dot Mirgon. When did Duke Alma return to Lion Lake City? Leong has now realized that he may have underestimated Alma. To be able to return to Shurhu City so quickly, the Duke's methods exceeded the Lord's expectations. About a week ago, and there was news that he had exiled his son father and a daughter just after he returned. This is a letter from Nelda's maid. So I have to send Nelda back quickly. I said it's the truth. I really have no other intentions. You can rest assured. Mirgon seems sincere now. Leon could see that he was indeed telling the truth. But this news was not good news for Leon. A week ago, that was when Leon just left White Deer Castle. As soon as Alma returned, Fawcett was exiled. In other words, Alma regained control of the Horton family in a very short period of time. The Duke's method was indeed somewhat unexpected. Alma's return to power is definitely not in line with King Ulrich's wishes. The king would not have been willing to let Alma escape so quickly. Alma must have received help from a caring person. Isn't Alma still fighting a lawsuit? How could he get away so easily? Because of Nelda. Mirgon must have been keeping an eye on Alma's movements. And Leong felt that he should know the reason. 
It seems that Prince Alanric provided a guarantee for Duke Alma. And then Duke Brennus, who was in charge of the case, closed the case directly. Prince Alanric again? I see. The prince really had to do this. Since Alanric was buying people's hearts, he naturally wanted to lose the king's people's hearts. If he died in the Lion City, many nobles would think that the king was crazy. People like Godric would definitely no longer obey Ulrich's orders. So they would probably support the prince instead. The king is causing trouble for Alma. And if he helps Alma escape, the prince can get the duke's support. This prince seems to be a little impatient. Leon finally thought it through. However, it was already very dangerous to be an enemy of the duke of Alma. And now there are enemies like Alan Rick and Nirgon Keelik for no reason. The lord is naturally very unhappy. They want their own lives. So the Lord has to repay them. A certain great man once said that we should reduce our enemies to a few and our friends to many. The Lord Lord has a unique understanding of this. He wants the enemy to deal with the enemy. Miron, it's easy to talk about Nelda. I'm not interested in the love life of the two of you. I'm more concerned about my own life. Your mercenary group was originally hired by the king to deal with the Noldor. Right? You why did you accept the mission to kill me? Leon wanted to try to see if it was possible to persuade Mirgon. Igor was the one who contacted the king about hiring us. But he first asked me to kill you in the Lion City area, saying that his highness the prince could give me a pioneer baron certificate. I asked about it, and some people said that you are a traitor. I thought this was the king's intention. So I took the job. Later, I saw that you had a lot of men. So Igor added a high price of 50,000 dinars. But yesterday I saw that you had so many troops to join the army. When I came out of the Lion City, I thought I might have been fooled. Seeing that Leon was willing to agree to his request, Mirgon was of course willing to explain the reason clearly. Anyway, now his mission is out of the question. It seems that they are all promises. But nothing substantial is given to you. Mirgon, have you ever thought that Igor and Prince Alanric are deliberately trying to get you to fight with me? I have so many convoys. How could he not be aware of it in Lion City? Even though Igor knew that there were so many people around me, Igor still asked you to kill me. You know, if it was to assassinate me, Igor should find a professional killer. Instead of looking for you, Leon found a breakthrough and started to provoke. In fact, Igor definitely didn't know that Leon had so many people. The convoy entered the city in batches, and Eric deliberately did not let them wear heraldic robes. Who would be so careful to observe those transport convoys divided into dozens of people? It is normal for them not to be discovered. But Mirgon was indeed doubting this. He originally felt that it was very problematic for Igor to give him this business. At first, he said that Leon was alone. Later, it was discovered that there were hundreds of people around Leon. So Igor increased the price. But now I found that they had brought three to four hundred people. Thinking about it from Milgan's point of view. It does seem like he is deliberately provoking a fight between the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group and Leon. I just think there is something wrong with this. So I have given up on this mission. Mr. Leon, what is the grudge between you and them? If so many of your troops can come out of Lion City openly, you are obviously not a traitor. Miron frowned and agreed with Liang's statement. I think it's not that I have any grudge against them. They might be plotting against you. Mirgon, seeing that the mercenary leader seemed to be able to be fooled, Leon began to persuade and educate him. How could I have any grudge against a prince? Mirgon shook his head. It's not necessarily because I have a grudge to plot against you, Dot Mirgon. You have hooked up with a lot of women. You should know that there are probably many nobles who want to kill you. But they are afraid that they will be embarrassed if they say something. Leon looked at Nelda in the distance. Then looked back at the female explorers. Mirgon was stunned and nodded. Of course he agreed with this statement. Most of the time. They insist on joining in. He defended himself weakly, but it was very unconvincing. There were rumors a few days ago that I was treasonous. In fact, it was because the Bacchus Empire was framing me. I came to the Lion City because King Ulrich gave me the authority to rebel and also gave me the use of gold, the privilege of heraldry. You should be able to understand. At this time, what does it mean to kill me? A lord who has just been granted privileges by the king and the person who killed me. That is, you, at this time, had sex with me what are the consequences of conflict? Leon took out a contract signed with the king from his arms and let Mirgon take a look. Mirgon frowned deeply. Of course, he knew what the golden coat of arms represented. Eager, or Prince Alanric, actually asked him to murder a loyal minister who had the authority to retaliate. I have no grudge against Alanric. 
He is just taking this opportunity to trap you. Miron. As long as you make a move against me, your mercenary group will be classified as rebels. No matter whether you can kill me or not. In line with his wishes. In addition, I am using the Griffin emblem. Hum. Miron. You have been claiming that your Griffin equipment is a trophy. Then you can't even explain it. You have been calculated. Leon said it categorically. As if it was indeed the truth. Mirgon was stunned. From his standpoint, this seemed to be the case. Your Excellency Leon, what you said makes sense. But, a prince plotted against me? This is unbelievable. He looked a little unsure, but had to admit that it was indeed possible. Whoever gave you an empty promise that you didn't keep is plotting against you. Mirgon, this is just like you hooking up with a girl. Isn't it difficult to understand? Leon smiled. His words were ambiguous and unconvincing to others. But for Mirgon, this is indeed the truth. He himself is the best at making empty promises to girls. But I don't understand why Alanric would do this. He is a prince. Does this approach do him any good? Liang's words are in line with Mergen's own behavioral logic. He obviously believes it. But his political ability is obviously not as good as his certain abilities with women. Have you never thought about how other nobles would react to this? You should know that many nobles hate you. If you and I fight, we will both lose and be labeled as a rebel by Alan Rick. And then be labeled as a rebel by Alan Rick. Destroy dot those nobles who have had their wives or daughters kidnapped by you but have nothing to do with you will be able to take revenge. They will be grateful to him and support him for this. Leong glanced at Nelda in the distance and began to channel Mergen's victim mentality. Dot I can understand this. If my mercenary group wasn't strong enough, I would have been killed long ago. Mirgon does this. Of course, he himself can best understand what other men think of him. Besides, Nelda has appeared by your side. Do you think Igor doesn't recognize her? Igor is the head of the House of Nobles. And he knows most of the nobles. Leon shook his head and smiled. Alanric must know about you and Nelda. Since he can help Alma escape. It means that he wants to get Alma's support. And by provoking you and me to fight. Both sides will suffer. This is all to help Alma solve the problem. Because Alma and I have a grudge. And your presence will embarrass Alma. If you get rid of us, Alma will owe him a favor. The Lord is following Mergen's mentality in spreading conspiracy theories. This targeted approach is very effective for people who are already worried about corresponding matters. No wonder Igor didn't find a killer. But he found me. But they are princes and dukes. And I can't deal with them. Milgen's mentality has basically changed to that of a victim. And his hostility towards Alan Rick and Alma has been revealed in his words. Leon suddenly stopped smiling and his expression became very serious. That's not necessarily the case. As long as you have enough courage. Miron. I don't think it's interesting for you and Nelda to be sneaky. In my opinion, you might as well find a way to kill Alma secretly and raise Nelda to the position of Duke. Judging from her feelings for you, you will gain huge power from this. And no one will be able to plot against you by then. The first step was to make Mirgon hostile to Alan Rick and Alma, which has been successful. So Leon turned around and followed Mergen's thinking and started a new guidance. Mirgon was stunned for a moment. After being stunned for a long time, he sighed. It must be a noble lord like you who is ruthless. The lord shook his head and looked at Mirgon seriously. This is for self-protection. Mirgon, you should know that the matter between you and Nelda may have been discovered. If you don't take action, sooner or later you will be killed the Duke of Alma. Milon frowned. Why do you say that? The Duke of Alma may want me to die. But he should never mention it. But other people may use this to harm me. No. For the sake of the Lion Lake City Flag Guard. Alma will definitely kill you. Miron. The flag officer Grand Lawn will also know about this sooner or later. Maybe he knows it now. As a husband, he will definitely be with you. It is human nature to be at odds with each other. Leon once again started the conspirator mode with a serious attitude. Grand Lawn. Maybe. But this is only between him and me. Mirgon obviously began to think according to the Lord's rhythm. This is not just a matter between the two of you. What would Alma think in this situation? You know, his daughter has betrayed Granlon. If the Duke turns a blind eye or helps his daughter cover up, then Granlon will we have no choice but to betray the Duke. Otherwise, how can Granlon have the honor to live? Leon shook his head and spread his hands. So, the Duke of Alma has only one way to ensure the loyalty of this elite force and help Granlon kill you. Mirgon frowned deeply. Think about it for yourself. While Nelda is still here, you can become Nelda's guardian knight 
and use the opportunity to escort her back to Lion Lake City to secretly kill the Duke of Alma. Now father is exiled. Alma's other sons are all underage. And Nelda will definitely be able to take custody of the duchy as the eldest sister. In this case, Nelda can only divorce and inherit the territory of Sherhu City. And you can become her new husband. You are also a noble. So I don't need to tell you what you can do next. Liang's voice was like a demon. Mergen's face was uncertain at this moment. But he seemed to have listened. Indeed, for Miran, if Alma died at this time, he could use Ms. Nelda to gain huge benefits. If Alma died now, father was exiled, and the other sons were minors. The duchy could only be under the guardianship of Nelda, or even directly inherited by Nelda. If Mirgon is ruthless enough, he might even take this opportunity to become a grand duke. For example, kill all of Alma's underage sons. Even if he doesn't do this, he may still be able to obtain a very high status with the help of Miss Nelda, and a territory that is not inferior to any big lord. I doubt your excellency, Leon. I'm afraid it will be difficult for me to kill the Duke of Alma. Mirgon was obviously moved and his voice even trembled a little. He would take over the murder business for an empty promise of a Pioneer Baron certificate, so he would naturally have ideas about power and territory. Now that Leon has shown him a very feasible path, how could he not be tempted? But the Duke of Alma is destined to deal with you. This is not a question of whether you are willing or not. You have to save your life. Leon stared deeply into Mergen's eyes and gave him the last words that made him make up his mind. This playboy has fallen into the conspiracy theory deliberately created by the Lord. In fact, this matter wouldn't have been that troublesome. Even if the affair between Nelda and him was discovered, it would most likely end with Nelda and Granlon divorcing. As long as Mirgon didn't come looking for death, everything would be fine. But Leon deliberately led Mirgon to think about the conspiracy. Once his thinking fell into it, he would feel that everything Leon deduced was very likely to happen. And Leon also gave him a reason to convince himself to protect himself. Mirgon was indeed moved. He looked at Nelda frequently, his eyes filled with ambition. Of course, Leon regarded Mirgon as his enemy from the beginning to the end. But the enemy did not necessarily have to be eliminated, but could also be exploited. Alanric and the Duke of Alma are enemies anyway. But dealing with a prince directly was not feasible. So Mirgon was induced to be hostile to the prince and dealt with Alma first. There is no need for Mirgon to succeed. It only requires the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group to deal with Alma in a hostile manner. The Griffin Sword Mercenary Group was recruited by King Ulrich and hired through Igor. Igor is Alanric's uncle. These things are public information and most people will definitely know it. Alanric asked the Griffin Sword to hunt down Leon. But the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group went to assassinate the Duke of Alma. Regardless of whether it succeeded or not. What would Alanric think? What will he do? And what would the king and the Duke of Alma think? Letting the enemy deal with the enemy is the best policy. Regardless of success or failure. Miron, let me give you a gift. Maybe it can help you deal with the Duke. Leon took out a small bottle from his arms. Have you heard of Snake Heart Stone? I know what this is. I understand. Thank you for your help. Mr. Leon, maybe I should give you something in return. Chapter 157 The Young Griffin in the Ruins Early the next morning, the two teams parted ways peacefully, and Mirgon took his Griffin Sword mercenary group all the way north to Lion Lake City. Leon asked Eric to lead the large army back to Chang'e Town, and he led a dozen people upstream along the Tontian River. He was going to see the ruins where Milan found the Griffin equipment. That was Mergen's reward to the Lord, a road map leading to the ruins of the Griffin Knight's residence. Mirgon hand-painted it himself. This playboy is very good at drawing maps and has extensive knowledge. After all, he used to be an explorer who took risks everywhere. Originally, Fauché had found the ruins and found nothing. Leon had previously thought that there was not much practical value other than symbolic significance. But the news that Mirgon told the Lord made Leon very interested. Mirgon said that there was an ebony mine in that ruin. Ten years ago, Mirgon discovered the mine when he first found the ruins. However, at that time, Mirgon was just a knight adventurer who had lost his territory. Although he knew the huge value of the ebony mine, he did not have the ability to mine the mineral deposits. So at that time, he used the ruins of the ruins to hide the mine, and planned to talk about it later when he had the opportunity. Then he used the weapons found in the ruins to arm an army, named it the Griffin Sword, and became a mercenary leader. But in the past ten years, he has been seducing women to join his mercenary group. 
undertaking various tasks of escorting noble women, and became a famous knight among the flowers. He has never returned to the ruins. But now, with the guidance given to him by the Lord, Mildon feels that he has a faster way to develop and no longer needs those mineral deposits. Different from the game, this ruins is not located on the uppermost reaches of the Tontion River, but in a valley shrouded in heavy fog at the foot of the Goddess Mountain, more than 10 miles away from the source of the Tontion River. Of course, there is indeed another small river there, which also flows into the Tontion River, so it can also be regarded as the uppermost reaches of the river. The entrance to the valley is obscured by heavy fog, and there is a certain degree of visual deception at the entrance. It is difficult for ordinary people to discover that there is a large area inside the valley. The entrance to the valley is mostly blocked by a sloping hill, and the hill is already covered with trees. From the looks of it, this valley entrance had experienced a mudslide or landslide, and mountains of earth buried the road, blocking the entrance to the valley. So it is normal that no one has discovered it. From the outside, there is no way to go in this valley. But a large number of boulders fell into the creek, changing the course of the river. At the same time, they combined with the soil from the landslide to form a new road, which even horse-drawn carriages could enter. It's just that when most people look at the mouth of the valley, they think it's just a rocky beach and wouldn't even think about going in. According to Frederick, Fauché once searched along the Tontillon River for several times, but failed to find it. In the end, he got lost in the fog and discovered it by chance. It is indeed a very secluded place. Entering the valley, your vision suddenly becomes clearer. There is fog outside, but there is no fog inside the valley. It is a paved road with many stone slabs. There are no tall trees, so the sun can shine directly. The road surface is very smooth and quite spacious. It can be seen that this place was a very important place in the past, but now many tough grasses grow stubbornly from the cracks in the stone slabs on the ground, hiding the story of this road under the grass roots. There is a gate wall outside the ruins. The gate wall is not wide, but together with the cliffs on both sides, it forms a pocket-shaped closed fortress. Outside the wall is the small river. This small river more than 10 meters wide forms a natural moat. This place was probably originally a fortress-like station, and a lot of thought must have been put into it. The natural moat should be the snow water flowing down from the goddess mountain, and its tentacles are freezing cold. The gate wall is in dilapidated condition, but a rusty chain suspension bridge still remains. The chains are completely rusty, but the bridge deck seems to be very solid, and it is quite stable when it is built on the river. On the nail head of the chain, a griffin-like relief can be vaguely seen. It is estimated that the original craftsmanship was very delicate. After walking across the bridge, there is probably a thousand-acre settlement inside. But all the houses and facilities have been destroyed. Nowadays, there are only some weeds growing in the ruins of this garrison. It can be seen that a lot of effort was spent on the construction in the past. The ground was compacted so solid that not even shrubs can grow. But I didn't see any skeletons or anything like that inside. It felt like it had been cleaned by someone. The mine that Mirgon was talking about is under a rock wall in the ruins. There used to be a stone building there, which was probably a warehouse used to store things. Now there is a mess of rocks. But no grass or trees grow out of the cracks in the rocks. This is also the only place in the entire ruins where there is not much grass growing. This is indeed a mine. And it is basically an open pit mine. Leong just asked his men to remove some of the stones covering it. And he could already see some, or with a black metallic luster underneath. This ruin is actually more useful than the Lord originally imagined. Or in other words, it is much stronger than the pure, hidden ruins he originally imagined. Even without this mine, Leong would still think it was a good place. If you want to do some illegal business, or want to hide something secretly, then this place that is not easy to be discovered is very useful. Such as coinage. Of course, now that we know there is an ebony mine, it is obviously more suitable as a secret production base. Leong doesn't know the specific composition of ebony, but it may be the most suitable thing for making special equipment, because this kind of thing is actually very similar to the special tungsten steel that Leong knew in his previous life, which is used to make drill bits, milling cutters, and guns, special carbide alloys such as pipes and tank armor. Although I don't know if they are the same substance, such extremely hard things are generally very difficult to mine and process. Natural mines like this are very rare. But just when the Lord began to instruct the brothers to continue moving stones and prepare to see what the ebony mine below looked like, a voice came from outside the ruins. It was the brother, who was on sentry duty, who said back the warning. Sir, 
There is a group of people coming outside and have already entered the door. Fill in the pit and let's go out and take a look. Leong asked his men to continue to rebury the stones that had been lifted up. There were ruins here. And they drove some more carriages over. Since the people who came could find the entrance to the ruins. It meant they were familiar with this place. And there was no way to hide. The Lord led his men directly out. There were more than a dozen heavily armed people at the entrance of the ruins. They probably noticed someone inside at the entrance. They stopped by the small river, looked wary, and drew their swords. Who are you? Seeing Leon leading people out. The leader, a knight in a black cloak, pointed his sword at Leon menacingly. The lord saw that this knight's sword was actually an ebony sword. And it was quite well made. Are ebony swords so worthless these days? Why are they everywhere? Who are you? You don't even raise a flag dot bandits? When someone points a sword at someone, of course Leon will draw his sword and point it at the opponent. And he will be equally aggressive. Those dozen people didn't actually look like bandits. They even looked like regular soldiers. The leading knight took a few steps forward suspiciously, seeming to see clearly the sword in Liang's hand, and frowned. Are you the Griffin Sword? Adventure group? Despicable thieves? Suffer death? Then he actually led the dozen or so people to charge towards the lord. Leon felt inexplicably that he had been wronged. This guy seemed to have recognized the wrong person. Did he think he was mirrored on? But it seemed difficult to explain at this time. So the Lord could only raise his sword to fight. After all, it will be more convincing to explain after being convinced. But just as the knight rushed closer and raised his cloak, Leon saw the coat of arms on his body. Stop! I don't want to fight with you! The Lord Lord suddenly shouted loudly and took a few steps back. The knight was wearing an ancient armor, a very old style and it seemed to be the same style as Leofric's armor. Embedded on the chest of the armor is the same old gold-backed black griffin emblem. This is a griffin knight. Oomph! But I want to fight you! Mere gone! You once stole the property of the griffin knights and injured my father! The griffin knight didn't stop and struck directly with his sword. Leon used the sword in his hand to deflect his attack, and then realized that the sword he was holding now was Mere gone Killik's sword. This sword may really be a trophy Mere gone got during his mercenary career. But the Griffin Knight continued to attack without mercy. And each sword was powerful and heavy. It seemed that he really wanted to kill Leon or Mirgon. This guy's swordsmanship is pretty good. And he seems to have worked hard. However, the combat experience of this Griffin Knight cannot be compared with that of the Lord. Leon easily found an opening in his sword movement. Then stepped forward directly. Knocked off the blade he swung with the hilt. And then used the opportunity to kick him over. The long sword pointed at the Griffin Knight's neck. Everyone stop it! Leon gestured with the sword in his hand. And the knight finally stopped moving and sat on the ground staring at Leon. You have such skills! But you steal! Shame on you! In this situation, the griffin knight still glared at Leon fiercely and seemed to have a rather bad temper. This is a misunderstanding! I am not Mirgon! I am Leon Griffin! Lord of Ayrshire! What is your name? Leon didn't want to hurt him. So he put away his sword and explained and pointed to the coat of arms on his body, which was newly made at the House of Nobles two days ago. The heraldic patterns on both sides are exactly the same, but the colors are contrasting. Leon has a gold griffin on a black background, and the griffin knight is a black griffin on a gold background. These two coats of arms should not be enemies at first glance. Are you Baron Leon? I've heard of you, and I wanted to find you. But why are you holding this sword? This is my father's sword. I thought you were mere gone just now. Seeing that Leon had put away his sword and seemed to have no hostility, the griffin knight calmed down, looked at Liang's griffin crest, and asked suspiciously, This is the loot I just captured from Mirg on the day before yesterday. Leon looked at the sword in his hand and simply threw it back to the knight. Since it belongs to your father, I will return it to you. I don't want to be your enemy. This sense of honor really gained the trust of the griffin knight. He stood up and nodded, but he was a bit arrogant and did not apologize for his reckless behavior. I am Dalian. Dalian of Pender. Since it was a misunderstanding, forget it. And you shouldn't pull the trigger on me. Sword. Your Excellency Leon. This guy seems very rude. Why don't you draw your sword? Who do you think you are? The Lord Lord mocked somewhat unhappily. Leon knew the name Dalian. He was a claimant to the throne in the game. However, Leon doesn't dare to believe the game now. Who am I? Ha! Huh. I am a direct blood relative of the ancient royal family of Pander. 
It's just that my great ancestor was betrayed when he was about to be crowned King of Pander. The Lion King now on the throne is nothing but a shameful person descendants of betrayers. I will definitely take back the throne that belongs to me. Mr. Leong, since you used the Griffin emblem, you should swear allegiance to me. Hearing what Leong said, Dalian started to stare again, his tone louder than a toad. The Lord was amused, but also found it a little strange. Dalian mentioned bloodline to make people loyal as soon as he arrived. This thinking seemed a bit naive, and it seemed that he did not have deep experience. However, looking at Dalian's age, he is only in his twenties, so it is normal that he does not have much experience. Leon knew that he was of the royal lineage of Gupand, and he was the most direct lineage. His mother's surname was Pendragon. But if this bloodline were to be made public directly, the disaster it would bring to oneself would definitely be much greater than the benefit. If you don't have any strength in your hands, why mention your bloodline? No matter how noble your bloodline is or how orthodox the legal principles are, you still have to have money, soldiers and power before others dare to bet on you. Otherwise, you will become a puppet in the hands of careerists and you will have to be placed in the open to help others block open and hidden arrows. Moreover, Dalian's so-called blood relatives and great ancestors are not necessarily reliable, and they are most likely bluffing. After all, Liang's experiences these days have allowed him to understand many secrets. At that time, almost all the members of the Pender royal family were infected with the Black Death, and the only survivor was a missing baby. Dalian's ancestors were not necessarily the Pender royal family. Moreover, if you say this in front of yourself, the lord of the fierce lion kingdom, aren't you afraid that you will directly eradicate the traitors? Sir Dalian, the lion king may indeed be a tyrant, but it has been a 150 years since the kingdom of lion was founded, and you want to overthrow the king just by claiming to be of the bloodline of ancient Pend? Will anyone support you? Leon was not sure whether Dalian was immature or deliberately bluffing, so he tentatively asked a suspicious question. Of course there will be people who support me. The kingdom of Pender is the orthodox one. Naturally, there will be people loyal to Pender who will fight alongside me. Dalian said angrily and showed the ring on his hand. And you should call a true king who wears the royal ring of Pender as your majesty instead of sir. It was a golden ring with a griffin emblem, which looked quite simple. The surface of the rings worn by nobles is actually the seal they usually use. The king's ring can also be considered as a national inheritance, just like the emperor's personal jade seal. But this kind of behavior looks even more stupid. It's something from the previous dynasty. Are you showing it to the lord of this dynasty? Allowing others to address you as your majesty before you are crowned is also an act of trespass. Lord Dalian. Moreover, you claim to be the royal family of Pender in front of me. Are you not afraid that I will kill you? Leon shook his head and thought about the way this guy started killing people without even asking questions. He was diagnosed. This guy was a reckless person, and he probably hadn't seen much of the world. Your Excellency Leon, your performance just now has proven that you will not be my enemy. Your elder should be from the Griffin Knights. Right? The Griffin Knights have the creed of protecting the Pender royal family. Dalian shook his head and pointed to Leon's Griffin emblem. Heraldry is usually not used indiscriminately these days. Because in this era when the entire population is illiterate, most people rely on heraldry to identify forces. Leon uses the Griffin emblem because it is a family heirloom. The family crest cannot be changed casually. Otherwise, the inheritance and opportunities that should have been lost may be lost. Once a noble's coat of arms is registered, it is usually difficult to change it. You will understand how troublesome it is for Leon to change the color. People who can use the Griffin emblem will most likely have some connection with the Griffin Knights. Baron Leofric had shown kindness to Leon before because they all used the Griffin emblem. Although Leon had not asked, he could guess that Leofric's elders were probably from the Griffin Knights. Now after meeting Dalian, I am even more convinced of this. It is the same style of griffin armor. But Baron Leofric was much smarter than Dalian. He didn't say anything openly and had been quietly accumulating strength. He even gave up the originally comfortable territory of Kerwin Village and took the initiative to win the Brave Shield. Fort. Just to get more opportunities. Judging from Dalian's appearance, he probably felt that Leon should be related to the griffin knights after confirming that he was not mere gone from the Griffin Sword? Mercenary Group. Dalian probably has a very special feeling for the Griffin Emblem. He probably feels that if the person who uses the Griffin Emblem is not an enemy or a traitor, then he should be a friend. What a young black and white thinking. No, my elder does not belong to the Griffin Knights. But she may have accepted the allegiance of the Griffin Knights. Leon curled his lips and smiled. 
and simply told the truth. You are lying. The Griffin Knights will only be loyal to the King of Pender. Griffin? I have never heard of this family. Dalian was a little angry and looked at Leon carefully, probably feeling that Leon was deceiving him. Telling the truth is really not effective these days, and people don't believe it. Sir Dalian, when you tell me this, do you want me to support you in becoming the legal king of Pender? Leon understood Dalian's intention, but he felt that Dalian's stupid mentality really needed to be beaten by society some more. Chapter 158 The Bloodline of the High King Looking at the dozen or so people Dalian brought with him, although they were fairly neat, their outfits were not as good as those of Liang's most poorly equipped bodyguards. Obviously, he didn't do well. It was estimated that Dalian had just left home not too long ago. From the looks of him, he seemed to have the spirit of chivalry. But his thinking was obviously a bit sloppy. I don't know how his family could safely let him go out. To overthrow a kingdom, you need more than chivalry. That's right. Your Excellency Leon, since you are here, you must be remembering the glory of your ancestors as royal knights. Right. On behalf of my father, I will welcome you back to the Griffin Knights. Of course, as a Griffin Knight, you should definitely support me to become the legal ruler of Pander. Remember the glory of our ancestors? The Lord returned the sword, which was indeed an expression of goodwill to the Griffin Knight. In addition, this guy with the Griffin Crest probably thinks of Liang as a descendant of the Griffin Knight. However, before you become a human being yourself, you use such a middle-class method to get others to join the Griffin Knights and still support you as the king? The Lord sighed and turned around to leave not wanting to waste time with this guy. Dalian didn't expect the Lord to leave just as soon as he said so. He was stunned for a moment and chased after him. Lord Leong, wait. Whether you want to support me or not, you should go see my father. He asked me to come out to find you. Dalian stopped in front of the Lord, his young face full of seriousness and stubbornness. The Lord stopped and looked at Dalian carefully. Who is your father? The King of Pender? There was a hint of sarcasm in the Lord's tone. No doubt it's my adoptive father, Sir Paul Damar, the last inheritor of the Griffin Knights. He lives on the mountain, not far from here. He asked me to try to grow my strength in Kerwin Village and pay attention to you. If I see any traces of you, I will take you to find him. Dalian didn't hear the sarcasm and explained it seriously. He seemed to have a lot of respect for his adoptive father. Leon put away the sarcasm on his face and was a little confused. Your adoptive father asked you to pay attention to me in Kerwin Village? Did you follow me here from Kewen Village? That's right. I met your convoy outside Kerwin Village. But you were not in the convoy. Then my men discovered traces of the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group. I thought Mirgon came here again. Station. I came back quickly to take a look. I didn't expect you to be here. But I was really looking for you. After my father heard that you helped Kewen Village block the Drunker Group a few months ago, he let me go down the mountain to find you. Dalian explained very seriously. It seemed that he was really looking for Leon. He probably met Eric taking the convoy back to Chang'e Town. The Lord can understand why Dalian's adoptive father asked him to find him in Kerwin. He has grain transactions with most of the nobles in Kerwin. And he stayed here for a long time not long ago. It is indeed very possible to find him in this village. Moreover, Kerwin is relatively safe. And the Lord is Leofric, who also uses the Griffin Emblem. And has good intentions towards those who use the Griffin Emblem. At the same time, most of Kerwin Village is composed of traditional old-school aristocrats who have retired. These old aristocrats will not take it seriously even if they encounter a guy like Dalian who constantly claims the throne. It is estimated that Sir Paul Damar also knows that with Darian's reckless temperament, it is indeed more dangerous to go to other places. If Dalian had not mentioned that his adoptive father was looking for Liang, then Liang would have concluded that Dalian was just a reckless person. With the Lord's temperament, he would either stay away from him, or use him as a shield or even a puppet. But after learning that his adoptive father was deliberately looking for him, Leon became a little confused. Dalian's adoptive father probably wasn't looking for the descendants of the Griffin Knights. Otherwise, why didn't he look for Leofric? Leofric was the lord of Kerwin Village before. So close to each other. And Dalian seemed to respect his adoptive father quite a bit. So... Is this reckless man who claims the throne really reckless or is it a deliberate arrangement by his adoptive father? This Paul Damar should really be seen. It's not far anyway. Dalian asked his men to wait at the entrance of the ruins and motioned to Leon not to take anyone else with him, but to follow him alone. Then, he took Leon through the woods from inside the ruins and then went up the mountain from a path in the woods that was difficult for ordinary people to find. 
it seems that this ruins can be regarded as the doorstep of his home. No wonder he said Mirgon stole something from his house. Dalian's adoptive father lives halfway up the Goddess Mountain. This is an outpost-like stone house built at the true source of the Tontion River. The snow water from the top of the Goddess Mountain merges into a small lake next to the stone house. And then flows to the Tontion River. The stone house is quite plain. Nothing surprising. But the scenery here is very beautiful. The location of the stone house is just on the fog line. Looking down, you can see the thick fog filling the mountains. It keeps rolling, giving people the illusion of a sea of clouds. Upward, you can see the top of the goddess mountain, which is frozen all year round. The melted snow drips and gathers into a stream, and the ice and snow shine in the sun. In the middle, there is a small gem-like lake, a gurgling stream, and green grass and trees beside the lake. It's such a good place to see three views. Father, I'm back. I brought back your sword. Dalian started yelling from a distance. An old knight with white hair staggered out of the stone house. The old man was very old. Probably over 70. He was wearing a plain brown robe. Like a scholar. The robe was already a little worn and the color had become dull. But it was still clean and tidy. There is an obvious black griffin embroidered on the chest of the robe. The black embroidery thread is layered in layers and has probably been mended for many years. Dalian, it seems you brought a friend back? The old man reached out and took the sword handed over by Dalian, but put it aside and looked at Leon first. Sir Paldemar, I am Leon. Dalian said you are looking for me? As soon as the lord came forward to say H, lo, he saw the old knight's eyes widening as if he had seen a ghost. Leonardo? Yes, it seems that he is also an acquaintance of his parents. That's my father. Do you know him? Leon shook his head. The Lord already knew that he looked very much like Leonardo. And it seemed that many people knew his father. Who doesn't know the famous blood lion? That's the last lion knight dot Leon. Huh? No wonder it's that name dot he didn't die at the hands of the mad king back then. Paldemar seemed to know a lot. But he didn't know the whole story. The mad king? He lived at least 20 years longer than the mad king. Sir, you don't have any grudge against my father. Do you? Leon felt that the old knight's tone seemed not to like Leonardo very much. Hate? No hatred. But he failed to protect Princess Helen. And I really can't forgive him. He actually has the nerve to marry another wife and have children. Sir Paldemar gritted his teeth a little. But it was clearly not out of hatred. But more like regret. Wait. Helen? Are you talking about my mother? Why do you say my father didn't protect her? He didn't marry another wife either. The Lord really didn't understand. Leonardo was the one who rescued Helen. Your dot mother? My child. Your mother is Princess Helen? Did she escape from the Mad King? The old knight's eyes widened. He stumbled towards Leong and grabbed Liang's arm. Otherwise, where do you think I came from? Did I pop out of the cracks in the rocks? The old man's hands were very strong, and Leong was a little sore from being caught. The Lord has understood that Sir Paul de Mar thought Helen and Leonardo had died in the palace. It is estimated that not many people knew that Godric had let them go privately. And it was indeed something that could not be known to others. I always thought she was killed by the Mad King. It turns out. Ha! Huh. Ha ha ha. As expected of Leonardo. He can save people single-handedly. I have wrongly blamed him for so many years. Boy. Can I? It would be great to see you before I die. Paldemar let go of his hand and looked at Leon up and down. His eyes full of relief. But soon, Sir Paldemar seemed a little nervous. He looked at Dalian and then at Leon. Dalian, give me the ring and wait for me outside. Leon, come with me. Dalian, who was next to him, took off his ring and handed it over. Looking confused, he had no idea what was going on. But Leon probably guessed who Paldemar was. This old knight should be a griffin knight who was once loyal to Helen. Paldemar waved, asked Leon to enter the stone house with him, and closed the door. There is an exquisite statue of the goddess of order in the stone house. There is a small window directly above the statue. Standing in front of the statue. You can just see the snow-capped top of the goddess mountain from the window. The white snow on the top of the mountain reflects the sunlight. And shines into a beam of light through the small window in front of the statue. Which looks a bit solemn. Paldemar asked Leon to stand in the beam of light facing the statue. And handed the ring to his hand. Put it on. As soon as Leon took the ring. Before it was put on his finger. The surface of the ring suddenly emitted a soft light. There were some mysterious runes on the ring face that originally had only a griffin emblem. 
but those runes disappeared in a flash, and it was unclear what they were. After a few seconds, the light dissipated, and the ring surface returned to its original appearance of the griffin emblem. This ring. The lord was startled and almost let go and dropped the ring to the ground. This is the ring of the high king. It was like this when Helen first got it. It is only effective in the hands of direct descendants of the Pender royal family. You will know when you put it on. Paldemar's voice was very soft, as if he didn't want Dalian outside to hear him. Leon looked at the ring in surprise. This was the first time he had seen a real magic item. This ring should be an enchanted item, although it only flashed a little. There was no doubt that it was already magical. I never thought that a ring could be used for DNA testing. And as Leon put the ring on his little finger, the ring showed its true magic. It emitted a soft white light again and seemed to be alive. The ring-faced griffin seemed to have become a living creature, and it was even seen spreading its wings and flying out. Then, a completely different line of inscriptions was projected on the flat ring surface. Yes, it was projected like a projector, but the inscription was only visible in the beam of light that penetrated the hut from the window. The inscription is in clear pender script. Countless beliefs can exist in the void, but the earth only needs one will. The will of the Supreme King. Sir Paldemar had a relieved smile on his face. He had probably seen the scene before. After a while, the light and shadow gradually disappeared. But there still seemed to be some inscription surrounding the ring. Looming. Leon was a little surprised and tried to imprint the ring face on his palm. There was no ink pad. No ink. And no fire paint. But a golden crest was still left in the palm of my hand. A line of small text surrounds the image of a griffin. The text surrounding the golden griffin is as thin as a hair, but extremely clear. This is the will of the High King. Indeed, this is what the King of Pender's seal should look like. When it was in Dalian's hands, the ring only had a griffin image on it. Only the direct bloodline of the Pender royal family can bear the coat of arms of the High King. Others can only leave a griffin mark. This is the ring of the late King Kavala. Paldemar let out a long breath and said softly to Leon, It seems that you are the bloodline of the late king. I will tell you why Dalian is not recognized by the High King. This magic ring dot is its function just to declare the legitimate royal power? Just to prevent counterfeiting? The Lord felt that such a dazzling effect was just for anti-counterfeiting. It seemed a bit luxurious. He thought it would be a traditional method such as dripping blood. But he didn't expect that it would take effect when he put it on. The technical content was quite high. For the powerful late King Kabbalah, the magic items he needs are enough to prevent counterfeiting. Paldemar shook his head and answered directly. It seemed that he had had the same idea as Liang. This is true. It is said that the late king was once the most powerful warrior, and he never suffered a defeat in his life when he led troops in conquests. It is estimated that he really does not need other functions. Leon, with your status, you should not bend your allegiance to the enemy. How can you be loyal to Ulrich? Where is your mother? Where is she? As the light on the ring gradually faded, the old knight's smile also gradually faded, and he frowned again. He seemed to be quite dissatisfied with Liang's status as a lord, and he probably hated Iron for not being able to become steel. Both she and my father were killed in Buckley, and I escaped back to Pender while being chased by the killer. I don't even know who killed them. The lord spread his hands. I am alone. What else can I do if I don't become a lord? Should I just raise the flag to rebel? The old knight was silent. After a short moment of silence, he took a deep breath and his tone became extremely gentle. I'm sorry, your highness. I'm too anxious. Your highness? This was a direct change of title, which caught Leon off guard. Sir, you'd better not use this title to me. If I guess correctly, you asked Dalian to search for nobles who use the Griffin Crest just to find the true bloodline of the Pender royal family? Then why do you still want to howl about letting Dalian claim the throne? Leon instinctively believed that titles such as your highness represented danger. The pale-haired old knight, Fong Tsong and the Sea of Yuting, impeached by Xi and Sonlu and stole the tomb. And stole the tomb of the old knight. It's a long story. I actually misunderstood it for many years. Twenty-five years ago, it was the 330th year of Pan Delhi. Sir Paldemar, who was nearly 50 years old at that time, was rushing to the foot of the goddess mountain. He got news about Princess Helen again. Paldemar is a senior griffin knight who has been secretly passed down for generations. He is also a knight sworn to protect Princess Helen. He has always been with Helen. But after Helen rescued more than a thousand people from a village infected with the Red Death, the village was massacred by the Mad King, and Helen was constantly attacked. Leonardo rescued her. 
and then the two all missing. After that, there was no trace of Helen in Paldemar for several years. Now we have received new news that Princess Helen will join Leonardo's Lion Knights to officially rebuild the Griffin Knights at the ancient station under the Goddess Mountain, more than a hundred years after the death of the Banner of the Knights of the Griffins. It was a great joy for Paldemar to be able to officially announce its reconstruction. Generations of his family have never forgotten the honor of being a royal knight. Sir Paul de Mar has also been trying to rebuild the Order of the Griffin for decades, but has been unsuccessful. Therefore, after getting the news, Paul de Mar was originally very happy. Of course, this news means an illegal assembly for the Lion Kingdom. In the eyes of the Mad King, this probably belongs to the time when the rebels gathered and the Lion Knights were also an illegal knights. But for Paul de Mar, this means that the sister knights of the Lion Knight and the Griffin Knight will once again openly be loyal to the Pender royal family and order and loyalty will once again bear witness to each other. It also means that Princess Helen will raise the golden griffin flag of Gupand and lead the two knights to formally claim the royal power that should belong to her. In the eyes of Paul Damar, this is a major event to bring order to the chaos. But after Paul Damar rushed to the station at the foot of the goddess mountain, he only saw corpses everywhere. The lion knights guarding here were completely wiped out. Princess Helen was probably betrayed by someone when she summoned the griffin knights to rebuild the order of the griffin knights. Later, he heard that Princess Helen was captured and taken into the palace of Lion City. And he also heard that Leonardo rushed into the palace single-handedly. So Sir Paul de Mar also rushed to the Lion City. He knew that this was a moth flying into the flame. But he planned to use his life to fulfill his oath. But just outside the Lion City, he saw a knight escorting a woman and the baby in her arms to escape from the Lion City. Someone was chasing them. He had seen that woman before. She was the girl Helen rescued from the Red Death Village. She seemed to be a distant relative of Leonardo. So he tried his best to kill the pursuers. But the knight and the woman had been killed. Later, Sir Paldemar discovered the griffin-faced High King's ring in the baby's swaddling clothes. Sir Paldemar, who had not seen Helen for several years and did not know the whole story, thought that both Leonardo and Helen had been killed when he saw the ring. He thought the baby was the heir to the Pender royal family and Helen's child. Since the bloodline of Pender has not been severed, the Griffin Knight's oath to protect the royal family of Pender must continue. So Sir Paul de Mar secretly took the baby away, found a secret place on the goddess mountain to raise the child, and named the child Darien. In order not to be discovered, he dug up the river embankment next to the ancient station, diverted the river water to wash away the valley mouth, and artificially created a huge landslide in the valley leading to the station, sealing the entire valley. Chapter 159 The Contradictor Who Makes Mistakes Sir Paul Damar had always believed that Dalian was the last heir to the kingdom of Pindor, and he himself was probably the last griffin knight with a legacy. He vowed to help Dalian restore his country, which is what he has always taught Dalian. However, as Dalian grew up, Paul Damar had a suspicion that Dalian looked nothing like Helen, and the ring that once shined in Helen's hand was almost invisible in Dalian's hand. No response. So his heart was full of contradictions and distress. He is a griffin knight. He is the guardian of the royal family of Pendor. And his lifelong belief requires him to find the true royal descendants. But the old man has raised Dalian for so many years. And his relationship is closer than his own. He would rather believe that there was something wrong with the ring. This is very confusing. Therefore, Paldemar did not mention his suspicions to Dalian. He didn't know what to say. After all, he had always taught Dalian, the true king of Pender, the bloodline of the previous king, and the legitimate heir to the throne. But no matter what, the doubt in his heart always existed. So he still insisted that Dalian was a direct descendant of the royal family. And he still educated Dalian in this way. But he made two preparations. While teaching Dalian, look for other possibilities. It would be best if you could find someone who could use this high king's seal. If he couldn't find it, then regardless of whether Dalian was of the blood of the late king or not, he would insist on helping Dalian restore his country. This was the meaning of this old man's existence as the last griffin knight and the value of his life. This seemed like a reasonable idea. But the problem was that he didn't know how to look for other possibilities. He is older and has no manpower. Moreover, even if there are still descendants of the late king in the world, they will definitely remain anonymous. After all, he himself can only live in seclusion in the mountains with Creon. Until ten years ago, Mirgon led some adventurers to find the sealed ancient settlement. Dalian was only a teenager at that time, and Paldemar was already old. The young man could not deal with Mirgon and could only watch as he looted all the weapons 
and equipment in the station. But this gave Paldemar an idea. The old knight came forward and told Mirgon that this was the arsenal of the Griffin Knights. Those who find these Griffin equipment are the chosen ones. And they can use the name of Griffin Sword to rule the world. In order to make Mirgon believe. Paldemar also deliberately said that if he defeated himself, he could take away the Griffin Sword in his hand, which represented Gupan's supreme royal power. Of course, the sword in his hand was actually just a griffin, the weapon of the knight commander of the knights. The sword that truly represents the royal power was taken to Buckley by Leon's parents. But the old knight did not know it. Mirgon was young and energetic back then. So he really believed it. He defeated the old knight, took away Paldemar's sword, and then indeed named the adventure group the Sword of the Griffin. Paldemar is actually using Mirgon to attract the attention of the outside world. Anyway, the weapons and equipment are destined to be taken away by Mirgon. So it is a good idea to take the opportunity to let Mirgon attract firepower. In the view of the old knight, this would not only test the Lion Kingdom's reaction to the name, Griffin Sword, but also attract real royal blood through this iconic name. Because the real Griffin Sword does represent the royal power of Pander. But more than a hundred years have passed. And few people in Pander now know the meaning of that sword. Probably only the descendants of the royal family, and those who retain the legacy of the Griffin Knights will not forget it. The old knight felt that if there were still descendants of the Pender royal family in the world, they should know the meaning of the Griffin Sword, and would definitely go to Mergen's team. He might gain something by keeping an eye on Miron. Coupled with so many Griffin Knights equipment, most people would think that the Griffin Sword mercenary group is the pseudonym of the Griffin Knights. And members of the Pender royal family will definitely pay attention. Just as the old knight imagined, the Griffin Sword Adventure Group became extremely ostentatious after obtaining the Griffin equipment and became famous in a few years. However, Paul Demar, who has been tracking and observing this adventurous group, has gained nothing. There is no royal family of Pendor. Only many careerists looking for trouble for Mirgon. And people will grow. After several years of being a shield, the arrogant Mirgon also realized that the so-called Griffin sword he got from the old knight was actually of no benefit to him. Mirgon stopped being so high profile and declared that all his equipment was just trophies. He wanted to distance himself and stated that his mercenary group was hostile to the Griffin Knights. Since then, the Griffin Sword has become a pure mercenary group, taking more tasks to protect or find noble women. And fewer and fewer people are paying attention to this mercenary group. So the old man's calculation failed. In fact, the old knight's plan was destined to be unsuccessful. Because the old man did not expect that after Princess Helen and his wife fled to Buckley Continent, they did not mention anything about blood royal rights to their children at all. And even sealed the Griffin Sword for the sap. Leon Griffin doesn't even know the meaning of the Griffin Sword. The noble royal princess became an ordinary aristocratic woman. And the unrivaled knight became an ordinary hired knight. After experiencing many things, the couple no longer planned to return to the country. And just wanted to live a good life in Buckley. Of course, Paldemar was not completely without gains. He at least discovered that the current Lion Kingdom did not respond to the Griffin Sword. This means that the current Lion King Ulrich seems to be different from the Mad King. He does not care much about the existence of the Griffin Knights. But he does not agree with its legitimacy. Later, Baron Leofric became the Lord of Kerwin. Which further proved that nobles who publicly used the Griffin Crest could already become Baron Lords of the Kingdom of Lions. The Old Knight went to see Baron Leofric a few years ago and learned that Leofric's ancestors were indeed Griffin Knights. However, Leofric said that now that he was the Lord of the Kingdom of Lions, it was impossible for him to return to an illegal knight order, let alone support Dalian's restoration of the kingdom, unless the banner of the kingdom of Pindor is raised again and his safety can be guaranteed. Of course, Leofric also showed kindness to the old griffin knight. But that was all. So the old knight simply asked Dalian to come down from the mountain and directly claim the throne. This can not only accumulate strength, but also attract real royal blood if there is any. Of course, if you really haven't found it yet, then let's make it right. So the mistake was made a few months ago. The story of Liang's dissuasion of the drunkard group in Kuen village spread and reached Paldemar's ears. In fact, for Liang, the battle was not fierce at all. In essence, Alaric took the initiative to seek normal transactions after he sobered up. However, due to the huge disparity in the number of people on both sides, it was rumored to be very magical in Kuen village. With 30 people, he defeated 800 people. His opponent was the notoriously difficult, drunker group. And according to rumors, Leon also defeated the drunker group. After all, they all gave money to buy alcohol. 
When did the drunkard group ever pay for drinking? Money. In fact, Leong paid the money. But in the eyes of those who don't know the truth, this is of course a brilliant and legendary victory. In addition, Liang's griffin flag has appeared frequently recently and is used by caravans and convoys. Baron Liang's reputation in this area is actually much greater than imagined. So Paldemar began to pay special attention to Liang. But now that he was old and had inconvenient legs and feet, he could not run to Liang's territory. So he had to let Dalian develop in Qin village and invite him back when he met Liang. The reason why he asked Dalian to stay in Kerwin was similar to what the Lord had imagined. Dalian has been living in the mountains with his adoptive father. He has not seen much of the world and has a very upright temperament. Therefore, Paldemar really did not dare to let Dalian run too far and asked Dalian to only move around the village of Kerwin. Because Baron Leofric knew of their existence and would protect Dalian. Your Highness Leong, I have long felt that Dalian is not a descendant of the royal family. So I have been looking for the real person. But I also did not expect that you are the son of Princess Helen. I am really happy to be able to marry you at this age. I see your presence. Paldemar looked at Leong with a smile. But there was a trace of bitterness behind the smile. Of course, the Lord understands this bitterness. The old man has raised Dalian for more than 20 years. And now it is confirmed that there is another heir to the royal family. Although the old man is mentally prepared. He will still feel a little bit sad. I admire the Griffin Knight's loyalty. Sir. Leong bowed to Paldemar. He really admired this old knight who had been fulfilling his oath all his life. Paldemar bowed, probably pleased that his loyalty was recognized. In fact, I have investigated you. Your Highness, I know most of your deeds. I am very pleased that your performance is worthy of being followed by the Griffin Knights. In this way, I finally don't have to let Dalian do what he is not good at. I am self-aware that I can only teach him to be a knight, but I cannot teach him how to govern the country now that he can get rid of the shackles of the throne. This is actually the happiest thing for me. I just need to let him he passed on the legacy of the Griffin Knights. The bitterness on Paldemar's face has disappeared, leaving behind a sincere smile. And you are capable enough to raise the flag of Pander. Of course Leon can understand. This old man has raised Dalian for more than 20 years and obviously has a deep relationship with Dalian. If he had a choice, the old man would certainly not want Dalian to fight for the throne. The old knight knew Dalian's temperament and how risky it was. After confirming that the lord was the direct heir to the Penn royal family, Paldemar was indeed happy from the bottom of his heart that his adopted son could get rid of the most dangerous job. But Leon also doesn't plan to make his identity public now. He already has enough enemies. So, the lord raised a question that troubled the old knight. Sorry. Sir, I don't plan to openly raise the flag of rebellion to face a kingdom just yet. So you really can't call me your highness but I can support De Leon re-establish the Griffin Knights. But I have some doubts. What do you want to tell him? Leon looked at the old knight teasingly. I was just thinking about how to tell him. It's my fault. He has always believed that he is the king of Pinder. Paldemar suddenly became sad. Dalian has always believed this since he was born. If he suddenly changes his mind, Dalian will definitely have doubts about life and may become autistic. However, this matter can only be solved slowly by the old knight, who is the adoptive father. Leon shook his head and took off the ring in his hand and handed it back to Paldemar. I will not use the High King's seal until I have the power of the High King. Sir, please put it away first. You don't have to let Dalian follow me for the time being. Maybe he has his own way to go. I can first build the station at the foot of the mountain as the station of the Griffin Knights. Leon does intend to rebuild the Griffin Knights. Because at least he has to let the ruins be protected by armed forces. Moreover, the Griffin Knights as the oldest knighthood on this continent, are still the existence that many Pender knights yearn for. Although they have been destroyed, many ancient noble families still think that they are the most orthodox knighthood. The kingdom of Pender was not destroyed due to governance issues, but was invaded by the Red Death, which cut off the royal heirs and triggered civil strife, which gave foreign enemies an opportunity to take advantage of it. So many old nobles will indeed miss the kingdom of Pender. In fact, Dalian claimed that he had the royal blood of Gupand and put himself out there as the claimant to the throne. Although this approach is likely to be regarded as a puppet, it can also be regarded as a talisman in a sense. Because except for the king, no one would easily kill him publicly, lest he be known as killing the orthodox royal family. After all, the Lion King's accession to the throne was indeed unfair. And Alfred himself, the first Lion King, did not tamper with this history. However, 
Whatever is true or not is false. And strength has the final say in the end. If there is a formal confrontational war, no matter what the legal principles are, most nobles will only follow the strong ones. Just like Baron Leofric said, at least his safety must be ensured. Most civilians may yearn for the once powerful and prosperous kingdom of Pendor. But in fact, they will only support the good lord. They know. After all, they are more concerned about whether they have food to eat. Therefore, Leon has never had the idea of using his blood identity to attract people. Because, when you are strong enough, someone will naturally add a legal footnote to your bloodline. Bloodline becomes noble because of the strong. The heraldic ring of the Supreme King was actually only used to prevent counterfeiting. Probably the biggest purpose was to prevent the seal from being stolen. Other people's seals would certainly not be able to display the small words. This is the will of the Supreme King. Surrounding the griffin. Of course, it does represent inheritance. But it can only be unveiled publicly if it is strong enough. Just like the griffin sword that represents the royal power of Pendor. Leong doesn't dare to take it to the Lion City now. The Lord is not strong enough. The old knight did not object to Liang's approach. He put away the ring and nodded. But when Leong turned to leave the hut, Paul Demar said behind him, Your Excellency Leong, before you publicly raise the flag of Gupand, I will let Dalian continue to claim the throne. I hope you can send someone to protect him. The old knight seemed quite hesitant when he said this, feeling that it was very difficult to say it. And this time, there is indeed no need to use, Your Highness. Of course, I will send someone to follow him. Thank you for your help. Sir! Leong turned around, and saluted sincerely to thank him again. This should indeed be thanked. The old knight is using Dalian to help the lord attract attention, so that the lord can grow in obscenely. Of course, this may also be because the old man doesn't know how to explain to Dalian for a while. The lord walked out of the hut, patted the bewildered Dalian on the shoulder, and said, I will send people to protect you and your father. Dalian, in addition, I will rebuild the griffin at the old station at the foot of the mountain. Knights, really? That's great. Father! The confusion on Dalian's face turned into excitement. But then, he was called into the hut by the old knight. The Lord Lord smiled, and went straight down the mountain. After the Lord returned to Chungha town, a lot of news came from the entire east. Brave Shield Castle faced a joint siege by Jatu and bandits. But because the bandits failed to trap Godric, Charles and others, they brought their troops into Brave Shield Castle. And Godric also called most of the Chungha town garrison was eliminated. The total number of defenders of Brave Shield Castle is actually 1,500. In addition, the castle itself is very conducive to defense. So it is naturally as solid as a rock. In just two days, the two barons Godric and Leofric went out separately and completely defeated the enemy. The Red Arrow Longbowman also gained some fame in this battle. These originally unqualified archers quickly grew into a good force in continuous battles and even became Godric's new guard. His original guard at White Deer Castle has become Amy's guard. The more famous one is Charles. After the siege of Brave Shield Castle, he even rushed to Fletcher Village with injuries, and defeated hundreds of bandits in a madman-like way with less than a hundred troops. Charles took no prisoners in this battle, killed many people, and impaled all their heads on wooden stakes outside the village of Fletcher, because those bandits massacred many people in Fletcher Village after he entered Brave Shield Castle. Also because, Reva is dead died to protect Charles. After the battle, Godric did not return to Chang'e town. He and Charles continued to lead the troops to pursue westward, chasing the bandits into the jurisdiction of Shurhu City. The baron who never attacked unexpectedly attacked, which was beyond most people's expectations. Godric knew that those Red Brotherhood gangsters must come from the Duke of Alma, but no one had any evidence. Alma did not appear to any of them. Therefore, he wanted to chase the defeated gangsters and find a piece of evidence. When those gangsters are defeated, they will definitely return to their masters. As for Charles, his purpose is relatively pure. He just wants to kill the person behind the scenes. There are currently very few troops stationed in Chungha town. The Horn Call Rangers seem to have disappeared since they claimed to go to suppress bandits. It is not known where Alma took them. It is said that they went to the Northern Lion Lake City jurisdiction. The beacon fire in White Deer Castle has also stopped. It was a lie. Eric has sent back the news to White Deer Castle that Leon left the Lion City safely. The fighting in the entire east seems to have subsided, and the battlefield has turned to the northern area of Shurhu City. But for Leon, this means that the struggle has just begun. Chapter 160 Little Girl You have to be more reserved. Some people are destined to get more opportunities. 
like Eric. He only came back two days before the Lord, and was once again given the arduous task of leading a hundred people to rebuild the ancient settlement at the foot of the goddess mountain. This is because Eric's temperament suits him very well. Ambitious, but also disciplined, courageous, but also calm. The most important thing is that he understands the world, is good at observing people, can make friends with anyone, and is diligent and studious. Although he also has many shortcomings, such as his mediocre skills, his gambling and lustful nature, and his tendency to go to certain entertainment venues whenever he has free time. But despite his flaws, Eric is already the easiest person to climb to a high position compared to most people. Dalian has a straight temper. If anyone else is allowed to go to that station, it is very likely that they will have conflicts with Dalian. Only Eric, a smooth guy, can play it off. Maybe Eric can fool Dalian into being lame. The mission given to Eric by the Lord is to rebuild the station into a valley fortress in the name of rebuilding the Griffin Knights. As for the establishment of the Griffin Knights, you have to wait for the station to be built first. Otherwise you won't even have a place to live. The 100 people Leong asked Eric to bring were escorts selected from the Long River Express. But they are not the ones with the most combat effectiveness. But those who are loyal enough and have some life skills, such as carpentry, blacksmithing, etc., mining. Such a choice has naturally explained the problem. The Lord did not intend to truly rebuild the Griffin Knights immediately. He mainly wanted to mine the ebony mine. And other things could be done slowly. This is why Eric has to go. When Dalian is still claiming the throne. There needs to be someone with brains who can guide Dalian. Lest the reckless guy can't wait to see these people. Make something happen. After all. Although Sir Paul DeMar can control him. The old man is too old to keep an eye on him all the time. Moreover. Before the Lord raised the flag of Pendor, the old man probably would not tell Dalian the truth. Leon knew very well that in addition to letting Dalian stand at the front desk to help Leon attract attention, the old knight might actually have something in his heart. Some investigation meanings. Because Paul Damar is not sure whether Leon will return to the country. His understanding of Leon is limited. What if the Lord just wants to be the noble master of the Lion Kingdom in peace? Therefore, if the Lord will raise a flag to rebel and claim to be the king of Pendor, then Paldemar will tell Dalian the truth and let Dalian fully support Liang's restoration of the country. But if the Lord remains silent, then he will let Dalian take on the task of restoring the country. At least his adopted son will definitely carry out this difficult task. The old knight is still making preparations. This idea is very reasonable. Paldemar vowed to protect the Penn royal family. But only those who are willing to restore the country are called the Penn royal family. In fact, if the Lord is given another year and a half, when the saltpeter pits in the territory have harvested enough, and there are more money, food, population and troops, then Leon will definitely not mind confronting him directly. It is possible to raise the flag and claim the title of king. But after all, Liang's time to become a lord was only more than seven months, which was too short. Although he had been developing his strength, many things needed time to ferment. To be honest, being able to reach the position of governor of a county in seven months is already amazing. But how can a county with tens of thousands of people fight against a kingdom of two million people? Moreover, those ten thousand people are not under Liang's control in name. After giving Eric instructions carefully, the Lord set off back to White Deer Castle after he led the team out of Chang'e Town. Miss Amy? Master Leon is back! In the main building of White Deer Castle, a guard hurriedly found Amy. Where is it? Where is it? Amy dropped the quill pen in her hand and jumped out of the room like a wild deer. Half of the letter she wrote was stained by the ink on the pen. A dot outside the city dot Miss Amy. Your shawl fell off. The guard looked at Amy who ran downstairs quickly and said the second half of the sentence to the instantly deserted stairs. But it was estimated that Amy could no longer hear her. Amy has been very nervous these days. Even after receiving the news from Eric two days ago, she quickly ran downstairs and ran to the castle door. It wasn't until she saw Leon entering White Deer Castle safely that she breathed a sigh of relief. Of course she was worried about Leon. But after seeing Leon walk into the city gate, she turned around and walked back and rubbed her face, changing her expression from joy to calmness. It felt like I ran 800 meters just to see Leon enter the castle. She had just received a letter from her mother. The general meaning of the letter was, Little girl, you have to be more reserved. Even I, who is far away in Lion City, can see how passionate you are about Baron Leon. When you wrote to ask me to visit Leon, you didn't mention me as your mother. If you take the initiative to deliver it to your door, others may not value it. 
Of course, the smart Amy understands that her mother is laughing at her. So Amy taught herself to adjust her facial expression to what she thought was a reserved look. Of course, when you are just learning and practicing, you are not very good at grasping the appropriateness. The Lord saw Amy from a distance, but he was quite confused. Why did the girl turn around and leave after seeing him? I haven't seen you for 10 days. What went wrong? Could it be that he discovered the skill book that he secretly collected to improve his personal abilities? There is a book. The Combat Career of a Centurion of the Legion hidden by the Lord's bedside. It was bought in the Bacchus Empire last time. Emperor Lin Gang is a good place. This book is similar to the memoirs of an officer. Wonderful. Well, what's even better is that Centurion of the Bacchus Empire is very good at playing, with many scenes and poses, and maybe it can improve his coaching skills. But it's wrong to think about it. Amy discovered this book first. She thought it was a battlefield biography at the time. But who knew that after reading the beginning? She dropped the book and ran away with red ears. If it weren't for the Lord's discerning eye, this good book would have been buried. Later, when the Lord bought the book, Amy was still standing by and expressed his disdain for her. But she knew that Leong had this book. Amy, what happened these days? The Lord quickly caught up and walked side by side with Amy. Yes, Leviuz's scouts came for reconnaissance many times, but they were killed by Sir Roland. The Owl Knights are also asking if they can settle in Whiteheart Castle. They seem to be unable to stay in true broad any longer. Also, my father, I heard that he pursued the enemy all the way to Sherhu City. I was a little worried. Oh, those corns are more than a foot tall. They look good. Amy was expressionless and talked nonchalantly, like a robot butler reporting the situation. Her words were all business, which made Leong stunned for a while. Hey, Dot Amy, wait a minute. The Lord looked at Amy, and his forehead began to hurt. The girl's face was expressionless, and she spoke like she was chanting sutras. But her eyes looked at Leong with eagerness and joy, and she was a little evasive. Leong felt that this situation was very difficult. Of course he could understand Amy's mind, but he had never dealt with this kind of scene and was really inexperienced. He simply followed behind with his mouth shut and began to think about official business. But Sarah, who came out of the main building of the castle, saw Amy's appearance. She raised her eyebrows and stood at the door of the main building. When Amy passed by, she said softly, Stop pretending. You haven't mentioned teacher in a long time. This is a title. Everyone can see it. Aw? Amy suddenly lost her composure and became a little panicked. She felt that her mother was probably right, as everyone could see it. No, this won't work. I can't be so eager. If you offer it to your door, he won't cherish it. No matter how you say it, you are still the daughter of a princess. But she has no experience with this kind of thing. She didn't know what she should do. Her mother only laughed at her, but didn't teach her. And neither did Sarah. That dot Lord Godric sighed. Hmm. Over there in the Bacchus Empire. The Lord and Amy turned to mention business at the same time. Then the two people closed their mouths at the same time. The Lord must be quick to respond and know how to avoid embarrassment. Tell me. As a result, the two people entered into a discussion mode. Sarah, who was waiting to watch the show, sighed deeply and shook her head weakly. There is indeed a lot of official business to deal with now. King Ulrich needs 100,000 dinars. This must be done within a month. And it is not easy to default on the debt. There are still 24 days. The All Knights plan to move to White Deer Castle. But they are in a legal knight's order. Their identity is indeed a bit embarrassing. And their reliability is questionable. This was mainly because Trubrin had a new lord, and that lord asked them to leave as soon as possible. The new lord was a lion knight under Duke Brennus, and had no good impressions of the illegal knights. On top of that, Amy was a little undecided after Godric's victory at Brave Shield. She heard about the battle at Brave Shield Castle, and knew that Godric led troops to Lion Lake City. She was very confident in her father's ability to lead troops in combat. So she was not worried about it. But in this case, White Deer Castle would be worth worrying about. It was thought that White Deer Castle would not receive outside support for a long time. Because the troops from Long River Town, Fletcher Village, Fort Brave Shield and other places were all taken away. The Horncall Rangers were also missing. In the past 10 days, beacon fires have been lit in White Deer Castle, which attracted several groups of spies from the Bacchus Empire, although they were discovered and solved by Sir Roland in advance. No one is sure whether the Bacchus Empire sent spies to cause trouble. There's no guarantee that something won't go wrong. Therefore, in order to ensure the safety of White Deer Castle, 
she had to make some preparations. For example, in the same way that the Bacchus Empire framed the Lord, it also framed Governor Levius. But in the past few days, all she could think about was the Lord's safety. So how could she think about strategies? Of course, you still have to look to the Lord for strategies. However, after the discussion, it was Amy who actually executed it. Because Leong has to play a poor little lord who is framed by two countries at the same time and has to flee. Emperor Marius deliberately wrote a letter to Leong to alienate him. Didn't he just want this result? Then give him this result. And give it thoroughly. The eastern frontier of the Bacchus Empire has been restless lately. Not long after Governor Levius was sent to shield Wind Fortress. He caused a lot of things in this frontline fortress. The governor's life has not been easy recently. After all, Shield Wind Fortress only has soldiers and no people. So it cannot conquer the land. Moreover, Emperor Marius gave him the task of capturing Whiteheart Castle within one year. Now Levius could no longer drink the soldiers' blood and eat empty wages. Instead, he had to add his own money to replenish his troops. If it weren't for the Empire's different policies, Levius would have been driven into poverty. The regular army of the Bacchus Empire is uniformly allocated by the country. And the current large regular army of Shield Wind Fortress is under the banner of the Second Army of the Empire. Second, if you just look at the flags, you might think that this is a very strong main force. But in fact, these are just a group of new recruits. They don't even have equipment. They are actually a group of farmers. They don't even have a designation recognized by the Empire. This legion was formed less than a month ago. To put it simply, the existence of this legion was the newly expanded army after Governor Levius was assigned to Shield Wind Fortress. It was actually used to request military expenses from Emperor Marius. In fact, the 800 Shadow Infantry under Levius are the real main force in his army. But this main force is no longer organized into a separate legion. The Shadow Infantry were actually the Marines who followed General OSA to land across the sea. They were formerly affiliated with the Shadow Legion. As the main legion under the Conqueror back then, they were indeed a very strong force. Later, after the founding of Bacchus, this unit was organized separately and became the Shadow Infantry Regiment, which has been commanded by the Levius family. However, in order to maintain its purity, this army of all Bacchus did not accept any pinders to join. As the years passed, the number of Shadow Infantry soldiers became less and less. In addition, Levius was firmly opposed to reform, and his own personal ethics were not very good. If it were not for the huge power of his family, and the strong shadow infantry under his command. Emperor Marius would have been defeated long ago. Kill him. Some time ago, after Kairos handed over the two IOUs to Emperor Marius, Levius encountered a lot of trouble. Although Emperor Marius still let Levius command the powerful army of shadow infantry, he no longer gave him an independent organization. In other words, the shadow infantry are now reaffiliated with the shadow legion. Governor Levius, the commander of the infantry, will not receive separate legion allocations. The military resources provided by the state will be distributed by Governor Kairos, the commander of the Shadow Legion. And Kairos didn't like Levius very much. The two people's worldviews and values were inconsistent. Kairos couldn't stand him, especially Levius who raped, kidnapped and harmed the civilians all day long. Although Kairos is a person who distinguishes between public and private affairs, he can also reasonably allocate the military resources rationing belonging to the Shadow Legion in a business-like manner. For example, if the entire Shadow Army receives money, food, and military supplies during the harvest season in May, he can wait until October and then allocate the portion of the Shadow Infantry to Levius. This is quite reasonable. Anyway, money and materials will be given according to the rules. And they will definitely be given according to the budget. But for Levius, this is more difficult. There is no money or food available and White Deer Castle must be taken care of. Although the balding middle-aged governor had a very high level of land scraping in the past few years, and had a lot of money in his hands. But? Use your own money to support the country's soldiers? That won't work. And now that he has come to Shield Wind Fortress, he has no source of income. So Levius had no choice but to expand his army. In the name of attacking White Deer Castle, a new Imperial Second Legion was added. What he reported to Emperor Marius was, the garrison of White Deer Castle exceeds 700 people. In order to capture White Deer Fort, I must form a new legion of 2,000 people in Shield Wind Fort. This move was actually reasonable. After all, the 800 Shadow Infantry alone would certainly not be able to capture the fortified White Deer Fort. However, 
This matter may be exactly the opposite of what Emperor Marius imagined. Marius must have originally planned to force Livius to give up the Shadow Infantry and hand this unit into the hands of a more suitable person. The main purpose of Livius's new legion was to ask Emperor Marius for military expenses alone. It is difficult to say whether Emperor Marius would agree. But Livius felt that this matter must be done. How could he maintain his life without taking free money? He still has 70 or 80 concubines to raise. And according to common sense, this is indeed a reasonable military expansion. Livius felt that his move would definitely get material support from Emperor Marius. Of course, there is no telling how many people the newly formed legion will actually have in the end. Since they are going to attack White Deer Castle anyway, it can be said that the insufficient number of soldiers is dead in battle. Since when the legion was first formed, it had to be verified by the emperor with sufficient troops. Therefore, in order to completely escape the sea of suffering, Lidius directly conducted a large-scale conscription. And it is not recruiting volunteers, nor paying to recruit soldiers, but forcibly recruiting strong men. After all, this is the only way to do it without spending money. In the first week after he took office, he forcibly recruited more than 2,000 people from various villages, including Imel Village. He almost grabs a young man when he sees one. By the way, they also found a lot of villagers' property and food, including some young and beautiful women. If it was just a forced recruitment of troops, this would be excusable. In any case, it was for the emperor's order, and the Bacchus would not refuse to join the army. In addition, the current Archon of Ayrshire has changed from the kind-hearted Godric to Lord Leon and was deliberately passed down as a monster by Emperor Marius. The Bacchus around the front line are quite afraid of White Hart Castle. Of course nor will they care too much about military expansion. But this kind of forcibly arresting strong men and robbing property and women is so disgusting. Livius's bandit behavior completely angered the tribunes of each village and also angered General Creon. The general who was a plague exterminator directly called Livius a human plague and even directly led his troops to attack him. The two sides almost had a large-scale firefight, but it ended with Livius's troops voluntarily withdrawing to shield Wind Fortress. Livius did not expect that the resistance here would be so fierce, so he restrained himself a little and reluctantly returned the property of the women and villagers. But from then on, the surrounding villages and towns were determined not to provide supplies to Livius's troops, and would even expel his troops when they saw them. The farmers who were forcibly brought here also had a lot of objections to Livius. Every day, Livius would sneak away and capture people to join the army without paying military pay. Everyone would have objections. Therefore, Livius has been hiding in the Shield Wind Fortress recently and dare not show his head to avoid being shot in the dark. He just plans to wait until His Majesty the Emperor quickly allocates military funds to himself. However, after finally waiting for a month, his Majesty the Emperor did receive a response. But the response was only one sentence. Don't expand the army privately. Chapter 161 Pie in the Sky It seems that Emperor Marius knew a little about Lidius. He probably guessed after receiving Lidius's report that this guy was going to kill him first and then report him. So he directly ordered a reprimand, saying that he was not allowed to expand his army privately. But Marius probably didn't expect that Lidius would impose mandatory conscription as soon as he took office. Shield Wind Fortress is the farthest castle from the capital Siyuan city. It is indeed as high as the sky and as far away as the emperor. Livius was not a law-abiding person to begin with. And his family was an important member of the Presbyterian Church of the Bacchus Empire. He was used to being rampant in the previous territory. And his style had always been relatively unrestrained. Now that I have been sent to the border area, I still feel a little resentful. Originally, I wanted to create a fait accompli for military expansion first, and then get the military expenses. But since the response given by Emperor Marius was that he was not allowed to expand the army privately, then the emperor's intention was very clear. This was aimed at him. They had no intention of letting him capture White Deer Castle. They probably wanted to take away his military power in a year's time on the excuse of leading a strong army but doing nothing. Of course, Lidius will not sit still and wait for death. He is just arrogant and domineering. But he is not a fool. A warlord family like his knows better than anyone else the principle that you are strong only if you have soldiers in your hands. If there were no shadow infantry soldiers, he would not dare to be so arrogant in the territory. But he would not confront the emperor directly. After all, he also knew that he was hated by people. If he really wanted to be punished according to the law, he should have been hanged eight times long ago. Therefore, he will never make principled mistakes. 
such as blatant disobedience or collaborating with the enemy to rebel. Even Marshal Kairos, who was most opposed to reform, had been obeying the orders of Emperor Marius. Of course, Lydius would not disobey orders either, and he had to endure it. White Deer Castle still has to be fought, and it must be won. But the problem is that Lydius has already conscripted more than 2,000 civilians. The villages that deserve to be offended have already been offended. So we can't just let these young men go. Right? That's such a loss. So with a stroke of his pen, Lydius changed the nature of the Imperial Second Legion and turned it into a civilian regiment with a banner. This matter is reasonable and legal. Of course, a governor general has the right to requisition civilians, and the wages can be owed first and then settled later. After all, when the country encounters war, the local civilians do have the obligation to support the army. Moreover, equipping a large number of civilians with flags can disrupt the enemy's sight, which is also a normal combat behavior. The 2,000 civilian army, led by Lord Fabius, the son of Levius, began to move closer to White Deer Castle. But Levius did not let this army of civilians transport baggage or build city defenses. Instead, he asked Fabius to take these civilians to the Nolder Forest to the north of Shieldwind Fortress, which is between Shieldwind Fortress and White Deer Castle. In the area between them, large-scale logging began to build camps, because this can force White Deer Castle to send more troops. The civilian regiment he sent was under the banner of the Second Imperial Legion, although the location he sent to Logwood was in a forest about 200 miles away from White Deer Fort. It wouldn't take long for White Deer Fort to find out. There is a large army of the Bacchus Empire building a camp. In Levius's view, if the large army of more than 2,000 people is allowed to set up camp so close to White Deer Fort, White Deer Fort will definitely strengthen its armaments, so it will definitely send more troops for defense. Then Levius could use the reason that there are too many troops stationed in White Deer Castle to ask Emperor Marius to change the order or send more reinforcements. Yes, Levius was not a fool. He just wanted to increase the garrison at White Deer Castle. He wanted to use this method to make Emperor Marius change the order originally given to him. If White Deer Castle discovers that the Imperial Second Legion of more than 2,000 people is building a garrison, it will have to gather a large number of troops to take precautions no matter what. Then the order issued by Emperor Marius to capture White Deer Castle within one year would appear to be very unreasonable. In this case, Emperor Marius could either send reinforcements to Shield Wind Fortress, or ask Ledius to expand his manpower, or even directly change Ledius' mission from capture White Deer Castle to defend Shield Wind, Wind Fortress. As for whether those 2,000 civilians will be killed by the people from White Deer Castle, he doesn't care. Ledius still has many strengths such as adapting to changes. Otherwise, he would not be a governor. After sending the civilian army to start logging and building a camp, Levius began to continuously send scouts to White Deer Castle to investigate. Then he discovered that White Deer Castle had lit the beacon fire without encountering an enemy. At that time, the peasant army had just started logging and building camps. Levius thought it was because White Deer Fort had discovered his army of civilians. He was still lamenting that White Deer Fort's detection efficiency was very high as they could discover such things even from 200 miles away. Quick. In fact, it was just because after Leon was taken away by the Lion Knights, Amy lit the beacon fire directly according to Liang's instructions. There were a lot of things going on in White Deer Castle at that time. Amy was only focused on the Lord's safety in those days. She didn't send any scouts too far to the south. She didn't know anything about the civilian army 200 miles away. But Levius felt that his plan had succeeded. After all, According to common sense, after the beacon fire was lit at White Deer Castle, the army from Chang'e Town would soon come to help. So he immediately sent another 800-mile urgent message to Siyun City, the capital. This time he directly said that the military strength of White Deer Castle had increased to 2,000 men, and hoped that Emperor Marius would send him additional reinforcements. Otherwise, let alone an attack. Even defending the Shield Wind Fortress is problematic. Lidius did not directly say that he wanted to expand the army this time, because he knew that in such a situation, it would be better to recruit new troops on the spot than to dispatch reinforcements from other places. Emperor Marius would most likely agree to his new formation of the Second Army of the Empire, and would also ask other lords to obey his command. After that, he kept sending more scouts, intending to see the specific reaction of White Deer Castle. But since then, none of his scouts have come back. Of course, it's a good thing that the scouts didn't come back. Not coming back means that White Deer Castle is indeed strengthening its defense. 
Moreover, in Levy's view, the continuous dispatch of scouts can also make White Deer Castle convinced that the Bacchus Empire is about to attack. At least the beacon fire at White Deer Castle is always lit. But it didn't take long for the governor to realize something was wrong. The spy sent by the Bacchus Empire to White Deer Castle has returned. Those spies were just as men. And their original mission was to spread rumors about Leon. Although the rumors did not have a direct disruptive effect in White Deer Castle, they did get the planned result. Leon was indeed arrested by the Lion King. Then, the beacon fire was lit at White Deer Castle. But no reinforcements from the Lion Kingdom came to support. This also gave these spies a misleading belief that the rumors they spread had played a role. And there seemed to be civil strife in the Lion Kingdom. Amy then followed the Lord's instructions and brought Sir Roland to White Deer Castle to take charge of the defense. Roland is a careful person. And he has spent half his life dealing with various heretics. He is very good at finding those mysterious people who are hiding in dark corners and doing things. As a result, the spies sent by the Bacchus Empire to White Deer Castle suffered huge losses in a short period of time. So the spies had no choice but to stay silent for several days, not daring to show their faces. Naturally, they didn't know what happened during those days. And then, they discovered that Leon was back. With Liang's return, there seemed to be civil unrest in White Deer Fort. Several troops took action in the city. I don't know why. Later, the spies got the result. It was Leon who launched the rebellion in White Deer Castle. Leon really committed treason. But the rebellion launched by Leon seemed to have failed. He was expelled to White Deer Castle by Godric's daughter. The soldiers at White Deer Castle did not follow Leon in the rebellion. This kind of news naturally needs to be sent back to Bacchus in the fastest way possible. So the remaining spies returned to Bacchus as quickly as possible. And the closest one was Shieldwind Fortress. Levius was the first lord of Bacchus to get the news. However, after Levius got the news about the spy, he was in a bit of a dilemma. Because there is such civil strife in White Deer Fort. It is obviously the best opportunity to attack. Although it is not certain how much damage Liang's rebellion caused to White Deer Castle. At least this is the best opportunity that has appeared in decades. But the problem is that Levius has just returned to see you and city the news that White Deer Castle's military strength has increased to 2,000 people. Originally, this was just an exaggeration of the enemy's military strength in order to obtain more military spending and military support. But if the spies under justice spread the news of civil strife in White Deer Castle to see you in city, then the nature of the situation would change. The great opportunity to attack was described by Levius as the enemy sending more troops. This was no ordinary false military report. It could even be considered as a deliberate attempt to deceive the emperor with evil intentions. Emperor Marius would definitely be furious. After all, Bacchus was founded by General OSA through war and conquest. Everyone may understand that he takes a small amount of free money, but this kind of falsification of military intelligence is almost unforgivable. And Levius didn't know how many spies there were under justice. And spies were also sent from other places. So he couldn't kill these insiders. Then we must seize this opportunity and capture White Deer Castle first. Then the fake military report will become. This is a trick used by the enemy to deliberately frame the governor. Yes, Levius is very adaptable. But this means that it is difficult for him to cooperate with other lords. Otherwise the false military report will be untenable and difficult to explain. But currently he only has 800 soldiers in hand. And the 2,000 farmers don't even have equipment. The internal situation of White Deer Fort is unknown. And it seems not too sure to attack alone. So Levius was a little confused. However, just when Levius was struggling, he got a piece of great good news. When Reseder had arrived at Shield Wind Fortress, the place was already very tightly guarded by Levius. Levius still has many strengths, such as adapting to circumstances and protecting his own safety. In order to avoid disastrous consequences of his usual misbehavior, the governor always takes special precautions in his castle. A high-level killer like Lisa Dillon couldn't find a way to enter the city for a while. There were many soldiers guarding almost everywhere. Fortunately, the elf killer's mission this time was not to go into the city to kill people but to deliver a message. Since the Lord's request was to deliver the letter as soon as possible and there was no need to keep it too secret, Rasadalin used an unconventional method. He did not enter the city, but hid in the forest behind Shieldwind Fortress, using the protection of the trees to sneak up on Shieldwind Fortress, and then shot an arrow into the castle, in order to avoid misunderstanding. And because he could not recover the arrow, he did not use an older arrow, but an ordinary cone-headed arrow. The Nolder Elves' archery skills and range were first class. The arrow tied with a letter made a wonderful parabola 
and accurately shot into a small window in the middle of the shield wind fortress. The main reason for shooting at that window was that Lisa Dillon saw that there seemed to be someone there who had to let people see the arrow. As a result, after the arrow passed, a howl came from a distance. It seemed that there was accidental damage. But to Rosatalin, it didn't matter. The most important thing was to complete the mission quickly. Things like accidental damage were trivial, and they were all enemies anyway. Moreover, since the person was shot, the mission could definitely be completed. So Rissa Dillon turned around and ran away. The task was indeed accomplished by the arrow in the castle, which happened to be Lidius himself. Of course, his injuries were minor. Just a scratch. It's just that the position is a bit awkward. The injury is right between the legs. The Nolder elves were obviously unfamiliar with the structure of Shield Wind Fortress. Of course, only big people would live in the castle tower. The small window in the middle of the tower is only one foot long and wide. In fact, it is the vent of the toilet. It is just at the waist of the person. It is for squatting or sitting. When you get down, you can just face the window. Poor Governor Levius was going to the toilet. He had just finished using the toilet and lifted up his trousers. Unexpectedly, an arrow flew in from the window, then grazed his crotch and penetrated into the wall behind him. He was almost castrated on the spot. But fortunately, Levius did see the letter sent to him by the Lord. The content of the letter made him feel as if a big pie had fallen from the sky. And it just landed on top of his head. There was a secret letter tied to that arrow. The letter was written by Leong himself. And it looked a bit sloppy. He was probably nervous and urgent when he wrote it. The letter expressed his admiration for Lidius. And asked Lidius if he still remembered the Lord's kindness in letting him return to his country. Leong said that he had been persecuted by King Ulrich and could no longer stay in the Lion Realm. So he asked the Bacchus Empire if it would give him a chance. To this end, he could join hands with Governor Levius to capture White Deer Castle as a token of surrender to the Bacchus Empire. And hope that the General of Chang'e Town, awarded by Emperor Marius was not just a lie. In order to show his sincerity, the Lord was even willing to give the weak collar to Levius first. The most credible thing is that Leon said that he would go to the Shield Wind Fortress on July 30th to interview Levius about how to attack White Deer Castle. Lidius sighed while watching, feeling that the plan of Emperor Marius and Justice was quite powerful. I guess the letter from Emperor Marius worked? Lidius certainly knew that Emperor Marius was trying to harm Leon. And he also knew that Governor Justice had sent many spies to spread rumors. It seems that the effect of these strategies is very obvious. According to the statement in the letter, coupled with the news from the spy, Leon was probably convicted by King Ulrich and finally escaped. He originally planned to rebel and establish himself at White Deer Castle, but failed. So it is now being attacked by the army of White Deer Castle. Therefore, he wanted to cooperate with the Bacchus Empire, join forces with the Bacchus Empire to attack White Deer Castle, and send my Xiongling to the White Deer Castle. Even the reason was made very clear. The Bacchus Empire must get the my Xiongling, and Liang himself can ensure safety at White Deer Castle. Levius felt that if it was just a secret letter, it might be Leon deceiving. But if Leon really comes here in person, it will be difficult to lie. And he can catch him first. Besides, the way Leon sent people to deliver the letter was also very consistent with the situation. If it was a fake surrender, who would deliver the letter in such a way that could easily reveal secrets? One arrow shot in. So hastily. What if someone else sees it? What if it was not sent to Levius? This obviously means that Liang's current situation is very dangerous. And it is too late to send an envoy to visit and July 30th. That's tomorrow. So Lidius sent troops to set up a temporary meeting place more than 10 miles north of Shield Wind Fortress. He doesn't want Liang to enter Shield Wind Fortress just in case. What if this is still a deception? The Lord did not cheat. He only led a few dozen people to the agreed meeting place, and waved a white flag to ask to see Lidius. He looked quite embarrassed, as if he had just experienced a battle. Your Excellency Liang, I really didn't expect you to actually come. Lidius felt that a pie had indeed fallen from the sky. And this was really the time to surrender. There is nothing I can do. The Lion Kingdom is chasing me. And your Emperor Marius is not a good person. However, since I have been named General of Chang'e Town, I can't break my promise. The Lord took out the letter from Emperor Marius and threw it to Lidius. Then how do you plan to capture White Deer Castle now? How many troops does White Deer Fort still have? Of course Lidius knew the content of the letter and most of his doubts were eliminated. And he began to ask directly about the plan. There are probably three to four hundred people in White Deer Castle. 
but that's not important. As long as I lead my troops outside White Deer Fort, the troops from White Deer Fort will definitely pursue me. And then White Deer Fort will be an empty city. Governor Vias, it won't be difficult for you to make an empty city. Right? Leon shook his head and gritted his teeth as he spoke, looking like he really wanted to occupy White Deer Castle. Although this method is simple, it seems to be quite reliable based on the current situation. However, Liu still said cautiously, I don't have many troops at hand. Why don't I send people to my Xiangling to make sure there are no reinforcements in White Deer Castle? Liang nodded and agreed. Indeed, if you want to block the reinforcements from the Lion Kingdom first, you better send more troops. I will send someone to lead you. As soon as these words came out, Liu's doubted that this would really turn White Deer Castle into an isolated city. It seemed that Liang was really going to surrender to the Empire this time. Chapter 162, Taking Advantage of the Situation Your Excellency Leon, since a person like you is willing to contribute to the Empire, shouldn't he have no desires and desires? Liu's felt much more relaxed now, and asked about Liang's motive for defecting to the Empire. I just want White Deer Castle. I have put a lot of effort here. You have to send a message to Emperor Marius, and tell His Majesty, that White Deer Fort must become my territory. General Changha Town. I dare not it's an extravagant hope. But it's right for me to become the general of White Deer Castle. Li Ang's expression was quite serious, and he seemed to be a little obsessed. Li Mius can understand this obsession. Bailu Castle and Meixi Angling seem to have become quite wealthy recently, with a lot of grain farmland. Li Ang must have really put in a lot of effort. However, Li Mius in the border territory was not interested. He knew that Emperor Marius eventually planned to comprehensively reform the feudal system into a dispatch system. But the resistance to this reform was too great, and it had not yet been officially promoted. Leon can do whatever he wants, and he should still cooperate with this request. That's no problem. As long as White Deer Castle can be captured, I can guarantee that His Majesty will definitely make you the Lord of White Deer Castle. However, the way my subordinate sent the letter before was a bit sudden. Almost shot me to death. Lidius was still frightened by the arrow that flew past his crotch. Isn't that anxious? I have openly rebelled and I don't care if I will be exposed. If I send an envoy to visit normally, I may waste the opportunity. The Lord heard that Lisa Dillon reported on his method of delivering messages. In fact, he admired the elf killer for doing this, which just reflected the authenticity from the side. It doesn't matter if this matter is leaked. Anyway, there have been a lot of rumors saying that he is a traitor recently, spread by the Bacchus Empire itself, but he didn't expect to almost shoot Lidius to death. There will be troops coming from Changa Town soon. So you have to hurry up. I also have some people ambushed in White Deer Fort. Once your troops get close to White Deer Fort, they will take action to help you open the city gate. But White Deer Castle is definitely stepping up its investigation. I'm worried that my people will be discovered at any time. Lord Governor, we have to speed up. The Lord is indeed ready to defect to the Bacchus Empire. So Lenius must seize such a good opportunity. Since he could not waste time to avoid the support of the Lion Kingdom's army in Meixi Angling and White Deer Fort, the governor made up his mind on the spot, and the soldiers of Shield Wind Fort came out in full force and began to march north. However, due to some minor injuries in some parts, Lidius himself did not move with the army for too long. The friction on the crotch area made it really difficult to hold on, and it was difficult to endure walking and riding a horse. So when he led his troops to the previous location of the Imperial Second Army, he had to stop and rest. He planned to hand over the Shadow Infantry to the leadership of his son Fabius and stay in that camp to wait for the results. Leong had just come from White Deer Castle. Of course he knew that there was such a civilian army. It was only after discovering this, Legion, that he decided on the plan to surrender. In fact, the first person to detect this civilian husband group was Sir Roland. Roland has been leading the cavalry to clean up the scouts. He chased them farther a few days ago, and discovered the civilian regiment. At that time, when he saw that large army under the banner of the 2nd Imperial Army, he thought it was the Bacchus Empire that was launching a massive attack. But after getting close to investigate, Roland easily judged that it was not an army. Not only did this legion have no equipment and no baggage, but they were all listless and looked like a group of prisoners. If it were anyone else, he might not be able to make a judgment as easily as Roland. On the one hand, there are not many warriors, like Roland, who can face the big army and dare to get close to investigate. On the other hand, Sir Roland had just personally organized the migration of a large number of people a few days ago. Now, 
it is really easy for him to distinguish the difference between the army and the civilians. After making his judgment, the paladin immediately returned to White Deer Castle. He happened to meet the lord who came back and was discussing with Amy how to deal with the Bacchus Empire. Therefore, the lord asked Amy to lead Godric's guards and have an internal strife with the troops he led in White Deer Castle. The beating was so fierce that the shouts of killing were loud. As the battle started, many troops came from the direction of Makes Angling and entered White Deer Castle to participate in the battle. It looked like a civil war between two camps. As a result, many people who did not know the truth fled White Deer Castle. Then, Li Ang's troops were expelled from White Deer Castle in embarrassment, and then asked Lisa Dillon to bring the letter to Levius and to investigate the situation of Shield Wind Fort. Leon knew very well that the secret agents of the Bacchus Empire would definitely report back these circumstances, and the news brought back by their own people would naturally make the surrender appear to be quite reliable. The Lord's plan was to lead Levius troops to the direction of Makes Angling to block the western intersection, to show that his surrender was indeed true and credible, and even the retreat of White Deer Castle was cut off. Then he put on a show under the city of White Deer Castle, asking Amy to lead a large number of troops to pursue him south and then wait for Levius's troops to attack the empty city of White Deer Castle. Of course, White Deer Castle will not be an empty city. The bodyguards from Chang'e Town and the Owl Knights have already settled in. They will guard White Deer Castle under the leadership of Sir Roland, and Amy will take advantage of the opportunity of Levius's entire army to complete the most important task and lead the troops to destroy the Shield Wind Fortress, which has truly become an empty city. Yes, burning this fortress is okay. There is no need to occupy it, because there will be no reinforcements for a while. And if it is occupied, it is likely that it will not be able to hold it. Once Shield Wind Fortress is destroyed, it will be very difficult for the Bacchus Empire to attack White Deer Castle in the future. Without this outpost, supplies will not be able to keep up. Levius's troops attacking White Deer Castle will also lose all their backup. And Leong himself will launch a surprise attack at this time, leaving Levius with no way out. After Amy burns down the Shield Wind Fortress, she can lead her troops back to White Deer Castle. In this way, Levius's troops attacking White Deer Fort will most likely be wiped out. This is actually a plan based on offense and defense. It not only intends to eliminate the enemy's effective forces, but also intends to uproot the Shield Wind Fortress so that White Deer Castle will have no worries for a long time and can farm with peace of mind. And this false surrender plan is not too complicated. It is just following the plan of Emperor Marius in order to prevent the excessive number of enemies from causing excessive pressure on White Deer Castle, or to quickly retreat to Shield Wind Fortress after discovering something is wrong, causing Amy to be in danger. Leon will lead his troops to expel the 2,000 civilians to the direction of White Deer Castle, and vice versa. It became an obstacle preventing Levius' troops from retreating to Shield Wind Fortress. There is actually nothing dangerous about this plan. The only risk lies in whether Leon can be trusted when he goes to see Levius. Of course, Based on what happened before, the Lord felt that Levius would be able to take the bait smoothly. He planned to capture the governor and the common men of the Bacchus Empire again, and then extort a large sum of money to pay the 100,000 dinars demanded by King Ulrich. Yes, the Lord wants to use a plan to solve all the issues facing White Deer Castle. The Bacchus Empire was the first to cause the matter. Without Emperor Marius's plan, the Lord would not have been blackmailed by King Ulrich. Of course, it is only fair that the Bacchus Empire would have to pay. But now there was a little accident. Due to the unexpected impact of the small wound between Levius' legs, Levius actually planned to stay in that camp. Moreover, for his own safety, he actually left hundreds of Shadow Infantry soldiers in the camp, and only asked Fabius to dispatch more than 700 Shadow Infantry soldiers. This is likely to affect the Lord's plan. Leon also wants to lure Amy's troops south. The soldiers Levius left in the camp will be in the way. Moreover, if Levius cannot be caught in this operation, it will be very boring. Mr. Governor, you still have so many troops here. Why don't you act together? Leon was in that camp, pointing to the banner of the Second Legion. They are not suitable for fighting now. They are not needed for siege. Levius shook his head. Although he was not a good person, he was not bad enough to let civilians be used as cannon fodder for sieges. The Dexia people sometimes coerce civilians from hostile countries to use them as cannon fodder to attack cities and consume the supplies of the defenders. However, this kind of fighting method is quite bad and will be considered as an evil act against humanity. 
the Bacchus Empire regards itself as a civilized country and will not do such a thing. Besides, even the Dexia people would not be able to use the civilians of their own country to do such a thing. But the snake worshippers would do this. These civilians are already very resentful and are not willing to cooperate with things like building camps. Let them attack White Deer Castle. I'm afraid they'll be able to escape in a matter of minutes. And they might even rebel. Lord Governor, although I can see that they cannot participate in the siege, they can at least defend the city. I can ensure that White Deer Castle becomes an empty city. But after the White Deer Fort is captured, the Lion Kingdom will definitely send a large army to pursue it. Suppression. The civilians of White Deer Castle are very loyal to Godric. After we capture White Deer Fort, the civilians of White Deer Fort will not help us defend the city. They may even attack us. I was attacked by civilians before. We can capture White Deer Castle. If the Empire's reinforcements arrive slowly, we might not be able to hold White Deer Castle after we capture it. Leong seemed to be thinking about Lidius very much. But if you bring this legion, at least it seems that there will be more than 2,000 people defending the city. The Lion Kingdom will definitely not dare to counterattack for a while. And you will have enough time to fully defend the city. Make arrangements and call in reinforcements. This is indeed a reasonable approach. And Lidius also thinks it makes sense. However, both the siege force and the civilian army must be led by someone. If the governor and his son are not in a team, once the siege starts, then if there is no one to suppress and control these civilians, I am afraid that bad things will happen. So Levi suppressed the pain in his crotch and personally took everyone with him to march north. In fact, if Levi could pay more attention to these lower class people, he would find that these civilians became very active after knowing that Leon was ready to surrender. The Bacchus Empire touted Leong as the most terrifying general. A man with three heads, six arms, and a mouth that breathed fire and could eat eight children in one meal. Now that this terrible general seems to have become one of our own, these civilians naturally feel at ease. They even have a strange sense of identification with Leong. This is the bad name given to Leong by the Bacchus Empire itself. But if this kind of bad reputation is one of their own, it means a very high sense of security. So these civilians were actually more willing to listen to Leong. But Levius didn't notice it. When they arrived dozens of miles away from White Deer Castle, the Lord asked Levius to station the civilians at the edge of the forest. I'm going to lure the enemy later. And I can't let White Deer Castle see your army. You first have the combat troops move in the direction of Meg's angling. And Sarah will be responsible for leading the way to avoid White Deer Castle's detection. Let them move in White Deer Castle waiting at the intersection leading to Meg's angling from the fort. I will launch an attack as soon as I lure the troops from White Deer Fort. These civilians cannot participate in the siege and can only stay here first. If I see thick yellow smoke from White Deer Fort when it rises, it means that White Deer Castle has been captured and you can lead the civilians into the city. The Lord took out the map and began to explain. The goal of a large force of several thousand people was too big. In order to avoid being discovered by White Deer Fort when luring the enemy, the White Deer Fort troops did not leave the city. So this arrangement was reliable. Levius nodded and asked Fabius to take the shadow infantry and follow Sarah to the northwest. As for the horse, he had ridden for two days with an injury. He could no longer walk smoothly. So he stayed in the civilian army and waited for Leong to successfully lure the enemy. Levius felt that there was nothing wrong with Leon's style and plan. The 800 shadow infantry soldiers guarding between Meg's Yangling and White Deer Castle were enough to ensure that there would be neither reinforcements nor reinforcements in the Lion Kingdom ambush. Besides, if Leon wanted to ambush him, why would he specifically let himself bring more troops? After Leon draws out the troops from White Deer Fort, lets Fabius take the shadow infantry to capture the empty city, and then leads the civilians into White Deer Fort, it will basically be considered very safe, and it should not last for several months. Question. This battle will probably make his son famous all over the world. Right? Levius thought happily. Being able to lead the troops to capture the unfallen White Deer Castle at the age of 22, Thavius would probably become a famous general in the Empire. Emperor Marius has always been willing to promote young people and will definitely pay attention to and support him. So even if he loses power, Thavius will definitely become the leader of the Shadow Infantry. Levius felt that his position was obviously guaranteed. Even if Emperor Marius did not like him, at least he would not deprive a young man with great military exploits from commanding the Legion. Fabius also felt that his own era seemed to have come. With such a good opportunity, he was almost destined to become a famous general in the empire. This is a fortified city that has not been conquered for hundreds of years. Half a year ago, 
the White Deer Fort, which two governors and an army of 6,000 men failed to conquer, seemed to be easily conquered by me. Being able to capture White Deer Castle means that the Lion Kingdom has lost its largest barrier in the east. The Empire's army will easily march straight in, and at least it can swallow up all the areas east of Chang'e Town. If you get such credit at such a young age, you are destined to have an extremely bright future. Soon, the Lord led an army of about a hundred people to the gates of White Deer Castle. The excited Lord Fabius personally led the team to watch the movements of White Deer Castle at the intersection. And White Deer Fort did send a team of about 400 people to start chasing. This was almost all the troops in White Deer Fort. The two sides chased and fled gradually towards the south. Subsequently, Fabius led more than 700 Shadow Infantry soldiers and began to quickly attack White Deer Castle. White Deer Castle seemed almost defenseless. And there seemed to be sounds of fighting and killing in the city. It seemed that Leon did leave manpower in the city. As Fabius and his troops gradually approached, the gate of White Deer Castle suddenly opened wide, and someone was waving to him at the door. The people Leon left in the city did succeed. Fabius was overjoyed and led his troops to charge quickly. More than 700 Shadow Infantry soldiers swarmed forward and rushed into White Deer Castle. At this moment, the heavy city gate gate fell down. White Deer Castle is built on a mountain and has no moat. The city gate uses a gate, which is a solid wood gate inlaid with iron sheets that is hoisted with a huge winch to open the door. It would take several strong men to push the big winch on the city gate, even if it was a pulley block that could save effort. This gate is thick and heavy, weighing thousands of pounds. It is hung by several thick ropes and chains. When it is hoisted, a large latch half a foot thick is used to catch the winch. When you want to close the door, you only need to use a sledgehammer to knock the latch away from the winch, and the door will fall freely due to gravity and fall into the huge door frame. There is also a row of half-foot-thick holes in the door frame to prevent water accumulation. Also to allow the incisors at the bottom of the gate to embed into the ground, making the gate stronger and difficult to open. This kind of gate closes very quickly. But now, when Fabius had just entered the city with half of his troops, the gate was in free fall. Fabius and about 300 people were imprisoned in the city, while 400 shadow infantry soldiers remained outside the city and did not enter the city. Under the huge gate, there were two shadow infantry soldiers who had been killed by the gate. They had basically been cut in half. The incisors at the bottom of the gate were sharp teeth made of giant wood wrapped in iron sheets. This is the norm for gates in this era. The young Fabius stopped abruptly and looked around in panic. His shadow infantry stopped charging. And they were all at a loss. The air was suddenly quiet. They were located in the doorway and a small open space without cover inside the city gate. And inside the city, there were a large number of archers and crossbowmen standing on the surrounding heights. Then, a volley of arrows was fired, and the arrows quickly covered their eyes. At the same time, the Lord Lord and Amy's troops have arrived dozens of miles south of White Deer Castle. Nearby is the location of the civilian army where Levius is located. Chapter 163 The Reputation of the Monster General Levius did see with his own eyes the troops carrying the three lions flag chasing Leon's troops. Out of some evil thoughts, Levius had no intention of helping Leon to rescue him. He actually preferred to see Leon killed by the chasing force. But when he was about to watch the show, he saw the troops holding the three lions flag turning away from pursuing him. Probably because they saw his civilian army. Levius was so excited that he quickly asked his subordinates to raise the banner of the Second Imperial Legion. Then the White Deer Ford troop of about 400 people stopped. It seems that they were frightened. And Liang's small force went in a circle. Quickly came to the Imperial Second Army entered Levius's array and began to confront the troops of White Deer Castle. Levius was a little regretful that Leon did not die here. Then he saw thick yellow smoke over White Deer Castle. It seemed that Fabius had succeeded and White Deer Fort had been captured. Levius felt excited and then led the civilian army to slowly advance towards White Deer Castle. But then, his smile froze on his face because the troops from White Deer Castle began to march towards him. Does this mean that the 2,000 people on your side have little fighting power? Yes. It is indeed easy to see from a close distance. Fortunately, there are about a 100 shadow infantry soldiers beside him. And Leon also has about a 100 people under his command. If both sides work together, they should be able to withstand it for a while. It won't be long before Fabius will send troops to respond. This place is only a few dozen miles away from White Deer Castle. Levius thought. He didn't worry too much but asked his men around him to form a defensive formation. Leon also seemed to be very cooperative 
and dispersed his troops into Leviusa's lineup to assist in defense. It seemed to be making up for the shortcomings of the Shadow Infantry single unit being easily targeted. The current terrain is mountainous, which is very suitable for defense. 200 people can defend it for a long time as long as there is no chaos. As long as we can control those civilians from causing chaos. Levius had a lot of experience in fighting. And he didn't panic at all. He also deliberately asked the civilians to retreat and not participate in the battle. So as not to disrupt their position. The peasants were actually not in any disorder at all. Leon was actively cooperating with Levius and commanding the peasants to retreat. It can even be said that Leon was directing the civilians to retreat. As long as you obey, no one will die. But if anyone dares to run away, I will kill everyone. The Lord held a makeshift loudspeaker made of rolled leather and shouted, Since Baron Leon, the monster general, who was so praised in Bacchus's country, is currently on his side. The people are not only not afraid, but they are also looking forward to how powerful this monster general will be on the battlefield. So in an orderly manner, he followed Liang's command and left the team of combatants to watch the battle from behind. But a minute later, Levius and the civilian husbands collapsed at basically the same time. Because, just when Leon completed the defense deployment and came to Levius, Leon was about to talk to him. And Leon suddenly attacked him, whether it was Levius himself or his men. No one expected that Leon would make a surprise attack at this time. And as the Lord said, take action, Leon deliberately scattered the helping defense personnel in Levius' lineup and all raised their swords to slash at the most convenient shadow infantry soldiers beside them. Half of the hundreds of shadow infantrymen under Levius were killed or injured almost instantly. The troops from White Deer Fort also rushed into the chaotic battlefield at this time. Before the 2,000 civilians could turn around and run for their lives, they heard Liang's voice calling again. Everyone stop! I just said, as long as you listen to me, no one will die. But if anyone dares to run, I will kill everyone. You can't outrun the cavalry. The Lord is still holding the piece of leather rolled into a trumpet. Only then did the villagers realize what they meant by what they just shouted. But now no one really dares to run away. This notorious monster general is said to be the number one swordsman in the mainland. He can kill anyone he wants to kill. Isn't it true that a big figure like Lidius, a governor-level figure, was easily tied up by him? Lidius was indeed a smart man. Quite good at adapting to circumstances. He knew that he was no match for Leon. So he surrendered again and became a prisoner, with basically no resistance. And these 2,000 civilians were also coerced by Leon to go to White Deer Castle. Only Leon can control these civilians with a small number of people. The reputation of the monster general is actually very useful. Amy continued south with a force of 400 people to carry out her real mission. All of Liang's strategies were indeed successful. Amy arrived at Shield Wind Fortress smoothly, and put the castle into flames without much effort. In fact, Amy's mission is the most important. Everything is for Amy to set this fire smoothly. Others, including Leong, are just a part of the process. In order to ensure success, the Lord also asked Amy to bring enough manpower to avoid accidents. However, due to the Lord's acting skills and some coincidences, Levius did not leave any manpower at Shieldwind Fortress. Amy succeeded easily in Shieldwind Fortress, without encountering any decent obstacles. There are less than 30 people in Shieldwind Fortress. All of them servants of Levius. The governor had just taken office not long ago. And he didn't plan to live in this border fortress for a long time. So he didn't bring any of his family members with him. When these servants saw Amy's troops approaching, they raised the white flag in the city and surrendered. Amy didn't even have time to verify her musketry skills. And the city gate was already opened. When Amy returned to the army, she said, that the mission was too simple, and she had no chance to perform. But in fact, having no opportunity to perform is the best situation. The Lord now feels that many things will suddenly become easy as long as Amy is present. The last time she went to the Bacchus Empire to help the people of Menheim solve the famine problem. Amy seemed to be protected by a goddess. She easily obtained corn and potatoes, and even abducted an agricultural and water conservancy expert. Thinking about Amy's musket skills, the accuracy of muskets these days really depends on character. The barrel has no rifling, and the charge is not fixed. The trajectory of the spherical lead after being ejected from the chamber sometimes forms an S-shape. But Amy was surprised to be able to hit accurately, and said she relied on feeling. If there is such an attribute as lucky value, Amy should be at full value. Right? Another guy with a very high luck value is probably Fabius. When he entered White Deer Castle, 
he stood at the front and faced countless arrows and crossbow bolts. But miraculously, he was not shot to death on the spot. You must know that the more than 300 shadow infantry soldiers who followed him into the city were basically wiped out in White Deer Castle. After several rounds of arrows, less than 100 people surrendered alive. Of course, Thavius was still seriously wounded and his whole body was pricked like a hedgehog. But he was lucky that no arrow hit his vitals. The 400 people outside the city originally planned to retreat. But they encountered Leon who forced 2,000 civilians to intercept them. Behind him, Sir Roland from White Deer Castle came out with his troops to pursue them. And encountered a flanking attack from two sides. Coupled with the outstanding scouting ability of the Owl Knights. These 400 people were unable to escape and were unable to fight. After losing about a hundred people, Leon asked Levius to come forward and order them to surrender. With Amy's smooth return to the army, White Deer Castle will no longer have to face the threat of the Bacchus Empire for a long time. The only problem is that the prison is not enough. The original prison was converted into a cellar to store potatoes. It is not easy to accommodate more than 400 shadow infantry prisoners. Fortunately, Liang's prestige was quite effective. And the 2,000 civilians were quite obedient. The Lord even allowed them to do some work, such as building a temporary prison. After cleaning the battlefield, the Lord released several injured shadow infantry soldiers and asked them to return to the Bacchus Empire with a letter written by Levius to demand ransom. This time, the ransom he demanded was relatively high. The wholesale price is 150,000 dinars. Who allowed so many prisoners to be taken this time? This is a 30% discount, which can be called a bargain price. Moreover, Payment is only valid within one month. No waiting after the expiration date. The retail price is 500 dinars for a shadow infantry soldier. A total of more than 400. Fabius priced it at 5,000 dinars. Levius. I'm sorry that the governor is the last to sell. In other words, the governor will have to stay in prison until the others are ransomed. The Lord's business has always been voluntary. So Governor Levius voluntarily wrote a letter and asked the shadow infantry soldier to quickly bring it back to his family to raise money. As for the 2,000 civilians, after the Lord knew that they were forcibly conquered by Levius, he had no plans to release them for the time being. He planned to try to see if he could influence them. These civilian husbands are all descendants of the Pande Aboriginal people. They don't even have land in the Bacchus Empire. They are all tenant farmers who Levius would not dare to forcibly conquer the Bacchus nation. The Lord felt that as long as he gave these people a little land, he might be able to have 2,000 more young people under his rule. And he might even be able to let them bring their families over. So, he asked Sir Roland to take these peasants to make the angling and let him try to persuade these peasants to become his subjects. The reason why Sir Roland was asked to come forward was mainly because the current image of the Lord himself in the eyes of the common people was at the level of demon and monster. And he probably did not have enough affinity. Besides, Leong actually thinks this image is good and may be useful in the future so he doesn't plan to change the character for the time being. Emperor Marius may not have expected that after he exaggerated the Lord into a monster-like and terrifying general. The people of the Bacchus Empire actually developed a strange sense of trust in Leon, since the monster of the Lion Kingdom is so powerful and no one is his opponent. Even the governor was easily captured by him. Would it be safer to join him? Yes. The psychology of ordinary people is so simple. After all, life in the Bacchus Empire seems not to be very good. The governor general of the empire usually either arrests young men or collects taxes, and his life is not easy all year round. On the contrary, the so-called Ayrshire devil was willing to let them farm and also provided rations and seeds. In addition, Sir Roland and a group of old people from Aishyongling showed up to speak out. After learning that this terrible lord never harassed civilians, many civilians were indeed a little tempted. Within a few days, the Lord also asked Roland to erect two other goddess statues in the wheat field. The statue of the goddess of justice was placed next to the goddess of order. And the harvest goddess Demaya was placed in a small area surrounded by wheat fields. In the open space. These three goddesses each represent several different beautiful values created by human beings. It is okay for the people to become believers in any of them. In fact, in Liang's view, the best way to prevent his territory from being controlled by religion is to introduce a variety of gods as long as the doctrines are good and lawful. When a place only worships a single god, it will inevitably produce fanatics, such as the Knights of the Dawn. And there will inevitably be organizations that seek personal gain in the name of religion, because this is a monopoly, and it is also a monopoly on worldview and ideology. This is more terrifying than a monopoly market. 
but in the case of multiple gods. Even if religious organizations will be formed, competition between organizations will continue. As long as no one can completely occupy the market, it will be fine. Before completely occupying the market, everyone will just try their best to use various methods. Benefits attract customers. Of course, having said that, the Lord placed the statues of the goddess of justice and the goddess of harvest mainly because there are already many beliefs in the territory. The statue of Demaya actually played a big role. After the statue was completed, some people tried to find Sir Roland. They were willing to stay here and farm, but they hoped that Sir Roland would agree to let the other people who were unwilling to stay. People go back to Bacchus so their families can move here. Roland didn't know how to deal with it at the time. Of course, he wanted to meet the demands of these people but he also knows that many Bacchus people will not come back if they go back. These people are currently considered prisoners, and it depends on Liang's opinion whether they should be released or not. But what Sir Roland didn't expect was that the Lord actually agreed to this request, and also asked Roland to distribute some food as payment for the peasants who plan to go back. In other words, those who are willing to go back to Bacchus can go back and send a message to the families of those who stayed in Makes Angling, asking their families to move here in order to maintain his character. The Lord also added a threat that he could go back if he wanted. But if he caught you next time, he would have to kill them all. As a result, only one third of the people finally decided to return to Bacchus due to the reputation of the monster general. More than 1,300 people stayed in Makes Angling. Nearly 700 civilians were released and returned home. They traveled together without any danger, and soon passed by the camp where Lidius had asked them to cut wood and build it. It's just that these people didn't know that they had just passed the danger. Not long after they passed the camp, a team appeared in the forest next to them. It was a group of Nolder Elves. Your Highness Islandel, why don't you let us attack? Many humans in the north have entered the forest, including the nasty Ebony Gauntlet Knights. And these people in the south have built a camp here. This is obviously it is humans who are going to launch a full-scale attack on us. A Nolder dressed almost the same as Resaderin said to another tall Nolder Elf. The tall Nolder Elf looked extremely heroic. Of course, Every Nolder looked handsome, but this one looked more elegant. In other words, there is a kind of nobility. His whole body was dressed very gorgeously, and his armor was covered with all kinds of mysterious patterns. The arm armor and boots are also silver rune equipment. He wears a special scimitar on his waist, and carries a bow and laid with gems on his back. The gems are still shining faintly, like a living thing, generally. Standing next to him were several Nolder knights in silver white equipment, who looked very extraordinary. The plate armor on his body looks ancient and mysterious. And the shield, sword, bow and other weapons seem to be better than Rasadalans. But they look more lethal. These are the Knights of Twilight, the eldest of the Nolder nobles, and the leaders of the Nolder elves' armies. Powerful knights like them would appear behind others as followers. So the leader would naturally be the great lord of the Nolder elves. Perhaps humans are indeed going to attack in a big way dot, but those people who just passed by seem to be just farmers. We should not attack a group of unarmed people, even if they are our enemies. The Nolder lord known as Islandil squinted his eyes slightly and spoke a little indifferently, probably thinking about something. Your Highness, we should warn these ignorant humans, a Twilight Knight said. If you want to warn humanity, you can't kill civilians. Did Aldarian go north? Islandil shook his head and asked. Lord Aldarian said he wanted to kill those stupid ebony gauntlets. He organized a large army to clear out the humans who entered the forest from the north. The Twilight Knight nodded. Since he is gone, we don't have to worry about anything. The Ebony Gauntlet Knights should indeed learn a lesson. But I would like to find a human lord to ask. Why do humans suddenly attack in large numbers? Islandil does not seem to be as arrogant as other Noldor. And he is probably the most affable among the Noldor. Humph. What else are humans for? For their own selfish desires. They will do anything. A Nolder shook his head with disdain. But this time it looks different. Humans have assembled an army of more than 3,000 people between White Deer Castle and Brave Shield Castle. They haven't done this for 300 years. There must be a reason for this. I the crux must be found. If we cannot coexist peacefully with humans and continue fighting like this, we will eventually become weaker and weaker. We have lost too many people over the years. Islandel sighed. There are tens of millions of humans. But our clan members are less than 10,000. We cannot afford to die. All the Twilight Knights fell silent. After a long time, a Twilight Knight spoke. Your Highness, do you still remember the Resaderin who was exiled by you? Chapter 164 New Crisis Islandil frowned. 
Are you talking about the boy who ignored the law and allowed his tribe to die in a duel? Of course, I remember him. I met Rasadalan behind White Deer Castle half a year ago. He seemed to be fighting for a human lord. He was the one blowing the horn in the forest. Twilight Knight said hesitantly. He is fighting for the human lord? It seems that he has the trust of that human lord. Are you planning to ask his lord through Rasadalan to find out why humans invade our forest in large numbers? Alindal's mind is obviously very sharp. Yes, your highness. He may be the only nolder trusted by human lords. But I can also understand your pain of losing a loved one. The Twilight Knight hesitated a little as he spoke. It was Islandil's nephew that Sadilon killed in the duel. To be honest, if it had been the violent Lord Eldarion of the Inner family, Rasadilon would have been cut into pieces long ago. Islandil only exiled him, which was already very merciful. Oh, then let's try. Let's try. We can't go to full-scale war with humans. Things will eventually be resolved. After sighing deeply, Islandil nodded in agreement. Your Highness, what should we do with this camp? The Noldo who spoke first asked hesitantly. You lead a patrol to monitor this place. As long as no one enters this camp, you don't need to worry about it. But if there are humans who dare to settle here, dot, then destroy them. After Islandil finished his instructions, he led the Twilight Knights into the depths of the forest. Today's makes the angling is no longer the same as before. In the eyes of many people, my Xiongling is now considered a part of Bailu Castle. Most people in Chungha town already refer to my Xiongling as my Xiong Collar of Bailu Fort, because most of them know that Lord Liang has been stationed in White Deer Castle regularly. Today, this territory surrounded by wheat fields is completely connected to White Deer Castle. Due to the existence of Chongha Express Transport, whether you travel by water or land from Chongha Town, you can quickly reach Mexiangling. The transfer of goods is very convenient. So all trade activities between Bailubo and Chongha Town have gradually been transferred to Mexiangling. Leading Market Mexiangling became the trading center for the entire Ayrshire. The market area originally planned by the Lord has now become a comprehensive wholesale market. This caused more and more people in White Deer Castle to devote themselves to business activities. The exchanges of people between my Xiongling and White Deer Castle have become very frequent, especially the merchants of White Deer Castle and the logistics attendants of the knights. Now there are hundreds of people traveling between the two places almost every day. They will go to the Makes the Angling Wholesale Market to purchase goods and then go to various villages in Bailubo for retail. They will also buy some local products or handicrafts from the villages and go to the comprehensive market and make the angling to sell to merchants in Chang'e Town. Many farmers in Bailubo also open new shops or engaged in handicraft production and switch to business. The increase in the industrial and commercial population is actually a good phenomenon in this era. This will cause the area to develop rapidly and continue to attract foreign people to move in. Although there are only 10,000 people in Bailubo County, there are now about 2,000 people engaged in industry, commerce, or the tertiary industry. This ratio is actually very suitable for urban development. This is entirely a behavioral change brought about by convenient transportation. In the past, transportation was inconvenient and there was no chance to do business. But it is different now. The road between Makes Angling and White Deer Castle has become quite good. The farmers who were divided into production groups by Leong had their farms scattered on both sides of the road between Bailubo and Makes Angling. When nothing happened, they would consciously maintain the roads and ensure road safety. This was not a request from the Lord. It was considered a spontaneous act. Of course, the people in the territory were not so noble originally, but when they discovered that there was a free bus in the territory, they did consciously start to repair the roads. Since the Lord returned from the Bacchus Empire two months ago, in early June, a dedicated bus line has been opened between Makesy Angling and Bailu Castle. That is, the box carriage made by the Lord. But the vans in the territory are completely different from the one sold to Kairos. These buses are quite crude and extremely simple in style. There is no decoration except for the huge griffin emblem on the carriage. Compared with the freight car, the wheelbase was only deliberately enlarged. A rainproof roof was added. A few benches were added to the carriage. And two draft horses were used to pull the carriage. If the road is smooth, a dozen people can fit into a carriage. This kind of carriage only takes half a day to reach this hundred miles. Taking into account the time for the horses to fully rest in the middle. It is more than enough for each carriage to run back and forth every day. So the Lord arranged for more than 20 vehicles. This ensures that no matter whether you go back or forth, you can meet one every half hour. The residents of Meksiangling and Bailubo don't have to rush to work during the morning rush hour. 
On average, one carriage passes by every half hour, which is enough. This is the first batch of public transportation that appeared in Pender Continent. The fare is very cheap. From Mexiangling Square to the foot of White Deer Castle, a distance of nearly a hundred miles, the fare for each person only costs five large copper coins. That is 50 fills, equivalent to one twentieth of a dinar. The currency of Pender is roughly one dinar equals ten dirham equals one thousand fills. One dinar can buy nearly a hundred pounds of wheat at the market price. Of course, this refers to unprocessed grain. If it is processed into flour or made into finished products such as bread, the price will be different. 50 fills is roughly equivalent to the price of 5 pounds of wheat or 2 pounds of bread. The reason for this pricing is mainly due to the fact that people in this era have a habit of traveling hundreds of miles. Whether it is a business trip or a night's retinue going out to do errands, most of them will be accompanied by two people. A merchant would bring a mercenary or a hired worker. And a retinue would usually bring an apprentice. Because in a place with a vast land, and sparsely populated areas. Difficulties would inevitably be encountered on the road. And there always had to be someone to take care of them. Therefore, the fare for two people was exactly one dilhan silver coin. In this day and age, the fare is quite cheap. You must know that in other parts of the Pender continent, if you hire a carriage to travel a hundred miles, the cost will be settled in dinars at least. And the road is full of dangers. But don't think that the price is not profitable. It seems that the carriage can only carry a dozen people in one trip. But it goes up and down in the middle. In fact, there will be at least 20 or 30 passengers paying for one trip. One trip and two trips are about there can be dozens of people, which allows an income of more than two dinars per car per day. Taking into account the wages of the grooms and the consumption of the draft horses, each vehicle can net at least one dinar for the Chonghai Express every day. It may seem like a small amount, but a dozen or so cars can generate a net income of 700 to 800 dinars a month, which is almost tens of thousands of dinars a year, which is really a lot. You must know that this is only the first route. The total cost of investment is actually dozens of draft horses. The cost is only about 10,000 dinars, but the annual net profit can reach 10,000 dinars. Moreover, running 200 miles a day on the road at a leisurely pace, with a few hours of rest in between, does not cause much wear and tear on the draft horse. Of course, it's not that profitable right now. The current cheap ticket price is currently only for outsiders, such as vendors from White Deer Castle and logistics personnel from the Knights. Because residents of Makes Angling ride for free, they have monthly passes. The monthly ticket was originally created by the Lord to mobilize his subjects to build roads. It was actually a piece of parchment stamped with a heraldry mark, with a month marked on it. The first batch of monthly passes are actually given free of charge. The Lord issued a monthly pass to every citizen living near the road, and also issued one to each soldier, including some soldiers from White Deer Castle, mainly for Amy's guards. On the one hand, the residents don't have much money at the moment, so they have to provide some convenience so that they can boost the bus business. On the other hand, this allows the residents to consciously maintain the roads while also making it easier for soldiers to take vehicles at any time during patrols. Since this is a horse-drawn carriage, it is not that convenient to stop at the wave of your hand. If the road conditions are not good, the driver will not stop. If the load of the horse-drawn carriage is too heavy, it will be difficult to start and brake. You may need to give way when encountering an uphill slope. Passengers go down and give it a push. And when two cars meet, it will be really difficult if the road surface is not wide enough. Besides, these carriages were quite crudely made, and they were not comfortable to sit on. A slight hole in the ground would cause pain in the buttocks, because the Lord has not had time to get the shock-absorbing steel plates and springs. Therefore, the citizens who have monthly tickets in their hands are of course willing to build better roads, as a result of more than a thousand people voluntarily taking action. In just over a month, this road was built into the highest quality expressway in Penn Continent, which is five meters wide. Some smarter citizens even deliberately filled the flat land on the roadside with flat stone slabs to serve as a bus stop to ensure that the carriage would stop at the door of their farm. It is now the end of July, and this bus line has been running for nearly two months from the beginning of June to now. The second batch of free monthly passes in the hands of the residents is about to expire, and the buses are already running normally and are familiar and accepted by the people throughout Ayrshire, especially small traders and logistics personnel of various nights who need to travel frequently between the two places are quite satisfied with this cheap means of transportation. Originally, they couldn't travel between places frequently unless they bought their own horses. 
but the one-time investment cost is too high. And raising horses also costs money. The emergence of buses can actually reduce their overall travel costs. Although they need to pay a small fare, they can improve travel efficiency, which in turn allows them to save or earn more money. Because there are no middlemen to make their difference. Buses can bring the travel capabilities of ordinary civilians and wealthy businessmen to the same starting line. This essentially equalizes the information gap. Everyone can go to the wholesale market of makes angling frequently. And the number of small retail vendors will naturally increase. And those who have the skills to engage in handicrafts will have more sales opportunities for the objects they make. This also makes the prices of various commodities gradually become stable. Large merchants can no longer use the information gap between regions to control the prices of goods. The wholesale price and retail price will always remain within a reasonable range. And of course small traders will be able to maintain their long-term stability. Engaged in retail business. This can actually greatly boost the economy of the entire Ayrshire. In fact, people are gradually starting to move to Ayrshire. This is the greatest significance of convenient transportation. In fact, many small vendors and people in Bailubo are very greedy for things like monthly passes. And there are even reselling behaviors. Many residents in Makesi Angling really have no travel needs. Besides, they can share a monthly pass with the whole family. After the Lord learned about this, he was even a little confused. It seems that the behavior of the whole family using the same old age card happens in every world. Therefore, the Lord decided not to give away monthly tickets for free in August. The road has been well repaired. The people's freshness has passed. And the main group of people traveling have become traders and civilians in White Deer Castle. It would be a bit of a loss to issue monthly passes for free. The dedicated bus line must make a profit after all. So Leong set a standard price for the monthly passes. Nine dirks each. The reason why the convenient price of one dinar is not used is because less than one dinar sounds cheaper. And the Lord is deliberately collecting Dilhan silver coins. But considering that the people in my family are currently very poor, they don't have money. And the people in White Deer Castle are not rich either. It is difficult to afford to buy them with money. So the Lord issued another decree in the past two days telling everyone in Ayrshire that in the future, saltpeter can be exchanged for a monthly pass. Two pounds of qualified saltpeter can be exchanged for a monthly pass. This purpose is naturally obvious. The nationwide control of salt does not necessarily require a large-scale war. Sometimes sending dozens of carriages to run back and forth can solve the problem, and can also carry soldiers on patrol to ensure the security of the territory. Of course, this policy has just been issued, and the results have not yet been seen and new trouble has arrived. Nowadays, my Xiong collar has become very crowded. Originally, all the supplies and troops of my Xiongling were transferred to White Deer Castle, and most of the population was scattered to various farms. There were not many people living in the previously designated residential areas. But just a few days ago, more than 1,300 young people were brought in, and this small place was suddenly filled to the brim, coupled with the constant flow of vendors and carriages. Makes angling which was originally only two streets, can actually give people the feeling of a big city. The business of the merchants stationed in the Mexi Angling Comprehensive Market has always been very good. Even if there seems to be a war in Bailubo in the past half month, it has not affected the business of the wholesale market. The trading and transshipment of various daily necessities have always been smooth. Is to be done. The only impact was that the buses were shut down for two days to facilitate the surrender plan. In the past few days after the battle, my Xiongling's business has become even more prosperous. Groups of various mercenaries arrived at Makes Angling at this time. There are many mercenaries coming from the north, which is the road that the Lord first walked and met Rasadalin. But more of them came by boat from Changha town. The general market is full of people coming and going. And places like Food World are even more crowded. Most big cities are not so lively. These consumers are basically from other places. Recently, many mercenary groups have come to the vicinity of Makes Angling and their purpose is obviously to capture the Nolder Elves. In the Nolder Forest, only this famous local product can attract so many mercenaries. It's just that there are so many mercenaries coming recently, so many that my Xiangling can't even fit them in. These are all large and small mercenary groups, led by the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. The current total number of people has exceeded 3,000, and this is definitely not the final number, because they still have not fully entered the Nolder Forest and are still waiting obviously waiting for the arrival of subsequent personnel. Although these mercenaries can indeed increase the sales of merchants. For today's lords, the trouble they bring may far exceed the economic value they bring. 
The Lord is currently discussing countermeasures with Amy and his men. This is the Lord's Hall of White Deer Castle. Leong is sitting on the main seat. And Amy, Sarah, Roland, Anson and others are sitting around the round table. Lisa Dillon did not hide in the dark this time, but also sat in front of the round table. Everyone, according to the news I got in the Lion City, those mercenaries should be here to capture the Nolder Elves. And I'm afraid they are for the Nolder Noble Girl. Rasadalin, please tell everyone about the Noble Girl of your tribe. What does it mean? Leon was very anxious now, and motioned to Rasadalin to explain to everyone the situation within the Nolder tribe. We have a total of four ethnic groups. That is, for noble families. I belong to the Aino family. At present, there are only more than 200 nobles in the Aino family, including me. And there should be only two unmarried girls among the nobles now. I guess the same goes for other families. In other words, if those mercenaries want to complete their ugly mission, they will inevitably start an endless war with my people. Of course, I think they will get nothing but all. Buried in the forest, Rasadalin was also nervous. But his nervousness did not seem to be for the safety of the Nolder people. He felt that those mercenary groups would probably be wiped out halfway. In fact, Leon thinks so too. But both he and Rasadalin considered another issue at the same time. The employer of these mercenaries was King Ulrich. They were hired by the king at a large price. Not to capture ordinary elves, but to capture Nolder noble girls. There are not many Nolder in the first place. And noble girls are not that easy to find. This means that they will not engage in petty hunting activities at the edge of the forest. They will go deep into the Nolder forest and invade the core territory of the elves on a large scale. The mercenaries may be seeking their own death and probably no one will sympathize with them. But they were hired by the king to start a massive war with Noldor, which was actually a disaster for White Deer Castle. The last time human armed forces invaded the Noldor forest on a large scale was more than 300 years ago. The outcome of that battle was that a combined army of 30,000 human noble lords was buried forever in the forest. Yes, very few people can escape. Since then, the Long River Forest has been called the Noldor Forest. The Noldor no longer have any communication with humans. And the two races have become mortal enemies. There are probably not many Noldor elves. But no matter how arrogant they are, they will not ignore the fighting power of the Noldor. And no one will easily step into the depths of the Noldor forest. For hundreds of years, the Noldor elves have been hiding in the forest and watching humans conquer each other. They will never leave the forest easily when humans do not provoke them. But if it is such a large-scale invasion, the reaction of the Noldor is obvious. They are a group with extremely strong fighting power. They have the ability to fight back and they will definitely make the invading country pay a heavy price. Regardless of whether those mercenary groups can succeed, or whether they are completely destroyed, the Nolder's anger for revenge against the Lion Kingdom will definitely burn towards White Deer Castle, who made White Deer Castle belong to the Kingdom of Lions, and who made White Deer Castle the closest to the Nolder Forest. This is a huge crisis. Chapter 165 The solution to a problem is to create it. So, my lord, King Ulrich asked you for the 100,000 dinars just to hire an army to do this kind of thing? Anson frowned tightly, seeming to have a new understanding of kings and nobles. He probably thought that the blood of the Nolder could cure his illness. Or he wanted his descendants to have the blood of the Nolder. Who knows? Anyway, a king who learns that he is terminally ill will do anything crazy. Possible. The Lord did not hide these things from his own people. And he now feels that this matter is very difficult to handle. Unless we can convince the Noldor that White Deer Keep will not be involved in such a thing. We may not be able to avoid this disaster. Amy also became worried after knowing the situation. Risa Dillon, if you want to help your tribe, I can let you leave temporarily. This matter may be a good opportunity for you to return to the tribe. I have not forgotten my promise. But I also have a request. Your last request so that your people know that these mercenaries have nothing to do with White Deer Keep and that White Deer Keep is willing to support the Nolder in their fight against the enemy. In fact, I am very willing to form an alliance with your people. Only by peaceful coexistence can we develop together. You, you know, I have no prejudice against the Nolder. The Lord first expressed his attitude to the Nolder elves. Rasadalin nodded. Thank you. Sir, I can try to contact the people, but I am a criminal of the family, and it is too difficult for any Nolder to trust humans in this situation. Rasadran naturally understood that the Lord was indeed not hostile to Noldor. But he didn't know how to deal with it. I can give you something that will interest your family. I am one-eighth of Noldor blood. It's true. You can try it and see if this news can interest your family. The Lord finally mentioned this relatively secret matter. 
He also used this method to tell others that he really wanted to coexist peacefully with the Nolder. I will do my best. Sir! Rasadalin stared at the Lord for several seconds, then bowed deeply and left first. He wasn't used to meetings with so many people. Several other people at the round table were certainly surprised by the news. But it was easy to accept this kind of thing. The focus of everyone's current attention was not the Lord's ancestors' marriage, but the current crisis. And everyone knows that Rasadalin was exiled. It is actually difficult to say whether he can contact the tribe. This can only be said to be a try. The discussion continues. I think since we want to show our attitude, it's best not to allow any mercenaries to enter White Deer Castle, or even to provide them with supplies. Sarah shook her head. But in this case, we have to clearly exclude the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. This may cause disputes. After all, the Ebony Gauntlet Knights are regular knights. It doesn't matter. Regardless of the knights, they are not qualified to enter the territory of the nobles without permission. Roland, let's do this first. Guard the city gate and don't let anyone enter the city with weapons. The Lord doesn't care if he offends anyone. He has many enemies anyway. And he doesn't care if he has one more. But we can't keep White Deer Castle closed forever. And it's actually more dangerous to let them mess around outside the city. There are all kinds of people in those mercenary groups. If they are not allowed to enter the city, they will go to various villages. Who I know if it will bring any trouble. Unless we can find a suitable reason to completely expel them from the territory in an honest and fair manner. We have to make a fuss that even the Nolder knows about it. Amy lowered her head and rubbed her hair anxiously. Twisting her neatly tied long hair into a mess. Find a suitable reason to expel them. That's right. Amy, you are really smart. I probably have a solution. The way to solve the problem is to create a problem. The Lord thought for a while and seemed to have an idea. Anson, hurry back to McAllen to announce the news of the restrictions. He said that a large number of prisoners of war will be sent to McAllen for labor service. Ayrshire will temporarily implement military control. Except for the market in McAllen. No other places will accept them. Foreign workers. Sarah, go to Changa Town to find out the news and see if there are any other knights coming here. By the way, check the whereabouts of Lord Godric. I haven't heard from him for a long time, which is quite abnormal. Amy, you are waiting for my news at White Deer Castle. If there are mercenaries coming from Makes Angling, let them go south to the camp built by the second army of the Bacchus Empire. The Lord directly assigned tasks to several people and announced the adjournment of the meeting and then led his troops back to make the angling. In the evening of that day, not long after the Lord returned to make the angling, John came to complain. John is the mercenary who is also good at swimming, and who once shared the spoils with Eric. He is now the leader of the bus team. Sir, the Knights of the Ebony Gauntlet plan to commandeer our convoy. But I refused. This seemed to anger them, and they even took action. Now they are making trouble in make the angling. John's face was swollen and his head was bruised and bruised. It looked like he had obviously been beaten. However, coming to complain after being beaten obviously shows that this guy's ability to handle affairs is really not very good. With the same origin and the same opportunity, Eric became an official knight and could take charge of complex affairs alone. But John can only be a team leader just because he is loyal enough and works hard without complaint. But this conflict was actually expected by the Lord, who asked Anson to rush back to make the angling to issue an order of military control. Just to create a conflict, Makes the Angling suddenly declared martial law in the afternoon, and the Ebony Gauntlet Knights were probably caught off guard. No matter what the Knights did, it was normal for a little dispute to arise in Makes the Angling, because the scope of control is places other than the market. No matter what era, as long as a restrictive decree does not treat everyone equally, but proposes a separate area, then disputes will inevitably occur in this area. Now there is actually reason to expel the Knights of the Ebony Gauntlet and no one is blameless. But if you want Nolder to understand Ayrshire's attitude, expulsion from the CD player is not enough. The Lord thought for a moment and looked at John. They hit you? Did you fight back? No, sir. There are many of them. And they are knights after all. I am worried that they will harm civilians. Leon looked at John's submissive look inside. This guy seemed to have limited achievements in his life. Although Leon knows that John is a kind person. Kind people need a flexible mind. Otherwise, it is usually difficult to serve as a middle level or above manager. Even as civilians these days can only swallow their anger when facing knights. To Leong, the Ebony Gauntlet Knights are nothing more than knights. The Knights of the Ebony Gauntlets have indeed a long history 
and are very well known. They were originally the knights of the ancient Pen Kingdom. Since the outbreak of the Red Death plunged the continent of Pender into chaos. Unlike most knights, the knights of the Ebony Gauntlets insisted that the plague was caused by long-eared elves, and they wanted to attack these enemies of mankind. Revenge. So they no longer blindly recruit nobles. As long as they are willing to conquer the Nolder, they will accept them. You can imagine how complicated the personnel composition of this knight order is. Later, the knights of the Ebony Gauntlet even abandoned horses, a partner that was of great significance to traditional knights. Now, both their knights and their followers are all heavy infantry crossbowmen. These guys who have been dealing with the Nolder in the forest for a long time are not the same. No horses are needed. After all, there is no way to ride horses in the virgin forest. For more than 150 years, these ebony gauntlet knights traveled in groups between the Nolder forest and the craggy bay. They often ambushed lone elves and small groups of elven patrols on the outskirts of the forest. All Nolder equipment are rare and high-priced commodities on the black market and beautiful Nolder girls are in short supply among the nobles. And so are the boys. So this knights use their unique way of fighting for mankind to seize a lot of wealth. But at the same time, this also makes this knights very unpopular. Although most members of the knights of the Ebony Gauntlets live in the cliff bay of the Lion Kingdom, all their energy is spent on launching the Eastern Crusade against the elves. And they have hardly made any contribution to the kingdom of the lion. Many nobles believed that the Ebony Gauntlet Knights were neither loyal to anyone nor performed the duties of a knight. They had no faith other than the Dinar, and even the heavy crossbowmen, all of whom fought on foot, were not worthy of being called knights at all. Most of the other knights have publicly accused the Ebony Gauntlet Knights of using crossbows in combat, which is not in line with the spirit of chivalry, and their human trafficking behavior is also in line with the criminals of the Red Brotherhood. And even those illegal knights do not as for falling to this point. As for the civilians, they don't have a good impression of them. The knights of the Ebony Gauntlets neither help civilians nor protect business travelers, nor do they protect their homes and countries. Although they will not rob civilians like bandits. If your home is being invaded by foreign enemies, you find that this knight still only want to hunt an older. Turning a blind eye and watching the enemies kill villagers without doing anything. No common people will have a favorable impression of them. But this world is sometimes very absurd. Although most people don't like the Ebony Gauntlet knights they can still live a good life, which is much more nourishing than the ordinary knights, because the great nobles of Chiaoyan Bay, as well as the Lion King, all need their existence. However, my Xianling is not Qianwen, and Liang is not the Lion King. To the Lord, the Knights of the Ebony Gauntlets are essentially a group of mercenaries recognized by the Charter of Valets. Most of those so-called knights are not nobles. Faced with such a knightly group, John, as an official of my Xianling, could have fought back and was reasonable. So what if there are many people? Do the Ebony Gauntlet Knights dare to go to war with the kingdom's baron? He couldn't even pull off a tiger skin to make a big statement. John was indeed too honest. Come on! Take me there! Anson! Call all the troops! In the square of Makes Angling, a huge crowd was watching a riot. The road from Makes Angling to White Deer Castle was blocked by civilians and businessmen. A group of people from the Ebony Gauntlet Knights were surrounded in the square, and were constantly greeting the coachman and the female relatives of the businessmen. The scolding war between the two sides has been going on for a long time, and it has now entered a stage of slight physical contact. But fortunately, both sides were relatively restrained, and no excessive violent conflicts occurred. What happened was a trivial matter. This afternoon, Makesy Angling suddenly issued a military control order, requiring all outsiders to leave the Makesy Angling area, and only people were allowed to move inside the market. It is true that White Deer Castle has just started a war. It is normal that many prisoners of war will be sent to make Zingling, and the transportation of prisoners of war will indeed be strictly controlled to avoid unexpected situations. If this kind of military control order is not obeyed, the lord of the county has the right to kill people on the spot. But the market was definitely not very convenient. So the Ebony Gauntlet Knights originally planned to leave make Zingling and go directly to White Deer Castle. The territory of White Deer Castle is large and there are many villages around it, even if the city is also under control. At least there are villages around it that can be temporarily stationed. So there is no need to camp in the wild. Then they found the bus. Since it was already afternoon, dozens of leading knights from the Ebony Gauntlet Knights wanted to arrive at White Deer Castle before nightfall, so that they could also make arrangements for other mercenary groups. The king gave them the hired mercenary groups. Of course, because the knights of the Ebony Gauntlets had the most experience in dealing with an older elves. 
for the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. This is also a good opportunity to increase their influence. So they have been helping to coordinate the mercenary groups coming from other countries along the way. Out of their own anxiety and a little curiosity, they focused on the buses waiting to depart at Mation Link Square. But their behavior was a bit rude. They kicked all the civilians who were already on the bus out of the bus. This behavior is very common in other places. The civilians have no status at all. But this is McLean. So John came forward and refused them to take the bus directly, saying that everyone should follow the rules of my Xiangling and line up to get on the bus. This was originally a reasonable request. But who made John a civilian? In addition, after the military control order was issued, more and more people were queuing up in the square to wait for the train. Why not wait until midnight to get on the train? As a result, there was a quarrel. After a few words of quarrel, the members of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights relied on their status as knights and threatened to requisition these carriages. Of course, this kind of thing cannot happen. In fact, the people of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights probably only said a few angry words. So John sternly refused and planned to drive the civilians, who had just been kicked out of the car, to White Deer Castle himself. As a result, John was beaten for being rude to the knights. Subsequently, this incident angered merchants at the Mexiangling Comprehensive Market. Although John is neither smart nor flexible, he is a well-known good person in McFly, from working diligently on road construction at the beginning to managing the fleet diligently later on. He was always eager to help others when they encounter trouble. Many businessmen have received his help when transporting goods. If such a good man was beaten, the businessmen would naturally look down upon him. So the businessmen surrounded the Ebony Knights, protected John and went to the Lord to complain. And then, they all began to denounce the barbaric style of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. The people of the Ebony Knights probably didn't expect that beating up a civilian clerk in makes angling would cause public outrage. And they didn't want to offend the businessmen. These are merchants who are engaged in the wholesale business of various materials including some processed food and daily necessities. Many of them are necessary materials for entering the forest to fight. They come from far away to fight. If the merchants stop selling goods, it will be inconvenient for them to supply. Besides, Mexiangling is the territory of Baron Leon, and martial law is still being implemented. It is said that this Baron does a lot of business and has defeated the three prophets. So of course they will not make a big deal out of it. Of course, it was impossible for the merchants to fight against the heavily armed knights. So the two sides began to gather and quarrel. After the quarrel continued for half an hour, in order to prevent the matter from getting bigger, the leading knights of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights began to smooth things over. Originally, this matter would be over soon. But at this time, the merchants refused to do any business with the knights of the Ebony Gauntlets. All truck and bus drivers also said that nothing would be transported today and that they were all on holiday and he also cursed these ebony gauntlet knights to all die in the forest. On the one hand, the quarrel just now was indeed very angry. On the other hand, the lord secretly sent a few soldiers to fan the flames. In addition, there were more and more mercenaries watching, and the people of the ebony gauntlet knights probably felt that they could not keep their faces off. So it was difficult to restrain their emotions. So the two sides began to push each other. A few hot-tempered knights from the ebony gauntlet knights really started to snatch the carriage. The result of the robbery was that the residents and merchants of Mexiangling worked together to block the road with carriages and began to surround the Ebony Gauntlet Knights under the leadership of the security patrol. In the next hour, the people in my Xiangling were confronting the Ebony Gauntlet Knights with both sides shaking people. The Ebony Gauntlet Knights have gathered more than 300 people, 50 or 60 knights, and about 300 sergeants. This is probably all the people they sent here. The civilians and businessmen on my Xiangling side gathered together and gathered nearly a thousand people to surround them. The other mercenary groups were all watching the fun. When the Lord arrived with the cavalry, it was already evening. In order to wait for the small dispute to escalate into a big commotion, Leon delayed for more than an hour before arriving at the scene. In fact, the distance from his residence in Makes Angling to the wholesale market is only a few hundred meters. Lord Leon is here! Give it all! Let Master Leon teach these bastards a lesson! Seeing Leon coming with his men, the merchants blocking the intersection gave way and let the lord into the square. What's going on? Are your knights planning to declare war on me? I don't seem to have allowed you to bring weapons into my territory. Leon stared at the leading ebony gauntlet knight with unkind eyes and started to slap his hat on him as soon as he came. Chapter 166 The Nolder Army is Dispatched The leading ebony gauntlet knight didn't know how to answer for a while, so he had to sell first. 
Ah, Sir Liang. Nice to meet you again. Seeing Liang, an ebony gauntlet knight suddenly left the team and came over to say H, Lo, with a smile on his face. It's you dot I'm not happy to see you in this situation dot tell me. What's going on in this situation now? Why do you beat up my men every time I meet you? How can I do you feel like you look down on me? Seeing the smiling face of the knight, Liang remembered that this was the ebony gauntlet knight who had besieged Lisa Dillon in the Long River Forest. But Liang still didn't give him a good look. The Lord was not here to resolve disputes. I am Dumbledore. Lord Leon. We are going to the Long River Forest this time. Everything here is a misunderstanding. You know, our life is to use a mace to crack the skull of Nolder. We don't want to be with him. There was a conflict between people in your territory. It was really just a small misunderstanding. The knight didn't mind Liang's attitude. He obviously saw John next to the Lord and wanted to settle the matter. But the Lord was not prepared to accept his kindness. Dumbledore, attacking my subordinates in my territory can be called a misunderstanding? Who were the people who attacked people in my territory just now? Come forward and let me see. No one stands up, and no one is a fool. But the businessmen nearby had already begun to point and point. Sir, this, this, and this. They attacked Mr. John. And this. He just pushed me. The Lord Lord nodded. Okay, everyone else can get out. Those of you who have done anything, according to the laws of my Xiangling, this is provoking trouble and disturbing public order. And you have been arrested. The ebony gauntlet knights looked at each other in confusion. Looking for quarrels and provoking trouble? Is there still such a crime? There really isn't such a security clause these days. So it's normal to have a fight or something. Sir, they just wanted to take away these carriages. A coachman saw that the Lord was obviously going astray and quickly began to accuse. Oh. Robbery of my Xiang collar in broad daylight? You guys are so brave. It looks like they are going to rebel. Arrest them all. The Lord, with a sinister smile on his face, looked like a villain, waving his hand to signal his men to arrest people. This time it was no longer a matter of arresting three or five people. Hundreds of soldiers separated from the crowd, their swords drawn out of their sheaths. Watching eagerly, naturally, the ebony gauntlet knights all took out their weapons. At this time, John behind Leon raised the golden griffin flag in his hand. I disobeyed the control orders, plundered the noble territory, and tried to attack the kingdom's border governor. And this was while I was transporting prisoners of war from the Bacchus Empire. Leon began to read the charges loudly. This is not an injustice to them. It just magnifies everything a few levels. No! Lord Leon, we will withdraw from your territory immediately. We promise not to step into the wheat field. But before the Lord could finish reciting the charges, Dumbledore stopped him by waving his hands. At the same time, he also pulled several ebony gauntlet knights to apologize to Leon and John, and even took the initiative to take out a large amount of dinars for compensation. That was several hundred dinars, and he gave it out without blinking an eye. The knights of the ebony gauntlet were indeed rich. This Dumbledore seemed to be a very smart guy, seeing that the Lord was obviously trying to criticize him. He knew that he could not have a bigger conflict with Leon at this time. So he quickly surrendered. Dumbledore is a noble from Cliff Bay. He knows that the flag embroidered with the golden coat of arms cannot be used by everyone. It means that Leon is now a rebel. Which means that King Ulrich's trust was previously Pan. Duke Alfred, the fierce lion of the Kingdom of Germany, is a rebel. In other words, Leon can directly attack this rebel on the grounds that the Ebony Gauntlet Knights intend to rebel without reporting or asking anyone for instructions. As for the evidence proving their rebellion, judging from Liang's current behavior, if the ebony gauntlet knights don't leave, the evidence may be produced at any time. After all, the ebony gauntlet knights are not very popular, except for the nobles of Xiaoyan Bay. I am afraid that no one will speak for them. Then again, those big nobles and kings may also be happy to see them become an illegal knights. In fact, the entire Ebony Gauntlet Knights has a total of 600 people, including more than 100 knights and 500 retinues. They are all well-equipped heavy crossbowmen and war hammermen, and their combat effectiveness is quite strong, even counting only those currently on site. There are nearly 400 people. If there really was a fight, Leon would probably not be their opponent, but they neither wanted to become rebels, nor could they clearly say that this mission was the king's order, so they wisely did not have a bigger conflict with Leon. If they attack Liang, it will be the rebels. Who wants to become an illegal knight? And judging from Liang's intention, it seems that he wants the ebony gauntlet knights to attack him. 
then consider Liang's golden coat of arms. So Dumbledore made a decisive decision and planned to withdraw from my Xiangling immediately to avoid further escalation of the situation. But the Lord still stopped them. Dumbledore, this is not to embarrass you. Ayrshire just fought a battle with the Bacchus Empire two days ago. I captured more than a thousand people, including a governor. You should be able to understand the importance of this matter. Bar? Leon looked at Dumbledore suspiciously. I understand. Lord Leon, we really shouldn't step into your territory at this time. It's understandable that there will be misunderstandings. We will leave immediately. Dumbledore nodded frequently. His attitude was quite good. It's not enough to just leave Weaveland. Dumbledore in order to prevent the prisoners from getting into trouble. And for the safety of the entire Ayrshire, I must see you stay away from Ayrshire with my own eyes. I don't care why you came here. What? But you can't set foot in Ayrshire. Otherwise, I will think you are rebels. The Lord shook his head and pointed in the direction of White Deer Castle. I am referring to the entire Ayrshire. Lord Leong. But we need to at least rest in the village. Right. We don't have to enter Makes Angling and White Deer Castle but we can't even have a place to station ourselves. Dumbledore frowned. You have been in the market for so long. You should have finished purchasing the materials. Right. I can take you to a suitable place. That is the camp that the Bacchus Empire established before to attack White Deer Castle. It is enough to station several people. Thousands of people. Dumbledore, take your people and these mercenaries from who knows which country. Follow my men and go there now. I will keep an eye on you from behind. So, with ugly faces. The ebony gauntlet knights followed Liang's cavalry to the large camp 200 miles south of White Deer Castle. We walked this way for a day and a half. And the Lord was indeed watching from behind. It felt like a small force of more than 100 people was escorting an army of more than 3,000 people. Those mercenary groups actually think it doesn't matter. Most of them come from other countries. The nature of the mercenary group's work determines that they must obey the requirements of local lords wherever they go as long as the requirements are reasonable. They will not have any problems with local lords. Conflict. But being stationed in the wild is not comfortable. Although the mercenaries can understand that military control will definitely be implemented during the war between the two countries, it is inevitable to make noises and complaints all the way. Although the people of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights felt that it was very embarrassing. Completing the king's mission was more important. So they didn't care about it that much. And they didn't even make any noise. The knights of the Ebony Gauntlets are, after all, a knightly order, and the overall quality of their members is still much higher than that of pure mercenaries. There were so many armed men operating at the edge of the Nolder Forest, and they even settled in the camp with great fanfare. Anyone with eyes could see this. In particular, the mercenaries' military discipline was not very good, and they were noisy all the way. Of course, the Nolder could see it too. When the Lord first discovered the camp, he felt that the location would be easily noticed by the Nolder Elves. Amy, who has lived in White Deer Castle for a long time, is more familiar with the Nolder Elves. In Amy's opinion, the 2,000 people who cut down trees to build camps were not attacked by the Nolder Elves. It is probably because the Bacchus people are lucky. Rasatlan also told Leon that he had met the Nolder people behind White Deer Castle, which meant that the Nolder were actually paying attention to White Deer Castle. Probably, as long as there is a war near the Nolder Forest, the elves will keep an eye on it, but they will not participate in the human struggle. This is a normal thought. If your neighbor is fighting with another group of people, you will definitely pay attention and probably watch the whole process. But most likely you will not participate. But if they stop fighting, and a lot of hooligans come to squat downstairs in your house. Not only that, but you also find that one of the gangster leaders has a grudge against you. Then you will definitely have to participate in this situation. And you will probably rather miss work and school. We have to deal with these little hooligans first. At this time, if the neighbors come forward to expel the hooligans and call the police directly, they will show a hostile attitude towards the hooligans. Even if the hooligans who have been expelled by your neighbors are still in the stairwell of your floor, at least you can know that these hooligans have nothing to do with your neighbors. And you will share the same hatred with your neighbors. Therefore, the Lord wants to create a conflict. And then use the conflict to expel these more than 3,000 mercenaries and let them squat in the stairwell, built by Governor Levius. Moreover, after the Lord completed this matter, he closed the White Deer Castle. After returning to White Deer Castle, Liang's first order was to close the city gates, except for the side doors that allowed civilians to enter and exit. Any strangers would be strictly interrogated, and those carrying weapons would be expelled on the spot. 
He also asked Amy to send a large number of soldiers to declare decrees in various rural night territories and control the entire county. No armed personnel were allowed to enter even an inch of land in the county. Once a knight is found to be providing supplies and accommodation to foreign armed personnel, it will be regarded as suspected of treason. At the same time, Roland was asked to drive away the rest of the people around White Deer Castle again. This is the first time such strict control has appeared in Bailu Castle. At this time, this is a very clear attitude that White Deer Castle does not support these mercenaries. Not only does it not provide supplies, it does not even allow them to enter. In this way, the Nolder Elves probably won't cause trouble to White Deer Keep. After all, the Nolder are paying attention to White Deer Castle. So they will definitely know that White Deer Castle does not even let those mercenaries in. The Nolder did see it too. In fact, as early as when Levius asked the Imperial Second Legion to build the camp, the Nolder were already paying attention to the whole process. If it weren't for Islandil not allowing his subordinates to attack civilians, the 2,000 civilians would have been gone long ago. But with more than 3,000 armed men, plus the Ebony Gauntlet Knights, who have a blood feud with Noldor, this is completely different. Islandil originally gave an order to kill anyone who enters the camp. The current attitude of White Deer Castle is that it obviously does not support the actions of those mercenaries. And Islandil can certainly understand that. He is probably the Noldor who understands the fastest. Because he knew that the Lord of White Deer Castle had shown his trust in Rasadalin, a Noldor elf. More than half a year ago, White Deer Castle was besieged by a large army. When it was about to be captured, Rasadalin blew the horn in the forest, delaying time for White Deer Castle. This was what the Twilight Knight mentioned to Islandil. Of, Islandil is also the great lord who leads the army. In his opinion, only the most trustworthy subordinates will be sent to carry out the most important and dangerous tasks. Since the lord of White Deer Castle trusted an older elf, it is easy to understand why White Deer Castle expelled the mercenary group. In the forest near the camp, Islandel was listening to the report from his men. Judging from the reaction of White Deer Castle, these mercenary groups are not motivated by the entire human race to attack us, but a private act. Where is Eldarion now? Didn't he claim to be dealing with the Ebony Gauntlet Knights? Why is this knight order still here intact? Your Highness, Lord Eldarion seems to have been chasing dozens of Ebony Warhammermen all the way north. As you know, he never lets go of any human. The answer was from a Twilight Knight, who seemed to be mocking Eldarion in his tone. It is unimaginable that a powerful warrior favored by God has not made any progress in 300 years. And his mind is still so simple and crude. He was actually led away by a small army like this? Islandil shook his head. And it seemed that he didn't like Eldarion very much. Your Highness, when will we attack? This Twilight Knight seemed to have a very flexible mind. He changed the topic. Aldarian was a great lord no matter what. His highness could comment on the other party. But he could not agree with him. Is his majesty Kale Von Iyar still unwilling to let his people fight? Islandil looked at the camp and then at his subordinates looming in the forest. And seemed a little hesitant. His majesty has been doing this for hundreds of years. But as always, he agreed to let you summon the warriors of the Fenarfin family on your own. As long as they are willing. Twilight Knight shook his head. Come on. I can't command the artists of the Fenarfin family. Forget it. That's it. Send the order. Attack at the quarter moon. After Islandil finished speaking, he turned back and walked deeper into the forest. Another twilight night happened to run quickly from the forest. Your Highness, I received a message from Rissa Dillon. He sent it on his own initiative. The twilight night held a shining silver nolder arrow in his hand. There is a letter tied to the arrow. At night, there was a little argument in the camp on the edge of the forest. Dumbledore, I can understand why you don't want to conflict with that Baron Leon. In fact, I think you are doing the right thing. But why don't we attack immediately? White Deer Castle will not let us enter. And our supplies will be slowed down. A man who looked like a mercenary leader was questioning Dumbledore. The Ebony Gauntlet Knight. Friend, you should understand why I became the Knight Commander leading this operation. I spend half of every year fighting those pointy ears in this forest. I know those pointy ears. I don't want to be with them. Fighting at night. Moreover, our people have not arrived yet. And the Griffin Sword and other large mercenary groups have not yet arrived. Dumbledore shook his head. Acting calm. I think our current military strength can fully complete the king's mission. We are not trying to destroy the pointy-eared race. The mercenary captain shook his head and expressed his objection. Looking a little anxious. There are hundreds of tents in the camp. 
and a scale of more than 3,000 people is indeed enough to do a lot of things. It is understandable that he would have such an idea. Shut up. I've told you not to mention it. This is a private mission issued by Archmaster Igor. I hope you and your men can understand this. Dumbledore gave the mercenary leader a hard look. Okay. Okay. I won't mention the king. I want to do it but I dare not admit it. Huh? Then how long are we going to wait in this damn place? I miss the taverns and brothels a single very much. The mercenary captain shook his head slightly. With a sneer on his face. Wait until the news comes from the north. Do you think our knights haven't taken action? We have already sent people to lure away the most terrifying large force of the Nolder. The mercenary leader shook his head and sighed. The sneer on his face clearly turned into sarcasm. You people in the Lion Realm like to use these tricks too much. I don't think those pointed ears are so difficult to deal with. Enemy attack. Just as he said this, a hail of arrows struck, and the mercenary captain fell down without saying a word. In his head was a shining silver Nolder arrow. The Desha pointed helmet on his head failed to protect him at all. The helmet was pierced by an arrow. Take cover. Everyone get down. Raise your shields. Dumbledore rolled over and lay on the ground. Then crawled forward and leaned behind a wooden low wall in the camp. Tilted the shield at an angle. And slowly raised it upward. Whoosh. A Nolder arrow shot through his shield easily even though the shield was tilted at a 40 degree angle. But Dumbledore judged from the strength of the arrow that the Noldo, who was shooting the arrow was only 50 meters away from him at most. He is too familiar with the Nolder. If he only shoots arrows at such a distance. It is definitely not a small Nolder patrol. If a small Nolder patrol encounters a large human force, they will either shoot hidden arrows hundreds of meters away or hide in the forest. Close range attacks will only occur when the Nolder are absolutely sure. Now, there are 3,000 people stationed in the camp. This is the Nolder army dispatched. Chapter 167 Belated Friendship Arrows rained down from the sky like silver locusts and screams echoed throughout the camp. At this time, the moon had just risen, and most of the mercenaries were not sleeping yet, so they could react fairly quickly when encountering a surprise attack, but suddenly encountered a night attack. The mercenaries were still in chaos, because, at night, their combat capabilities are simply not comparable to that of the Nolder Elves. Under this thin moonlight, humans could not see clearly everything in the jungle. They could only see the Nolder warriors flickering in and out of the woods, like ghosts. But the Nolder Elves still missed the target. The Elves are the darlings of the Dark Knight. And the moonlight is enough for them to see everything clearly. Moreover, the long-pointed ears make the Elves have much stronger hearing than humans. Most Elves can even identify the position by listening to the sound and shoot blindly. This is why Risa Dillon can always find the enemy before Leon. Especially at night. Dumbledore stood up from behind the low wall and quickly looked out. This camp is located in the lower part of this mountainous area. To the west is the gentle slope extending from the Dangil Mountains, dozens of miles away. To the east is the gentle upward slope next to the Noldor Forest. The camp itself is a relatively flat open space. But this means that the Noldor coming from the direction of the forest can shoot arrows from a high position. Dumbledore's current location is the easternmost part of the camp, near the edge of the forest. From his position, he could see at least hundreds of Noldor warriors walking through the forest. And there seemed to be a dozen Noldor Twilight Knights commanding them. The Twilight Knight is covered in silver armor, which is relatively conspicuous. There are more than ten Twilight Knights that can be seen. Dumbledore was a little desperate. He didn't expect the Elves' army to come so quickly and on such a large scale. He had entered the depths of the Noldor Forest and encountered Noldor troops. He knew what those Noldor commanders covered in silver armor meant. A few years ago, he followed the first group of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights to explore the territory of the Noldor. They thought the Noldor might have established a city in the forest and wanted to explore it. After entering the forest and marching arduously for nearly a hundred miles, this team of more than 200 people, armed to the teeth, was raided at night by a Noldor patrol of about 50 people just after setting up camp. With a numerical ratio of 5 to 1, the first brigade of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights certainly took the fight without fear. But the outcome of that battle was that the Ebony Gauntlet Knights, which had five times the number of people, were completely destroyed. The Nolder patrol that led to their annihilation had a commander in silver armor. The Nolder Twilight Knight. Dumbledore still clearly remembers the scene at that time. The Twilight Knight asked the Nolder rangers behind him to scatter into the woods. And then he stood there and shot more than 20 people in a row with terrifying shooting skills. Dumbledore could swear that it must be the fastest archery creature he had ever seen. The Twilight Knight shot 30 arrows in 3 minutes. And almost every arrow took away a life. 
the thick plate chain armor, and black pointed helmet had almost no protective effect against the Twilight Knight's arrows. At the same time, continuous arrows were shot from all directions in the forest. The Nolder Rangers kept changing their positions in the forest. The Ebony Gauntlet Knights were shot for a while, and were unable to fight back. In three minutes, the number of people killed by the arrows of the Nolder was close to a hundred. That's just fifty Nolder. Then, the Twilight Knight put down his bow, and even dropped his quiver. Just when he thought that the terrifying archer had no more arrows to worry about, the Twilight Knight pulled out the long sword on his back and charged towards them. Dumbledore watched helplessly as the slightly curved sword killed five of his comrades in less than ten seconds, all of whom were masters at the front. However, their warhammers and swords could hardly break through the strange and primitive armor of the Twilight Knight. Then all the Nolder Rangers appeared from all directions, and fifty Nolder actually surrounded them and faced the Ebony Gauntlet Knights, who were still three times their size. Before long, only half of the first group of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights were still alive. They finally retreated, able to survive half of the battles before collapsing. The Knights of the Ebony Gauntlets are already considered the top elites among the human armed forces. But the result they achieved was only to kill seven or eight Nolder Rangers. The terrifying Twilight Knight, whose silver armor was stained blood red, still continued to pursue them. Dumbledore led a dozen people to escape from the forest with difficulty, and became the knight commander of the 1st Brigade of the Ebony Gauntlets. The 1st Brigade was almost wiped out, and Dumbledore was the only noble knight to escape. Dumbledore had greatly increased the proportion of crossbowmen in his ranks over the years, and had been dealing with the Noldor at the edge of the forest. But he never saw the Twilight Knight again. In other words, even if he encounters it, he will not try to attack, without a tenfold numerical advantage. Dumbledore would no longer easily provoke a Nolder patrol of more than 40 people. He already understood how terrifying the Nolder shooters were once they formed a large scale. Most of the time, he was dealing with lone Nolder warriors or hunters, or he was leading a force of more than a hundred people to kill small Nolder reconnaissance teams of about 10 people. The 1st Brigade of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights also made considerable gains under Dumbledore's caution, since they have been fighting small-scale battles with small losses and high profits. The 1st Brigade has gradually reorganized over the years. The scale of more than 400 people. Now, Dumbledore saw the Twilight Knight again. And he once again understood the outcome of this battle. Based on his experience, a Twilight Knight would probably lead a mixed Noldor army of 50 people. Now that more than 10 Twilight Knights have been seen, the total number of Noldor warriors outside will not be less than 600. The total number of human mercenaries in the camp is about 3,000. Which is also a ratio of 5 to 1 the same proportion of people as before. After setting up camp, and at night when the moon was just rising, they were also raided by the Nolder at night. But these mercenaries were a mixed bag, and they were in no way comparable to the original Ebony Gauntlet Knights. In fact, Dumbledore was not willing to go deep into the Nolder forest, but the Ebony Gauntlet Knights could not ignore the king's request. So he originally planned to let the mercenary group take the lead, especially the famous Griffin, Sword Mercenary Group but he really didn't expect that Nolder's large army would appear at the edge of the forest so soon. And the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group never came. In the past, when capturing lone elves at the edge of the forest, we never saw Nolder's large army coming so quickly. In the camp, the mercenaries were hurriedly putting on their equipment and were unable to fight back for the time being. Most of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights, who were responsible for the night vigil were fully equipped, but no one dared to show up. Under the low wall on the side of the forest, a row of people soon formed, mostly members of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. They all leaned sideways on the inside of the low wall in a similar posture to Dumbledore, and used their crossbows to poke out of the low wall to fight back. Only the wooden wall, which was more than half a foot thick, could block the Nolder's arrows, so they rarely showed their heads, and they almost shot blindly when they fought back. But this is the right way, although this kind of blind shooting has no results. It can at least buy time for the mercenaries in the camp and prevent the Noldor from directly breaking into the camp. The Knights of the Ebony Gauntlets indeed have much more experience in dealing with the Noldor, although they were caught off guard and suffered a lot of damage under the first wave of arrows. They quickly made the most correct response. Behind them, the mercenaries who came out of the camp had no such awareness. In just such a short time, hundreds of people had been hit by arrows and fell to the ground. Most of them were mercenaries who had just emerged from the tent. Then, they were shot down by an arrow from the Nolder as soon as they stood up. Wails and groans came and went. The Nolder army was getting closer at this time. Some Nolder warriors fired arrows, so that not many people in the camp dared to show their heads. 
Hundreds of other Nolder Rangers formed a loose array 30 meters outside the camp. It was a long row, with two Noldos working together in groups, one holding a shield to defend, and the other holding a bow to shoot. It seems that this is to continue remote suppression, but this way of fighting in formation rarely appears among the Nolder, because although this can get a better shooting position, it will also make them lose their greatest advantage of concealment in the woods. The various mercenary groups finally began to counterattack, shooting crossbows at the Nolder Ray, and the mercenaries with less complete equipment gradually moved closer to the low wall to the west of the camp. Follow me. Dumbledore glanced through the crack in the wall again, and then waved to the nearby Ebony Gauntlet Knights to follow him. The mercenaries did not understand the intentions of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights, thinking that they were going to attack the Nolder from the side. So they stepped forward to take over the shooting positions against the low wall. But Dumbledore actually had the intention to retreat. And he did not tell the mercenaries that he was retreating. He knew that these mercenaries would not retreat. And those mercenary captains would not obey orders so easily. The price Ulrich offered was enough to make these mercenary captains risk everything. Moreover, the mercenaries did not know enough about Nolder. The mercenary captain who was shot to death by an arrow just now is a typical example. The men of the ebony gauntlets began to crawl along the low wall, gradually moving to the north of the camp, then continued to retreat along the low wall on the north side. A few minutes later, Dumbledore quietly left the camp with the knights of the ebony gauntlets and retreated into the wilderness to the west of the camp. The trees around here have been cleared, leaving only low stumps and gentle, undulating slopes. Dumbledore abandoned all the mercenaries in the camp and quickly retreated with the ebony gauntlets, continuing to retreat to the Danhill Mountains to the west. He only brought out more than 300 people, which is the vast majority of the members of the 1st Brigade of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights, who are currently able to move. This is the right choice. Half an hour later, Dumbledore led more than 300 people to the gentle slopes on this side of the Dengil Mountains. On the top of a hill, the opposite camp could be seen in the distance, and screams could still be vaguely heard. At this time, a small group of cavalry came from the south of the camp. About 300 people. However, the only cavalry that can move forward quickly in the mountains is the Nolder. The elven horses bred by the Nolder elves are probably the only mountain horse species in this continent that can cross mountains and ridges as if they were walking on flat ground. Dumbledore was very happy with his decision. Perhaps it was dishonorable to flee without a fight. But the way the Nolder lined up to fight, it was obvious that they did not intend to let any humans enter the forest. This was rare and very unlike the Nolder's style. With the strong fighting power of the elves in the forest, they should have let the mercenaries enter the forest. But they attacked the camp directly and blocked the way to the forest with a raise. For Dumbledore, this could only mean one thing that the elves were confident of annihilating them all. And were using this method to prevent them from escaping. That means that Noldor armies will appear on other sides. And perhaps only the Dengil Mountains to the west will have no enemies. Dumbledore confirmed this after seeing the group of Noldor cavalry. If nothing else, there probably is such a cavalry force in the north of the camp. The Nolder used an army of about 1,200 people to surround the mercenary army of 3,000 people from three sides. The elves don't want the humans here to leave alive. So Dumbledore led his troops westward again without stopping, retreating towards the Dengil Mountains. Unlike the mountains in the Nolder forest, which are all tall trees, the Dengil Mountains are a typical stone mountain. The soil layer of this mountain is relatively thin, and there are a lot of stones underneath. So the vegetation is also relatively thin. Most are shrubs and relatively low. There are also big trees. But they are relatively sparse. Because the rock formations inside the mountain are very fragile and landslides are easy when it rains. And it is difficult for big trees to take root. It was once said that there was a gold mine on the top of this mountain. But after many landslides, no one dared to go to the top of the mountain anymore. However, gold mining farmers can often be seen at the foot of the mountain. Probably because of this. The Nolder did not take root in the Dengil Mountains. So this direction is indeed safe. If the Nolder do not continue to pursue it. After marching hard all night, Dumbledore led his troops to stop on the top of a hill on Mount Dengil. This place is already at least 50 or 60 miles away from that camp. It was daylight. But Dumbledore was in a dilemma. A Nolder cavalry team of about 300 people appeared in his field of vision. Nolder's cavalry actually came after him. They probably followed their footsteps to find them. In the soft mountainous terrain, the footprints left by the Ebony Gauntlet Knights were very clear. This is not surprising considering the feud between the Knights of the Ebony Gauntlet and the Nolder. But Dumbledore's first team didn't get any rest. They had been running in the mountains all night and were now exhausted. Besides, 
In this kind of mountainous area, the Nolder Elves couldn't escape even if they wanted to. He could only order to defend in place. Fortunately, their location was high up and there weren't many big trees around them. So at least, they had a geographical advantage. The Nolder cavalry were probably very tired. They discovered the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. But they did not attack immediately. Instead, they dismounted at the bottom of the hill. They probably wanted to rest before fighting again. My lord, this is a letter from His Highness Islandil. The Dusty Rasadalan returned to White Deer Castle again. And he brought back a strange letter to the lord. You meet your people so soon? The lord was a little surprised. He didn't expect that it would actually work if Risa Dillon tried it. I only met an elder in my clan. He knew that I was working for you and gave me this letter. He said that His Highness Islandil is also looking for you. My lord. Rissa Dillon seemed a little excited. He probably saw the hope of returning to the clan. His people did not make things difficult for him and allowed him to serve as a messenger, which was obviously an excellent signal. The letter was written on paper that looked like a work of art. The paper was white and cut into a standard square shape. There are faint cyan patterns on it. The patterns are extremely complicated and form a mysterious pattern. This is probably the coat of arms of Islandil. But it is not printed on it, but seems to be embedded in the paper. This technique is wonderful. This piece of paper is probably worth a lot of money. And it can be used as a decoration if framed. But there are not many words on the paper. It is a large piece of paper. Only used to write a few words. It seems quite wasteful. I guess Islandel has some obsessive compulsive disorder. The words are written in the middle of the paper. And each line is extremely neat. Islandel's letter to Leon was very short and only mentioned two things. First, he wanted to know why humans attacked the Noldor forest in large numbers, and for what purpose. The second is that he wants to know whether Leong is willing to coexist peacefully with Noldor. Signed by Islandil Aino. You call him your highness. Is this Islandil the prince of the Yin tribe? Leong was a little curious. The names of these Noldor lords seemed a bit confusing. Of course, he also hopes to coexist peacefully with the Noldor. His royal highness Islandil is the crown prince of the Aino family. But his father has retired for 300 years. In human terms, he has long been regarded as one of the three elf kings, but he has never worn it. The crown of the king. So we always call him his highness. He is a respected leader. And although he exiled me, I still respect him. Rasadalan did not have any dissatisfaction with Islandil. In that case, Rasadarin, tell your tribesmen that I asked you to hand over the letter to Islandil with your own hands. I hope you can see Islandil and apologize to him. Maybe you this will allow me to return to the tribe. Leon said. Thank you. Sir, I will take your reply to my people, who are waiting for me a hundred miles south. Sir, if I am exonerated, I will still serve you. I also remember my promise. There was a rare smile on Lisa Dillon's face. The Lord nodded, found a neat piece of parchment, cut it into a square using the same method as Islandil, and wrote a reply in the middle of the paper. Also write a few lines neatly. But this time, the signature he used was, Leon Leonard Pendragon. Unfortunately, this letter comes a little late. I feel that those mercenary groups are in danger. Rasadalin, you must see Islandil as quickly as possible. Chapter 168 Favors and Accidents The camp where the mercenaries were located was now quiet. Islandil appeared in the camp again, seeing the Nolder warriors cleaning up the human corpses. He seemed to be in a bad mood. How much have we lost? The Twilight Knight beside him replied, Your Highness, a total of 92 people have been lost. The human losses are more than 30 times ours. Islandil sighed. Oh dot, but the number of humans is more than a thousand times ours dot 92 tribesmen. How many years will it take to make up for this? Twilight Knight also fell silent. With the loss of less than a hundred Nolder Elves, it caused nearly 3,000 mercenary casualties and even basically achieved the goal of annihilating the enemy. This was undoubtedly a brilliant victory. There is no way to kill people in a battle. Not to mention that this battle was quite successful. If the human army were allowed to enter the depths of the forest, the final losses would probably not be smaller than this. But Islandil was still very distressed. Every death of his people meant that one of his people would be lost. The population of the Nolder Elves was too small. The loss of a hundred people is not worth mentioning to humans. But to the Noldor, this is already a great loss. Therefore, Islandil's brow has never relaxed. Not long after, a Nolder noble found him. Your Highness, I brought Rasadalin. Who brought you a reply from Baron Leon? It is said that Baron Leon asked him to hand the letter into your hands. Islandil's brow suddenly relaxed a lot. Let him come to see me. 
Lisa Dillon walked over uneasily and handed over Li Ang's reply letter, but didn't know what to say. Your Highness, I'm sorry. Rasatalan looked a little embarrassed. He imagined how to face Islando many times along the way. But when he actually saw him, his first words were to apologize. I remember that you never apologized to anyone. Lisa Dillon, you have always been an extremely proud nobleman. And you would find someone to fight if you disagreed. While opening the letter, Islando glanced at Rasatalan with a somewhat complicated expression. Your Highness, I can now understand your original teachings. I am sorry that I did not obey your laws. Lisa Dillon lowered his head and apologized again. It seems that the human lord you work for probably taught you a lot. He asked you to hand over the letter to me with your own hands. This should be to ensure that you can see me. Right. It seems that Baron Leon is very interested in you. Good. Islandel nodded, opened the letter, glanced at it, and then smiled. It seems that Leon used the same writing method as the Nolder Lord to have an effect. He did teach me some things such as humility and tolerance, and respect for the law. Your Highness. Rasatalan's face was even more complicated. To be honest, Leon used poison to control him. But the Nolder Elves themselves also knew that the so-called 100-day heartbreaking poison was probably not true. But he just didn't dare to gamble. So he realized that he was not as brave as he thought. And he did learn to be tolerant because of this. But apart from that, Leon did regard him as one of his own, and hid nothing from him. His treatment of him was no different from Anson or Sarah. And his salary was also based on Close's standards. So Lisa Dillon was in a weird mood. He had been controlled by Leon. But he didn't think Leon was hateful. After all, Leon was indeed a reasonable and trustworthy person. Now he is gradually getting used to working for this lord. Which is indeed easier than being a killer. Rasatalan didn't know that his kind of thinking was called inertial obedience. It seems that he does treat the Nolder and humans equally. I have to meet with Baron Leon, Rasatalan, but I can't let a sinner serve as a messenger. From now on, I forgive your sins. You go and arrange for me to meet him. I think this is probably his intention to ask you to hand the letter to me in person. Islandel rerolled the letter, and it seemed that he did have some obsessive compulsive disorder. The letter was neatly rolled up, and the paint was pressed to the original scenes again. No, your highness, your current pardon is not legal. I will use the clan's laws to atone for my sins. Lord Leon also allows me to fight for the family, even if it means dealing with humans, as long as the family does not attack his territory. Rasatalan refused Islandil's order to be spared. Very good. It seems that your pride is still there. I look forward to you fighting for the family. But you have to understand that according to the family's laws, just killing the enemy cannot atone for your sins. You can only save the clan or bring back new knowledge. Only then, there was some relief on Islandil's face. To him, Rasatalan was a young junior. This junior had ignored the law and killed his nephew in the duel. He should certainly be punished. But now that he has become obedient to the law, Islandil feels that this is the meaning of punishment. A sinner turned back and was willing to contribute to the family. In the eyes of a lord, this result was much better than killing the sinner. Your Highness, I will do it. I will first arrange a meeting between you and Lord Leong. Lisa Dillon said, as he lowered his head and saluted. But before he finished speaking, he was interrupted by another voice. Your Highness, there is news from the north. Aldarion has been defeated. Another twilight knight hurried over and reported huge bad news. Aldarion? Defeated? He has never failed on the battlefield. Islandil felt unbelievable. What's going on? Aldarion led his troops to pursue a centurion of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights until they reached the border of the northern grassland. As a result, they were ambushed by the Jadda army that suddenly appeared. It was said to be the army of Judah the Destroyer. Aldera and his tribe suffered heavy losses. At least 200 people were killed. Now Judah's army is still chasing him and has already pursued him deep into the forest. The Twilight Knight quickly recounted the military situation. Destroyer Judah? His army actually pursued him into the forest? Islandil frowned tightly. He did not expect that the most powerful warrior in the Nolder tribe would be defeated. I didn't even expect that the most terrifying Jatta warlord on the grassland would actually enter the Nolder forest. According to the reports from the tribesmen, Judah's troops were approximately more than a thousand. They abandoned their horses and entered the forest. Marching southward, the twilight night pointed to the northeast. Judging from the time, they may be about to enter the territory of the Fenway family. After the defeat of Lord Eldarion, no one in the north can stop them. Calling all the troops to gather here, 
We must go to rescue immediately. Judah's army must be coming for the elven horses of the Fenway family. Islandil did not hesitate and immediately ordered the army to be organized. Your Highness. Master Liang sighed. Lisa Dillon asked. Islandil sighed and told her Sadalin. It seems that we can't meet him for the time being. Go and tell Baron Leon that for his sake. I will let the one who escaped on Mount Dendil go. Knights of the Ebony Gauntlet. And leave all the loot here to him. This is the greatest kindness I can show him. In addition, I hope Baron Leon can provide some help in rescuing the Finley family. I know the Jata people are also his enemy. Baron Leon's Nolder bloodline is likely to come from the Finway family. Lisa Dillon nodded and excused himself. Leon has shown his intention to coexist peacefully. And of course, Islandil must reciprocate to prove the sincerity of the Aino family. Although the proud Nolder elf was not willing to engage in such favors and would not easily ask for help from others. As a lord and due to the limitations of the current situation, Islandil still did so. Yes, it's a smooth favor. Islandil was going to take away all the troops to rescue the Fenway family in an emergency, and there was no time to collect the spoils. He also had to take away the 300 cavalry who were chasing the Ebony Gauntlet knights. He also had to take away the Ebony Gauntlets who escaped. There is no time to clean up. It was simply said that the knights of the Ebony Gauntlets were spared, and all the loot was left behind. In Islandil's view, this allowed Leon to see his sincerity, and the Nolder elves could let go of the most hated ones. The enemy, the Ebony Gauntlet Knights, was given enough face. A family leader who has lived for hundreds of years is certainly proficient in these techniques. However, the Lord Lord was not very happy after receiving the news. He had already offended the Ebony Gauntlet Knights and didn't care whether Nolder would let them go. However, Islandil has already forced this favor. If he doesn't accept it, wouldn't it mean that he looks down on Islandil? But fortunately, Islandil still gave some practical benefits. The trophies. He called were actually the equipment of the mercenaries and the money of the mercenaries. King Ulrich must have paid a large deposit to hire these mercenaries. Most of these mercenaries probably didn't have time to spend it. So they must still have it with them. Therefore, the Lord is still happy to accept this kind of favor. And he can still do the work of cleaning the battlefield. But just before setting off, the Lord had a flash of inspiration and told Anson, Go and bring out all my flags. The members of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights all had mixed emotions at the moment. There is both the relief of surviving a disaster and the shame of running away without fighting. In the view of Dumbledore, the knight captain of the first team, they were indeed lucky enough to save a life. Of course, Dumbledore knew what would happen if the same number of people faced the Nolder. But just when the Nolder cavalry were resting and preparing to attack, they strangely and suddenly withdrew. Dumbledore wasn't sure why at first. He didn't see any reinforcements nearby at that time. So he cautiously continued to guard the top of the mountain for most of the day. It was not until he saw Liang's flag appearing at the bottom of the mountain that he slowly descended the mountain. The Lord is waiting at the foot of the mountain. There are only about 30 cavalry around him, but each of them holds a golden griffin flag. This is his entire flag. It is not a cavalry flag, but a Lord's flag. Lord Liang dot what's going on. Dumbledore still didn't understand the situation. You want to ask the Nolder troops? Right? They're gone. Guess why I raised so many flags? The Lord started deceiving him without even blinking. Just looking at the number of flags. You might think this is an army of 3,000 people. I understand. Thank you for your selfless help. Lord Liang. Dumbledore was still very smart. And he guessed the Lord's intention at once. He thought that Leon used a large number of flags to disguise himself as a large army to scare away the Nolder. From Dumbledore's point of view, although Leon did not support their actions at all before, he still sent troops to rescue them at the most critical moment. This is indeed admirable. The small friction before is no longer worth mentioning. Dumbledore, I know that your mission is arranged by the kingdom, but I think you can now understand why I was unwilling to let you enter before. The hatred between you and the Nolder is too deep. If you are stationed in the White Heart the villages under the fort, what do you think will happen to those villages? The Lord took the lead with a very helpless expression. I didn't expect Nolder to take the initiative to attack. In fact, I thought I was dead this time. Dumbledore nodded to express his understanding of Lord Leon's painstaking efforts. Amy, who was accompanying him, had eyes full of admiration. Leon actually reconciled the previous conflict? Look at this. The Ebony Gauntlet Knights have to be grateful to Leon. This ability to turn an accident into a sophistication and make people owe you a favor is probably called cunning. Lord Leong, in the camp over there, 
Dumbledore asked about the situation with a somewhat sad face. Those mercenaries are gone. Not a single one is left. The Lord Lord shook his head. I would like to ask you a favor. Lord Leong. Dumbledore swallowed. It was expected that the mercenary group would be wiped out. He also knew that it was impossible for Leon's troops to save those mercenaries. It would be good to scare away the Nolder cavalry team. Dumbledore, I can probably understand your intention. You want me to hide this battle report from the inside of the kingdom. Right. I can guess why you appear here instead of in the camp. Leon looked at Dumbledore with a complicated expression. He knew that Dumbledore would definitely ask him not to disclose the circumstances of those mercenaries who died in the camp. Because the Ebony Gauntlet Knights are now well organized. It is obvious that they probably fled without a fight. If anyone knew this, the reputation of the Knights of the Ebony Gauntlets would be ruined. You know, this knighthood has always boasted that it dare to charge the Noldor under any circumstances. Lord Leong, when I saw your golden coat of arms, I already guessed that you probably know the mission of our Knights. So you must also understand that even if I can't complete the mission now, I can't if people know that those mercenaries are gone so quickly. My end will definitely not be good. Dumbledore's expression was equally complicated. Of course, he didn't dare to let people know that he fled without a fight. He couldn't even let people know that all the mercenaries had been wiped out now. Otherwise, only half of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights were left alive. If word spreads, anyone everyone can guess how they survived. And there is also suspicion of deliberately killing those mercenaries. Although he did abandon those mercenaries and ran away. And he did have the intention of trapping those mercenaries so that they would block Noldo. He couldn't admit it like that. Dumbledore, we are destined. And I can help you this time. But the question is, where are you going now? You can't go back to Cliff Bay now. Can you? I don't dare to let you knights stay at White Deer Castle. Otherwise it will definitely attract the Nordo army. The Lord shook his head, seeming to be thinking about Dumbledore. Oh, you are right. Dumbledore let out a long sigh. Indeed, he can't go back now. He has to wait at least ten days and a half. Otherwise he will at least fail to fulfill his duty. But it is true that his troops cannot stay within the territory of White Deer Castle now. And his men should not dare to enter the forest anymore. He has nowhere to go now. How about this? You go to the west of Brave Shield Castle. I heard that Judah, the destroyer, entered the Noldor Forest. So you know why the Noldor army took the initiative to attack. Right. The Jata people defeated a Noldor army in the north of the forest. Then they left many war horses at the edge of the forest and chased them into the forest. The Lord pointed to the northeast. The Noldor in the forest are difficult to deal with. But the dismounted Jatu are easy to deal with. I think they will definitely bring some Noldor prisoners when they exit the forest. You can take them away. Horses. And then stop them outside the forest. And those Noldor prisoners of war will fall into your hands. This information was not easy for me to get. If you can get the Noldor prisoners of war. Remember to bring those Gadam horses to my weak collar. Come. Thank you for your advice. Master Leong. There was light in Dumbledore's eyes. And he knew that this information must be true and reliable. Because the Knights of the Ebony Gauntlets did send a team of people to lead Aldarian's troops to the Jata Grassland. If the Jata people chase into the forest, then this is his best chance now. The Jata people will definitely take the Noldor prisoners with them when they retreat. If he can take away the Jata people's horses first, then it is indeed possible for him. Defeating the Jata people and taking away the Noldor prisoners of war even if there are no noble girls among them. At least it can prove that he tried his best. Lord Leong, thank you for your help. The Ebony Gauntlet Knights will repay you. Dumbledore led the troops all the way north, marching quickly throughout the process. The Lord got a large amount of dinars and various equipment from the mercenaries who died in that camp. The cash alone was almost 100,000 dinars. This is a windfall, but there is a price to pay for this wealth. He has to rescue the Finwy family of Noldor. Leon did not deceive the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. In fact, he originally planned to go to the Northern Grassland to pick up leeks. He even sent a message to Baron Leofric, asking him to try to see if he could pick up leeks at the connection between the grassland and the forest, to a large number of war horses. But after thinking about the second half of what Islandil told him, the Lord finally decided to lead the army directly into the forest to rescue the Finway family head-on. The Jata people are also his enemies and Leon's Nolder blood is likely to come from the Finway family. The Lord feels that, of course, this requires positive support. It's not for any blood relationship. Nor is it for Noldo to be grateful to him, but for the technology Nolder elf horses and enchanted equipment mastered by the Finway family. 
Chapter 169 Chaotic War Situation From Rasadalin, Leon already understood the overall situation of the Nolder Elves. There are currently four tribes of Nolder Elves. Aner, Finarfin, Finwi, and the Dalian tribe, which is not yet an official family. The most well-known family leaders are Islandil and Aldarian, who often lead the army. But neither of these two Nolder lords were actually elven kings. 300 years ago, humans invaded on a large scale. Although the elves successfully defeated the human army, the four major families suffered heavy losses. Islandil's father was seriously injured and disabled, and then retired. Islandil became the leader of the Aner family. But he has not been crowned for 300 years, and has always been. His Royal Highness, an Aldarian's, Darian tribe, is not actually a family. Because Aldarian is actually a warlord. He was a warrior of House Finley. In the war with humans, Aldarian used his unparalleled archery skills to repel powerful enemies and save his family. He became the most outstanding Twilight Knight in the past few hundred years. He once served as the leader of the counterattack against the human army. He was also awarded the Nolder Elf's treasure. The Bow of the End. This bow was originally in the hands of the Elf King, Balthazar. But this Elf King had no heirs. He originally regarded Aldarian as the heir to the Finley family. But in the process of fighting back against the human army, this powerful warrior gradually became an extreme racist and was extremely hostile to the humans of Pender. This is understandable. After all, many of his family members and comrades died in the wars initiated by humans in those years. In the eyes of Aldarian, humans invaded the land that belonged to the Nolder elves and massacred his compatriots. Some lords even imprisoned the Nolder's proud female rangers in high towers and torture them day and night. Therefore, he constantly sends his patrols to patrol around the Chungha forest. Once they encounter humans, they will kill them without mercy. Any expression of compassion for humans will be regarded as a coward by him. But such behavior is not a good thing for the entire Nolder community. Aldarian continues to actively attack human civilians. This not only deepens the hatred between the Nolder and humans, but also causes the Nolder to lose more in the battle. Tribesmen, more importantly, War and hatred continue to deepen. The Nolder, who are closed in the forest, will be unable to communicate with the human world, trade, gain new knowledge, and even find it difficult to understand the changes in the outside world. Therefore, after discussions, the elf kings of the three major families decided to take back Aldarian's power to lead the army. Aldarian was dissatisfied with this result. In addition, he was the most powerful warrior among the Nolder elves and had great appeal. Therefore, he took away a large number of warriors who were willing to follow him, including people from three families. And then these people established a new tribe, Dalian, themselves. But fortunately, Aldarian did not initiate any civil war. And his arrows never aimed at the Nolder Elves. He was still protecting the entire ethnic group. But in his own way, he just wanted to take revenge on humans. Or just sit back and watch the battles between humans. Hoping that one day humans would be weak due to internal strife and Nolder would have the opportunity to rule the continent of Pender. The three elf kings were not willing to lose their tribesmen due to internal strife, and Eldarian did have outstanding achievements. So they chose to acquiesce and set aside a territory for Eldarian. The Aner family, led by Islandil, has always been the tribe that inherits knowledge among the Nolder. What they are most concerned about is the acquisition and protection of all kinds of knowledge. As for the Fenway family, the elf king Fergusoner has concentrated on cultivating elf horses and manufacturing various weapons and equipment in the past 300 years, and basically no longer appears in front of people. As for the Finarfin family, the elf king Kali von Iyar is an artist and scholar. He is most concerned about the art and culture passed down by the Nolder and has never participated in wars. Knowledge, technology, and art are the inheritance of the original three major families. The tribe founded by Eldarian had no such inheritance. So his territory was only regarded as a warlord tribe by the Nolder. However, the Noldor are still quite united, and there has been no civil war among the four ethnic groups. In fact, the Finwi family is in more danger now. The elf king Fergusoner has no heirs, and his bloodline is about to be cut off. Aldarian also took away the largest number of people from the Finwi family. This resulted in the Finwi family's population becoming extremely small. It is said that there are only 800 people now. This weak family mastered the Noldor's elf horse and equipment forging technology. And the Elf King also had different ideas from warlords like Aldarian. It was supposed to be prone to accidents. But in fact, no vicious events occurred in the past 300 years. On the contrary, Aldarian would deliberately protect the Fenway family. 
Similarly, if Aldarian's tribe needs war horses and equipment, the Fenway family will fully support it. Although there are ideological conflicts between the two parties, the friendship is still there, and Aldarian is not regarded as a betrayer. However, after the most powerful Noldor warrior in hundreds of years suffered his first defeat in his life, he unintentionally brought the greatest danger to the Fenway family. The territory of the Fenway family is actually located in the mountains and dense forests 200 miles east of White Deer Castle. Each Noldor tribe has its own territory, but the boundaries are not so clearly defined. Today, forests are to the Noldor what farmland is to humans. Because most of the Noldor elves are vegetarians, fruits and nuts produced in the forest are their staple food. Of course, this does not mean that they do not eat meat or pasta. The main reason is that the forest is not suitable for lighting fires for cooking. Therefore, the Noldor elves rarely kill forest animals for meat. But they still have hunters who specialize in shooting birds and beasts. The food chain in the Noldor forest is not too complete. And there are not many ferocious beasts. The top of the food chain here was originally bears, forest wolves, and goshawks. However, because the north of the forest is close to the Jata grassland, and the Jata people particularly like to use wolf teeth to make ornaments and arrowheads. The number of wolves has gradually decreased. Goshawks are semi-migratory birds. In cold seasons, they fly south to spend the winter. However, the Bacchus people in the south like to use eagle feathers to make headdresses and catch goshawks and raise them as falcons. The Bacchus people even use falcons for their military flags. But their love for eagles directly led to a sharp decline in the number of goshawks. There are many savages in the Misty Mountains in the east. The savages in the Misty Mountains like to hunt bears very much. And sometimes they even enter the forest to hunt. The result is that the balance of organisms is destroyed. Natural enemies are reduced. And vegetarian animals become more rampant. Therefore, the Nolder Elves will specially organize young people to shoot those excessive birds and beasts. Otherwise the forest will sooner or later be eaten up by vegetarian animals that breed very quickly. This is also a way for the Nolder Elves to grow up and their bows and arrows were also trained in such an environment. Now the Lord is in the forest, looking at many animal carcasses with amazement, and no one has taken care of him. Lisa Dillon led the way. Only he could fully grasp the direction in this primitive forest. Lisa Dillon, were these animals shot to death by your tribe? Even if you don't eat meat, why don't you peel off the skins? When he saw a relatively fresh body of a wild badger lying dead under the tree, Leong finally couldn't help but ask. Because there is already too much leather. We can't trade with humans. So of course there's no need to bother. It's better to let them return to the earth. Rosatalin looked back and shook his head. Besides, we don't like to use fur. Even after it is tanned, we can still smell the fishy smell of fur. I originally thought it was because the Nolder elves love animals. Anson, who was accompanying him, seemed a little disappointed. Huh? A tribe that is always facing the danger of extinction will always consider survival. The fishy smell of the fur will attract wild beasts and bring danger to the tribe. Lisa Dillon explained. But with Nolder's skills, he shouldn't be afraid of wild beasts. Anson still didn't understand. Because the number of ferocious beasts in this forest is too small. We are not willing to kill them. Too few ferocious beasts will cause other animals to reproduce in large numbers. When I was a child, I shot many animals. All according to the instructions of my elders. There are standards for which animals should be killed at what time and in what quantities. All of this is for the survival of our people in the forest. Only by ensuring the balance between species can the forest remain viable for a long time. Thereby ensuring that our people being able to get enough food is no different from how humans farm and weed. Lisa Dillon is in a much better mood now and talks a lot more. I see. What about this? What's going on with this? Anson pointed to a dead bear cub in front of him. The Lord and Risa Dillon frowned and walked over quickly. It was a little bear, definitely less than a year old, lying under a big tree with two arrow holes in its chest. This is what the Jada people did. Everyone prepares for battle. The Nolder would not shoot a cub. And like Rasadarin, most Nolder elves were taught the importance of ecological balance in the forest from an early age. Bears have almost become protected animals in the eyes of the Nolder elves, unless they actively attack the Nolder. The elves will not take the initiative to harm them. But the cubs obviously do not have the ability to attack the Nolder. Now that they encounter the shot cubs, it naturally means that the Jata people who invaded the forest from the grassland are not far away. At the same time, Chungha Town has become a chaotic situation. Leslie was rushing to White Deer Castle to report the news. Because two days ago, 
There was a big battle between Godric's troops and Duke Alma's troops in Long River Town. This was a civil war in the true sense of the word. It starts with Godric chasing those Red Brotherhood members. Around the same time that the Lord captured Levius again, the troops of Godric and Charles followed the fleeing Red Brotherhood members and pursued them all the way to the vicinity of Payne Village, southeast of Lion Lake City. Later, they found traces of the Horn Calling Rangers. There are more than 400 members of the Horn Call Rangers here, most of whom are Ralph's Rangers. It was obviously strange for the Rangers to appear in this position. And of course both Godric and Charles could sense something was wrong. Moreover, after the Horn Call Rangers saw the gangsters running for their lives, they immediately began to intercept and kill those gangsters. This caught Godric off guard. He originally planned to chase these Red Brotherhood members all the way to find the mastermind. Or at least capture the leader of these gangsters. Godric had no intention of killing these gangsters. Even if he wanted to destroy them, he would at least capture a few alive leaders. Of course, these gangsters have now traveled seven to eight hundred miles and arrived at Payne Village, which is only more than a hundred miles away from Sherhu City. This is already very illustrative. However, Godric wanted to catch the gangsters alive. But now the rangers are intercepting and killing the gangsters without leaving any survivors alive. It feels like they are killing them. So Godric planned to stop this behavior and sent many soldiers to convey orders to the rangers to stop attacking and capture prisoners. But what was unexpected was that the Horn Call Rangers completely ignored his orders. The local knights of Chongha Town actually ignored the orders of the military chief of the eastern region. It was obvious that there was something wrong with this ranger. So Godric took an army of more than a thousand people and planned to surround these rangers. But what's even more strange is that after the rangers killed the bandits, they didn't leave. Instead, they waited in place. They even put down their weapons and surrendered directly, letting Godric surround them. Later, Godric found a seriously injured Ralph in the village of Payne. Since Raphael was held hostage by the Duke of Alma, Ralph could only obey Alma's command and led the rangers to help Alma form a military deterrent, regained Lion Lake City, and followed Alma to prepare to go to Fort Brave Shield. But he didn't expect that Duke Alma's real target was not Brave Shield Castle, but Long River Town. The Duke of Alma initially brought out more than half of the military forces in Lion Lake City, plus the Horn Call Rangers, a total of 2,500 troops, and led the army westward, saying that he wanted to rescue Fort Brave Shield. But as soon as they reached the north of Payne Village, another scout came to report that apparently Ong had committed treason and rebellion in Chunga Town. At that time, the news of Liang's treason was indeed spreading. So the rangers were divided into two factions, including Ralph, Half of the people felt that Baron Leon would not do this. This must be false news. The other half felt that regardless of whether it was fake news or not, they should return to Chang'e Town. They should go back to Chang'e Town first to make sure that everything was alright in their hometown before going to rescue Brave Shield Castle in time. So the Duke of Alma took the other half of the rangers, plus his own troops, an army of more than 2,000 people to Lunga Town, and asked Ralph to take the rangers to support Fort Brave Shield. But in fact, the task he gave Ralph was to kill all the Red Brotherhood members he could see along the way. As long as this was completed, he would let Raphael go. Ralph's only son is in the hands of Alma. So of course he could only obey the arrangements on the surface. But after Alma's last experience in Long River Town, he already knows what Alma is going to do. So, after Alma left, Ralph told the Rangers the situation he was facing. After all, Ralph had been the Knight Commander of the Horn Call Rangers for 20 years. The rangers all trusted him and knew that he never lied, regardless of whether Longa Town will eventually be controlled by Alma or Leon. It is an internal struggle among the lords of the kingdom, and the Horn Call rangers have no interest in participating. Anyway, any lord who controls Chang'e Town will not harm the civilians, as long as his hometown is not harmed by Jata people or bandits. But if Raphael is rescued, at least Ralph will not be controlled, and Lion Lake City is nearby, so there will be no delay. So the rangers decided to save people first. Ralph and the rangers all believed that Raphael must be imprisoned in Lion Lake City. Therefore, this half of the horn summoning rangers planned to try to send an elite team to sneak into the city and rescue Raphael. But Ralph failed. Although more than half of the garrison in Sherhu City was taken away, the first flag guard was still in the city. And the flag officer, Grand Long, was not an easy person to deal with. The most important thing is that Raphael is not in Sherhu City prison. Ralph and Granlon fought to the death, and the elite team of the Horncall Rangers was almost completely lost. 
Ralph was seriously injured and managed to escape from the city. Ralph was so seriously injured that he could barely move. He had originally told the rangers to go to Brave Shield and leave him and Raphael alone. But the rangers were still loyal to him. Not only did they not abandon him, they also followed Alma's request to him and intercepted and killed all the members of the Red Brotherhood they saw. They were originally dispatched to suppress bandits. Really speaking of which, Alma didn't lie to them either. Godric, who knew all the situation, had no choice but to temporarily recruit the rangers into the army and then rushed to Longa Town. He is more worried about Chang'e Town than Ralph because most of the Chang'e Town garrison is currently in his team. And there are only two to three hundred people in the city's garrison. When he arrived at Longa Town, the Golden Lion flag was still hanging on the city. And the city was quite peaceful. Godric originally thought that Alma had not succeeded. But just as he led his troops into the city, a large net fell from the sky. It was a big fishing net. Both Chang'e Town and Shuru City were backed by lakes and seas. There were many fishing nets. And Shuru City was actually backed by a large inland sea. Fishermen had long used this kind of net to catch big fish. Godric was extremely skilled and was not seriously injured. But no matter how skilled he was, there was really nothing he could do against this kind of net. And he was captured. The ones who attacked him were none other than the troops from Shuru City. Alma's men. The moment the big net fell, the city gate of Chang'e Town was also closed when the troops were halfway in. The troops on both sides started a brutal battle in Long River Town. But Godric's troops were certainly no match due to calculations or unintentional calculations. And the town soon became a river of blood. But Charles saw the opportunity quickly. He was walking behind. And when he saw the city gate closed, he immediately ran out with the red arrow long archers around him. And he actually ran out. But then the troops from Shurhu City began to pursue Charles all the way. And deliberately stopped him from running to the southeast. It was obvious that the enemy knew about his relationship with Liang. Charles couldn't run in the direction of Mexiangling, seeing that there were only about 200 brothers following him, and there were at least a thousand enemy troops chasing him. He was unable to fight, so he simply let all the brothers run away separately. He himself ran to the west, while most of the Red Arrow Longbowmen went to their hometown of Fletcher in the northeast. Charles was brave enough to lure the enemy. The troops from Shurhu City chased Charles all the way and basically ignored the fleeing soldiers. However, Charles was not overtaken. He fled into the village of Kerwin, which was the home of the Countess. The Countess did shelter him and hid him in the wine cellar. Chapter 170 Who is the Rebel? Circumstances in life are always full of wonderful coincidences. Charles fled into Kerwin village. This was probably an instinctive reaction. Just to survive. But he did not expect that the troops from Shurhu City did not pursue him into Kewen village. In the eyes of most people, Charles is just a small character. He is just a knight under Baron Leon. His fiefdom is the border village of Fletcher, with a population of only a few hundred. He is not well known and his skills are not very strong. He is neither rich nor noble, nor powerful. And he is still an illegitimate child. In addition to the praise of killing his enemies with his own hands to avenge his father. In the eyes of a noble like Alma, he was almost as if he didn't exist. And of course, there was no need to pursue him. The large troops in Lion Lake City will continue to pursue Charles. The reason is actually that those troops and Charles have the same destination of Kerwin Village. After the army of Lion Lake City entered Quinn, they immediately took control of Baron Leofric's territory in the north of Quinn. The Countess's estate, on the other hand, was not disturbed at all. However, Dalian, who claimed the throne in Kerwin Village, was soon caught and Leofric's territory could not protect him. In fact, the troops from Shurhu City came specifically to capture Dalian. The Duke of Alma has actually known about Dalian's existence for a long time. The Red Brotherhood has spies everywhere. Not long after Dalian came down from the mountain. From the first time, he showed King Pinder's ring to others. The information had already reached Alma's ears. It's just that Alma happened to be involved in a heresy lawsuit at the time. And she didn't have time to react. But now, of course, Alma could think of the guy who claimed the throne with Pinder blood. When Dalian was captured, Eric was still engaged in real estate in the ruins. After hearing about this, Eric was very smart and did not go to the rescue blindly. Instead, he immediately sent an order to the Chang'e Express in Chang'e Town to close down. And all armed personnel were hidden in the city and on standby. This is why Leong asked Eric to manage the team's bodyguard. Eric has enough brains. He can consider many things and make relatively reasonable arrangements. Eric could at least think that when Duke Alma's men captured Dalian, 
It was definitely not to kill him, but to take advantage of Dalian's identity. Then there is no need to save Dalian, because he will definitely not die and may even be crowned king. But Alma occupied Chungha town. In order to avoid losses, the escorts had to hide first. An ambush in the city might be effective, because Alma definitely doesn't know about Chungha Express. The company was founded and developed during the time when the Duke of Alma was busy with the lawsuit. The name Chang'e Express doesn't seem to be anything special. But it's just that the team will interrupt it when they go out. Carrying the banners of the three barons. Anyway, many of the coachmen work part-time. And the carriage itself is nothing special. As long as the bodyguards don't wear heraldic robes. Alma's men must not know that this is actually an army. They will only think that this is a transportation company established by Leon to make money. Anyway, the Lord has many companies. Eric himself can't even figure out how many companies his boss owns, let alone people from Sherhu City. Eric himself took a risk with 20 or 30 of his selected men. They quietly approached Chang'e Town, intending to disguise themselves as ordinary mercenaries and sneak in. In fact, this was their original business. Okay, it's not even pretending. And Leslie had quietly left Chang'e Town by waterway after the battle broke out in the city. She wanted to return to White Deer Castle to report the situation. The most important thing is that Alma attacked Godric. And immediately after capturing Godric, Alma publicly declared that Godric was treason. And accused the Red Brotherhood gangsters, who appeared in the Lion Lake City area of conspiracy with Godric. Derek is concerned. Of course, Leon was also accused at the same time. Alma directly claimed that Leon had rebelled at White Deer Castle. And Alma also claimed that Baron Leofric was an accomplice to Leon and Godric. This is the rhythm to wipe out all the powerful barons in the eastern region. But unfortunately, although Leslie rushed to White Deer Castle as quickly as possible, she failed to see the Lord. Leon went to the Nolder Forest, and there were only Amy, Sarah and Sir Roland in White Deer Castle. Amy was furious on the spot. When she heard that Godric had been captured, she immediately announced the preparations for war, and planned to take away all the troops from White Deer Castle to save her father. Fortunately, Sarah persuaded her and Sarah only said one sentence. Amy, you told me before that you shot Fauché. Then, I think you can think of why Alma attacked your father. Other than that, he has no reason to attack Lord Godric. Then Amy became quiet. That's right. Alma dared to attack Godric in Long River Town. For no other reason than this. Godric is the military commander-in-chief of the Eastern Region and a powerful nobleman of the Lion Kingdom. If the king's brother-in-law attacked Godric in Longa Town, it was definitely a rebellion. And it was unforgivable because Chang'e Town is now a territory directly under the king's jurisdiction. Not an ordinary noble territory. If it were two big nobles fighting for power and territory, like Alma and Odin fighting openly and secretly two years ago, most people would probably pretend not to notice, including the king, who would turn a blind eye, because that's so normal, and that's the way it should be. If the nobles no longer fight for power, then it is the king who should be afraid. But now reach is the king's personal domain. And Godric is King Ulrich's appointed supreme military governor in the east. In River Town, Godric not only represents the law of the country, but also represents the authority of the king. Plus, he's King Ulrich's brother-in-law, even Duke Brennus, the most powerful nobleman in the Lion Kingdom. The Lord of Cliff Bay and the leader of the Lion Knights would ask his son Marbert not to talk to Godric when he asked him to serve as the acting administrator of Lunga Town. A conflict occurred. Lord Marbert didn't even dare to escort Leon to Lion City, lest he offend Godric. In fact, no one can touch Godric in River Town except the king. The Duke of Alma is an old man. If someone like him dares to march an army into the territory directly under the king's jurisdiction and attack the king's brother-in-law, it is certainly not because of a hothead. This is for revenge. Alma returned to Lion Lake City, and after asking everything from Fawcett, he already knew who killed Foss Cher. When Amy shot Fauché, the escaping pirates must have seen it. And Fawcett knew the cause of Fauché's death. Before retaking Lion Lake City, Alma certainly didn't think about dealing with Godric. In fact, he initially just asked the Red Brotherhood to hold Godric back. But after knowing the truth, Alma's mind must have changed. He may be ready to go against anyone. After all, Alma is Fauché's father. His favorite son was killed. It is impossible for any father to maintain absolute sanity. Although Fauché was only an illegitimate child, he was an open illegitimate son. Alma publicly recognized Fauché as his son, but she had no inheritance rights. His biological son died, and he was the eldest son, 
so Alma must take revenge. Moreover, Alma will definitely expand his revenge, and he will not leave Godric as a terrible enemy to himself. Therefore, he first entered Chungha town to ambush and capture Godric, and then accused Godric of treason with Leon, using this method to force Leon and Amy to show up on their own. He didn't even have to bother and attack a strong city like White Deer Castle. After some consideration, the three women came to a unified conclusion that Lord Godric would definitely be safe for a while. And Alma would not kill him even if she was crazy. But Alma would catch Godric just so that Leon and Amy, the two murderers of Fawcett, could be sent to their homes to die. Amy suppressed her impatience. She also knew that she would definitely die if she led troops to Chang'e town now. But now, there was nothing she could do. On the contrary, Sir Roland had some ideas. After he heard several women talk about things related to Fauché, he believed that people like Fauché were irredeemable and were the kind of criminals who definitely deserved death. Amy's shooting of him was just enforcing the law on behalf of the goddess. It's just law. In Roland's opinion, such people are more hateful than heretics who torture innocent people, kill civilians, rape, plunder, and even harm the people in their own family's fiefdom. The duke who avenges such criminals. Roland felt that such revenge was dishonorable and was a way of framing others. So he gave his own suggestion to go to Chang'e town and have a look. If Godric can be rescued, then give it a try. If it really can't be saved, then at least we can learn more about the situation. He is a paladin. No one can stop him from going anywhere. Alma does not know him. He can indeed enter Chang'e town openly. It's just that he definitely doesn't have the ability to rob a prison. In terms of martial arts, Roland is indeed very strong. But he is a truly decent person. And he can't even lie. So Sarah and Leslie planned to go with Roland. Only Amy was almost forced to stay in White Deer Castle by these people. They all liked Amy. And they all knew what would happen if Amy appeared in front of Alma. Chungha Town. The Duke of Alma was sitting in Godric's chair. He was looking at a king's order with a golden lion crest on the table. It was an edict from the Lion Kingdom. And the general content was to transfer Chang'e Town to the Duke of Alma in the name of the Lion King. Chang'e Town is Alma's hometown. And it is also the family territory that he wants to restore throughout his life. The family territory was lost in his hands. And of course, he wants to get it back with his own hands. Such a transfer of territory is certainly in line with Alma's wishes. This was also the reason why he could easily settle in Chang'e Town without causing any commotion. However, this king's decree probably has nothing to do with King Ulrich. You can think of it with your knees. King Ulrich will definitely not seal Chang'e Town to the Duke of Alma, who already owns Lion Lake City. But so what? As long as the people in Chang'e Town do not object to this transfer order, it will be fine. In this way, Alma is executing the will of the Lion King, no matter whether it is Ulrich or Alanric sitting on the Silver Throne. It is the Lion King. In Alma's opinion, it would probably be more appropriate if the person on the throne was Alanric. After all, Ulric was definitely not so generous. This edict is a gift from Prince Alanric to Alma. A great gift. If the Horton family reoccupies Chang'e town, and the entire eastern and northern parts of the kingdom are connected, such a territory would be almost half the size of the Lion Kingdom in terms of area. It's just that the population is relatively small. The eastern part and the Biba Gulf are both sparsely populated areas with vast territory. And the population is not large. The eastern region with Chang'e town as its core has a total population of only over 200,000. After all, it is a pioneering area. Border fortresses such as Brave Shield Castle and White Deer Castle are at war with each other all year round. And they face the most troublesome enemies. Biba Gulf, with Shirhu City as its core, has about 300,000 people. This area used to have a large population, but it has been harmed by the Jata people for more than a hundred years. Now the northeast has completely become a no man's land, and a large number of people have moved to Chiaoyan Bay or the southwest. The northwest region with Chiaoyan Bay as its core is prosperous and prosperous. Kainburg is also a big city. The entire northwest has a population of more than half a million, which is equivalent to the combined population of the eastern region and the Biba Gulf. As for the western region, that is, from Lion City to Changshao Fort, this area has basically never been invaded by foreign enemies. In addition, the land is fertile and easy to cultivate, so there are villages and towns everywhere. There are nearly one million people in the entire western region, which is almost equal to the combined population of the other three regions. But population is one thing. Combat effectiveness is another. When it comes to combat effectiveness, 
the troops in the east and north are the main combat effectiveness of the Lion Kingdom, because these two places have been at war for a long time. The soldiers have much richer combat experience. If we understand it in another way, it is probably that most of the soldiers in the eastern and northern regions are relatively high-level arms. Although the western region has a larger population, the soldiers are generally lower level and have less actual combat experience. Therefore, if he can control the eastern and northern gulfs, the Duke of Alma will no longer be afraid of anyone, including King Ulrich. As long as he can control River Town, the Horncall Rangers can only submit to him, because this is the home of the Rangers. Now he still has more than 1,000 troops in Lion Lake City, and more than 2,000 people in Chungha Town. In addition, although they can't stand him, they must only temporarily obey his horn summoning Rangers, as well as their ally Baron Ketelin. Alma now has an army of 5,000 men, and he has enough confidence to do anything. Now that they have captured Long River Town and Godric, the only troubles Alma needs to face in the east are White Deer Castle and Brave Shield Castle. The three barons in the eastern region are allies and close business partners. Of course Alma knows this situation, so he will deal with it together. In Alma's view, White Deer Castle and Brave Shield Castle were both borders. The military forces in both places did not dare to move rashly so they would not be able to attack him, and they would have to surrender sooner or later, to make Leofric a brave shield surrender. Of course, he had to control Leofric's original territory, so he sent troops from Shurhu city to Kuen village. As for White Deer Castle, Liang is now in charge of it, and Alma naturally plans to solve Liang's problem. Alma already knew that what Fawcett did was closely related to Leon's deception. Fauché was also killed by Liang or Amy, and he would definitely take revenge. In fact, Alma couldn't even figure out when Leon started to oppose him. Probably, he said a few words to Rainier when he was in the throne room. But Rainier is Alma's nephew. Of course, Alma would speak for her nephew on that occasion. But who knew that all kinds of troubles would appear one after another? Alma thought that Leon was quite cunning and that White Deer Castle might not be that easy to deal with. So he started a series of arrangements. Just after entering Chang'e Town, he dispersed the Horn Call Rangers to various villages in the form of a hundred-man team to guard against the Jata people. Although Alma colluded with the Jata people, he, like Ulrich, only caused harm to others. Territory. When Chang'e Town becomes his territory, he will not let the Jata people cause trouble anymore. Of course, this arrangement is mainly to comply with the Ranger Group's desire to protect the country, so as to prevent the Ranger Group from ruining his affairs. The Horn Call Rangers indeed have no intention of participating in the Civil War and have no objection to this arrangement. Then Alma did release Raphael. And the Duke could be said to keep his word. But Raphael hated him with all his heart. The young Raphael impulsively moved his hands on Alma as soon as he was released. Of course, this had no effect. As Alma now had hundreds of knights around him to protect him. But Alma was not angry. He even told Raphael, I know your father is friends with Baron Leon. Take your father to White Deer Castle. As a result, young Raphael left Chang'e town with a seriously injured Ralph and a small group of rangers who were willing to follow Ralph, intending to defect to Leon. That's about 50 rangers. But not long after they left Long River Town, Alma issued an order to arrest the rebel leaders, Ralph and Raphael, and his son. Any lord who takes in the rebels will be regarded as treason. It is absolutely true that Ralph was charged with killing nobles and creating riots in Lion Lake City. In order to rescue his son, Ralph killed many knights in Lion Lake City. Some of them were indeed minor nobles. It caused a lot of trouble. And it is absolutely true that Raphael was accused of attacking the duke in public. And many people in Chang'e town saw it. Ralph's previous identity was a pioneer baron granted by the king. In other words, he was not officially a noble. With such a charge, it means that his status as a pioneer baron has expired and he is now a convicted civilian. As for Raphael, his current identity is also a civilian. For civilians to kill nobles and cause riots, or to attack high-ranking nobles. Both of these crimes are capital crimes in the Lion Kingdom and cannot be pardoned. Alma did not accuse them wrongly. He just wanted to blame Godric and Leon. He was already publicly accusing Godric and Leon of treason. If White Deer Castle took in Ralph and his son, it would indeed prove that they were all treason. Then, his attack on Godric was an act of incomparable justice, eliminating rebellion for the country and saving the kingdom. Moreover, he also found the best reason for rebellion for Godric, Leon, and Leofric, the ancient claimant to the throne of the kingdom of Pend, Dalian, 
Dalian is indeed a rebel to the Lion Kingdom. This is a certainty. And Dalian himself will not deny it. But Alma probably didn't expect that just when all his plans were successful. Something happened to him. Chapter 171 Destined Cause and Effect Lion City Old Noble House Tower Your Highness, your father has not been in charge of government for more than 10 days and has not even seen anyone. Probably the only one who can see him now is Princess Felina. I think you should go to the palace and find a way to see him, just in case. Archmaster Igor was still speaking respectfully to Alan Rick. My dear uncle, I can probably understand why he doesn't see anyone. He may be a little confused now and can't control himself. It won't do any good if I go to see him. There may be danger. He may still be there. I didn't find the lion seal in my hand. Alan Rick seemed to look better. But this was probably due to mental factors. He had put on long sleeves to cover his arms. But there were also some red spots under his cheeks and neck. He was still leaning in front of the window. Playing with a seal in his hand. It was a pure gold seal with a lion showing its teeth and claws. That is the authority of a king. Your Highness. Perhaps. I should call you your majesty now? In fact. In my opinion. The best way is to let your father never wake up. Igor lowered his head and spoke very softly. Shut up. He is my father. He has never abused me. Although I want to get everything I deserve. I will not murder him. Just like he did not murder my grandfather. Alanric turned around. With a cold glint in his eyes. Alanric. Son. You probably don't know what your father did back then. Dot I mean not letting him wake up. But I didn't kill him. Dot your father treated your crazy grandfather. That's what you do. Igor suddenly raised his head, with a mocking smile on his face. Alanric's hand playing with the golden seal paused, and he looked at Igor intently, with some surprise in his eyes. What did he dot do? The sarcasm on Igor's face became even more obvious. King Ulrich was a filial prince back then. He knew that your grandfather had been tortured by pain. So he used psychedelic drugs to relieve your grandfather's pain every day. And like you, he took away the seal of the lion when your grandfather was unable to govern and asked me to write a will imitating your grandfather's handwriting. Has he tampered with the inheritance? Why? I mean that will. Is it necessary? He is my grandfather's only son. Alan Rick already had a look of disbelief on his face. Because your grandfather did not originally intend to pass the throne to him. The person who was supposed to become the Lion King was your grandfather's younger brother, Prince Raymond Rick, the father of Princess Felina. I was very worried at that time. He is young but I can probably guess the reason why Princess Felina has never suffered from this genetic disease. Moreover, the prince has many friends and a high reputation, and almost all the nobles support him. Igor sighed deeply. In fact, if his royal highness hadn't died unexpectedly, and with the help of Princess Felina, it would have been difficult for your father to secure the position of king. Until Bryn ten years ago, Duke News helped him rebuild the Knights of the Lion, and he really gained a foothold. The death of Prince Raymond Dodd is it related to him? Alan Rick asked this sentence with some difficulty. Dodd maybe not. After all, it was indeed an accident. That prince didn't like power struggles. He preferred to travel outside every day. And he was the prince of Chiaoyan Bay at that time. He had wealth, glory, power and everything. Life is much better than that of the king. He was not willing to go to Lion City to be the king and deal with government affairs every day. There are always some people in this world who don't like busy official duties and just want to live a leisurely life. What's more, he does have the capital of a happy life. Besides, being a king who needs to clean up the mess of the mad king is not a pleasant job for him. Igor seemed to feel some feelings too. He shook his head, probably laughing at himself. After all, he himself has been pursuing power all his life. Then Dot, how did he die? Alanric's expression was also a little complicated. Speaking of which, he can live a life of ease and he also has the capital. Not long before your father ascended the throne, his royal highness the prince fell during a rock climbing activity and was seriously injured. He died not long after. He was 50 years old and loved adventure sports such as rock climbing and diving. You can imagine that this the temperament of the prince. In fact, he died with no regrets. I met him for the last time with your parents. And he even passed away with a smile. I guess there was no conspiracy in his death but it was really an unlucky time. So many people did think that King Ulrich did it. As a result, your father encountered a lot of difficulties and doubts in the ten years after he ascended the throne. Igor sighed deeply. In fact, King Ulrich had little power at that time. 
and he had to deal with your crazy grandfather while cleaning up the mess left by your grandfather. He had no power at all. That ability to murder the prince. Alanric let out a long breath and seemed to relax a little. Dear uncle, forget about the psychedelics you just mentioned. Alanric changed the topic back and shook his head at Igor. I think my father is probably not happy to drink that kind of thing. He would rather endure the pain. If I give him the psychedelic drug, I will he will probably draw his sword and chop me to death. On the contrary, I am very interested in tampering with the will. Maybe you can try to write one for me. Your ability to imitate handwriting is really impressive. Igor sighed. You father and son have exactly the same temperament. But your highness, why did you hand over Lunga town to the Duke of Alma? That duke will not be loyal to anyone. Humph. As long as he is loyal to himself. That's fine. Do you think I'm handing over Changna town to him? Ha ha ha. Eager. I came to you to ask you to put the seal of the fierce lion in Lion Lake City, and go to Alma stole the king's seal, and forge the king's decree. Do you think my father will lead an army to attack him? Alanric laughed. He seemed to enjoy the feeling of controlling others in his hands. You? Igor's eyes widened, and he wanted to say something. But at this time, Alanric had already thrown the gold seal in his hand over. The Grand Maester hurriedly caught it. But at this time, Alanric had already turned his back. A king should die gloriously on the battlefield. Not in a secret room or toilet. If he cannot conquer rebellion, then. Let me. Maybe it's destiny. Or maybe the goddesses do have some divine protection. The causes that Liang had planted before came to fruition at the most dangerous time. After all, history is always made up of coincidences. Although Dalian was captured by the troops of Shurhu City, he was not taken to Chungha Town. Because not long after the troops from Shurhu City left Qin Village, they unexpectedly encountered an army of nearly a thousand people. Noisy. Alaric and his group of drunkards. No one knows where the drunkards were before. But there is no doubt that Alaric cares about Kerwin Village. Because here is the largest winery in the continent. And thanks to Leon, this is the only place willing to do business with him. So Alaric came to buy goods. And this time, he even brought enough money. Now is the beginning of August, which happens to be the season when the grapes in Kewen Village are ripe. Kewen has a good climate. The grapes here will ripen at the end of summer every year. And when the grapes mature, it is naturally the time when wine is brewed in large quantities. Alaric and his group of drunkards came to buy wine at this time, probably with the idea of taking over the production of the Countess Winery at once. As a result, they happened to meet the troops from Shurhu City. The troops in Lion Lake City didn't know that the drunker group was just passing through. They thought it was a guy claiming the throne from Dalian's army, but he only had 20 people under his command. In the eyes of the troops in Lion Lake City, they thought it was quite abnormal. You should know that Alma did not stop by Kerwin Village directly on her way south to Chungha Town. Instead, she went to Chungha Town first to ambush Godric before sending people over. She was worried that there might be a large number of rebels in Kerwin Village. In order not to waste time and to ambush Godric more smoothly, he chose to control Chungha Town first, and then send people to Kerwin Village. And after taking control of Chungha Town, he even sent thousands of people out. Alma was actually not sure how many people Dalian had. After all, he heard that there was a claimant to the throne in Kerwin Village three months ago. Now, he really didn't know what the situation was. Logically speaking, it should be quite normal to have hundreds of people. Right. After all, it doesn't seem very scientific to dare to claim the throne with 20 people. But in fact, when Dalian first claimed the throne, he didn't have anyone under his command. Half a month ago, he only had about 10 people under his command. Now these 20 people have actually received help from Leon and Eric in the past few days. I got it when I had some money. Therefore, the troops in Shurhu City naturally believe that the members of the drunker group might be the main force of the rebels. As a result, the two sides fought an unclear and terrible battle. And the one who won in the end was the drunker group. Although Alaric's troops are just a ragtag group of people, these drunkards are not afraid of death and have a fighting goal. For the sake of the wine here, the combat effectiveness they exert is extremely terrifying. In addition, Alaric goes crazy whenever he fights. No one can stop this heavily armored man with terrifying divine power from going crazy. After adding dozens of dead souls under his huge long-handled hammer, the people of Lion Lake City the troops were scared. The troops said by Alma were not elite troops at first. In fact, they were the troops stationed in Chungha Town that Liang had deceived. The cavalry among them also followed Liang to fight the three prophets. But the leading knight was now different. 
This group of people would of course be afraid of a monster player like Alaric, who had the same power as the Three Prophets. This reminded them once again of the power of the Three Prophets. As a result, the troops in Shurhu City were generally at a loss. After more than 30% of the casualties were killed, the troops in Shurhu City began to retreat toward Changha Town. Of course, this is also a normal situation for human troops. The casualties exceed 30% before retreating, which is actually not bad. In fact, Alaric's group of drunkards had lost more than 40% of their men, but they still chased the troops from Shurhu City with high spirits to hunt down these drunkards. They might not even know how many people died on their side. When Alaric led these drunkards to fight like crazy, it was indeed quite scary. This group of drunkards couldn't feel pain or tiredness, and they had no tactics. They only knew how to swarm up and attack them. But in the hilly areas near Kuin, the effect of the attack was quite good. As a result, Dalian was rescued in such a strange way. And after the Lion Lake City troops abandoned him and ran away, Alaric's drunkard group also chased after him. But Dalian and his few remaining men were actually left there. People manage. Alma obviously did not expect that the thousands of troops he sent would be defeated. The return of the defeated army also led to his misjudgment. He also thought that there were indeed a large number of rebels in Kerwin Village. In this case, he did not send any more troops to Kerwin Village. Instead, he gathered troops to defend Chungha Town, and then publicly accused Baron Leofric of treason. If a large number of rebels appeared in Kerwin Village, it certainly meant that Leofric was indeed a rebel. Alma thought that he had found the truth unintentionally. In fact, he was not worried about defeat, but instead a little excited, because in this way, he doesn't even have to frame him anymore. Alma originally planned to capture Dalian and then concoct some evidence that the three barons in the eastern region were loyal to the rebels. But now it seems that this evidence does not need to be concocted. Groundless accusations can easily have loopholes. But there will be no problem in accusing them of real crimes. Just like the reason why Alma wanted to use Raphael to create real charges was actually to make his attack and imprisonment of Godric legal. Raphael will definitely be taken in by White Deer Castle. And White Deer Castle is Godric's territory. So Alma's capture of Godric will become reasonable. Even if the king intervenes, he cannot let Godric go. Because Raphael did attack him. He could definitely say that Godric ordered Raphael to do it. While such a crime was unlikely to lead to concrete results, it would give him reason to keep Godric locked up. As long as Godric is in his hands, Leon and Amy will naturally come to his door. A large number of rebels appeared in Kerwin Village. Leofric's territory. This was considered to be irrefutable evidence. So he directly sent people to Brave Shield Castle to capture Leofric. If Baron Leofric dares to resist capture, he will be committing treason. But if you don't resist, then you will be captured and beaten. And Leofric will be used to concoct testimony to characterize Godric. Leon and Leofric as traitors loyal to Dalian's rebel organization. This accusation is very likely to be established. Because Godric has been caught by Alma. And the evidence can be easily produced. You don't even need to bend the rules to make a few documents of allegiance or stamp a few seals. The parties don't need to do it themselves. If Alma defines the three barons in the eastern region as rebels as he wishes, then all his operations will be justified, and he will definitely be able to control the entire eastern region. Coupled with the edict issued in the name of the Lion King in his hand, Chungha Town will be legitimately taken back by him, and maybe he can also bring Brave Shield Castle and White Deer Castle with him. Although the edict was only signed by Alanric, the golden seal of the Lion King was genuine. It is impossible for King Ulrich to take back Chang'e Town under such circumstances. Unless Ulrich is willing to kill his only biological son Alan Rick, steal the king's seal, and falsely pass the king's decree. This kind of thing is impossible anywhere. It is a capital crime and absolutely inexcusable. So Alma felt that everything was fine. Although the strength of Kerwin's rebel army was a bit unexpected. At least it posed no threat to Chang'e Town. She only needed to wait in Chungha Town. If nothing unexpected happened, he really just had to wait. Alma had achieved almost everything he wanted to achieve. Maybe just one or two more nights would be okay. But an unexpected outsider unexpectedly appeared at this time. Mirgon Kirik. After Mirgon brought Ms. Nelda back to Lion Lake City with the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group, he had been thinking about how to secretly kill Alma. But in Shurhu City, he didn't get any good opportunities. Later, Alma went out with a large army. Mildon felt that an opportunity had come. So he led the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group to follow Alma's large army. Follow until south of Payne Village. The Griffin Swords were all cavalry. 
and they traveled very quickly. After judging that Alma's destination was Chang'e Town, Mirgan simply came to Chang'e Town first and asked others to ambush everywhere. While he took a few of the individual is lurking in the inner fort of Chang'e Town, the inner castle of Longa Town is where Duke Elfwan and Lady Bella once lived, and it is also where Godric's military commander is now based. Mirgan felt that Alma would definitely enter here, so he hid in Godric's office. The most dangerous but safest place. He was right. Alma was indeed here. Alma was busy dealing with various matters before, and only after he felt that everything was sure. Did he finally come to this room that meant victory? He put the imperial decree on the table and stared at it in a daze. He was probably feeling grateful. Or maybe he felt a sense of satisfaction and relief that he had accomplished all the important things. Chung'e Town was lost from his hands. And now he has taken Chung'e Town back with his own hands. The murderer of his son Foshe is also about to become a traitor and will die under the army sooner or later. Kalm will soon return to the eastern region and everything will be under his control. Soon! The king will be unable to do anything to him. Maybe he can take the opportunity to establish a Horton Principality. Now! It is the best time for the entire Holden family, full of opportunities to reach higher places. Just a month ago, he was still struggling with an accusation. This is indeed easy for an old man in his 60s to appreciate. But within a few minutes, Alma's smile and contented expression were permanently fixed on her face. He fell asleep sitting in his chair. Mirgon used the snake heart stone that Leon gave him, and all the nearby guards fell to the ground silently. Then, at the moment Alma closed her eyes, Mirgon fell from the top of the room and stabbed the duke in the vest from behind. Alma is dead. He died in Chungha town, which he had just acquired. He died silently in his sleep, still with a satisfied smile on his face. At about that time, he was dreaming that he had fulfilled his family's long-cherished wish not only becoming the master of Chang'e Town again, but also leading his family to a higher throne. The place where he died was exactly the same as the place where Alfwan died. Chapter 172 Scumbag is good at disappearing. There is no doubt that Alma is indeed good at gaining power through strategies. In the eyes of most people, he is an insurmountable mountain covered with clouds. But no one would have thought that this mountain would fall into the hands of a villain who peeks into the power. Mirgan did not consider the consequences of Alma's death at all. He just wanted to use Alma's daughter to gain power that should not belong to him. However, Miran may be a bold adventurer, but he is definitely not a qualified assassin. After the assassination was successful, the mercenary leader obviously did not control his mentality well. He neither cleaned up the scene immediately nor hid on the spot, but planned to escape directly at night. This is actually something that only inexperienced novice assassins can do. After the assassination is successful, the best way is to lurk in the city and wait for the city to become chaotic because of the deceased before escaping. If you have time to tidy up the scene, you should definitely tidy it up, or create some misleading, so as to increase your own safety. Most novice assassins will die within the first hour of success. Calmness and meticulousness are the most important qualities of an assassin. A guy like Lisa Dillon, who can always remain calm even after being caught is considered a high-level assassin. But Mirgan was neither calm nor thoughtful, nor even very collected. Therefore, Milgan's behavior of hurriedly fleeing the scene just after he succeeded was discovered by Alma's men without any surprise. Immediately afterwards, the entire inner fort became extremely noisy. The soldiers discovered that Alma had been assassinated, and hundreds of people began to hunt down the assassin. However, Mirgan was indeed very skilled. Although the masters he brought in all died in the inner fort of Chang'e Town, he actually managed to escape from Chang'e Town alone. In other words, it is not called killed out, but jumped out. Many things are surprisingly similar. Miron, like the previous Doom Inducer, was also blocked in the corner of the room on the fifth floor. He was also forced into the corner. Then he accidentally discovered the reversible secret door and jumped from the fifth floor into the lake. But Mirgon didn't grow up near a lake. His water resistance was not very good. And the equipment on his body was relatively heavy. Although he did not wear the blue heavy armor for the assassination, he still almost drowned. But he was lucky or Eric was lucky, and Mirgon met Eric in the water. In fact, this is not a coincidence. Eric is a native of Chang'e Town, and his best skill is swimming. He originally planned to sneak into Chang'e Town by water with 20 or 30 men, but he couldn't get in for a while. Chang'e Town was very tightly guarded, and the river terminal in the city was now guarded by many soldiers, so he kept wandering around the lake. 
preparing to try to swim in from the lake behind the inner castle. As a result, the two met in the lake behind Chongha Town. The inner fort was noisy as they were chasing Mirgan. The lights were bright, and someone jumped from the fifth floor into the water. Of course Eric could see such a big movement on the lake. So Eric rescued him from the lake. In other words, Miron fell into Eric's hands in the lake, and his life and death were indeed in Eric's hands. Although Eric was not good at martial arts, he was on land, in the water. There are really not many people who can fight against this prostitute. Of course, Mirgan is a man who knows the current affairs. In addition, he knows Eric, and they just walked hundreds of miles together not long ago. Although not friends. At least, they can be considered acquaintances. Moreover, Mirgan actually possesses the excellent quality of repaying kindness. Of course, when it is necessary to possess it, it can only be possessed. After knowing that Eric planned to enter the city, Mirgan said that most of his mercenary group was still in the city and could bring Eric in. He also told Eric everything he knew in detail. But Mirgan was not a fool. And he did not mention that he killed Alma at all. Eric was already having a headache on how to get into the city. But now, he finally found a way. So with Mergen's cooperation, Eric finally sneaked into Chang'e Town. But Eric is not a fuel-efficient lamp. And he is familiar with the environment of Chang'e Town. Of course, he can think that since Mirgan fell into the water from the inner castle, he probably did something extraordinary. So he Mirgan was tied up and brought to the station of Chang'e Express. As a result, this poor assassin who planned to flee Chang'e Town immediately was brought into the town again and was placed next to the inner fort of Chang'e Town. Chang'e Express's station was right next to the inner fort. At this time, the inner fort of Chang'e Town was already in chaos. Due to Mergen's novice behavior, Almost all of Alma's men left in the barracks in the square of the inner castle knew that the duke had been assassinated. And now they were all in chaos. These troops from Shurhu City are now leaderless and at a loss. Probably out of a sense of responsibility and instinct. They divided into two parts. One part went outside Chungha town to look for the assassin who jumped into the river. While the other part left the inner fort and launched an attack on all suspicious people in the city. Chungha town fell into full-scale riots within an hour. A small number of Shurhu city soldiers with poor military discipline began to take advantage of the opportunity to rob, killing people and taking wealth. Some local ruffians in Chungha town also began to take advantage of the troubled waters. Fortunately, Godric launched a severe crackdown when he first took office, and the robbers and bandits in Chungha town were basically extinct. Otherwise, the consequences of the riots would have been more serious. The members of the Griffin Sword mercenary group scattered in various taverns in the city became the first victims of these rebels. They were indeed the most suspicious personnel. Although this was an unexpected conflict. In fact Alma's men did find the right target. This was originally done by the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group. The members of the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group had no news about Mirgan. They thought that their leader had been killed. And they would naturally resist the attack. The female warriors of the mercenary group were really interested in Mirgan. Quite loyal. As a result, Alma's troops and the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group fought together in the city. The top leaders on both sides are absent, and the troops in Shurhu City have a numerical advantage, while the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group, although not large in number, is highly elite and has stronger individual combat capabilities. The two sides were evenly matched, and as a result, the two sides fought an indistinguishable battle in the streets of the city. This strange war lasted until late at night, since half of the troops in Shurhu City went outside the city to search for the assassin, who jumped into the river. Only half of the people were in the city. As a result, both sides suffered losses from the fight with the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group. The correct judgment Eric made before played a decisive role at this time. The escorts who were originally hiding in Chang'e Town now all put on heraldic robes and regrouped at the Chang'e Express Station. When the troops of Lion Lake City were fighting fiercely with the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group, Eric and his escorts captured the inner fort of Chang'e Town without any effort and successfully rescued Godric. Later, Godric discovered that Alma had been assassinated and saw the edict on Alma's desk. Of course Godric knew that King Ulrich could not transfer Lunga town to Alma. But he did not know that this was done by Prince Alanric. He thought that Alma forged the edict and passed on the king's edict. So Godric raised a banner and announced that Alma was rebelling. And together with Eric, he led the bodyguards to counter the rebellion. Godric, who had served as captain of the royal guard, was probably the best at cleaning up chaos in the city in the entire Lion Kingdom. He and Eric led the bodyguards to suppress them one by one, maintaining the same rules in each street, fighting more and less. 
they quickly regained control of the situation in the city. In the early morning, the entire interior of Chang'e town was cleared by Eric, Alma's men, who had no fighting spirit to begin with. All evacuated Chang'e town and retreated to Shurhu city. The Griffin Sword mercenary group was forced to fight an extremely difficult war in the city, with frighteningly high casualties. In addition, Mirgon never showed up, and the remaining 200 people of this mercenary group also left. Chunya Town fled towards Trubrin. At the same time, Sir Roland, Sarah and Leslie, who were rushing to Lunga Town, met Raphael halfway. Of course Sarah and Leslie knew Raphael. After listening to Raphael's explanation of the situation, Sarah was keenly aware that this was the method of the Duke of Alma's envoy, and she also realized that it might not be time to rob the prison. Sarah had been socializing among the nobles for many years, and was very familiar with these tricks. Alma first released Raphael, and then immediately declared that Raphael was a traitor. This was probably to blame others. At the same time, releasing Raphael would make everyone know that Godric was caught by him. Since he dared to make this public, he was probably deliberately attracting people to rob the prison. So they did not go to Chunga town, but first took Raphael and the dozens of rangers to True Brun, intending to find out the news. As a result, they happened to run into the remnants of the Griffin Sword mercenary group who had fled to True Brun. The Griffin Sword mercenary group was ahead of Alma's troops in Chang'e town. They actually knew that Raphael had attacked Alma. Since they had a common enemy, there was no conflict between the two sides. But after coming into contact with the Griffin Sword mercenary group, Sarah's expression became worse and worse. Because when some female adventurers in the Griffin Sword mercenary group mentioned Mirgon Killick, they used the name K.I.R. Sarah knew the name. She knew it eight years ago. When she was 18. The handsome knight she was obsessed with at that time. Her lover who suddenly disappeared. Called himself Keel. No wonder he disappeared. No wonder he had so many adventures. It turns out that he taught so many girls how to use swords. Sarah was dizzy and lost almost all her strength. In fact, for Miron, not only the beautiful girl could not bind him, but even Eric's rope could not bind him. What are the things that scumbags are best at? Of course, it's to disappear. After taking complete control of Chang'e Town, Eric returned to the station of Chang'e Express, only to see a few broken ropes on the ground. Mirgon had disappeared. This is actually inevitable. If he didn't have this ability, the best scumbag in Pinder would have died eight times long ago. Mirgon and Leon have the same habit. They both like to carry a concealed knife with them. However, the Lord brought a knife mainly for kidnapping while Mirgon mainly used it for running away. In his more than ten years of adventure, that knife saved him at least eight times. But Mirgon did not find his mercenary group. After escaping from Chang'e town, he went to Shurhu city alone. Leong didn't know about the chaos in Chang'e town. He was now busy facing a group of strange enemies. In other words, two groups of strange enemies. One group is the Jada people. The other group was mostly wrapped in animal skins. And they all looked like misty mountain savages. The reason why I say it is strange is because how could these two groups of people get together? The Lord couldn't understand why the Misty Mountain people attacked the Nolder Elves together with the Jata people. But at least now, he understood why Eldarion was defeated. And why the Jata dared to go deep into the Nolder Forest. Because many Misty Mountain barbarians hold heraldic shields and maces that belong to the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. And a small number of Misty Mountain people hold Nolder swords and Nolder shields. Obviously. These Misty Mountain people have probably been fighting together with the Jata people. Most of the Ebony Warhammers responsible for seducing Eldarion are gone. And their weapons have fallen into the hands of the Misty Mountain savages. Their fate is obvious. It is estimated that the Jatu and the Misty Mountain people jointly arranged an ambush. And they ambushed together with the people of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. According to Rasadalin, Eldarion hated the Jata people very much and would probably not let them go if he saw them. It is understandable that he was ambushed by the Jata people and the Misty Mountain people. Leong is now next to a forest racecourse, hiding in the dark and peeping at the situation inside the racecourse. He didn't have many people, only 200 people, which were his non-commissioned officers and some newly recruited soldiers. The ratio of recruits to veterans was one to one. This is deliberate, and the one-by-one -one approach allows recruits to grow quickly, entering the forest to help Nolder fight. He could only bring his own people. The knights and soldiers of White Deer Castle would definitely not be willing to do this kind of work. After discovering the traces of the Jata people, Rasadalin speeded up and led the team all the way here, just when the enemy was launching an attack. Since he did not have many men, 
Leon did not rush into the battlefield immediately, but kept waiting for the opportunity. Risa Dillon showed strong obedience at this time, knowing that the Lord planned to ambush the enemy. He neither urged nor became impatient. Instead, he hid in the woods to guard the flanks to prevent Liang's troops from being discovered. The Lord's troops were hiding in the dense forest and were probably not discovered. Leon was lying in the frontmost position. In front of him was an open forest grassland. This is the largest horse farm of the Nordafinma family, breeding hundreds of elven horses. This was probably the place with the sparsest trees in the Noldor forest. Wherever Leon looked, there were tall yew trees, but most of the distance between the trees was more than 20 meters. This was obviously deliberate by the Fenway family, making this racecourse the only place in the forest where horses could run. The Fenway family has about 80 people left at this racecourse led by two twilight knights and divided into two teams. One team was guarding a large stable, while the other team was in front, shooting the enemies who appeared. In fact, 80 Noldor elves are already very powerful in combat. If they were in the woods, they might be able to deal with 10 times as many enemies. But now, they were in this sparsely wooded place, lacking the cover of trees, and the Noldor elves could only fight head-on. In fact, there are not many Misty Mountain people appearing in front of them now only more than a hundred. But after obtaining sophisticated equipment, the combat effectiveness of these savages is not weak. The most important thing is that they, like the Jada people, don't care about their own lives at all, and keep charging forward despite the rain of Noldor arrows. Although dozens of corpses had been left behind, they stayed at the front and quickly approached the Noldor's lineup. There were probably more than 300 Jata people, but they were spread out widely. They basically did not come forward to participate in close combat. Instead, they consciously approach the stables. It seems that the purpose of those Jata people is indeed for the elven horses of the Noldor. It was more difficult for the Noldor who were unwilling to trade their lives with the enemy. The Noldor in the front row retreated step by step and gradually retreated to the stables. Now, they couldn't retreat. Behind them was the stable. If the Jata people got on the horses, the problem would be serious. Due to their numerical disadvantage and the fact that the Noldor wanted to protect their horses from the Jatuan, it seemed that the Noldor were about to be forced into hand-to-hand -hand combat with their enemies. This was originally something the Noldor wanted to avoid. They were unwilling to trade lives with others. Brothers, charge! When the enemy was still 20 or 30 meters away from the Noldor elves, the Lord Lord issued an order and then rushed to the front. The Lord's troops rushed over from the enemy's side. Just after rushing into the battlefield, Leon shot down a Jata man with one arrow. Then he dropped his bow and charged at the other Jata man with his sword rushing out from this direction. It happened to be the direction where some Jata people were outflanking him. The nearest Jata people were only 20 meters away from him. He shot an arrow at the beginning just to express his position, so as to prevent the Noldor from hitting the wrong person. At this time, Rasadalan also ran out and ran towards a twilight night. Both sides of the war saw the group of human soldiers rushing out wearing neat heraldic robes. However, the Noldor had no time to pay attention to the fact that the Misty Mountain wildlings had already rushed in front of them and started fighting hand to hand. On the other hand, the Jada people were hesitant, probably reassessing the battlefield situation. But Liang's troops did not hesitate at all. The 200 people gathered together rushed directly towards the Jata people who were already in a skirmishing state. Although there was no way to set up any military formations in the forest, the local superiority of troops and the dense formation against skirmishers made the impact of this charge quickly apparent. In just one minute, dozens of Jata people fell to Liang's troops. Bispa! Leon once again heard the Jata words that represented retreat, and the Jata people on the periphery slowly began to retreat. But the people of the Misty Mountains are still fighting hard, because they are now fighting for their lives against the Noldor Elves, and there is no way to retreat. It seems that the relationship between the Jata people and these Misty Mountain people is not too strong, and those Jata people actually betrayed their teammates. Chapter 173 in Dongjia of Misty Mountain Leon separated dozens of archers to keep an eye on the retreating Jata people, and then immediately ordered his troops to begin besieging the wild people in the Misty Mountains. Unfortunately, the current team's individual combat effectiveness is not strong enough. At this time, Leon somewhat missed the macho men of Mettenheim. The soldiers he has now are indeed brave and obedient, but they are not suitable for a big melee. Otherwise, he will definitely let the strong men of Mettenheim lead the team to pursue these Jata people who have betrayed their teammates. Now he can only let the Jada people retreat into the mountains and forests. The purpose of his battle is to protect the horse farm. And the Noldor will do the killing of the enemy themselves. 
The people of the Misty Mountains were already having a difficult fight with the older elves. And now they were surrounded from behind. Of course they were no match for them. And there was no way to escape. But they showed quite terrifying fighting qualities at this time. They did not run or mess up. But all rushed in the direction of the older elves. This group of Misty Mountain people launched a rare suicidal charge against the older elves. It was indeed suicidal. And even more cruel than the way the Jada people charged into the battle. They did not have the tactical coordination ability of a group of ten, like the Jata people. Of course, they could not carry out a group charge while being surrounded. But at least half of the people in the Misty Mountains flew out at the same time, roaring Aweo, and threw their bodies onto the swords of the Nolder. They fit forward and lunged forward, using their bodies to lock the stabbing or slashing weapons of the Nolder. Then they tightly grabbed the Nolder's arms, and threw the already small number of Nolder elves to the ground to death. Suppress it to death. The blood of the Misty Mountain people splattered. But the Nolder's defensive formation was instantly destroyed. Leon was even stunned for a moment. And then immediately rushed forward as fast as he could. This method used by the Misty Mountain people can really defeat the Nolder. This is really one thing that brings down another thing. On a regular battlefield, this kind of flying attack would inevitably only be pierced on the spears on the outside of the military formation. There must be many spearmen in the human military formation. Among the team Leong brought into the forest, there were 50 or 60 people carrying spears, which were indispensable weapons in human military formations. But the Nolder do not have spears. Perhaps because the Nolder travel in the forest for a long time. And it is not very convenient to carry long pole weapons. The Nolder elves all use bows and arrows. Swords and shields. The result was that a large portion of the Nolder elves did easily stab the Misty Mountain Man in front of them with a sword. But were then chained to the ground unable to move. Then, these Nolder were easily killed by other Misty Mountain people. These Misty Mountain people, who were not considered strong in Liang's mind, actually traded with the Nolder elves at this time. The numerical disadvantage of the Nolder was infinitely amplified by the suicide attack. Only the two Twilight Knights were not bothered by the suicidal charging method of the Misty Mountain people. They used their excellent combat skills to avoid the enemies in front of them, and then created countless stumps among the Misty Mountain people. Broken arm. But the Nolder could not stop them. The Misty Mountain people got a huge opportunity with their life-saving attack. They protected a shaman-looking guy and rushed through the gap where the Nolder were washed away. Intending to rush into the stable, Leong had been rushing at the front. But now, he was close and saw the situation in the stable. Only then did he understand why they had to rush to the stable. And also why the Nolder had to guard in front of the stable. The foal. As well as several seriously injured people and two Nolder younglings. Nowadays, there may be enemies everywhere in the forest outside. And it is really inconvenient to move seriously injured people and young children. This stable is the most suitable place around to house the wounded. As for the Nolder elves who have difficulty in giving birth to young children, they will of course protect them at all costs. Risa Dillon! The Lord Lord shouted. Naturally, the elf killer also saw the actions of the Misty Mountain Man. He was already near the stable. Seeing this, he ran all the way and shot an arrow. There was only a dozen meters between him and the enemy at the front. And the arrow, he fired hastily while running was still there. Accurate hit. The misty mountain man who fell to the ground hindered his fellow tribesmen behind him. And then a twilight knight threw out the sword in his hand. Blocking the enemy again. Several Nolder elves who were thrown to the ground also struggled to hold back some of the misty mountain people. Leon ran all the way behind. After the misty mountain people in the front row were blocked several times. He and Risa Dillon arrived almost at the same time, and the griffin sword cut off a bloody head. However, there were still two Misty Mountain people who rushed into the stable one after another. They seemed to be a man and a woman. The Misty Mountain man running at the front was the shaman. He was the only one wearing a unique helmet. Among the Misty Mountain men present, this was the only one wearing a barbarian horn helmet. But just when Leong thought that the Misty Mountain people might kidnap the child, the woman suddenly stabbed the shaman in front of her in the back with a sword. Then she gasped for air and stabbed the shaman's throat with her sword. After making sure that the misty mountain shaman she stabbed over was no longer moving, she dropped the sword, turned around and raised it. Hand. Ouch! 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 There was a strange scream from the misty mountain people outside. After the woman killed the shaman, the remaining misty mountain wild people collapsed almost instantly, and they immediately planned to flee. However, in this case, the only way to escape was to escape. The Nolder and the archers brought by the Lord quickly cleared them away. But currently, there are only 30 Nolder elves left 
who can still stand up and shoot arrows. Just over a hundred Misty Mountain wildlings caused the deaths and injuries of fifteen older elves. And this was done while they were surrounded. This was indeed beyond everyone's expectations. Although the Nolder guarding here are not the strongest nobles and rangers among the elves. At least every Nolder can be called an elite warrior or jungle killer. And their individual combat capabilities far exceed those of the Misty Mountain people. In fact, before the Misty Mountain people rushed to their side, at least sixty or seventy people had been shot to death. But who would have thought that after these Misty Mountain people rushed in front of the Nolder under the Reign of Arrows, they could actually cause such terrible damage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Berserkers of Misty Mountain are stronger than imagined. Probably the woman in the stable was the only Misty Mountain person who maintained her sanity and calmness. She didn't make any moves that might cause misunderstanding. She just hobbled out of the stable with her hands raised and shouted, I surrender! But the Twilight Knight seemed not to let her go. He walked over and struck her with a sword in the head. Stop! She just saved your child! Are you so stupid? She has already surrendered! The Lord blocked the Twilight Knight with a sword. And Anson also ran over. Looking at the Nolder Elves cautiously, everyone on the field stopped. Seeing that there would be no fight, Anson led two medical team members to begin treatment. I didn't expect that I would get help from humans. Seeing Anson begin to treat the Nolder's injuries, the Twilight Knight, who was covered in blood, relaxed, although his voice was full of suspicion. And the looks he looked at Liang and Anson were quite unnatural. He finally put away the sword in his hand. There was both condescending arrogance and unwillingness to face reality in his eyes. It feels like humans are being attacked by a group of monkeys and getting help from another group of monkeys. This guy probably has a deep hatred for humans. It seemed that this twilight night was not easy to deal with. The Lord simply ignored him and motioned for Rasadalan to come over and meet him. Lisa Dillon came over and taunted you. You people of the Fenway family don't even have the most basic etiquette now? You can't even distinguish between good and evil. Right. Lord Leon came here specifically to help you. But you he didn't even say thank you. What kind of attitude is this? Rasadalan is a noble of the Aino family. So of course, he does not need to show favor to the people of the Fenway family. I know you. Rasadarin. It seems that you defected to humans after being exiled? What a shame to the Nolder. Those who can become Twilight Knights are naturally nobles. And they responded to Rasadalan's ridicule without showing any signs of weakness. Leon could be said to have experienced the Nolder's attitude towards humans, as well as the condescending arrogance unique to elves. In fact, when he just met Risa Dillon, Risa Dillon also showed his indifference to humans. This is probably something engraved in the bones of the elves. They may still think that they are still the masters of this land, or that any other creatures can only be regarded as animals that are no different from wild boars and wild deer. This is a disease. It can be cured and the Lord has the medicine. Lisa Dillon had obviously been cured by Leon with horse dung eggs. But now is not the time to provide psychological counseling to the Nolder. Leon walked to the Misty Mountain Woman first. Tell me, what's going on? Leon pointed at the Misty Mountain Shaman, who was stabbed to death by a woman on the ground. The shaman who fell to the ground was holding the shield of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. And the armor on his body was obviously cobbled together from various places. The breastplate and shoulder armor did not match. And the inner chain armor was damaged. Obviously all trophies. Only his helmet looked like it was his own. It was a very strange one-piece cast iron helmet. It was probably cast directly on the head of an animal with molten iron. Or it might have been cast on the head of a human being. Anyway, the helmet looked like a half-skull cover. And the molten iron was flowing. The traces are obvious. There is a pair of iron horns on the top of the helmet that are polished quite smoothly and look solid. Probably the symbolic meaning of this pair of iron horns is greater than its actual function because this thing must be extremely heavy on the head, and it must be extremely uncomfortable after wearing it. But the woman didn't wear a helmet, only a leather robe, and a purple mark was painted on her face with potion, which looked like a cat's footprints or a bear's paw prints. The woman was also seriously injured. The skin on her waist was rolled up and bleeding. Her face was pale, and she looked like she had lost too much blood. She looked at the corpse on the ground and the long sword thrown beside the corpse, and actually smiled. It was a Raven Realm long sword, which was originally supposed to be the standard equipment of the Raven Realm Dragon Knights. I am Andonda from the Cat's Claw tribe. Sir, you seem to be the Lord of Pendor. But why do you want to help Nolder? And Dongjiao looked at Leon with strange eyes. She looked very calm. She didn't seem to have any regrets about the deaths of those Misty Mountain people. Instead, she had a look of relief. And Dongjiao, 
answer my question first. Are these Misty Mountain people your subordinates? How come you are mixing with the Jada people? The Lord felt that in Dongjia's state seemed a bit strange. So he motioned to Anson and asked him to come over and bandage the woman. Her injury had been bleeding. And if the bleeding stopped, she might be unconscious and unable to question her. Ha ha ha. And Dongjia suddenly laughed. They are not my subordinates. This Lord. They are my enemies. As he spoke, he staggered. This woman had indeed lost too much blood. And Sin had just walked to Indongjia at this time. Realized something was wrong. And gave Indongjia a hard hand. But his strength was really weak. And they both fell to the ground. As a result, Indongjia fell on top of Insin. This was obviously the kindness in Anson's heart. Which prevented the weak and wounded man from falling to the ground. And Dongjia laughed again. Thank you. Shy boy. She was talking to Anson. And Dongjia. What's going on? Liang felt that Ndongjia was full of stories. Lord, these are people from the Bear Claw tribe. And I am from the Cat Claw tribe, and I am not on the same side as them. I just want revenge. She looked back at the dead shaman again, with obvious pleasure in her eyes. And Donga is a native of the Misty Mountains north of Crowland. And her father is the leader of the Cat Claw tribe. But she had a similar fate to Rosadalyn, as she was also banished from the tribe. This is because she led the Misty Mountain raiding team and was ambushed by Earl Stephen in Ravenland. And almost all of her Misty Mountain people were lost after the ambush. But this time she was ambushed. Not because of the high tactical level of Earl Stephen of Oldenburg in Ravenland, but because the people of the Bear Claw tribe betrayed her. There are countless tribes north of the Misty Mountains, and they are a tribal alliance. In fact, the term Wild Men of the Misty Mountains used to describe the Northern Raider tribe was actually spread by the original Pender people in Ravenland due to misunderstanding. Until now, the Pender people have mistakenly believed that the Misty Mountain people are wild people living in the Misty Plateau snow-capped mountains in the north. But in fact, the Misty Mountains are as foreign to the Misty Mountain people as they are to the Pender people. They actually live on the other side of the Misty Mountains. That place is a land that the Pender people have never set foot on. And there is no map. The permafrost north of the Misty Mountains is desolate and empty. The perennially cold environment is not suitable for the growth of crops. Large-scale grazing in the ice and snow is also impossible. It is like a real H, L. Bitter cold and barren. Therefore, the development speed of the Misty Mountain tribe is far slower than that of the Pender civilization due to environmental factors. In ancient times, the Misty Mountain tribe was a society that operated on a 64-year cycle. This was a regular cycle of population decline and increase discovered by the Misty Mountain shamans. To put it simply, every 64 years, Misty Mountain will go through a cyclical cycle. During the period of maximum population, there will be a shortage of arable land and livestock to support the Misty Mountain tribe, which will lead to widespread famine. At this time, various tribes will fight each other to seize resources, thus reducing the population and reproducing deer and other animals. Then, the wars between the tribes stopped and they began to recuperate. This barren land with a sharp decrease in population began to recover again. When the population reaches its limit a few decades later, the cycle begins to repeat itself. For a long time, this cycle, which is repeated every 64 years, has caused various tribes to have troubles. Biovis is the mountain god worshipped by the people of the Misty Mountains. In fact, this image of a silver lynx is, in other words, a snow leopard. The people of the Misty Mountains believe that only shamans can see, Biovis, and can talk to the gods. So they will continue to kill each other in this cycle according to the shaman's will. In this cycle, the Misty Mountain tribe once regarded the Misty Mountains, with an altitude of more than 6,000 meters, as an insurmountable limit. They did not cross the Misty Mountains into the Pender continent for thousands of years. In fact, they did not even cross the Misty Mountains at that time. I didn't know there was such a large continent south of the Misty Mountains. Until hundreds of years ago, a hunter named Pathfinder, Deerfoot received the call of the gods and crossed the mountains for the first time. In the legend of the Misty Mountains, when the hunter named Deerfoot saw the huge silvery white lynx called Biovis, his tribe was facing an originally impossible situation due to the 64-year cycle. Wars avoided, because he saw with his own eyes the gods worshipped by the people of the Misty Mountains. He followed the giant lynx all the way across the Misty Mountains. As a result, this tribal hunter from the north of the Misty Mountains saw the wider land for the first time. Although many shamans tried to prove that Deerfoot was just a hunter, not a shaman, and could not see Vegevus, 
no one could prove that he actually crossed the Misty Mountains. But as the 64-year cycle gradually approached, the news that there was a large area of cultivated land south of the Misty Mountains caused many Misty Mountain tribes to cross the mountains in order to escape the war and enter the base area established by the early Pender people in Crowland. Although the cold Raven land is not a good place for most Pender people. In fact, the Ravenlands was originally just a place where prisoners were exiled. It is difficult to grow seeds from the south in the cold north. Most of the time, these exiled Pender people all had to endure famine. But these misty mountain people who crossed the snowy mountains to escape the war, these people who passed through the true age, L to come to Ravenland, they knew how to choose the cold-resistant seeds that maximized the harvest. They taught the Pander people the agricultural knowledge they gained in the ice fields. And the exiles, who had a hard time surviving due to the large population and sparse land, also welcomed these outsiders. As a result, the two races supported each other and lived together on this land came down and gradually melted into one. In fact, for the current continent of Pendor, the people of Crow Realm are the common descendants of Pendor and Misty Mountain people. The so-called Misty Mountain savages that Raven Kingdom has been fighting against are actually of the same bloodline as them. Those Highland warriors in Churchway Bay are actually the most direct descendants of the Misty Mountain people. The people of the Crow Realm, especially those near the Fallen Bay, can probably be called the Southern Misty Mountain people while the tribes who still stay north of the Misty Mountains can probably be called the Northern Misty Mountain People. Originally, the first group of Misty Mountain People came to Pender to bring peace and friendship. But then, things changed. The shamans and tribal leaders of the Northern Misty Mountains have set their sights on the land of Ravenland south of the mountains. Chapter 174 Cat's Claw Revenge In the 198th year of the Pender calendar, a bloody plague completely destroyed the kingdom of Pender. Countless people abandoned the land and fled. In those years, the operation of the entire Pender continent came to a standstill. Only the tribes north of the Misty Mountains were not affected by the Red Death. Therefore, amid rumors that the south was full of food and fertile land, the people of the northern Misty Mountains invaded Pender in 1999. Pender was paralyzed and in turmoil due to famine and plague, and the kingdom of Pender did not have enough troops or financial resources to respond to the invasion. But the Misty Mountain people who first came to the south have regarded Crowland as their home. And of course, they do not want to return to the uncivilized barbarian tribes north of the Misty Mountain. So they spontaneously launched an all-out resistance. The descendants of the Misty Mountain people became the biggest force blocking the invasion of the northern Misty Mountain people. Without support from the south, Earl Gregory of Ravenland in the north formed a coalition. And with the help of the Misty Mountain Highlanders in Fallen Bay, defeated the northern Misty Mountain people drove them back to the north of the Misty Mountains, and then established Crow Kingdom. Today, the term Misty Mountain People actually no longer applies to this nation, but only to those barbarians who still live in the north of the Misty Mountains. The people of the northern Misty Mountains have actually changed very little, and its population is still limited by its barren land. In order to maintain the peace of the tribes in the northern Misty Mountains, the leaders and shamans of the major tribes in the Misty Mountains have now changed their tactics and changed the original internal war to external plunder. They began to systematically send young people from various tribes to the south of the Misty Mountains every year to plunder the richer land of Pinder. Moreover, this practice was described by the shamans as the will of the mountain god Viobis, and gradually formed a rule. This is the coming-of-age ceremony for the people of the Misty Mountain, except for the first heir of each tribe. Everyone else must form or join a raiding party to go to Ravenland when they first come of age. In other words, the members of the plundering team are all young people who have just come of age. And the leader is usually the second-in-line heir of a certain tribe who has just come of age. Those who can return with large amounts of loot will be given the opportunity to marry into larger tribes. And if the leader's level of plundering is high enough and he can come back with high-quality food seeds, he will be recognized by all tribes and allowed to form a new tribe, no matter which tribe he is. In the final analysis, he cares about food objectively speaking, from the perspective of the people of Northern Misty Mountain. There is no problem with this approach. The desolate and barren frozen soil cannot support so many people. It is better to send people to the south to rob them than to kill each other among the tribes. Therefore, the Misty Mountain plundering team that comes to Crowland will basically be led by the son or daughter of a tribal leader. And the team members are a joint force composed of young people from various tribes. Since the team members come from various tribes, the leader must be responsible for the lives of the members of the plundering team. 
If a member of the team dies, the leader will owe a large blood debt to the family of the deceased when he returns. Therefore, forming a plundering team is actually not a good job. It is like being forced to take risks with lone sharks. And the lives of other ethnic groups are borrowed, which means a great risk due to the limitations of the Misty Mountain people's own technical level and resources. The equipment of the looting team is relatively poor, and the blood debt of these team leaders often accumulates. As a result, many Misty Mountain raid leaders may end up having no choice but to settle down in Raven lands and eke out a living alongside a few raiders. The existence of this blood debt system seems to be to prevent the leader from blindly commanding and causing excessive losses. But in fact, it is a trap designed by the big tribe. Because the leaders and members of the Misty Mountain Plunder team are young people who have just come of age. They have not seen much of the world and have little experience in the world. The quality of equipment and organization cannot compete with the army of Raven Realm. Therefore, most of the leaders are unable to come back alive. For the small number of people who returned, their spoils could not offset their blood debts, which often resulted in the leader's tribe being forced to seek refuge with a larger tribe due to too much debt. The large tribes in Misty Mountain use this to kill two birds with one stone. On the one hand, they have a stable source of loot. On the other hand, they can use this method to deprive small tribes of most of their fighting power and resources in order to annex them. Through these plundering teams, there has been no large-scale war among the tribes in the northern Misty Mountains for more than a hundred years. But the annexation of small tribes is happening all the time. The Cat Claw, tribe led by Ndongja's father is a small tribe with only 300 people. But the Misty Mountain people who died in the Noldor Forest were not the plundering team led by Ndonga. These were all warriors of the Bear Claw tribe. This was a large tribe with 3,000 people. Such a number was found north of the Misty Mountain. It is already a big force. As the daughter of the leader of a small tribe, Ndongja brought a plundering team of more than 200 people to Crowland, with team members from various tribes. This is a routine and an errand that cannot be refused. Originally, the progress of this plundering team was going very smoothly. And Dongjia is not the kind of idiot who only thinks about muscles. She never provokes the patrols and big lords of Crowland. Instead, she led the team to successfully rob several noble farms in relatively remote locations and got a lot of money. Spoils of war. But then, she met the Bear Claw tribe's team near Oldenburg. And the Bear Claw tribe shaman expressed his intention to join forces with her. At first, she thought it was a good thing that they were both members of the Misty Mountain tribe. And it was indeed safer to be able to support each other in Raven Land. The shaman of the Bear Claw tribe suggested that they join forces to attack Earl Stevens' village of Belbuck, which has a large amount of food. There were more than 500 people on both sides, which was more than enough to capture a village. And there was no need to attack the city. This originally seemed like a reasonable plan. But after Andongia invaded the village, the people of the Bear Claw tribe retreated directly. Subsequently, a large number of Earl Stevens troops appeared outside the village and surrounded Andonga's plundering team. Under the rain of arrows from the Krolan Rangers, Andonga experienced a disastrous defeat and the entire army was wiped out. She managed to escape from the battlefield. In fact, she was able to escape entirely because she was wearing a leather robe and carrying a Ravenland sword. She looked more like a person from the Ravenland than a savage from the Misty Mountains. After losing all her troops, she returned to the tribe. But she owed a huge blood debt that she could not repay at all. Not long after that, people from the Bear Claw tribe came to collect debts. All the blood debts owed by Andongia to other tribes were transferred to the Bear Claw tribe. Obviously, Andongia's ambush was deliberately created by the Bear Claw tribe, just to make her bear a huge blood debt that she could not repay. So her father expelled him from the tribe to prevent the huge debt from being inherited by the Cat Claw tribe, which would lead to the annexation of the Cat Claw tribe. And Dongjia did not expect that the people from the Bear Claw tribe, who were also members of the Misty Mountain tribe, could be so sinister. But she could only accept this fate. She shouldered a large debt and returned to the south of the Misty Mountains alone. However, from now on, she is no longer the innocent young person she was. People who have been tricked by such a conspiracy will naturally grow up rapidly. She began to look for people from the Bear Claw tribe in the Crow Realm. She knew that the Bear Claw tribe would use the same method to trap other small tribes. The shaman's troops had not returned yet. So they must still be in the Crow Realm. And Dongjia does not hate Earl Stephen who caused the annihilation of her army. The owner of the village killed the looters to protect his property. In her opinion, it is natural. In fact, no matter it is for anything. As long as he kills him openly opponents are not considered enemies 
to the people of Misty Mountain. But she hates the people of the Bearclaw tribe. She wants revenge. It wasn't long before she did find it. Again near Oldenburg. This time, Andonga put a mark on his face and told the shaman of the Bearclaw tribe that he was about to marry the leader of the Bearclaw tribe as his concubine. The Catclaw tribe had also been merged into the Bearclaw tribe. This statement is actually very credible. Because the shaman knew that the leader of the Bear Claw tribe had originally planned this. The paw prints on Ndongjaw's face are indeed a sign of engagement. The people in the northern Misty Mountains are relatively barbaric and have always practiced a bride robbing system. Girls without marks on their faces are likely to be raped. Of course, many tough women will also rob young men. And having a tribal mark painted on the face means that she is the wife and concubine of the tribal leader. If she dares to rob her, she will be hunted down by a tribe. The mark on Ndongjaw's face could be said to be cat's claws or bear's claws. Anyway, the marks on Ndongjaw's face looked like this. So the shaman had no doubts. In his opinion, Ndongjaw could only face this fate. Moreover, Ndongjaw said very cleverly that she had not forgotten the fact that this shaman had caused her to fall into a trap. If she did not want to be troubled by her pillow blowing when she went back, she had better do herself a favor. Otherwise she would sooner or later make him look good. The shaman did believe in Dongjia's lies and threats, which were all in line with the shaman's expectations. Although the shaman has a high status in the tribe, the leader of the Bear Claw tribe is quite powerful, and within Dongjia's status, it is indeed very likely that she will become a favorite concubine. This shaman will definitely not have a good life by then. And Dongjia told the shaman that the Cat Claw tribe once hid a lot of property and leather in the East Misty Mountains. She wanted to give back these properties so that her father and brother could redeem their freedom. Her father and brother are the leaders of the tribe. It is really not appropriate to be a servant after being annexed. She wants to give back the property to help them redeem their lives. This seems to be a very normal way of thinking. And it is also in line with the concept of redeeming blood debts. The eastern misty mountains are the snowy mountains to the east of the Jata grassland and the Nolder forest. However, this snowy mountain is different from the northern misty mountains. The side of the grasslands and forests here have all turned into insurmountable icebergs due to the influence of warm air. Basically, it cannot be climbed over. But the Catclaw tribe did originally develop from the other side of the eastern Misty Mountains. It is indeed possible for a tribal leader who developed from here to hide something in an iceberg that no one can climb over. The environment on an iceberg is generally relatively stable, and there are few birds and animals, and things can remain incorruptible all year round. It is indeed possible. A great place to hide treasure. Even if it's fake, it's just a trip in vain. Anyway, the shamans of the Bear Claw tribe had recently taken over many villages in Crowland, and they originally planned to avoid the limelight. So the shaman asked in Dongjia for the specific location, and then decided to take her to find the property together. Of course, this shaman definitely didn't have any good intentions. But just as it happened, and Dongjia didn't have any good intentions either, she led the people of the Bear Claw tribe to the southern part of the Jata grassland, the junction with the Nolder forest. This place was extremely dangerous, but it fit her life very well, because the eastern Misty Mountains could already be seen to the east. This place is Jatu in the north, Nolder in the south, Brave Shield Castle in the west, and the highest iceberg in the entire continent in the east. It is called the most dangerous place in Pinder. There is nowhere to run if any situation arises. And Dongjia, who had lived in the east Misty Mountains, deliberately brought the Bear Claw tribe here. And Dongjia just wanted to lure the people of the Bear Claw tribe to a place of death in the same way that the shaman had framed her, to retaliate in kind. She was burdened with countless blood debts and was kicked out of her home. She didn't want to live in the first place. But in Dongjia's revenge plan was only half successful here. The first people the Bear Claw tribe encountered were the Jada people. And they were also the troops of Destroyer Judah. But just when the Bear Claw tribe and the Jada people were meeting each other, a group of people from the Ebony Gauntlet Knights came out of the Nolder Forest. A hundred or so ebony hammer bearers. These ebony war hammer men originally wanted to lure Eldarian to the Jata grassland. In fact, they also sent people from the mercenary group to attract the Jata troops. So Judah's team appeared here. But when they saw the people from the Bear Claw tribe, the ebony warhammers were a little misunderstood. They thought these misty mountain people were friendly forces sent to attract Judah. These people from the Bear Claw tribe had indeed snatched a lot of equipment before. And they were dressed in patchwork clothing. From a distance, they did look like a mercenary group with poor equipment. As a result, the Ebony Warhammers planned to join the friendly forces. Of course, 
the shaman of Misty Mountain misunderstood this approach. He thought that the Warhammer troops were going to attack them. But the two sides ended up fighting each other in confusion. At this time, Aldarian also rushed out with more than hundreds of Noldor warriors. Jatu and Noldorna had a blood feud. Judah, the warlord, had a special hatred for the Noldor elves. When he saw the Noldor elves, launched the attack immediately. More than 300 people from the Bear Claw tribe and the Ebony Warhammers were fighting in a melee. And of course Jude ignored them. And it just so happened that Aldarian was also a Noldor lord who hated the Jatta people extremely. He thought the Jatta people were ambushing him. As a result, the Noldor and the Jatta fought together. When the Ebony Warhammer realized something was wrong, he planned to run away in time. But Ndongja instigated him. These people look very rich. And their equipment is also very valuable. And they only have so many people. As a result, the people of the Bear Claw tribe chased the Ebony Warhammer hand and beat him up, chasing him several miles away. The Ebony Warhammers were small in number and had no fighting spirit. In addition, the Misty Mountain people were really good at hand-to-hand -hand combat. Most of them were quickly killed, leaving only a few alive. Then, the Shaman of the Bear Claw tribe learned from the Ebony Warhammer that an army of thousands of mercenaries was attacking the Noldor Forest. This is a good opportunity to fish in troubled waters. The Misty Mountain people who have been plundering for a long time like to take advantage of the chaos. Everyone knows that the Noldor Forest is full of valuable things. Whether it is weapons and equipment, horses, or the Noldor elves themselves. Getting anything is much greater than robbing a village. So the greedy shaman was moved. In addition, he got a lot of equipment from the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. The popularity of the Misty Mountain people greatly increased. Seeing the Jatu and the Noldor elves fighting inextricably, the greedy shaman led the troops, ambushed Aldarian from behind. Speaking of which, this shaman is actually very smart. He knows that this approach will allow Jatu to fight alongside him. The Jatu people also make a living by robbing, so they should also be able to fish in troubled waters. In this way, the opportunities will be much greater. Aldarian did not expect that the Misty Mountain people would leave and come back. He originally had the upper hand, but was rushed into the archer formation by the Misty Mountain people who suddenly appeared behind him, being attacked on both sides and fighting in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Aldarian had to retreat with his entire army. With this retreat, a lot of trophies of Noldor equipment were obtained, and the Misty Mountain people, who felt that they could still take advantage, chased them forward. Judah's troops received help from the Misty Mountain people for no apparent reason, so they did not attack the Misty Mountain people. Instead, they chased them in. Even the Misty Mountain people dared to pursue them into the forest. Of course, Judah's Jatta people also had to pursue them, because Judah was an extremely cruel warlord. If anyone in his troops dared to show cowardice, he would shoot the cowardly person directly from behind. Therefore, this Jatta army can only advance, but not retreat on the battlefield. But after entering the forest, it was actually difficult to retreat and chase after them. The large army dispersed in the forest, and Judah could not give them orders. In such a large area of virgin forest, getting lost is inevitable. And even with modern equipment, it may not be possible to get out. These Misty Mountain people couldn't find their way in the forest. And they lost a lot of people. But after wandering around for two days, they discovered this horse farm. Three to four hundred Jatta people who were separated from the large army also followed them here. In fact, until Leon arrived, there was no effective communication between the Jatu and the Misty Mountain people. They did not understand the language, but they have been in a very strange situation of emboldening each other these past two days. The Jatta people believe that since the people of the Misty Mountains dared to attack the Noldor, they were certainly right. The people of Misty Mountain felt that since the Jatta people dared to invade the Noldor forest in a large scale, it meant that what the Ebony Warhammer said must be true. Thousands of troops from the south must have invaded the Noldor forest. If everyone dared to invade the Noldor forest, then of course that you can also fish in troubled waters, and get some benefits. Moreover, they assisted the Jatta people, and these Jatta people did not attack them at all, which explained that everyone's goal was to rob them in the Noldor forest. Later, they discovered that the Noldor elves were transferring the property here, a large group of elven horses, and a large amount of supplies. Of course those Jatta people became excited all of a sudden. They all dream of getting Noldor horses. The shaman of the Bearclaw tribe also became excited. He found that the number of Noldor elves here was very small. But the property they were transferring seemed to be very large. Chapter 175 Creating Opportunities for the Enemy This is the territory of the Fenway family. And of course, they have a lot of property. 
although the Fenway family is small in number. They are indeed very wealthy. After all, they master the core technology. The Nolder Elves wanted to move supplies because after Aldarian's defeat, the seriously wounded men who came back from the front told them that the enemy was pursuing them deep into the forest. There were many enemies, so they were told to take shelter. However, due to the large amount of supplies and the inability to transport them by vehicle in the forest, they discovered a large number of enemies before they could finish transporting them. So they stopped transferring supplies and moved everything into the stables. The seriously injured and children also entered the stables. And all the adult nolders stood guard in front of the stables. And Dongjia originally thought that the people of the Bear Claw tribe would get a lot of benefits. Because she knew that the nolder probably couldn't stand up to the berserker warriors of the Bear Claw tribe. And the shaman didn't care how many people died as long as he could get the stable. Supplies? He doesn't care even if all the people die. But unexpectedly, Liang's troops suddenly came out and changed the situation of the battle. So she stabbed her enemy to death with her own hands at the last moment, which was regarded as completing her revenge. She ran forward with the shaman with the intention of stabbing the shaman to death. But she was injured in the melee before, and the shaman ran very fast. So, Miss and Don't Jia, you wanted to kill all of them. It seems that you have almost fulfilled your wish. I admire your courage. You can do it to such an extent alone. This is indeed true. It's not easy. Anson, who was binding in Dongjia's wounds, sighed, probably remembering the time when he was kidnapped by pirates. Anson's courage has been cultivated now. But he must remember how he looked like a weakling hiding behind Salama when he first faced the battlefield. He himself often laughed at himself at that time. He really admired this kind of person with extraordinary courage and intelligence. Not to mention that she was a woman. Uh-huh. Shy doctor. If you show up north of Misty Mountain, I will definitely take you home. And Dongjia's face was now pale from blood loss. But this did not affect her in making jokes about Anson. She seemed to have a good impression of this shy cultural person. Of course, perhaps more importantly, Anson's words made her feel that she got respect. For a person from the northern Misty Mountains, she had never heard a word other than, savage, from the people of Pender. Anson called her, Miss Antonia. This was of course Anson's usual polite attitude towards others. But for Anson, this was the first time. Anson's knowledge of history and culture is pretty good. He knows a lot of barbarian customs. And of course, he understands jokes like, Bring him home. So he stopped talking, smiled shyly, tied a knot on Dongjia's waist, and ran to treat other wounded people. And Dongjia looked at Anson's back and whistled. She looked like a female hooligan. The Lord Lord looked at the female gangster with great interest. And Dongjia, so it seems that you have nowhere to go? Of course, he admires this kind of person who has the courage to put her plan into action alone. Even if she is a misty mountain person. Sir, I really have nowhere to go. Dot, thank you for saving my life just now. But actually, I never thought I could still be alive. And Dongjia turned around, shook his head and said something, then turned to look at Anson again. She was quite serious when facing Liang. But when she looked at Anson, she licked her lips and then began to wipe away the marks on her face that she didn't know what to use. Uh-huh. It seems like you don't intend to die. In that case, you can follow Anson for the time being. I think you can just protect him. Of course. This means you have to be loyal to me. The Lord was very considerate and arranged a good job for Ndongjia. Huh? Uh-huh. Thank you. My Lord. This looks like a good job. Ndongjia turned to look at Liang and saw Liang pointing at an senator he was stunned for a few seconds before he understood what Liang meant and smiled in surprise. Then she half knelt down on the ground, picked up the sword on the ground and cut her hand, smeared the blood on her face, lowered her head towards Liang, holding the blade in her hand and holding the sword the handle was handed to Liang. I will serve you, my lord. It seems that this is a unique way for the people of the Misty Mountains to express their allegiance. The blood smeared on the face probably means that they are willing to follow the leader and fight bloody battles. Leon looked at her barbarian look with a bloody face, and mentally mourned for Anson for half a second. And don't ya? You'd better wash your face. Otherwise I feel that Anson may run for his life. Besides, my soldiers must learn some culture. I hope you won't regret it. The Lord took the sword and directly put it back into the scabbard on Ndongja. And Dongja has joined your team. This is probably the partner that Leon has recruited the most smoothly. It seems that she can't wait to protect Anson. At this time, a twilight knight from the Fenway family walked towards the Lord. Rasadalan planned to stop him. 
But the Twilight Knight opened his hands to show that he had no malice and that he did not have any weapons on him. This is another Twilight Knight who threw the sword before. It seemed that Anson's treatment behavior regardless of race gave him a lot of favor. And he looked at Leon with some kindness. But when he glanced at Ndongjia, the Twilight Knight still had obvious disgust in his eyes. Your Excellency, I am Cedron of House Finwi. I am sorry for the rudeness of my people. Of course, I think you can understand that none of us expected to receive help from humans. The Twilight Knight walked to Leon, lowered his head, and caressed his chest. The Lord Lord smiled. I can understand this. However, you'd better tell me the current situation. Didn't you encounter Islandel's troops? Your Highness Islandel? Isn't he dealing with a human army in the south? The Twilight Knight named Cedron was stunned for a moment. Leon felt that something was wrong. He got the news from Islandil. Logically speaking, Islandil's troops should have rushed back to this area long ago. And they should definitely be at the racecourse or the like as soon as possible. Defensive arrangements are made in important places. But the Finwis did not encounter any of Islandil's forces. The Jatu and Misty Mountain people are not very powerful in fighting in the forest. And it is impossible for them to stop Islandil's troops. Did you not encounter any troops from the Aino family? Rasadalin heard this and was a little confused. Islandil didn't come. No. I only met these wounded people from the Dalian tribe yesterday morning. They said that the Jatta people were chasing them. After I sent someone to report the situation, I started preparing to transfer people and supplies. Cedarin pointed to the wounded in the stable. And he also noticed something was wrong. So, in addition to the Jatu and the Misty Mountain people, there are probably other forces taking advantage of the situation. Sigh, Deren. You'd better spread your manpower quickly to investigate the surrounding situation. And inform other members of your family. The territory is on full defense. Leon quickly said to Cedarin that his own men were all humans, and there was definitely no way to send messages to other Nolder settlements. The Nolder elves could only do it. Cedarin knew that what Leon said made sense. If even Islandil's troops could not come here, it would mean that the territory of the Fenway family would have to face the enemy alone in a short period of time. He didn't waste any time and immediately dispatched his men. The Twilight Knight with a bad attitude was first sent to the southeast, probably to ask for help. And the other twenty or so Nolder were all assigned to serve as scouts in all directions. After sending out most of the uninjured Nolder elves, Cedarin returned to Leong. Your Excellency Leong, the wounded and supplies here must be moved, especially the children. But I don't have enough manpower now. I'm worried that those Jada people will leave and come back. Cedarin obviously wanted to ask Leong for help. And there were only a dozen or so available people around him. But now there are dozens of wounded people. Half a stable of supplies. And three young children looking at Leong with wide eyes and fear. There are no roads or carriages in the forest. So it is very inconvenient to transport anything. There are only some ponies left in the stables. It is estimated that the other adult horses have long been used to transport a batch of supplies. Where are you going to move these? The Lord frowned. It was right to move supplies and horses before the horse farm was attacked. Because we didn't know how many enemies there were at that time. But now, after a fight, moving supplies is not a good option. Because those Jada people must not have gone far yet. Our family has a settlement of more than 200 people about 60 miles east. And the family's weapons factory is also there. Cedarin stroked his chest and saluted Leon again. 60 miles away dot a weapons factory with more than 200 people dot it is specially used to make weapons and equipment. Right? There must be fireworks and loud noises there. Right? The Lord shook his head and seemed to disagree with Cedarin's plan. Yes, Mr. Leon. You mean? Cedarin became obviously nervous thinking that Leong didn't want to help him. I mean, if I were a Jatu, I would definitely not go far. I would lay an ambush near here, both to attack lone rangers and to ambush transport teams. Leon shook his head, feeling that Nolda's brain seemed out of proportion to their age. It was probably because he had been in the forest for too long, and his thinking had become rigid. Saturn was probably always thinking about how to avoid losses, but in fact it was more dangerous to move supplies at this time. Neither raising war horses nor making weapons and armor can be done in the city. So the Fenway family's properties are all built in the forest. But if you want to produce weapons and equipment, you must carry out high temperature forging. At least you must find a place where you can safely light a fire and have a water source. Otherwise, if you cause a forest fire, it will be all over. It is not easy to find such a suitable place in the virgin forest. So the two places are 60 miles apart. 60 miles doesn't sound far. 
but the distance in the primeval forests of the mountains is completely different from the 60 miles in the plains. On plain roads, whether using a horse-drawn carriage or carrying a person on his back, one can cover 60 miles in three or four hours. But when transporting wounded people and cargo in the virgin forest by manpower, even if you are familiar with the route, it may take 30 hours to reach the destination. There are no roads or horse-drawn carriages in the forest. To transport supplies, most people must be disarmed. Otherwise, they will not be able to carry supplies through the primeval forest wearing dozens of kilograms of weight. In this case, if they encounter an ambush, they will only die. Cold. Weapon war cannot be fought without equipment. Maybe Liang's judgment was just based on his feelings. But if he wanted to attack Noldo, he would definitely do so. The Jata people will definitely not fight head-on with the Noldor in the forest. So they will do the same. Sederit also frowned. This was originally just a simple substitution of thinking. But perhaps it was the arrogance in the bones of the Noldor that made him never think in this way. Just like humans would never take the initiative to substitute into the monkey's thinking. Whether it's here or the weapons factory, this relatively open place is easy for the Jata people to discover and find. In addition, a weapons factory with a scale of 200 people must have a lot of fireworks and noise. So the weapons factory there are probably a large number of enemies around. Cetarin, what you should consider now is not to transfer supplies, but how to quickly kill the enemies here, and then go to rescue them. As Leon spoke, he pointed to the sparsely treed environment outside. In fact, this relatively open place is most suitable for the Jata people to fight. So the Jata people will not leave here easily. They are definitely still nearby. And yours people will be safer if they stay in the virgin forest. So I suggest you hide all the wounded and children in the southern forest. As for the horses, food, saddles, etc. Leave the things that the Jata people want most. Wait for them to rob you in the stable. We can definitely ambush the Jata people here. After Leon finished speaking, he pointed to his troops and told Sederin that it would be better to change his thinking. Fishing and law enforcement can be tried. The Jata people will definitely continue to observe the situation at the racecourse. We can let's work together to set up an ambush at this horse farm. And there are ready-made baits in the stables. Let's create some opportunities for the enemy. And they will come. Sederin thought for a while. Discussed the specific tactics with Leon seriously. And then gathered the remaining ten older warriors and asked them to disperse to the surrounding forest to serve as scouts. He felt that what Leon said made sense. He had too few manpower before, and the room for maneuver was not high. But now Leon has more than 200 men, and his own men are familiar with the environment. So they can indeed lure the enemy into setting up an ambush. Half a day later, several Nolder warriors came back panting. They found the Jata people in the forest to the north. They were probably the Jata people who had retreated before. They were indeed hiding in the nearby woods. Set off! The Lord Lord left the horse farm with his troops and seemed to be heading east. Several foals were released from the stables and began to run happily near the stables. These green and yellow ponies are still young and don't understand anything. They look very happy jumping around. Only Anson and a few people were still healing their injuries by the stables, sweating profusely from their work. And Dongjia stared at Anson intently, lending a hand to help from time to time. The entire racecourse seemed unprepared. There was only a team of 30 people patrolling the racecourse. These were Nolder warriors under Cedron, who had just returned from a scouting mission. In fact, this method of luring the enemy is not too detailed. As long as the enemy has brains, he probably won't be fooled. After all, they just fought a battle half a day ago. So it is obviously more suspicious to assume this posture now. So nothing happened until the evening. The foal returned to the stable, and everyone entered the huge stable. It seemed that they were going to rest in the stable. The Lord also led a troop back to the racecourse. After a few more rounds, he led the troop southward. Countless birds were startled along the way. Judging from the tracks of the frightened birds, it seemed that they were going far south. A few hours later, it was already dark. The moon and stars were dim, and several night owl calls were heard. The Jata people finally came. Probably for the Jata people. Those little ponies are peerless treasures. In the view of the Jata people, Liang's troops had probably set up an ambush before. When they started walking east, they were obviously ambushed nearby. But the Jata people made no move. So Leon came back in the evening. But now his troops must have gone all the way south. Judging from the state of the birds in the evening, they must have traveled several miles at least. These Jata people no longer used their previous skirmishing status. Most of them held their bows and formed an irregular arc as they slowly surrounded the stables. 
they seemed quite cautious. This is the most suitable array for a large number of people to bully a small number of people. But there was little reaction in the stables. It wasn't until the Jata people got so close that they were only two or three hundred meters away from the stable that the stable door finally opened. A group of soldiers ran out of the dark stables and lined up in front of the stables. But they all fled after just a minute. Because the Jata people were already close to only a hundred meters away. They started firing arrows. With a huge gap in numbers. They couldn't shoot at each other. The side with fewer people would definitely have to run away. All of them ran towards the back of the stable. It looked like they were indeed running away. After the Jata people continued to advance slowly and cautiously towards the stable for a few steps. They finally felt relieved. Dozens of people had already come out of the stable. And there would not be too many people inside now. It was just a stable of less than a thousand square meters. And there were obviously sounds of horses braying inside. It was obviously impossible to hide more soldiers and horses. With a loud, Hazar! Jatu! Their pace began to quicken until they charged at full speed. There was still no reaction in the stable. Only a few foals neighing. Then, a group of Jatu people rushed into the stable without any confrontation at all. But they immediately let out a scream louder than the hazard, just now. Chapter 176 A Simple Ambush This is a double-story stable about 6 or 7 meters high, more than 20 meters wide, more than 40 meters long, and covering an area of more than 1,000 square meters. It is a rare large wooden building in this era. The elves made reasonable use of the tall yew trees in this area. There are many large trees that are still growing embedded in the outer walls and corners of the stable. When it was first built, some of the yew trees in this area were cut down, Leaving behind a large tree can be used as a wall pillar. And then the tree trunk is used as the base pillar to build it. There are seven or eight tree crowns on the top of the stable. Rustling in the night breeze. The tree crowns are more than 15 meters high. They are the branches and leaves of the big trees that serve as the foundation pillars. This is a fusion of man-made products and nature. It seems reasonable that the trees will still grow. But the bigger they grow, the other wooden piles on the exterior wall will be pushed closer and stronger. This stable has been around for who knows how many years. And the outside has been covered with vines. Making the outer wall tough and tight. There were probably hundreds of Jata people who rushed into the stable. They encountered no obstacles at all before entering. And the stable door was also open. The Jata people did not light torches when they first marched. Because the moon was bright outside and could actually be seen. But there was no light in the stable. It was pitch black and you couldn't see your fingers. If there is no light at all, it will be difficult for both sides to cause any damage. But since the stable door is open, you can see the situation at the door from inside the stable. And you can see it clearly. After hearing the screams, the Jata people in the back row probably thought that they had been handed over inside. And they still rushed into the stable. But although the stable door was not small, it was only five or six meters wide. Under the crowds, the Jata people who had entered the stable in front could not retreat at all, and could only hear continuous screams. The Jata people who couldn't get in at the back finally lit a torch and threw a torch into the stable door. Only then did they finally see clearly what was going on inside the stable. This tall stable has two floors, and the walls are filled with haystacks. Inside, there are at least 80 people standing high and low around the wall, all holding bows and arrows. There are humans, and there are no older elves. They were divided into three levels, upper, middle and lower, forming an extremely ferocious firepower network, and they were constantly drawing their bows and shooting arrows. Dozens of Jata people had fallen in the middle of the stable. When they couldn't see anything, these archers had already caused a lot of damage. But that was all they saw. For buckets of water were poured over their heads, and all their torches were extinguished. And a continuous stream of arrows were shot from the top of the tree crown. There are still many Nolder elves hiding on top of the stable door. And Sederin and Rasadalin are also on top. They are the strongest combatants at night, and the best archers. Cedron is responsible for causing damage, while Rasadalin's main task is to prevent the enemy from setting fire to the stables. Whenever he saw someone striking a flint, he would shoot him with an arrow. In fact, there were many buckets and troughs filled with water on the top and sides of the stable, and some buckets were hung from the horizontal branches of the big trees. This was a way of storing water in this era, and it was also a fire prevention facility. When it rains, Buckets and sinks will naturally fill up. Those buckets are tied with ropes and can be pulled over at any time to put out fires. The elves also attach great importance to forest fire prevention. And the fire prevention facilities of this stable are quite complete. The bow strings buzzed and screams continued. 
Sederin and several Noldor warriors hiding in the branches, and leaves on the top of the stable also began to fire arrows at an extremely fast rate. The dense Jatta people made it easy for them to create many arrows. Corpse. Since they couldn't see inside the stables, or the specific positions of the shooters hidden in the huge tree canopy, the Jatta people had no choice but to fire a few random arrows blindly to fight back. However, with this kind of blind shooting, the probability of killing someone was about the same as winning the lottery. The branches and leaves of the tree crown can not only hide a person's figure, but also block most of the random arrows. Bispa! Bispa! Some Jatta people have already begun to retreat. They know that they are ambushed. And they do not dare to light fires to create any sparks. Those who will fall to the ground and die in the next moment. Then it's best to stay away from the stables or retreat immediately. In fact, the Jatta people originally did this. But before the people on the outside evacuated, the Jatta people at the stable door were blocked inside and could not evacuate at all. It only took about 10 seconds for the Jatta people to rush into the stables, light the fire, and finally withdraw. It only took about 10 seconds for the Jatta people to react. But within these 10 seconds, the Jatta people left at least more than 100 corpses. Most of the Jatta people who rushed into the stables died in the stables. Those who could evacuate were also wounded, with pricks on their bodies like hedgehogs. Sederin and several Noldor warriors hiding in the branches and leaves on the top of the stable also killed at least 20 of them in these few seconds. After all, both sides are facing the dense Jatta crowd at close range. In this case, there is no need to aim at all. And there is no need to consider the wind direction. It is more difficult to miss. So you only need to draw the bow as quickly as possible. Okay. With Sai Diren's ability as a Twilight Knight, he could actually shoot two arrows in three seconds without having to aim. If he hadn't been hiding in a tree, and it was inconvenient to retrieve the arrows, he would probably have been faster. In order to guard against arrows, the Jatta people held up their shields and retreated slowly. Retreating relatively slowly. When the Jatta people began to retreat, 30 infantrymen holding giant fan-shaped shields came out from behind the stable. They rushed out from the side of the stable with their shields and rushed to the west side of the Jatta people, forming a line. The platoon began to close in on the Jatu. The huge fan-shaped shield could completely block the Jatta people's bows and arrows and attracted a lot of firepower. The Nolder warriors in the stable also took the opportunity to come out. They quickly stood in an array with swords and shields and began to approach the Jatta people. The armored archers also left the stable and stood behind the Nolder. At the same time, a troop appeared in the forest to the east and was charging rapidly behind the Jatta people. Those were not the troops that the Lord brought to the south before, but part of the troops that went east from the beginning. What the Lord really took away to the south were the wounded. In fact, not all of the troops he led eastward were brought back. Half of them had been hiding in the forest to the east. This ambush did not involve any complicated methods of killing the enemy. No fire was used. And no pits were dug. Of course, it's not that I don't want to use it, but that the consequences of not using fire in the forest will be very serious. If you are not careful, it may cause a forest fire. The Noldor will not take the risk of being exterminated. As for the ground near the dug stables, which had been trampled by horses all year round. It was so compacted that not even grass grew. In fact, the Nolder elves have much stronger combat power than humans at night. And the Lord's manpower is not much less than that of the Jatta people. So the key to the problem does not lie in the ambush process. An ambush does not necessarily require playing with water, fire, and falling rocks. Relatively conventional sudden side attacks and encirclements can defeat the enemy. With the Norder's familiarity with the forest, they can naturally eliminate the enemy in pursuit. The key is how to let the Jada people see the opportunity and launch an attack at their own designated time. In order to lure the enemy to attack, the Lord used a lot of tricks. As Leon said, this racecourse is a relatively spacious place and the target is obvious. Of course, the Jata people will continue to observe. Leon deliberately led a large force eastward during the day, arranged for the ponies at the racecourse to come out for a walk and also had Nolder warriors patrolling. This was actually to make the Jada people think that he was laying an ambush during the day. Therefore, the Jada people did not move. In the evening, Leong brought back the troops he had brought to the east. In the eyes of the Jata people, this was an ambush. So they withdrew. But in fact, Leon only brought half of the troops back in the evening, and he left the other half in the forest to the east. Then he held up a large banner and took the Nolder wounded and children to the forest to the south. This was to make the Jada people think that he had indeed gone far. 
because this time, he had really gone far to the south. Those flying birds are enough to prove it. After arranging the wounded in the forest several miles away, Leon went around to the east alone and went to the army that stayed in the east. At this time, the Jada people were not sure whether Leon was really going south. So they would not send anyone to the south. Then it got late, and the ponies were brought back to the stable. This was the bait, and they were indeed left in the stable. In fact, these ponies are still tied up in the corner of the stable, barking. But there are already more than a hundred people ambushing the stables, and another hundred people are ambushing them in the forest to the east. Then, at night, Leon's large army went to the south and never came back. The Jada people had seen the battle during the day. According to their judgment, only the Nolder elves should be left in the stable, and most of them were wounded. There should only be about 30 of them with fighting ability. This is the best opportunity. The Jada people will naturally launch an attack while Liang's troops are not here. Who knows whether Nolder reinforcements will come tomorrow. In this case, nearly 400 Jada people will of course attack at night. This is what the Lord Lord said, giving the enemy a chance. If they don't attack when they get a good opportunity like this, then what's the point of hiding in the forest? Then the Jada people entered the racecourse at night. They were really careful at first and slowly advanced, leaving scouts outside the racecourse. But Liang's infantry came out to defend at this time, and then quickly retreated as soon as the enemy entered the shooting range. This was of course deliberately intended to give the Jata people confidence. If there was an ambush here, they would definitely not run away when the enemies were already close to more than a hundred meters away. Running away in this situation seemed more like the Nolder were unwilling to stand on the bare ground and shoot at each other despite being outnumbered. This made the Jada people strengthen their confidence. They believed that Liang's troops were indeed not here. The escaping, Nolder defenders, ran behind the stables. There should not be much fighting power in the stables. So the Jada people began to charge, preparing for a quick battle. But after hearing the sound of Hasa, the Lord took the troops left in the forest to the east and took action killing the Jada scouts left outside the racecourse. Then the Jada people rushed to the stable door, and within 10 seconds hundreds of people were shot to death by ferocious firepower. And then they began to retreat. But the dozens of infantrymen who had originally escaped came back at this moment, formed a shield formation on the west side of the Jada people, and began to squeeze the space of the Jada people. Liang's troops from the east also charged, their spears forming an array and approaching quickly. The Nolder warriors and armored archers in the stable also swarmed out at this time. The Jata people faced attacks from three sides. These Jata people had gathered at the entrance of the stable before, and they were crowded together. Now they were pressed hard by the infantry and Nolder warriors holding swords and shields. As a result, they gathered even denser, almost standing in a ball, except for a hole left in the northwest. There were troops on three sides. Moreover, the Jata people had lost a lot of money and no longer had the advantage in numbers. In addition, the Jada people did not have horses now, so they could not rely on mobility to avoid them. Open surround. Once this kind of three-sided attack is formed, most troops will be unable to fight, because the soldiers will definitely think of how to escape after encountering the enemy on several sides. In fact, ordinary troops will be easily defeated just by facing a flank attack. But the Jata people are different. They are indeed brave and fearless. No Jata people escaped. They divided into two groups and started a hand-to-hand -hand fight, intending to break into the shield formation and force the battle into a melee. However, the infantrymen and Nolder warriors holding swords and shields had formed a relatively tight formation, giving them no chance of melee. Leon had also arrived with his troops and formed a long contradictory formation that was difficult to overcome. The pocket surrounded on three sides has been closed into a U-shape, leaving only the opening on the north side. In fact, the Jata people rarely face sieges. They are flexible and mobile on the grassland and most of the time surround others. But at this time, they were surrounded by the Lord with equal strength. After less than half of them were killed, the number of Jata people was almost the same as that of the coalition forces of Liang and Sedrin. Move forward with your shield up! After the Lord arrived with his soldiers, the first order he issued was to continue squeezing the Jata people's space. When the crowd is too crowded and there is little space, no one can fight normally. The Jada people surrounding the center had no space and could no longer escape. They were squeezed so that they were surrounded by people. Due to mutual obstruction, they could neither run nor make any big movements. And it was difficult to even exert force. In the game, when people are crowded too densely, the knife will get stuck. In order not to hurt friendly troops, the knife cannot be slashed out. 
and even if it is slashed out, the force will be reduced. In fact, it is the same in reality. When people are crowded, stabbing with a short sword or dagger, or using a hatchet or military hoe is much more effective than a knife, because chopping requires the most space. The weapons of the Jata people were scimitars, bucklers, and bows and arrows, except for the buckler, which is still useful at this time. Other weapons are basically useless. The Jata scimitar is not suitable for stabbing. This single-edged weapon, with a relatively large arc, is more suitable as a saber. But now they were squeezed in the middle and couldn't exert their strength at all, facing the surrounding shield walls and dense crowds. The scimitars in their hands did not play much practical role except causing accidental injuries. Liang's troops don't have this trouble. His soldiers either use swords or spears, and it is much more convenient to be on the periphery. The soldiers in the front row kept pushing forward with their shields, while the spearmen in the back row could even place their spears on the waist belt buckles of the front row personnel, and then stab them randomly. While stabbing, he moved forward step by step with a shield hand in the front row, leaving no space for the enemy. The infantrymen quite liked this situation. In this situation, one stab is accurate. The shield, as a weapon that has been used from ancient times to modern times, has many more uses than people think. In addition to its main blocking function, it can also be used for identification, rowing, repelling on grass or snow, and even frying eggs. It can also be used to squeeze out the fishy smell in ditches and talk about Mazanhuan. Even in the 21st century, explosion-proof shields are still used to isolate crowds or squeeze mobs. And the use of shields and explosion-proof rods is similar to what Leon is doing now with his spearmen, the Jada people, who were in the inner circle and had never been surrounded by a shield formation, were obviously not used to this fighting method. The shield formation was actually very weak, but they could not break through it for a while, and people kept being stabbed to death. Soon, as the soldiers pressed closer and closer, the encirclement circle became smaller and smaller, and the Jada people began to fall to the ground in pieces. Hazar! Jatu! The Jada people seemed to burst out in despair. They completely ignored the swords coming from the side and back, and began to charge towards the only gap in the north regardless of damage. But having lost the space, it is difficult for them to even move even slightly, and the shield array surrounding them will continue to tighten. Some of the first people to rush out were easily shot down by the archers on the outside, but their concerted charge did have an effect. After more than half of them were killed or injured, 70 or 80 Jata people finally broke out of the encirclement and began to escape into the forest to the north. But that gap was originally reserved for them by Leon to escape. A gapless siege would cause the enemy to fight to the death, which would cause great losses. Encircling three towers, and one tower is common sense in the Chinese art of war. The Nolder elves put away their swords and shields, and took off the bows from their backs again. At night, under the moonlight, in the forest, Environments such as pursuit battles are when the Nolder can best display their combat effectiveness. Sederin led the 30 Nolder in pursuit, and Resederin also followed. But the Lord's work has been done, and the battlefield can be cleaned. The losses in this battle were quite small, with less than 10 casualties. And the losses occurred only after close combat. But Leon was not satisfied that the casualties were all new recruits. The combat effectiveness of these new recruits who had just graduated from the training ground was far less than that of the first batch he had personally trained. This shows that after the Mendenheimers, Sarah, and himself no longer participated in the training, the recruits probably did not suffer too much torture. Sir Roland is an excellent warrior with respectable character and beliefs. But he is not a good coach. He is too kind, and the recruits are probably not afraid of him. It takes rough guys like Frederick and Close to train the troops well. The Lord began to miss the strong men of Mendenheim. Chapter 177 Brainwashing the Elf King The next morning, Sederin returned with an older. Your Excellency Leong, your plan is very good. I think there should be no enemies around here. Sederin looked very good, and it seemed that most of the Jada people were not able to escape. But I think you may not be able to rest. We should go to the weapons factory you mentioned right away. I hope we don't encounter any trouble there. Leon pointed eastward. Sederin nodded. Of course I have no problem. But don't you need to rest? My troops have just slept. So I didn't clean up these corpses. The wounded are in a valley five miles south. Leave your soldiers here and let them clean up the battlefield and take care of the wounded. You and I will go together. Look to the east. If you are not here, I will not dare to go near your tribe's settlement. After the Lord finished speaking, he began to assemble his army and planned to set off immediately. Of course, 
Leon will not stay here for too long. He plans to meet the top brass of the Fenway family. But if he appeared near the settlement of Nolder with his army, he would probably be attacked. So he had to let Cedric introduce him. There are deep mountains and old forests for 60 miles to the east. Even with Cy Deren leading the way, it still took a whole day to walk. It was already afternoon when we arrived near the Fenway family's settlement. We'll be there soon. Please wait here for a while while I go say H, low to avoid any misunderstanding. Cedron asked Leon to stop first, and then planned to walk into the woods ahead alone. Of course, the Twilight Knight also knew that there would be misunderstandings if the human troops approached. So of course, he had to report it first. But Leon raised his head and looked ahead, frowned, and grabbed Cy Deren. Wait. Then, he found a place with relatively sparse trees and looked at the sky. Cedron, wait. The Nolder must also use furnaces to make weapons. Of course you need a furnace to smelt chain metal. Mr. Leon. You mean? Cedron then looked at the sky, then turned back with a solemn expression. There is neither smoke nor birds in the sky. Cy Deren, there is a situation here. And it happened not long ago. Everyone, prepare to fight. Leon directed the soldiers to gather together and start marching on the spot wearing equipment. The troops were not wearing armor. Otherwise, they would not be able to operate in such deep mountains and forests. Who is it? Come out. At this moment, Cedarin seemed to have discovered something, shouted into the forest, and then began to look around. No one responded. But a few seconds later, there was a swish, sound, and a light and shadow passed by the forest on the side and went straight to Liang's back. Dang. Risa Dillon held up his shield and stood behind Liang, blocking the light and shadow. There is an arrow embedded in the shield. Over there. Rasatalin stood still. And the arrow tail must be pointing to where the archer was hiding. Cedarin took off the bow from his back and rushed into the dense forest in that direction with extremely fast movement. Risa Dillon glanced at his shield. And instead of rushing forward, he protected Liang and took a few steps back. What was stuck on the shield was not an older arrow, but a wooden arrow with patterned feathers. Sir, this is a single arrow dot the feathers are made of ostrich feathers. Rasatalan whispered to the lord behind him. Single people? Why did they come here? Leon was quite surprised. Single belonged to the principality of Desha in name, and was located in the desert in the southwest of the mainland. It was separated from the Noldor forest by more than half of the continent, at least more than 2,000 miles away. Maybe it's the single slave catching team. Rissa Dillon carefully looked around, handed the shield to Leon, and took off the bow and arrow on his back. Many years ago, this elf killer debuted in single. His first business was when he saw a murder contract posted publicly in the largest tavern in single. Yes, a publicly posted murder is like a reward. But instead of pursuing a guilty person, it's purely a price tag on a human life. Lisa Dillon, who was in desperate need of a living at that time, brought back one of the heads. And then just like that, he got his first income after entering human society on the bar of the pub. Rasatalan knew Single relatively well. So he acted cautiously. Anson also seemed to be relatively familiar with his hometown of Ashkaman, which now also belongs to the Principality of Dexia. He must have heard about the situation in Single. So his face was now full of nervousness. Especially after hearing Risa Dillon talk about the Single Slave Catching Team. Ah. Uh, a scream came from the direction of the dense forest where Cedron entered. Ten seconds later, Cedron dragged a man whose leg was shot through back to Liang's location. I only saw this one person. But there was only one person. Why would he attack the army? Cedron dragged the guy to Liang and stopped the man's screams with a slap on the head. It was indeed a Singalian. And he seemed to be a writer. But he never spoke. He just lay on the ground and stared at Cedron with hateful eyes. I'll give you a minute to say something useful. Leon looked at the soldiers who were still putting on their equipment and patted the prisoner's face with his sword. The guy didn't react. Sir, let me do this work. And Dong Jiao lifted up her Ravenland sword, scraped the blade with her fingers, and used the sword to chop the tree next to her without even cutting through the bark. It looked like the blade on the side was quite blunt. Then she walked up to the single without saying a word, just looking at him, then stepped on the captive's thigh that had been hit by an arrow and started to cut the captive's calf with the sword blade. Grid. Grid. The scene of being cut with a dull knife was quite unbearable. The prisoner finally spoke. Don't. Don't do this. Give me a good time. And Dong Jia remained expressionless, not saying a word, but seriously, constantly cutting his calf. 
The leather leggings have been cut to pieces. And a bloody groove has been cut on the calf. The bloody flesh is rubbing against the sword blade. Making a gruck sound. I am a subordinate of Lord Fru's. I was hired here to capture the Nolder Elves. But I was separated from the main force. Without asking any questions. The guy started to explain himself. It seems that Misty Mountain's torture method is very good. How many people are there in your army? Where did they enter the forest? Leon started to ask questions. Fifteen hundred people. We came in from the south of Dindil Mountain. From a burn castle. Oh. Shield Wind Fortress. That used to be Shield Wind Fortress. It seems that this is the sequelae of the burning of the Shield Wind Fortress. Such a large force passed south of the Dindier Mountains without being discovered by any force. Where did your army go? Cedron asked. Returning to the south. We already succeeded the day before yesterday. I got separated. And when I heard the voice of the Noldor, I thought I was discovered. So I shot an arrow. What? Did you succeed? Leong and Cedron were both surprised. If it was the day before yesterday, it would be one day earlier than the time when the racecourse met the Jatu and the Misty Mountain people. This should also be the time when Islandil was marching here. After the attack, they returned south and probably met Islandil's army halfway. So Islandil was held back by the army of 1,500 people and could not come here. When we arrived here, the Nolder here seemed to be preparing to move. So we hid in the woods and ambushed them. They had almost no defense. So they were easily defeated by us and captured more than 20 people. There are three girl rangers among them. That's all I know. Please give me a break. The single man's cap bone had already begun to sharpen the sword's edge. Making a squeak. Squeak. Friction sound. And Indongion never stopped. So the Sinjar man spoke very fast. He was now trembling all over and just wanted to die. Okay, Indongion. Stop and take him with you. After looking at the brothers who were fully equipped, they quickly headed to the weapons factory with their troops. Soon after, the Lord came to the settlement of the Fenway family. Many treehouses were built on the outermost trees, but all were deserted. Walking further inside, you will find a place that is more spacious than a racecourse. A large flat land surrounded by dense forests. Several large workshops were built in the center, and not a single tree was left within 200 meters around the workshops. A group of people separately inspected all the houses and factories inside and outside, but in the end found nothing. All the people and weapons and equipment were missing and only a dozen cleanly stripped corpses were left on the scene. How many people are supposed to be here? Leong frowned and asked Sai Diren. There are at least a hundred people. They are probably just like me at the racecourse. And they are preparing to transport supplies to the city. It's probably like you said. The enemy is hiding nearby. Waiting for the combatants to start transporting supplies. Surprise attack. Cedarin murmured. I have to find the enemy. But now no one knows where the enemy is. The forest is so big that even a large army of thousands of people will be difficult to find in this forest. And since the prisoner would be separated from the main force, he would naturally not be able to find his accomplices either. Besides, Cedarin hasn't slept for two days, and Liang's troops have been walking all day, so they can only rest here temporarily. Half a day later, ugh, woo, a strange flute sound sounded. Our troops are coming. Cedarin was sleeping. After hearing the sound of the flute, he immediately stood up, found a Nolder arrow without an arrow in his quiver, raised the bow in his hand, and shot it into the sky. It was a noisy arrow, or a whistle arrow, and it flew into the sky with a woo-woo flute sound. It seems that this is the way the Nolder troops send signals, and it should indicate the location of their own people. Soon a Nolder force arrived. When Cedarin saw the leader, he immediately lowered his head, put his hand on his chest and saluted. Your Majesty. Cedron, why are you here? What's going on with these humans? The leader was a Noldor who looked to be middle-aged and wearing a crown in the shape of a wreath of branches and leaves. This was obviously the off King Fergus and Ur of the Finwy family. In fact, it is difficult to tell how old the Noldor are because they live so long that they always look young. In terms of Nuodua's lifespan, if he looks like a middle-aged or elderly person, then he is probably really old. Your Majesty, this is Mr. Leong from White Deer Castle. He helped me kill more than 500 enemies. Mr. Leong, this is our king, His Majesty Fergusoner. Cedarin began to introduce. In fact, the Lord cannot be called Leong of White Deer Castle because his fiefdom is still only makes angling. But Leong did not correct this statement. All his thoughts were on the elf king. 
This was his main purpose in coming to the Noldor Forest. He wanted to get the support of the elves. Leon. Fergusoner looked at the Lord and seemed to have remembered something. But he did not show it. He just nodded kindly. Thank you for your help. Little friend. I hope that my family will have the opportunity to repay you in the future. But now? Cedarin. We have to rescue the captured tribesmen. It seems that many Noldor escaped two days ago and immediately went to the Elves' castle to report the situation. This was the right choice. Whether it was to save their lives or for the safety of other tribesmen, they could only run to where the Elf King was. If they had fled to the racecourse at that time, they would have attracted the enemy to the racecourse. Your Majesty, you actually want to personally lead the army to pursue the enemy? Saturn looked surprised. No, Your Majesty is just here to rebuild the factory. I will be responsible for leading the troops to pursue them. Those children who were captured are my students. A female ranger stepped forward, looked at Leong indifferently, turned aside Darren and said, You shouldn't trust humans. This is a mature woman with a beautiful face. But for some reason, Leong always feels that she should be described as tough. Risa Dillon shrank his head after seeing the female ranger, seeming to be quite afraid of her. Cedarin shook his head. When they dear, your excellency Leong has proven his goodwill. You can't treat your friend so rudely. Friend? Wendadier smiled contemptuously and walked directly to Leong. Okay, friend. Why did you come to the Noldor Forest? Just to find myself a reliable ally. The Lord Lord shook his head. However, looking at your current appearance, it seems that you are not qualified to be my allies. I originally thought that ancient ethnic groups like the Noldor meant profound wisdom. But what I saw along the way was not the case. More like a group of incompetent people who will only turn around and bully weak civilians after being bullied. Of course, the Lord said this on purpose. This is his usual approach. It is actually better to arouse the other party's interest, dissatisfaction, or anger in the conversation first. Liang's words sounded like a provocation. When Datier was obviously irritated, with a fierce look in his eyes, as if he was about to draw his sword. But Fergusoner came over and took a deep look at Leon. A human said this decades ago. My child, tell me why you think Noldor has lost his wisdom. Tens of millions of years ago, your civilization was founded on the basis of its own civilization. Let's beat the cook and complain to death. Let's stir up the lawsuit and kill the enemy. You originally had countless advantages, such as strength, longevity, and advanced technological inheritance. In fact, at the beginning, all you had to do was lower your noble heads and treat human beings as equal intelligent beings. Not only can you coexist peacefully with them, but you can even make humans worship you. 300 years ago, after you defeated the human army that invaded the forest, you already had the greatest deterrence. However, you did not make reasonable use of this deterrence. Instead, you killed all those around the forest who originally wanted to stay with you. Friendly people have lost their trade routes and communication channels with humans. Since then, you have personally destroyed your hope of rising again. Leon shook his head and smiled. But he did not finish what he said. The long lifespan coupled with the fate of being a slave of the Sindari elves has made you lose your creativity. And you do not have the ability to learn quickly. I must have you haven't made any new inventions in these thousands of years. Right? You probably lost a lot of your original ancient inheritance. Right? But now? You have turned all your advantages into weaknesses. It is your own arrogance that has caused mankind's love for you to become a reason to capture you but you regard it as hatred. You should hate yourself. With your lifespans, you should have participated in the war 300 years ago. Right? At that time, as long as you had a little bit of brains, you should negotiate with humans and agree on a place where the two races can live together and ask your people to treat each other as equals and live in harmony. Now you are just an armed tribe with no creativity, no ability to learn quickly, and no development prospects. You have been resting on your laurels and have not changed. Calling you an armed tribe makes you look down on you. You don't even have a target. You only know how to wait, watch, or kill civilians in revenge after being invaded. Leon finally ended his rant and spread his hands. I don't understand. What's the point of living like this? Is this kind of life called wisdom? Your Excellency Leon. Saturn did not expect that Leon would say this in front of the elf king of the Fenway family. And he couldn't accept it. However, when Nadir who originally had no good impression of human beings, frowned and began to think. But Fergus and her smile, You are right, child. But you don't understand that the longer the ethnic group has a long history, the harder it is to be changed. I know what you said is right. 
but I want to change human concepts are difficult. It's not difficult. It just requires some sacrifice. Unfortunately, you don't have the courage to sacrifice. Leon shook his head again. He was ready to brainwash the elf king. Ferguson was stunned for a while and nodded. Baby, you were right. But we cannot afford to sacrifice. The sacrifice I'm talking about is not a dead person. Leon grinned. I mean, you should let some of your people try to integrate into the humans who are kind to you. Sacrifice your arrogant character. Sacrifice your so-called traditions. Sacrifice those passed down from the Sindarin elves the so-called pure blood. The inheritance of civilization is not inherited by servility and blood, but by connecting the interests of humans and elves. In this way, humans will not only protect the Nolder elves, but also naturally help you pass on the elves civilization. Chapter 178 How many steps does it take to kidnap Noldo? When Dadier stared at Leon closely, frowning more and more. But she finally controlled her temper and said, Your Excellency Leon, if we lose the tradition and pride of the elves, then we will no longer be the Nolder elves. Very good. This was the response that Leon wanted to get. He was originally worried that these arrogant Nolder would ignore him. So he deliberately used such fierce words just to get a response. What is your tradition? Don't forget that you once lived in the center of the continent, in the largest city, instead of hiding in the forest and struggling to survive. What are you proud of? That comes from the glorious civilization that once ruled the entire continent in ancient times. But what are you like now? Even the Jatu and Misty Mountain people dare to attack you. Your traditions have changed long ago, and your pride is only the memory of the past. You are really still know how healthy? The Lord no longer smiled. His expression was serious and serious. Think about it. If you always treat humans as inferior creatures, then you will never be able to get out of this forest. Then, what will your tradition eventually become? What will become of pride? You will only slowly turn into a barbaric tribe hiding in the woods, gradually disappear, and finally be forgotten by the world. Only by walking out of the forest, returning to the sun, rebuilding the glorious elven kingdom in the center of the earth, using your rich knowledge to create more breathtaking craft miracles, so that other races will willingly recognize your greatness. Only such a group can be called noble elves. Every word the Lord said seemed to be criticism, but it also seemed to be encouragement. But at least, being able to say such words definitely means that Leong has no ill intentions, and the elves will definitely listen, and will listen very carefully. When Nadir was silent, the Lord Lord had indeed deliberately belittled the Nolder elves before. His words sound like deliberate criticism, but they are actually an effective psychological suggestion. Maybe the Nolder elves who hear these words will be angry. But they will definitely care about these criticisms. And thus, they will care about what Leong says next. Every word said. Moreover, the more proud a person is, the more he will care about such criticism. Because these are objective facts and do not involve any racial discrimination or personal attacks. They are just evaluations made from a neutral third-party perspective. But this kind of evaluation is actually unfair. Because only mentioning the shortcomings and not the advantages is deliberately belittling the other party. This is a brainwashing method that is rarely mentioned, but is often seen in daily life. Defective thought control. That is to say, use the criticism that the other party cares about to reversely induce the other party to act according to one's own wishes. Yes, what Leon wants is to control part of the Nolder as a superior, not to find an ancestor for himself. Therefore, he will not treat the Nolder elves as friends, and he does not have that much time to make friends with a race that lives for thousands of years. They are often friends with each other for hundreds of years. How many years can you get along with them? A human with a lifespan of only a few decades is just a passerby for a brief moment in the long years of the elves, and is not worth mentioning at all. In Liang's view, every adult Noldo is older than his grandfather. If he uses conventional methods to win favor, he will only end up with a group of old men who rely on their elders, and will not listen to his orders which centenarian would be willing to obey the arrangements of a 20-year-old boy? What's the use of putting in a lot of effort to gain the other's favor, but not to get the Nolder to obey him? The Lord Lord doesn't care at all whether the Nolder like him or hate him. What he cares about is whether the skilled Nolder warriors can obey his orders, and whether the Nolder's enchanted equipment and elf horses can be used by him. Moreover, it is difficult for him to establish any real friendship in a short period of time. The hatred between races cannot be eliminated by meeting and saying a few words. The Twilight Knight in the racecourse, who is hostile to humans, is the norm among the Nolder. Leon personally may be able to gain some of the Nolder's favor by continuously supporting the Nolder. But this is just a good impression. 
the Noldor will neither be willing to sacrifice and bleed for mankind, nor will they listen to the command of a junior. In fact, to the Noldor elves, humans are probably like some animals that live for more than ten years, such as kittens and puppies. No matter how much a person likes cats, he will at most regard them as family members and friends. But he will never die for a cat. The Noldor place themselves in a higher position than all species in the world. Therefore, Leong has to change his approach to get people to obey. Sometimes you don't need a good impression. Moreover, it is actually much easier to gain favor as a superior after the other party has already obeyed. In fact, most people must have experienced this situation. A person you don't know well suddenly makes some very unkind criticisms about a flaw in something you care about particularly. There are many things that you care about, such as your career, studies, hobbies, etc., that you have put a lot of effort into. The person criticizing you may be a new teacher or student, a new colleague, not necessarily a leader, but also a peer or subordinate, or a strange teammate you just met on the field. When encountering this kind of situation, if you are a proud person, your first reaction is often, I want to protect myself, so you will be angry. Anger is actually a protective emotion and is basically not controlled by the brain. If he is a reckless person, his first reaction is, No matter what he said is right or not, I am unhappy anyway and I want to fight him or just beat him up. But as long as the other person is talking about something you particularly care about, you will definitely be affected because you are unwilling to give in. If a familiar person, such as a close friend, says this, it doesn't matter because you won't be angry. When there is no protective emotion like anger, you will feel that it is no big deal and you will no longer care. If it is a relatively unfamiliar person, you will subconsciously fall into unwilling and complicated emotions because it is something or a career that you care about. No matter how open-minded a person is, they will subconsciously care about other people's evaluations. But some people will show it and some will not because you know that what the other party said is actually an objective and neutral evaluation. But this kind of evaluation is deliberate and incomplete. It is a pure defect evaluation. It does not mention any advantages. This kind of evaluation is not good for you. However, you can neither hide your flaws nor refute on the spot, because what the other person said is all true, coupled with the fact that you are not familiar with the other person. You can't even change the topic to reverse the embarrassment. At this time, your instinct will drive you to pay attention to every word that the unfamiliar person says. Because after people are criticized, your subconscious mind will drive you to find loopholes in the other person's point of view to prove that he is wrong. But in fact, it is difficult for you to find the other party's loopholes on the spot. Because you will be uneasy, anxious, and in a bad mood. When their emotions are affected by others, it is difficult for most people to stay calm and think. Moreover, you have unknowingly put your posture in a position that is equivalent to it. You will no longer ignore the other party, but will regard the other party as an opponent. This has actually formed the basis for negotiation. Even if you originally thought that the other person's identity was not comparable to yours. Even if you didn't originally want to talk to him. More importantly, you will deliberately hide your flaws or find ways to correct them. But not to better myself. But to stop being seen. At this time, if the other party uses the shortcomings that were just criticized to act, some positive incentives on you. This is actually the beginning of control. Because you will feel that the other party understands you and is not maliciously slandering you. You will not be resentful of the other party's looking down attitude. But you will consider the other party's words extremely seriously. This is actually pulling on your mentality. Keeping you in a shallow anger state where you can understand the other person's words. But your thoughts are complicated and difficult to fully think about. Then, the other party will definitely propose a methodology. You will definitely pay careful attention to this methodology and will use an examination method to try to find the untenable aspects of the methodology. Your subconscious is controlling your behavior. You will try this method and try to find the flaws of the other party. Maybe you can finally find a loophole in the other party's methodology and use it as a medium to make yourself open-minded again. Maybe you don't find it. And in the end it is time that repairs your angry and unwilling mentality. But whether you find it or not, your behavior has begun to be controlled by others. Because you will try the method he proposes. The other party's methodology is designed to let you find loopholes. If you don't implement this method for a period of time, how will you know if there are loopholes? Of course the other person knows that you will be unhappy and that you may hate him. But the other person doesn't care about that. Moreover, the other party doesn't care about your flaws. 
what the other person cares about is actually letting you act in the way he designed. In fact, this method is the most effective and widely used method of psychological guidance. It is especially suitable for supporting manufacturers and brand companies, new employees or new leaders taking office, and brainwashing marketing when they have just met but belong to the cooperative camp. This situation occurs very often in real life. This is also the simplest effective thinking control method. But there are still very few people who can use it well. Because most people who use this method do not understand that the core of this control method is to achieve effective control. In the end, they need to come up with a contradiction for this methodology. Or an opportunity to release control. The vast majority of people who try to do defect control don't get to the last step. If you want to effectively control others, the proposed methodology must be full of contradictions. And preferably there must be a loophole. A good methodology must have loopholes. Just like the people the king trusts must have leverage in the king's hands. Because there are only two things that the control person is most concerned about. One is how to hide his own flaws. And the other is finding the loopholes in your plan. This loophole will actually be executed 100%. Therefore, the methodology must be designed into a contradictory solution and the vulnerability must be designed into the desired control goal. When the control person executes and finds the loophole, the controller's purpose is achieved. And if this loophole is not implemented, it will never be proven that the controller is wrong and it will always be anxious and worried. Under this contradiction, almost no one can escape. The only way to escape control is to lie completely flat. But that means that the person no longer cares about this flaw. Everyone cares about their own shortcomings. The company boss cares about the company's shortcomings. And the leader of a group cares most about the shortcomings faced by the entire group. Of course, what Felgasian cares about most is the survival of the race. There are not many people in his Finley family anymore. So he must care about the real shortcomings of the older people. Your Excellency Leon, you said before that you want to connect the interests of humans and elves. How do you want to connect them? Fergus Aner did not use the term, child, this time. Let me give you a hypothetical plan. Your Majesty, I can open my territory for your people to move in. And your people can sell Nolder goods to exchange for a large amount of living supplies for the entire tribe. This can make my territory become being wealthy can also allow the entire Nolder tribe to have a better life. This is the first and easiest way to bundle interests. Through trade. If we cooperate more deeply, I will issue a decree to ensure that everyone is treated equally in my territory. Humans and Nolder elves are both territorial citizens. As long as they abide by the laws of my territory. All my troops come from the territory's citizens. And they will naturally protect everyone. The safety of the people will also protect the families of the people. In other words, my troops will naturally provide protection for the entire Nolder community. If someone enslaves the Nolder again, my troops will of course spontaneously save their relatives. Of course, this requires the Nolder to also obey my recruitment and military orders. If all this goes smoothly, then as my territory expands, the more places the Nolder can set foot, your family will be more prosperous and your tribe will be safer. In this way, we will there are more common goals and interests. In order to protect the interests of the Noldor, you can send some people to my territory. I will make these people lords and let the Noldor elves manage the Noldor elves living in my territory. This can also be maintained continuously with your cultural traditions. Is this a reasonable assumption? In fact, my territory has a law that treats everyone equally. And you have also seen that Rasatalan has been fighting side by side with me. And I have indeed led my troops and we have no complaints about helping the Nolder repel the enemy and bleeding and dying for it. Leon gave his plan. A plan that seemed normal and feasible. It's just that it's easy to see. Sure enough, when Nadir immediately began to retort. How can we trust you? Human beings are too fickle. And they are constantly launching wars. I think you just want my people to help you fight. This is an obvious loophole. Leon really wants Nolder to fight for him. From this perspective, it will appear that the starting point of Liang's plan is very suspicious. But Leon feels that when Dadir is really too cooperative, this plan originally hopes that you will be suspicious. You don't need to believe me in the first place. In fact, you can blackmail me. Madam, your name is Windadir. Right? I believe that with your skills. I can't defeat you in three moves. And you should always be suspicious of me. Right? Then, I suggest you follow me and go to my territory to serve as the lord of the Nolder. If I break my promise, or I plan to let the Nolder die, or I don't be kind. Anyway, as long as I am harming the Nolder elves, you will kill me with your own hands. So you can rest assured. Right? 
The Lord's smile deepened, and he even asked Wendavier, If I guess correctly, Risa Dillon is probably your student. Right? In fact, it is obvious that Rasadilin is like a mouse meeting a cat when he sees Wendavier. It seems that he is more respectful to Wendavier than the Elf King. Liang is very familiar with this situation. If he met the teacher who was the most severe to him back then, he would probably be like this. Wendavier glared at Risa Dillon and then stared into Liang's eyes with extremely sharp eyes. But she no longer refuted, and she also felt that there was nothing wrong with Liang's statement. If she was threatening Liang, then what should she be afraid of? In fact, this is the contradiction left by the Lord. If Wendavier and his people stayed in Liang's territory, then cooperation between the two parties would have been formed according to Liang's plan. But if not, how can the problem be solved? And when Dadier can indeed focus on this most suspicious point, a simple thought control was completed, and the elves' thoughts and actions were directed to how to ensure Liang's reliability. However, if you want to confirm this, you can only follow Liang first. Your Excellency Liang, although your previous words sounded rude, I admit that what you said makes sense, and I am willing to believe that you are well-intentioned, but I cannot believe other humans, including your subjects, yet, so I have to consider your plan. But you are right about one thing. We should indeed get out of the forest. Fergus and R.S. temperament is obviously gentler and calmer. And he is less affected by it. But in fact, his thinking was also guided in the direction that Leon wanted. As long as the Nolder planned to leave the forest, they could only settle in Liang's territory. And there was no other possibility. As long as the Nolder survive in Leon's territory, the Lord will have achieved his goal. Of course, Your Majesty, I'm just giving my advice. Look at what's going on right now. Your people have been captured, and Ms. Vendito probably has to lead her troops out of the forest to pursue the enemy. In this case, I will lead the troops to fight side by side with Vendito to save your people. This will not only prove the goodwill of my men towards the Nolder Elves, but also allow Ms. Vendito to observe the outside world and see how to lead the people. Better to come out of the forest. Leong volunteered to take over the rescue job, and when Dadier seemed to be unable to escape the fate of being abducted, Wendadier was a little confused. Do you know where the enemy is? Leon looked at Wendadier and smiled. I don't know, but I can at least guess where the enemy will take those girl rangers after they capture them. Chapter 179 Frau's Slave Catching Group Where will Sinjar's slave catching party go after they capture the Nolder? Returning to Sinjar. Of course. Sinjar has the largest slave market in the entire continent. According to the prisoner's account, the weapons factory was robbed by a slave catching group led by a guy named Fruz and it was because of a huge reward. Then Frau's slave-catching group naturally has to return to Sinjar. After all, the payment can only be settled after delivery. Frau's slave-catching group came from near Shieldwind Fortress, and they would probably go back from there. And this is indeed the most suitable path for the slave-catching group. To the south of the Denzel Mountains is the Kingdom of Lion and Buck. There are no people in the Sri Lankan Empire's buffer zone for hundreds of miles, so the army will not encounter any trouble passing by. For a slave-catching group has a large number of people. Neither the Lion Kingdom nor the Bacchus Empire would allow such a large force to enter the domestic territory at will. Therefore, the Lord believes that they must still pass through the buffer zones of the two countries. Return. Since Islandil failed to come here, it means that the enemy encountered Islandil's troops on their way back. If we hurry up, we may be able to meet them halfway. The Lord planned to rush to the southwest immediately. If he was lucky, he might be able to intercept the enemy halfway. In that case, let's do it this way. Your Majesty, I'm taking my leave. I really want to see if Lord Liang is what he said. When Dadier agreed with Liang's suggestion, judging from her appearance, she didn't seem to need the Elf King's permission to do anything she wanted to do. Risa Dillon, your teacher has a very high status. Master Vindadil is the teacher of most young Nolder. Her teachings have enabled Nolder girls to have powerful martial arts. The girl rangers she taught are more powerful than male rangers. Therefore, in the past 200 years, women the children have also become an important armed force of the Nolder. Her status in the hearts of the rangers is very high and is not restricted by any group. Rasadalin whispered beside the Lord. But she looks very young. How old is she? Leong didn't expect that Lisa Dillon used the word master. It didn't seem like he was talking about a beautiful woman. Your Excellency Leong, we should set off immediately. When Dadier glared at Risa Dillon, I can hear you talking about my age. This is very rude. Young man. She glared at Lisa Dillon. But her words were obviously talking about Leon. 
Elves do have good ears. Lisa Dillon shrank her head and did not dare to say a word. But Liang saw Risa Dillon secretly gesture to himself, extending three fingers, and then withdrew one. That definitely doesn't refer to 32. It seems to refer to 302. Sorry, madam. I was just thinking about how to address you. But I hope you can understand that if you leave the forest and enter the human world, you must obey my orders. It was really rude to ask a woman's age, and someone overheard her. The Lord bowed his head and apologized sincerely, but still made his request. If you can let me see your command ability, I will listen. I know that I don't know much about humans and how to fight on the plains. So of course, I will respect your opinion outside the forest. But now you haven't left the forest yet. Sir Liang, and don't forget, I may take your life at any time. After speaking, Wendadier turned and returned to her troops. Seeing that Liang had been looking at Wendadier, Risa Dillon said, Sir, Wendadier is a real master. Her martial arts are far better than the Twilight Knight. More than 200 years ago, she alone developed a method suitable for elves. The girl's fighting skills make the girl ranger an elite member of the army. Her conduct is also that of a master. And she will definitely fulfill her promise. So you don't have to worry. It seems that 300 years ago, when Winda Deer was still a simple girl, she probably witnessed the girls in the clan being kidnapped by humans. So she trained herself into a powerful female ranger and transformed herself into a powerful female ranger. Martial arts are taught to Nuudu girls so that they can have the ability to protect themselves. It is estimated that the martial arts skills she has figured out are more suitable for girls. So the strength of the girl rangers is higher than that of the male rangers. Of course, it may also be because the girl rangers are more aware of what will happen to them if they are caught by humans. So they will be more desperate. But according to Rissa Dillon, Windadier has single-handedly significantly improved the combat effectiveness of the entire ethnic group, which is indeed worthy of respect. In fact, the army currently led by Vindita looks quite strong. There are 200 Nolder rangers, half male and female. They all look like young Nolder, and they are probably her students. But the spirit of this student army is indeed extraordinary, giving people a sharp feeling. However, the girl rangers in her team did not ride horses, probably because these students have not graduated yet. In order to improve efficiency, Leon did not return to White Deer Castle. Instead, he asked Lisa Dillon to lead the way and walked a straight line to the southwest, heading straight to the Burnout Shield Wind Fortress. The Lord's judgment was correct. The next day, when they arrived at the large camp where Islandil had killed 3,000 mercenaries, they did meet Islandil. There are also dozens of human corpses placed in the camp, and they appear to be dressed as single people. There are a few alive and they seem to be being interrogated. Risa Dillon, is this Mr. Leong? Hey, when Nadir? When Islandil saw Liang's troops, he originally planned to say H, Lo, but after seeing Windadil, he took the initiative to greet them. Islandil, where are your troops? Have you encountered enemies before? Windadil stepped forward and did not use any honorific when facing Islandil. The two were probably familiar with each other. Encountered. I encountered a human force not far from the northeast. Due to the large number of enemies, a large number of enchanted weapons, and many Finway family hostages in their hands, I had to confront them for two days. But last night, I found that they planned to take some hostages away. So I had to launch a strong attack. As a result, they scattered and fled in all directions. So I had to let the troops disperse to pursue. Islandil pointed to the corpses in the camp and quickly explained the military situation. His Highness actually took the initiative to tell the details. It seemed that his respect for Wendadier was obvious. Leong felt that Islandil seemed a little afraid of Wendadier. Where are our abducted tribesmen? Wendadier was obviously most concerned about the abducted tribesmen. I probably only rescued half of them. The hostages they left to divert my attention were all male. But I saw several girls in the hands of the enemy before. Those girls may have been taken away by them. But I don't know which one they took. I am questioning the direction. And I have captured a few prisoners. Islandil seemed a little nervous. Soon, Leon understood why Rasadalan was so afraid of him as a teacher. And also understood why Islandil was nervous. When a deer grabbed a prisoner, she held the prisoner's neck with one hand, lifted him up, and held him up against a big tree. Where did your main force go? The unlucky prisoner kicked his feet in the air twice and let out a few O's in his throat. But he couldn't say anything. Then when Dadier let go of his hand, took half a step back, and at the same time as the prisoner fell against the tree trunk, he kicked the unlucky prisoner in the lower body with lightning speed. 
Bang! The force of this kick was extremely terrifying. The tree, which was more than one meter in diameter, began to shake violently. And the sound of the bark cracking was deafening. The prisoner fell softly along the tree to the ground. He must have been hopeless. There was probably only a thin layer of skin left between his legs. When the person fell down, the skin was still attached to the tree. Finally, it was removed by the body, pulled off by weight. The bark of the big tree was cracked open by the violent force, leaving a radial footprint full of blood on the white trunk. The footprint was at least half an inch deep into the trunk. Leon swallowed. Dumbfounded. This kind of strength is so terrifying. What he said before seems to have come true. He may really not be able to defeat others in three moves. Islandal and Rasadalan also swallowed at the same time. No wonder Vindatil is not bound by any group. This terrifying strength must be restrained by someone. The other two Sinjar prisoners were completely frightened and actually peed. They're going south! Going to Shield Wind Fortress. Seeing Wendadier turning around and staring at them fiercely. The two prisoners learned to answer. This answer was consistent with Liang's judgment. And Wendadier immediately set off south with his troops. Vendatil! You left the forest with so many young people. You could easily become a human target. Islandal planned to stop him. Your Highness Islandal! Wouldn't it be better if the enemy has a target? Leong smiled at Islandil. As a result, the first face-to-face -face communication between Leong and Islandil became a tactical communication. Near Shield Wind Fortress at night. Today's Shield Wind Fortress is in ruins. With only a black stone wall left. And the ground is covered with black embers from burning. But now, a large army of more than a thousand people is still stationed in this ruins. It was indeed Frau's slave-catching party. But there didn't seem to be a single horse in sight. Lisa Dillon had been here before and was quite familiar with the surrounding environment. He led the troops in front and moved quite quickly. After arriving near Shield Wind Fortress, Risa Dillon, Leong and Windadier personally served as scouts to investigate. Islandal led the troops and hid in a small forest. The dark ruins could not hide anyone, and the three of them quickly saw the troops in the ruins. What kind of person is that Fruzy? Hiding behind a big tree with Lisa Dillon, Leong asked about the enemy's situation. He was a little doubtful as to why the enemy would be stationed here. It was too eye-catching. And the enemy had already captured several elf girls. Logically speaking, they should not stay. This is not normal. That's a gangster from Single who specializes in catching slaves. He's quite powerful. Risa Dillon knew about Frau's slave-catching group, which was the largest slave-catching group in Sinjar and a large-scale black power organization. Fruzi's business was huge, and he was very famous. However, this guy had a pretty bad reputation. He was called Shameless Fruzy. The reason for such a nickname is mainly because his slave-catching group did not just rely on war to capture prisoners as slaves. This slave-catching group is indeed a mercenary army in itself. But they also plunder civilians in villages and towns. And they also kidnap children and abduct women everywhere. The worst thing is that they don't even spare their own villagers. There are even many temptresses in this gang who specialize in swindling noble men and women. Anyone who is young. Strong or good-looking is their target. They would set up traps to deceive, mostly using methods such as fairy dancing and gambling, to force young noble men and women to sell themselves into slaves. The price of noble girls in the slave market was quite high, and those strong noble young men were also very valuable. When people become commodities, some people will do anything to get goods. But Frouse has always claimed that the way he obtained slaves was prisoners of war obtained on the battlefield. This behavior of doing it and not admitting it is of course quite shameless. After all, most of the slaves he captured did not meet the definition of slaves anywhere. Citizens of this country usually do not become slaves unless they commit a serious crime and are deprived of their citizenship rights. Or they, voluntarily, sign a deed of sale in a life and death bet. Most of the time, the sources of slaves were criminals or soldiers of hostile countries. But Fraus did not even spare the civilians of his own principality of Desha. There were countless civilians who were tricked into selling themselves into slaves by his gang. And there were also many young nobles. It stands to reason that such an organization would be beaten up in most places. But not in single because Fruzzi's slave-catching group is the largest supplier of the single slave market. In addition, he has always shamelessly insisted that he was a prisoner of war obtained on the battlefield. The slave traders in single would not have trouble with the dinar. Because Fruz has always only captured slaves and sold them, wholesale, to slave traders but has never been involved in the slave market selling process. Yes, this is a supporting production enterprise that specializes in acquiring slaves. 
not a trading company that sells slaves. Single slave industry is clearly divided between upstream and downstream. And although Fruzzi's business is large, he never crosses the line. Business cooperation without competition is equivalent to a hardcore ally. Of course, the slave traders in single will join forces to keep this largest supplier. In other words, this guy is not only shameless, but also very sophisticated. In addition, he has many liars. Leon frowned. This kind of enemy is the hardest to deal with and will definitely not make any stupid mistakes. This means that the reason why this army is stationed here is definitely not because they are tired from the journey and need to rest for a night. The shield wind fortress is already in ruins and cannot protect it from wind and rain. Instead, it is easily discovered by the Nolder. If you really want to rest, you should go to the uninhabited land further west. Ms. Vendetir, what do you think we should do now? The Lord Lord turned around and asked. When Davier looked at the camp hundreds of meters away with disgust in his eyes. Surprise at night! We have enough strength to kill them! I guess that's what the enemy thinks. Then, I'll do as you say. Leon curled his lips and returned to the army. Half an hour later, when Davier indeed led her student army to directly launch a surprise attack. These 200 young Nolder were all elite archers. They stood in an array more than a hundred meters apart and began to cover the rain of arrows. The Sinjar people in the camp quickly poured out in all directions, looking like they were fleeing in all directions. They didn't sleep, and their reaction speed was amazing. They dropped their things and started running away. In fact, not many Sinjar people were hit by arrows. They started running away with their shields raised after more than a hundred meters. Of course, they were not easy to be shot to death, and they seemed to have left a lot of things in the camp. And there seemed to be a few L's. When Dadier immediately entered the single camp single-handedly and rushed towards the tide. Nua Nua maidens. But when she was still ten meters away, she suddenly stopped, dropped her bow, took off her sword and shield, and took a defensive stance. You are not. Bang! At this moment, in the camp, more than a dozen people suddenly emerged from the ashes on the ground. The Nordo girls also had sabers in their hands, and they all surrounded Windadier. Of course those, Nolder maidens, are not real. They are just a few who use wax camouflage to make long ears, put makeup on their faces, put on green clothes or were naked, made up to look like Nolder elves, and posed a human woman who looks like a slave. That's the single temptress from the slave-catching group. They probably saw that Windadier didn't get too close and knew they had been discovered. So they launched an ambush. Probably they usually use similar methods to deceive other nobles. This is very similar to the fallen women in the taverns of Lion City. It is said that in order to sell for a high price, the fallen women of Lion City will use white wax to disguise their ears as Nolder elves in various prostitution taverns, and then use a large amount of powder to make them thicker. She put on makeup to make her skin look white, and used spices to cover up the stench of abscesses on her body, and then hung around drunkards, who were so drunk that their eyesight could not be seen clearly. Windadier must have never seen these dirty tricks. And as a result, more than 20 temptresses surrounded her. At the same time, all the single people who were fleeing in the periphery seemed to have turned around and lined up. They picked up shields and bows and arrows, and gradually formed an encirclement. Their seemingly chaotic escape, just now, was actually gradually forming an encirclement for the Nolder Rangers, who were advancing deeper and deeper. Are you sure she's okay? Seeing Windadir facing more than 20 enemies alone, and seeing Islandil's calm and calm look, Leon felt a little uneasy. Islandil shook his head. No matter how much you take, it won't hurt her. Isn't Rasadalin already by your side? Rasadalin was indeed watching from the side. Right on the tree where he once shot the letter into the castle. And beside him were two twilight knights holding bows and arrows. This was all to avoid accidents. But Rasadalin found that he didn't seem to need to help. Chapter 180 It's up to you. Captain, Vindatil's fighting power is indeed terrifying. Faced with the siege of more than 20 Sinjar temptresses. Not only was she not injured, but she actually killed several of them in just a few seconds. She kept moving quickly to dodge left and right, using the shield in her hand to cover the low. She rarely took the initiative to attack, and only thrust out a sword after each successful block. Her swordsmanship looks very strange. The Nolder sigil sword in her hand is always stabbing, with few chopping movements, and no fancy moves. But every time she takes a shot, a temptress falls. Moreover, the direction of each thrust was not the direction she was facing. Almost every sword struck in the east and west. The shield in her hand was not in front of her, but was always tilted sideways. 
and it seemed that she was holding it a little too high. But in fact, her body center of gravity was lowered, and the shield protected her entire head and face, and her sight was always hidden in the shield. The enemy must not know where she was looking. This posture seemed strange, but the actual combat effect was extremely good. More than 20 temptresses did not hurt her at all, and at this time, she had already stabbed half of the more than 20 temptresses to death. The remaining witches knew that they were no match for Windadir, so they gave up the siege and scattered and fled to the periphery. On the outer battlefield, the enemies had formed a semicircle and formed a shield array to surround them. The rangers had begun to retreat while firing arrows to suppress them. But at this time, a cavalry galloped from behind these young rangers. This was indeed an ambush plan by the Fru Slave Catching Group. The camp was a bait, and the temptresses pretending to be girl rangers were also bait. Now they saw 200 young Nolder rangers, half of whom were Nolder maidens. All the ambush troops should have been dispatched. If this cavalry of more than 300 people breaks into the ranger array, and the surrounding single spearmen and temptresses swarm them, their numerical advantage will be magnified in the melee, and they will probably be able to capture many more girl rangers. The single riders who were speeding over had a greedy look in their eyes, and they all smiled ferociously, as if they were imagining the life of being a rich man in the future. But just when the cavalry started to accelerate, a loud arrow shot into the sky. Afterwards, two troops were killed from both sides of the battlefield. The Nolder warriors of Islandil stood out from the woods to the south while the Aang soldiers came out of the bushes on the hillside where Liang was hiding. Zhong stood up. Islandil himself was also in Liang's army. His Nolder warriors were led by three Twilight Knights. They divided into three teams in a rapid charge and appeared behind the single encirclement. The young rangers formed a flanking formation. The Nolder warriors did not rush into the enemy formation, but stood dozens of meters behind the enemy, and then quickly threw their bows and arrows. As for Liang and Islandil, while the cavalry formed a queue and charged at a faster speed, they led the troops behind the young rangers under Windadier and faced the cavalry rushing over 300 meters away. The battlefield situation reversed again. Her skills are really impressive. If she knows we are using her as bait later, will she beat me up? Seeing that the cavalry had not yet entered the shooting range, Liang asked Islandil next to him. It's hard to tell. She's never had a good temper. Islandil took off his bow. Put an arrow on it and curled his lips. Um, if she attacks me later, can you protect me? The Lord turned his head and took a look from afar. Windadier was running towards this direction. My swordsmanship is far inferior to hers. Anyway, this counter ambush plan was made by you. It's none of my business. Islandil shrugged regretfully, looking like an irresponsible scumbag. Leon rolled his eyes and said with a sad face, Your Highness Islandil, you can't harm your comrades like this. When they made the final plan, they did not tell Windadier because Windadier would not obey anyone's orders. When Lisa Dillon first discovered the enemy's location, Leong felt that there might be an ambush. So he kept his troops far away in the woods and did not get closer. But Windadier didn't trust the Lord yet. After seeing the enemy, this lady felt that she shouldn't waste time and plan to attack this straightforward woman directly. Lisa Dillon said that there seemed to be several girls in the enemy's camp, probably because I was too anxious and impatient. Leon originally planned to persuade him. But Islandil obviously knew Windatil very well. So he signaled Leon not to try to avoid getting beaten. Then Islandil proposed to get closer for reconnaissance before taking action. And then quietly discussed the countermeasures with Leon alone. His highness was not a reckless man. So the lord took Windadier with him to investigate closely. And Windadier's attitude was still to directly launch a surprise attack. In this case, he had to let her go. And the rest would be left to Leon and Islandil. To solve. Archers, come forward. Hold still. This is Liang's voice. Covering fire. Infantry on standby. At this time, more than 300 Sinar riders had entered the sprint distance of 100 meters. And some of the frontmost Sinjar riders were already preparing to charge into the formation with their lances in hand. Ladies, turn back and listen to your excellency Liang's orders for the time being. Islandil obeyed Liang's instructions at this time. His Highness obviously understood that there could only be one voice on the battlefield. So he asked all the female rangers to turn around and face the direction of the cavalry and follow Liang's command. Then he led the female rangers and started shooting arrows continuously. Islandil's archery skills are probably among the best in the entire continent. He is almost using a very casual posture to continuously open the bow. His shooting speed is so fast that it feels like he is completely unnamed. But every arrow will inevitably be shot. An enemy has fallen. 
the archers and rangers released two rounds of arrows. Under the covering fire, about 40 riders fell off their horses. The horses that lost their owners were spinning around in the battlefield, blocking the progress of some of the single riders in the back row. Free fire! Infantry on standby! More than a hundred enemies in the front row were still charging at high speed. The sound of horse hooves rumbled, and the ground could already be shaken. But Leong still shouted to the infantry not to move. Only the archers and Nolda rangers were shooting at the enemies in the front row, causing another twenty kills in the short distance where the enemies charged. Archers! Stand back! Stand up your shield! Raise your spear! It wasn't until the enemy was only a few dozen meters away that Leong gave the final order. The archers gave up their positions in the front row and the infantry stepped forward, thrust their large shields into the ground, and pointed their spears at the cavalry at an angle. When the guns were set up, the single riders were less than 30 meters away from this not-so-large front line. At this distance, the horror and despair in the eyes of the riders in the front row were extremely clear. During this last 30-meter stretch of life, the single riders must have been very sad. If they had known that a long conflict formation of the human army would appear here, they would definitely not have rushed over like this. But now, no matter whether the riders are willing or not, their speed has reached the highest level, and the distance is only 30 meters. No matter how good the riding skills are, they can't hold the horse back in this situation. A few riders did try to slow down or turn, but in fact this was suicide. There were other cavalry behind and beside them. As a result, rear-end collisions and horse collisions occurred continuously, which actually affected their formation. In addition, Islandil and the rangers had been shooting at high speed. In the end, only a few dozen riders rushed to the front of the formation. Only a dozen or so were able to rush into the formation side by side in the front row. And they did not have horse armor. The cavalry finally roared in despair and took the cover. Blood filled the air. People were on their backs. And horses were tumbling over. The screams of people and the neighing of horses were heard together. Fully sixty groups of large shields and spears stood in front of the formation. Most of the riders and their horses were stabbed through. It was only the impact of the horses that caused the infantry in the front row to pay the price of several injuries. It wasn't until the cavalry from the back row rushed in that two enemies successfully broke through the shield formation and rushed into the formation. However, one of them was stabbed to death by Windadier who just arrived, and the other was beheaded by Leong. Leong took advantage of this opportunity to get an uninjured Dexia war horse. At this time, there were more and more corpses and ownerless horses on the battlefield. It was difficult for the single riders to form an array in charge. So they all turned and circled. It was impossible for them to rush into the formation. So they had to shoot at each other instead. But the Nolder Rangers' shooting skills were obviously much better than theirs. And they could still cause considerable damage to them from a distance of a hundred meters. The Desha bow of the single riders is obviously not powerful enough. And the projectile effect is also very small in this case. In order to put the Desha bows in their hands into full play, these Sinjar riders got closer and began to speed up in circles, seemingly intending to shoot from close range. Seeing Windadier looking at him with an evil look, the Lord mounted his horse and rushed out of the array. He didn't really want to avoid Windadier, but he wanted to reduce the losses of his own troops and friendly forces. After getting the horse and holding the lance left by the rider of single, the Lord's combat effectiveness may have increased several times. For the Noldor, Bows and arrows are the weapons that best exert their combat effectiveness. But for Leon, he is the complete version on horseback. As soon as he got on the horse, the Lord raised the speed of the horse to the limit. This was actually very tiring, because a high-speed sprinting horse could only last for one minute. But it doesn't matter. The lance can only last three seconds. Anyway, there are horses and lances all over the ground now. So there is no shortage of equipment at all. But instead of confronting the Sinjar riders, the Lord rushed into the enemy's team from the side. Yes, Leong had just openly sneaked into the team of Sindar riders, who were riding and shooting in circles. But instead of chasing behind the team, he kept shuttling through the enemy team, holding a sword in one hand and a gun in the other. He is still the same as he was in the arena. His purpose is not to kill the enemy. The Nolder's bows and arrows kill the enemy more efficiently. His purpose is to disrupt the enemy's queue. He was wandering around in the middle of the enemy team. The enemy would be hacked to death by him if they tried to use bows and arrows to mount and shoot. And it was easy to accidentally injure friendly troops by shooting at Leon. However, the Nolder could still shoot and kill the enemy because Leon was not in front of them. On this side, there is no need to worry about accidental injury. The enemy cannot defeat Leon with lances or sabers. 
attacking each other on horseback in this high speed. Same direction movement is actually equivalent to a one-on-one -on -one duel and cannot form an encirclement. What the Lord is best at is single combat. As a result, the riding path of hundreds of single riders was disrupted by the Lord alone. The neatly circling team of single riders became chaotic and scattered. To solve this problem in the team, they had to disperse. After this breakup, the roots overlapped and hindered each other. And with the ownerless horses running around on the battlefield, the riders gradually became unable to form a formation. As more and more cavalry were shot to death, the Sinjar riders finally collapsed. And the remaining dozens of riders turned around and fled far away. The flight of the cavalry directly led to the complete collapse of the Fru Slave Catching Regiment. On the other side of the battlefield, the single spearman and the temptresses faced a hail of arrows from both sides. Although it was difficult, their losses were not particularly large. The spearmen and temptresses both had metal round shields. The large curved metal shield is quite effective in protecting against arrows. Moreover, they still had six to seven hundred people, and they were quickly retreating and rearranging their lineups. Intending to rely on their local numerical advantage to counter encircle the 200 Nolder warriors who were attacking behind them. If they can really execute it well, they may still not be able to turn defeat into victory. But at least they will have the ability to retreat while fighting. Because after a melee with the Noldor who are surrounding them, the young rangers in the front cannot fire arrows at will. However, the cavalry ran away at this time. So many single spearmen also began to flee the battlefield. On the contrary, those single temptresses were more determined. But they only held on for a few more seconds. When the spearmen all started to run for their lives, the temptresses had no choice but to run away. Vendatil! You can pursue the enemy now! The enemy had been completely defeated. And Leon returned to Windadier on horseback, looking at the female hero with a bad face. Your Excellency Leon! Are you using this method to let me see the cunning of human beings? Windadier looked unhappy. I admit that your judgment and tactics are correct. But the problem is... You didn't tell me! Leon turned his head and glanced. Islandel was far away. Well, this is actually the idea of His Highness Dill. He said that your martial art skills are rare in the world and can withstand any strong enemy. And your brave and strong character is as obvious as your beauty, which is enough to make you win without any disguise. The enemy is attracted to you. So we finally decided that you will face the enemy openly, and I will carry out this cowardly ambush. Leon flattered me with a smile. And by the way, it was indeed Isolandil's suggestion to let Islandil take the blame. But the final tactic was determined by Leong. I'm not so stupid that I can't distinguish between tactics and cowardice. Your Excellency Leong, I have seen your bravery. And I also know that you are trying to prevent us from losing money. But I don't like to be kept in the dark. Huh? From now on I, I will accept your command. But I hope you can tell me all the arrangements. Windadier said expressionlessly. She was not angry. It seemed that praise was useful after all. No matter how old a woman was. She also liked others to praise her. Of course. It is an honor for me to have a comrade like you. Ms. Windadier. Leong smiled and nodded. Then pointed at the Nolder Rangers who had begun to pursue them. Go and take care of them. Don't let them chase too far. Facing the retreating enemy army. They must expand their victory. Windadier and Islandil respectively led their men to pursue. Leong didn't chase after him. He was inspecting the loot and prisoners of war. And then discovered a troublesome situation. The captured Nuadua female rangers were not here. Most of the stolen Nolder equipment is not here either. And the enemy's leader, Fruzi, is also not here. A temptress among the prisoners of war explained the situation. Fruz had already left from the west with a team of about 20 people a few hours ago. This large force was arranged by Fruzi to stay here and try to see if any Nolder would chase them out. If there are, and there are too many of them, then set up an ambush and try to capture another group. If there are too many Noldos and it is difficult to fight then just block them for a while before running away. Anyway, the Noldos dare not chase too far. This is already human territory. This can at least delay time and ensure that Frau's returns with the spoils of war. Liang's judgment of Fruzi was correct. It is indeed difficult to deal with a person with a nickname like Shameless. It seemed that Frau's himself would have to be tracked down quickly. If Frau's escaped to single, it would be really troublesome to save people on the enemy's home court. But the problem is that the Nolder elves can no longer pursue them. Except for Leon. The other lords would probably start drooling and attack the Nuodua girls if they saw so many Nuodua girls appearing. This kind of local product has been more valuable than gold in the past 300 years. If you catch one, you can make a fortune. 
and the captured girl ranger must be rescued immediately. If it is too late, there may be some accidents. If she is sold, fortunately, he now had a lot of horses, and Leon quickly asked his cavalry to gather the horses. Neither Vindadil nor Islandil pursued them too far, and after killing most of the fleeing enemies, they returned to the vicinity of Shieldwind Fortress. Your Highness Islandil, I must fulfill my promise first, and we will discuss how to cooperate with you when I come back. Islandil nodded to express his understanding. He could not be as unfettered as Windadil. As the leader of the Aino family, he had too many things to consider, and he could only take his time in everything. Anson, go back and tell Aini to free up the temporary prison and let the Bacchus people do hard labor. By the way, tell the Bacchus people that if no one comes to redeem them, they will have to work hard for the rest of their lives. Windy dear, I will let Anson take your people back to White Deer Castle. I have a cornfield behind White Deer Castle. I will designate the nearby forest as your activity area. The city will also give you some provide a large camp. Of course, don't mind if I tell you the truth. It's actually a temporary prison I just built a few days ago. You go and stay first. If you have any needs, just tell Anson. Anson will help you complete the camp. Renovation. I will lead the team to rescue people, and I will definitely fulfill my words. The Lord quickly explained the affairs while Anson nodded like a chicken pecking at rice. Your Excellency Leon, if Rasadalan can follow you, then of course I can too. I am his teacher. Windadier shook his head and said that he would go with him to save people. Then you must promise to obey my orders. Leon stared into Windadier's eyes. And first of all, you have to dress yourself up like a human. Otherwise you will attract countless coveted eyes. Leon doesn't think that Yvonne Dartier's character can lurk in the shadows like Rissa Dillon but this kind of action does require her fighting power. When Dadier hesitated for a second, then nodded. I promise to listen to your arrangements. Captain, for such a master thug, the Lord certainly wished that she could always be in the team. But unfortunately, there was no prompt for her to join the team. It seems that this master is just joining the team temporarily. She will not easily become someone else's subordinate, or she will not be loyal to anyone. Afterwards, Anson took most of the troops, and 200 young Nolder rangers from various ethnic groups to clean up the battlefield and return to White Deer Castle. The Lord, with about 50 cavalrymen, 20 of whom were new recruits, and all the horses left behind by the single riders, pursued them westward at full speed. 